Recorded Books presents Kingdoms of Death, The Sun Eater, Book 4, by Christopher Rocchio, narrated by Samuel Rukin. Chapter 1 Twilight Night Night had fallen on Akana, and clung about the rooftops and bristling antennae that crown the old refinery like weathered tombstones. No light of moon was there, and the stars kept silent vigil, distant and cold as the grey sands that flatly stretched the horizon all around. The pale won't know what hit them, Crim said, whispering despite the relative safety of the ship around us. I sensed the anticipation in the man, sensed it in all the men about me, the soldiers huddled like the Achaeans in the bowels of their wooden horse. Each one of them seemed to be holding his breath. They better not, groused Polino. The fleet's still three hours behind. Heat sinks are holding, my lord, said the pilot officer, reassuring. Only way they'll see us coming is if they sight us out a window. I knew the pilot was right. The Ascalon was the fastest ship in our fleet a chalice-class interceptor whose massive heat sinks made it possible to mask its sublight emissions for days, thus making it invisible to heat and light detection and perfect for such stealth missions as ours. It was a small ship, a mere 500 feet from end to end, its hydroponics and life support systems designed to support an active crew of perhaps 10 men and few creches to sustain another 40. A small compliment, but enough, I prayed, for our task. Three hours. We had three hours to secure the Yamato fuel works at Verdi Planum. Peering out the slit window, I could clearly see the silver line of the bundled Hadron Colliders. Fully operational, the machines produced kilotons of antimatter a day. Iron hearts synthesizing the volatile substance from the collision of the smallest quanta to fuel the sector's starships. In the distance, I could make out the silver domes where containment silos waited to be hauled from Ekana's surface to high orbit. Without antimatter, our starships could not travel faster than light's slow speed. Without Ekana, the local capital at Nessus, and by extension the great mass of the Imperial Navy in the Centaurine provinces, was as good as crippled. It was a cunning target. It was not like the Sielsen to choose cunning targets. Not like most Sielsen. Something of my disquiet must have registered on my face, for Polino asked, You all right, Haid? I snapped my attention to the other man, found him watching me with shrewd eyes. When I'd first met Polino on Emesh centuries before, he'd been a grizzled old soldier, one-eyed and scarred. Decades of loyal service to myself and to the Imperium had won him a new eye and a second youth, while I, whose palatine genetic advantages promised me centuries, had grown older. Polino had slept for nearly a hundred years on ice aboard the Tamerlane while I had served as counsellor to the Magnarch on Nessus. I had passed him by, but even still there was a spark of almost paternal concern in the once older man's face. This attack has Dereka's name all over it, I said. Sure I was right. The scourge of earth, they called it. The prophet. Prince of the princes of the Sielsen, great enemy of man. While most of the great Sielsen war fleets migrated from system to system, burning and pillaging entire worlds as they went, Dereka moved deliberately. Its alien mind had grasped our own strategy with a vision none of its fellows possessed. It burned shipyards, disrupted supply chains, captured legionary transports. Polino made a face. You don't know that? I do, I said, eyes flitting over the masked and armoured soldiers of our cadre. My red company. Raising my voice, I addressed them all. I want the refinery cleared before our fleet arrives. I leaned away from the bulkhead, 
one hand grasping the loop on the padded arch above my head to steady myself. I want clean knife work, lads. We must not alert their ships to our presence. It was imperative we seize the fuel works by hand. It took one errant shot from a ship's tactical maser or misplaced photonic explosive to detonate the huge AM reservoirs beneath the outlying domes. And there was enough antimatter on Ekana to transform Verdi Planum from plateau to crater and crack the planet's crust. Clean as can be, Lord, said Krim, one hand checking the set of knives in the bandolier he wore. The Ascalon banked into a low arc, its knife-like body cupping the air as we slid lower. The silver line of the foundry's colliders swung into place beneath us. Prepare yourselves, I exclaimed, and pressed the trigger on my suit's neck flange, which triggered the helmet to rise. Metal panels rose about my face, unfurling like the petals of a flower, and closed about my head. The suit's augmented vision flickered on a moment after. Twin cones of light projected onto my retinas. Polino and Krim had done the same. A sea of armoured soldiery stared back at me, featureless ivory masks with the pitchfork and pentacle of the Red Company painted over the spot where their left eye should be. We had to move fast. The few seconds where the Ascalon hovered above the top of the collider were the most risky. It would be all too easy for any of the Xenobites in the refinery ahead to spot the vessel crouching like a vulture above the pipeline. Venting the cabin in five, four, three. The end of the pilot officer's countdown vanished beneath the rush and thunder of blood in my ears. Almost seventy years I'd been trapped on Nessus, my punishment for surviving the trial on Thermon. That trial had cost another twelve years. It had been more than a century since I'd faced the Sielsen in battle. So long. The shudder of my own heart was drowned by a violent hissing as the Ascalon's rear compartment was vented of air. Akana had none, and so the ramp opened on grim silence. All the better. There would be no wind to carry our voices or the clangor of our feet. I led the way down the ramp, Polino close at my side. Ahead, a few hundred yards of covered pipeline marched toward the squat and brutish buildings of the refinery complex. Not far ahead to either side, the rails of ladders rose, and with a gesture I ordered that my men should fan out. I paused to let them filter past, and turning back, watched the back blade of our starship rise on silent repulsor fields, ramp closing. Then it was gone. A darker shadow against the dark of night. Lord Marlow, the man who had spoken, was a common trooper, the last in line. I realized then that I'd been standing atop the collider for far too long. My gaze lingered on the silver expanse of the machine where it marched out to the horizon. The refinery's hadron colliders girdled the entire planet, so if I'd wanted, I might have followed the track of that machine about the planet's equator until I came upon the complex from the far side. A single road unbroken, a ring around the world. Lord Marlow, the man said again. Stirring at last, I followed him down the ladder. The men ahead of me moved in triasses, in knots of three darting cover to cover. We progressed quickly along the ramparts that ran along the outside of the great machine, and for the better part of a minute, the only sound in my universe was the noise of my own boot heels reverberating through my armoured suit. Contact, one of the soldiers said, on the left. A horned figure stood upon the roof of the nearest building, black against the darkness, an unearthly gargoyle crouched upon the heights above. It had not marked our approach, and I caught myself wondering if our inhuman adversary had fallen asleep at its watch. One of our hoplites raised his lance, Invisibly, a laser flashed, smote the gargoyle. No sound, no cry. The horned figure toppled, fell. Two more, came the voice of one soldier over the line. Nice shot, one three. They're down, came the first voice again. Sure seems like they weren't expecting us, said another. There's almost no guard. And why would there be? 
the Sielsin were counting on their long-range sensors, were counting on us to launch a full frontal assault on their orbital blockade. They were not expecting the attack to come from men on the ground. And therein lay our advantage and our hope. Ahead, the central building loomed. There, the newly created antimatter was extracted from the collider and funneled through magnetic coils to storage in one of the outlying silos. There, too, were the controls for the whole refinery. Our goal. If we could shut down the collider and clear the refinery of the volatile substance, we'd be able to bring ships and troops down with impunity when the fleet arrived. We would need them. A hatch cycled on the wall to our right, and a figure in gnarled black stepped out. Eight feet tall it was, and it had to stoop to clear the airlock. At a glance, the xenobite might have been human, two arms, two legs, a slim torso. The horns atop its head might have been only some feature of its cruel helmet. But I knew the Sielsin well, knew the subtle differences the way the uncanny horror of the creatures unrolled itself the longer one looked at them. The arms were too long, with grasping hands possessed of too many fingers, with too many joints. The legs were bowed and crooked, the torso at once too slim and too short, and the crown of horns was not a feature of any helm, but a part of the inhuman creature's own flesh. It hadn't expected us, betrayed surprise in the way it flinched as its white-masked face turned and saw us, the circular black lenses over its eyes wide and staring. Crim's hand flashed, and a moment after the creature folded, Ica black as ink spraying from a wound in its throat. Crim leaped upon the body, tugging the slender blade free with a motion that tore the inhuman neck open. Krim hardly broke stride, signalled two knots of men to retrace the creature's path into the still open hatch. Check inside. There may be more, he said, voice void of expression. We'd studied schematics of the Yamato refinery en route to Ekana, and a three dimensional projection of the plans floated in the periphery of my vision. I don't like this, Haid, Polino said, speaking over a private connection so as not to upset the men. It's too bloody quiet. That'll change soon enough, I said. Door's not far. Krim had reached the door as I spoke. A heavy square portal of solid steel, not an airlock. The areas of the refinery surrounding the Hadron Collider's collection ports were kept in vacuum to better isolate the antimatter in the event of a leak. Another layer of security, futile though it perhaps was, one of the men hunched over the control panel and in a moment had the entire unit off the wall. He drew a thin wire from his armor's gauntlet terminal and inserted it into the new hole he'd made. Can you open it? Krim asked. I could hear the tech's frown through his mask. Yes, sir, but they'll know the minute we do, working on override. We should backtrack through that side hatch that one came out of, Polino suggested jerking his head in the direction of the creature dead upon the catwalk behind. No good, I said, double-checking the map to be sure. We'll get tangled up in fuel collection. We need to get up to central control, lock the building down. The tech swore. No good, I can't cycle the door without lighting up security. Can you disable the sensors? Krim asked. We'll burn our way in. They're sure to pick up the temp spike, the fellow said. Then we'll have to cut our way in, I said, shouldering men aside. My hand went to the magnetic hasp at my right hip, armoured fingers finding the familiar Jadian leather grip of my sword. Stand aside, soldier. The technician did as he was told. All clear, my lord. Fingers tightened on the dual trigger, and the high matter blade flowered like a ray of moonlight on that world that had never known a moon. The exotic material rippled like quicksilver in the air, gleaming like a spike of liquid crystal. I checked my advance, sword casting ghostly highlights on the catwalk beneath us, and the metallic wall rising at our side. My left hand went to the catch that activated my suit's body shield, 
and I prepared myself for whatever was to come. I had been so long removed from the fighting that I had forgotten the charge of it, the harp-string tension in the air. Almost I felt a boy of thirty again, not a man of three hundred thirty. I plunged the point of the sword into the door. The metal cut easily. The atom-fine edge of my weapon sheared between molecules, and in short order I'd carved a ragged hole in the steel. I stepped back, blade humming in my grip, as Krim and two legionnaires stepped in and pushed on the door. It fell with a muted bang that reverberated up from my boots. A noise felt, not heard. Krim went first, one hand still clutching his bloody knife, the other grasping the hilt of the ceramic sword in his belt. He moved like a stalking panther, head down between his shoulders, footfalls delicate. The men behind moved like chess pieces, stiff and precise, sweeping the grey hall with the points of their short lances, ready to fire at the first signs of life. No alarm sounded. No guard sprang to alert. All too easy, I heard Polino say. I silenced him with a look and followed our men across the threshold, my shadow stretched before me by the torch beams of the men at my back. The moment I entered the hall, I saw a flash of light reflected on the polished walls and heard the hoarse shouts of men. Contact! Contact! One of the men staggered back into the hall from a side passage. Lance raised as he wrestled with something silver that wound itself snake-like about his weapon arm. Nahute! I exclaimed, lurching forward. The alien drone coiled tight about my soldier's arm. He screamed, panic flooding the comms channels as the metal serpent tightened. I saw the man's arm break as the snake bent his elbow backward. The soldier hit the ground, his cries turned to shrieking. Hold still, I said trying to straighten the ruined arm. Nothing in the man's response indicated he had heard me. He screamed as I steadied his arm. The serpent drone twisted its tail around my own wrist, lifting my sword. I slashed the snake in half, felt the machine die, and tumbled to the floor. "'Can you stand?' I asked, offering my hand to the injured man. I never heard his answer. Two more of the silver drones spiralled out of the dark from the side passage, drill-bit teeth whining. One shot over my head as I turned, and the other caromed off my shield. So fast did it travel in its eagerness to reach me. The second fell in the flash of my blade, and I stood square to face the dark opening of that side passage, waiting. A white face hovered in the gloom, sharp-chinned and featureless, but for its gaping black eyes. Horns, talons, a wicked white sword. The Sielsen berserker launched itself at me, elongated body seeming to materialize as if condensed from the shadows. I knew then who had thrown the serpent drones at us, and lunged forward to meet it, praying the beast had not put out the alarm. The white sword flashed over my head as I ducked, alien ceramic notching the steel of the doorframe. The creature had not seen high matter before, I guessed, for it seemed not to realise its danger. Nothing would stop a high matter blade short of the long chain carbons of adamant of which starship hulls are made. Unless it was high matter itself. The rubberized polymers of the inhuman's bodysuit were no obstacle. Rising from my crouch, I dragged my sword through a rising arc that sliced through door frame and foe alike. The creature fell in two pieces. They must know we're here by now, Polino said, coming to my side, weapon raised. I kicked the fallen Xenobite sword from nerveless fingers, spurned the body with my toe. Dim red lights flickered from pockmarked recesses in the slashed breastplate, made black blood shine. Suit diagnostics? Or the indicator of some distress signal? I knew Polino was right. We have to move. The first half hour of our window was gone, and our secrecy with it. I told myself the Sielsen had no way of knowing if they faced an army or a last desperate survivor of the refinery work crew. But that did little to allay my concerns as we climbed square spiral stairs. Nearly five hundred workers had lived on site, 
the only permanent inhabitants of airless and arid Ekana. I shudder to think of the fate that had befallen them. Refinery control was not far, up several levels and along a gallery overlooking fuel collection and the maintenance tram. The chamber itself lay at the end of an access way that ran out above the refinery floor so that the techs might peer down at their complex machinery. It was sure to be guarded. As I mounted the third landing, the stairs shook, and above I saw the flash of energy lances as men shouted over the line. The lack of air may have afforded us silence as we entered the fortress, but it had its disadvantages too. We had not heard them coming. "'Stay back!' Polino said, throwing an arm across my chest to stop me climbing. Above I saw the horned shapes of the enemy vying with our men in the entrance, a half-dozen at least. The steel runners rattled beneath my feet, and looking down I saw more horns behind. Black shapes moving on the stairs. "'No good!' I shouted. The whole stair fell by inches, its bolts torn loose. Polino and I lurched against the rail, and looking down I saw the white and silver jewel scarab shape of a Cielsin chimera. The alien brain inside the machine regarded me a moment through optic sensors. Little of the creature it had been remained, and the body the Cielsin's human allies had built for it was stronger than any flesh. Its jointed iron hand clutched the bottom of the stair, rail crushed like paper in its fingers. "'Climb!' I shouted, shoving Polino on. We made the landing just as the creature tore the steps free. They tumbled a dozen feet and hit the steps below with a resonant boom that echoed up my feet. Two men fell with them. They'd been too slow. The chimera flexed its mighty thighs, pistons firing, and leaped. Polino fired, but his lance was absorbed by the monster's shield. The magi who had crafted the thing's new body had lavished all their art upon it. Jointed white fingers closed on the lip of the landing at our heels, but the beast had forgotten elementary physics. The tremendous weight of its body bent the metal of the platform, and I felt a grinding beneath my feet as mighty bolts scraped against the poured stone wall of the stairwell. We ran, spurring our men ahead of us, I followed them through the open door onto the gallery above, stepping over the bodies of man and xenobite alike. Krim's sword drew a black line across the throat of one attacker and moved smoothly to parry the strike of the next. Flowing like water, the Norman swordsman punched his assailant under the arm with one of his knives, drew it out wet. The ink-dark substance boiled in that airless place, and the desperate creature tried to return the favour, only to be skewered on the bayonet of the nearest soldier's lance. The gallery ahead was filled with horned devils, white-masked, black-armoured, wielding scimitars, the colour of bone, or else grasping Nahute, coiled in hooked hands like silver whips. Nothing for it. No way out but through. "'Seal the door!' someone called, and the bulkhead closed behind us. Through sloping windows at our left, a man might look down upon the cluster of Hadron Colliders where they passed collection, and the magnetic siphons that channeled the volatile fuel out towards the silos. I had a fleeting glimpse of the control room through the window, hanging like an inverse mushroom above the refinery floor. But the shouts of men over the comm line filled my ears, and I came crashing back to myself. There must have been a score of them in the hall between us and the airlock to access refinery control. The space between us was filled with the snarling of flying drones and the slashing of blades. Energy lances fired, shield curtains gleamed. Men died, and Cielsin too. Krim's sword sketched a bloody maze through the bodies of those who fell upon him until his red and white armour was stained black. I slew two of them myself. The sword Sir Alorin had given me so very long ago made short work of the enemy. An Ahute had gotten through the shield of one of our hoplites and chewed between the plates of his armour. Red blood ran and boiled like the black, and I saw three men cut down where they stood. But we were gaining ground. Doom! The floor beneath us shook. 
and looking back I saw the heavy steel of the bulkhead warp inward as though some mighty fist were knocking. The chimera had reached the door. Into the airlock, Krim shouted. Those doors were double the strength of the ones we'd just closed, and electromagnetically shielded, for what little good that would do in the event of a critical failure to the refinery systems. With antimatter, there is no containment, no shielding. Annihilation will out. Doom. Another blow dented the far door. I stood on the threshold of the airlock, looking back across a river of dead men and monsters. We were almost there. Lord, close the door, I said. Chapter 2 Truth How long will the door hold? I asked the room at large, surveying the control chamber and the dozen or so inhuman bodies we'd left slumped in chairs or over consoles. Despite the size of the Cielsin fleet in orbit about Ekana, they had left remarkably few defenders in the refinery station itself. I supposed they must have concentrated their efforts on the fuel silos, preparing to offload the valuable material up the gravity well. I didn't know the man who answered, voice flattened by his helmet in the stale air of the control room. Long enough, unless they brought something bigger than that giant. They might blast their way in, suggested another. Not this close to the collider, Krim objected. They're not suicidal. But I had seen the Cielsen throw themselves to their deaths on foot and in space, and I wasn't so sure. Eyes locked on the tangle of magnetic coils that spider-webbed the chamber below. Can you shut it all down? The man hunched over the central console paused and looked back at me. I think so, Lord. It's more complicated than the fuel shunt on the Tamerlane, but I've nearly got the collider down. It should be a simple matter of letting the siphons funnel the AM out to storage. He was a junior engineer, one of Ilex's men. Should be, Polino asked. The Kiliarch glanced up at me from his place by the central console. I didn't need to see his face to feel the disbelief and exasperation wafting off him. I raised a hand for quiet, locked eyes with my thin reflection in the alum glass. My reflection peered back. Black mask fashioned in the shape of an impassive human face, touched with labyrinth tracery about the eyes. The armour still fit after so long, breastplate shaped in Roman fashion after a muscled human torso. The pitchfork and pentacle cartouche of my house, set amidst eight mighty wings resplendent in enamelled crimson in the centre of my chest. This over a tunic of matching red, strapped to rouges at shoulder and waist, leather intricately embossed. The gauntlets and greaves were richly shaped, decorated with sculpted ceramic vines and faces. And above it all, the cape, black above, red below, fastened at the right shoulder. Lord Hadrian Marlowe stared at me from my reflection, not really seeing. In the momentary calm I saw, he saw, we saw, the infinite manifold us. A thousand Hadrians stared back at me from that glass. A thousand thousand eyes, ten thousand thousand black masks. All the infinite versions of myself spread out across the infinite versions of that instant. Each one slightly different, and more different, the further those reflections stretched from me. As I watched, I saw countless versions of myself vanish wiped out in a flash of light as the tech at the console failed. Whole parallel worlds vanished from my sight as his mistakes killed us. I did not understand the choices the fellow was making, do not understand the mechanics of particle accelerators or electromagnetic siphons. But I understood their consequences well enough. It is said that in the presence of an observer— the particles of light collapse from waves of energy into the beams our eyes understand, that the presence of consciousness alters reality itself. The quiet changed something in me upon their mountain. 
I felt then as I imagine a blind man must feel, opening his eyes for the first time. As if I'd been blind all my life. As our eyes make straight the waves of light, my new vision straightened time. I had only to look, to concentrate, to choose. I chose for us to live, focused on a path through time where containment didn't fail. I've done it, the technician said, unaware of my influence. The vision faded, reflections dripping back together, infinity collapsing until I stared at my solitary reflection once again, eye to eye. Very good, soldier, I said, screwing my eyes shut inside the helmet. Calling on the vision was never easy. How long until the fleet arrives? Krim had removed his helmet and ran a hand through his shaggy mane of curling dark hair. One hour, thirty-seven minutes. We can hold here. He squinted, peering through the windows back toward the gallery whence we'd come. I followed his gaze to the gallery we'd so recently vacated. Sielsen's soldiers moved hurriedly along it, back and forth, relaying orders or else carrying equipment. They won't dare blast their way in. They'll use plasma cutters. Most like, I agreed. Still more of the creatures were moving on the floor of the refinery below. Evidently the bulk of the force remaining on the station had found us. There must have been two, perhaps three hundred of them. Not for the first time, I wished I were a scoliast, able to subitize their precise number at a glance. As we spoke, a faint mechanical whining, almost unnoticeable from the moment we passed through the airlock to the command centre, began to slow. Below us, the great engine that wrapped about the planet began to shut down. With the collider stopped, it would not be long before the siphons emptied the refinery of its volatile product and funneled it to the storage silos miles off. It was possible the pale wouldn't notice, standing in vacuum as they were. If they did, they might opt to blow the control centre entire and abscond with the fuel already in the outlying silos. They had no notion that the fleet was coming, or when it might arrive. But I thought not. It was not like Siriani de Reica to waste an asset, and the Yamato fuel works was an asset. No, the pale prince of princes would try to squeeze it for all it's worth. The Sielsin would not risk trying to destroy the refinery until they were sure they couldn't hold it. That was why it was imperative the Collider be powered down. Active, a single shot might trigger a runaway annihilation. Inactive, it might sustain damage. But damaged was not destroyed. Stalemate. For the moment. I don't like this, Polino grumbled. Not having a way out. We have a way out, Krim said, removing something from a pouch on his belt. Despite decades in Imperial service, the former Norman mercenary still wore his striped red and white Jadian kaftan over his armour. The older soldier rounded on Krim. Sitting on our ass is not a way out. Krim leaned against a console with the ease of one lingering in a city park. He peeled the wax paper off the candy he'd taken from his belt and popped it into his mouth, chewing thoughtfully. They'll be here. He tossed the paper on the floor. Want one? Polino shook his head and turned away, letting the silence stretch awkward between them. I did not intervene. The other soldiers all stood in knots in the doors, one man bent over the security terminal that monitored the airlock and the gallery doors. Presently, one of the junior men, another who'd removed his helmet, cleared his throat and said, Can I? Can I have one, sir? Wordless, Krim reached into his belt pocket once more and tossed the fellow a candy. No one else asked. Collider should be fully powered down in another nine minutes, the tech said. Magnetic siphons cleared in thirteen. I allowed the man the barest nod and touched him on the shoulder as I passed toward the door. What are they doing? I asked the man at the console. He flinched as if struck. I'm not sure, my lord. They've run a cable from downstairs, but the cameras are out all along the gallery. Didn't want us watching. He glanced up at me and away. I think they've gone for some kind of plasma bore. Cut their way in like the commander was saying. It's hard to tell at this angle. I peered over his shoulder at the holograph plate. 
It showed the feeds from four different cameras within the airlock, only one of which peered out through one alum glass panel toward the outer door. The massive chimera stood stolidly outside the door, blank face staring fixedly at the command centre. Unmoving. It must have tried its luck on the airlock door and been defeated by the cubit-thick steel. Its comrades busied themselves with a heavy black crate. Its surface ribbed and gnarled, as though it were the rotting carcass of a box. It was definitely some sort of weapon. Plasma cutter, possibly. Some kind of drill. It's a pity we can't talk to them, I said, wincing inwardly. Seldom had I spoken truer words. Without air in the outer hall, I could not speak to our attackers in the gallery. Unless... Can you access the public address system? The soldier fumbled on the controls. I think so, yes. You're one of the new ones, aren't you? I asked. We'd taken on new men for the expedition. So many of the Red Company's technical and support staff had been stripped from the Tamerlane after my trial on Thermon. Ship technicians and engineers were always in short supply, and with the Tamerlane in mothballs with its crew for almost a century while I languished in a gilded cage on Nessus, they had been needed elsewhere. I had been given new men when the crisis on Ikana had ended my seventy years in purgatory. The man stopped fussing with the security terminal. Yes, Lord Marlow. First tour. What's your name, lad? Leon. Leon, I said, studying the fellow's rank insignia. He wore a hoplite's heavy plate, but his shoulder panels bore the red circles of an ensign. That's a very old name. Aye, my lord. It's been in my family for a very long time. You've never seen the Sea Elson before, have you, Leon? Only in the hollows. I could hear the pained expression he wore and the stain in his voice. I didn't think they'd be so big. He turned his masked face to look at mine. Is it true they... eat people? Beneath the mask I smiled, thinking of a dinner conversation more than three hundred years gone, and of my brother Crispin. Do you doubt it? I asked. No. I did. I said. When I was a boy, I believed it was a story the Chantry told to frighten us into war. Why was I unburdening myself on this young man so? Had I been so long out of the world of battle? Was it nerves? Or had I become an old man in truth beneath my body's still youthful appearance? But some stories are true. That's a terrible thing. Better to believe nothing is true, and you're free to make what you want of the world. My lord, Leon's frown was as audible as his pain had been. I won't lie to you, I said. It doesn't get any easier, fighting. I clapped him on the shoulder. But we'll fight together, eh? The junior man stood a little straighter. I, sir. Put me through public address and step aside, I said. Leon did as I asked, and I marked how much surer were his fingers on the controls, though privately I was glad it had not been him in charge of depowering the matrix of Hadron Colliders. A blue light pulsed in the corner of the holograph plate, indicating the feed was live. Most of the refinery was airless, but there were pockets like the control room that were conditioned for the comfort of the work crew. Though most of the address system would wind silently in vacuum, I was sure to be heard somewhere and I was doubly sure the Chimera would hear with its internal radio, along with any more of its kind on the base. Bayarum bem o ajun, I said, speaking the Zenobite's own tongue. You have us surrounded. I would speak to your leader. My likeness was sure to be displayed on every holograph plate in the refinery, black and red. Even in places where my message would not be heard, my face, my mask, would be seen. I had fought the Sielsin for hundreds of years, on dozens of worlds, battled them from the far expanse of Norma and up and down the Centaurine provinces, Aptica and Oxiana, Berenike and Matina, Comum and Senuesa. My face and mask were known. The inhuman reply came slowly, 
as if our foe were waking from long sleep or deep focus. No image appeared on the plate. The voice that spoke was higher and colder than any human tone, and flat of all affect. You are the devil, it said. In the flesh, I answered it. You have the command here? Daratolo ne, the creature said, strange flat voice crackling as the signal faltered. You live, after all this time. I had almost lost hope of meeting you. I stood stock still, glad of my suit's mask for fear the Xenobite would have understood the look of surprise that coloured my face. It was not the greeting I'd expected. After a moment's hesitation, I managed to say, Who are you? I did not know the voice. You killed two of my sister brothers, it said. Rakata Ude Tiwi Tidiu We are four now. The answer clicked into place like the Mr. Gog's last fortune card. Ayubalu, I said. Bahude. A wordless snarl answered me, grinding like the noise of saw blades. It was no natural sound, as though the voice were generated on some soundboard and not the product of any throat. Those names had riled it. You are one of the Yedir. The Yedir Yamani, the White Hand, were Syriani Dereka's generals, its concubines and sworn servants. Each one had been given a machine body by its master. No two of them alike. I had killed one fighting on the road to Nemavand, and with the help of the Irktani, we had slain another on Berenike. You dare speak their names, the creature said. They're moving in the gallery, Polino's voice cut across my attention, and I spared a glance through the window to where the Sielsin massed by the outer door of the airlock. They'd removed the lid of their box, though what lay within I could not tell from my vantage point. The flat, cold voice was not finished. I will bring you to my master, it said. You may try. A taut smile pulled one corner of my mouth. Might I know the name of my destroyer? I asked. The creature made a high keening sound, like a woman wailing. It was a Sielsin laugh. I am Hushansa, the many-handed. Vayadan bash yomu! and I will enjoy watching him break you. My master has desired you for so long. It took every effort to stop my stomach turning over. I knew all too well what the Sielsin were capable of. But I said, You haven't won yet. Siajenu Tisayem Yukia Nuri, Hushansa exclaimed. You have nowhere to run. You cannot escape. You will be ours. That is what your brothers thought, I said, matching the alien coldness and cut the transmission. Turning, I found Polino watching me through his helmet. What was that for? I wanted to know who we were fighting, I answered him. And I wanted it to see me. Why? my old friend asked. No other soldier would have dared question me in front of the others. Because now it wants me alive. I replied. They won't try anything that's sure to kill us all. Polino fell silent, seeing the logic in this. I could almost hear the man's teeth grinding like gears beneath his helmet. We're still stuck here. No, we're not, I said, moving to the window and looking down on the refinery floor. Groups of Sielsin still hurried about or else stared up at us with their hideous white masks. They had no firearms, and I took the fact that none had trained explosives on us as evidence that my hypothesis was correct. I checked my wrist terminal for the time. Seventy-nine minutes till our fleet arrives. We'll drag this out so long as we can. In the gallery beyond the airlock, the Sielsen had readied their machine. Hoses and cables ran from the stair in the lower halls, and the machine itself rose on three spindly legs. It was some manner of plasma bore, a bit of repurposed mining equipment retrofitted to melt through the reinforced metal of the door. 
that the machine's alien makers had built it for hollowing out the asteroid warrens they made their home, I did not doubt. How much time do we have? I asked, watching them clamp the device to the airlock door. To my surprise, it was Leon who answered. Those doors are eighteen inches thick. If that burner of theirs is close to one of ours, fifteen minutes, twenty? For each door, I mused. It wasn't enough time. It was barely half the time we needed. Remind me, how much longer until we're sure the siphons are clear? The tech who'd powered down the collider cleared his throat. They're clear already. Good, I said. They must have cleared while I was speaking with Leon or with Hushansa. Mine the door. Use the biggest charges you have. The order was met with dumb silence. The men all looked at me. None dared speak. I knew what they must be thinking. Even with the refinery cleared of antimatter, setting off high-powered explosives in so confined a space was a death sentence. I ignored them. Lord? Move! The end came in time. The Cielsen succeeded in melting through the outer airlock door, and after a few minutes' careful fumbling, transported their plasma drill through the glowing hole they'd made. The Chimera followed, leading ranks of Cielsen troopers as they set to work on the inner door. It was going to be close. I explained my plan and stood waiting, watching as the doors began to glow dull red, then golden. Fifty minutes till the fleet arrives, Crim said. He'd been counting off the time in five-minute intervals. We should move. The Norman had donned his helmet once again and stood with one hand on the hilt of his sword. Almost there, I said. Every second was a gift. The moment I made my move, the Cielsin below would be all over us. I didn't think the Chimera from the stair was this Hushansa. There would be others where the first Chimera had come from, and worse. Get ready, I said, watching the steel begin to flow like melting ice. It was time. I drew my sword and cut my circle. The floor fell away beneath me, and I rode it down. Forty feet straight down to the level of the refinery floor. My suit's gel layer took the impact, protected my bones and delicate joints. Still, I winced as I rolled clear. Shield up, sword in hand, but unkindled to protect myself from the fall. Men fell after me like a heavy rain until all forty-two who remained of the three score we'd brought were down. I gave the signal and the control room above erupted in oily scarlet flames. A secondary explosion followed as the plasma bore detonated. I pictured the chimera and the scores of inhuman soldiers packed into the airlock turned to cinders and winced, imagining the whole factory erupting from some overlooked sample of the precious fuel. No annihilation came. Only the enemy, circling like sharks. Chapter 3 The Red and the Black What is that classical English expression? Out of the frying pan into the fire. We were surrounded, but we had struck a mighty blow against the enemy, and we had less than an hour before our fleet arrived. We could make it, but only if we could win free to some better position. My stunt in the control room had bought us time, and taken out an entire enemy platoon, but I'd thrown us from one desperate position to another. All the air in the command centre had rushed out when I'd cut the floor out from under us, and the lances of the men about me fired mutely at the approaching foe. Bright spots flashed against their rubberized armour and smoked as they fell. There's no way they can power on the refinery again after that, Crim said, looking up at the ruins of the control room. We should radio the Ascalon for evac. It can get here before the fleet. They know we're here now, I said. They'll be on guard. Shoot it right out of the sky. We need the fleet for cover. As I spoke, I slashed one of the enemy's Nahute in half, ending its murderous flight. A lone Cielsin berserker leaped down from a catwalk over our heads, the point of its sword thrust down to skewer me. I jumped aside, 
The Xenobite's ceramic blade bit the floor and splintered. It rounded on me, abandoning its broken sword. The creature was strangely puppet-like with its face hidden, like one of the full-scale marionettes one sometimes saw perform at the courts of Nipponese lords. Polino's voice dominated the line. We can't stay here! The tram! someone shouted. The tram. There were a set of maintenance tram cars that ran along the exterior of the Collider Beltway, making it so that workers could ride all around the massive machine if necessary to effect repairs. There were way stations placed at regular intervals about the track for those repair missions that took station techs thousands of miles from the compound on Verdi Planum. They relied on magnetic accelerators and in the airless environs of Ekana could reach speeds of nearly 300 miles per hour. Will it work? I asked. A thin voice rose in answer. Should do. The trams should be on a separate system. They're not far, said another. We still have to get there, said a third. Then move, I ordered, brandishing my sword in the direction of the platform. Another trio of Cielsen screamers clambered down from atop the housing of one of the magnetic coils. Polino shot one and ran the second through with the bayonet of his lance. The other's sword clanged against his armour, and another soldier shot the creature before it could try again. The nearest tram platform was not far, straight ahead and down a short stair beneath the track of the Hadron Colliders, where it ran clear through the refinery. Krim was already at the steps, locked in combat with one of the pale. Another of the Nahute flew past my head, braided metal body rolling against my shield like a passing eel. I heard a man scream and to my left I saw him fall, writhing as one of the alien drones chewed through his suit's underlayment and burrowed in the flesh beneath. Something huge and white landed on the nearest catwalk, and the thin strand of metal buckled beneath its weight and crashed to the floor in eerie quiet. Huge as a bear, the chimera loomed over my men, dull white armour and thin limbs making it seem like the skeleton of a giant. The half-machine creature seized one of my men with fingers long as daggers and snapped him like a rag doll. Without breaking stride, the giant hurled the body of its victim at another of our men, who hit the deck and skidded beneath the weight of his dead comrade. Keep moving, Polino shouted, taking aim at the giant. Sielsen crashed into our company from either side. They had the numbers and the superior position, but we were shielded and the light of our energy lances tore through their line like a hot knife through wax. The giant lashed out with its arm, sweeping two of my men off their feet. They hit the wall and bounced off, tumbling down the stairs after Krim. I drew up, sword in hand. I was on the wrong side. The chimera's turret of a head swiveled toward me. Found you! The flat mechanical voice sounded over my suit's built-in comms, and I knew it was no ordinary chimera that stood before me. Twice the height of a man it stood, and narrower, as though it were an evening shadow cast back across the earth. Its white armour was of adamant, proof against even my sword. All the villainous art of Minos lay in the shape of its graceful arms, the wicked curves of its knife-like fingers and in the faceless terror it called a head, crowned with metal spines. Here was no mere lieutenant, no servile creature. Here was the general itself, the Vyadan, Hushansa. You're smaller than the others, I said, taunting it in its own tongue. It wasn't even many-handed. Was there nothing left when they built you? I watched over the general's shoulder to where the front half of our forces hurried around the bend for the tramway. Hushansa's fingers all lengthened. A hatch opened in its shoulder, exposing the silvered head of some projectile. The grapnel lanced out, fast as an arrow, slow enough to pierce a shield. Time stretched, and at once there were countless millions of grapnels arcing toward me. So accurate was the general's machine-assisted aim that most struck the soft joints of my armour and skewered me like a fish on a line. Many more bounced off, and others... I raised my sword and slashed the grapnel in half, severing the line before the awful spike could strike home. Genuthane, Hushansa said. Impossible. I said nothing. Hadrian, we need to move. Polino said from his place at my shoulder. I know. 
A flash of violet light smote the metal giant, and Hushansa lurched to one knee. I knew that telltale shade, the color of hydrogen plasma. Grenade! The cry went up a moment after, and a second flash of light followed as superheated plasma blossomed against the back of the staggered giant. Hushansa fell face forward, scrabbling against the floor like some manner of crab. I saw Krim standing at the top of the stairs, Jadian robe flapping strangely in that airless place. Two legionnaires bracketed him, each aiming the short grenade launchers at the slumped metal monster. The plasma grenades were suspended in a colloidal gel that made them stick to whatever they impacted. The launchers themselves were only air-fed, relied on gas cartridges to fire them slow enough to bypass any personal shield. Hushansa rose, rounded on them. Talak! Krim exclaimed. That was fire in his native Jadian. The grenadiers fired again, and again twin rosettes of violet fire bloomed. The metal monster lurched backward, fired a barrage of pin missiles from a hatch in one wrist. They impacted against Krim's shield and those of his men. Useless. Forward! I shouted to the knot of men who stood with me, pointing toward the stairs with my sword. The next barrage of grenades struck home. Pale shards of the general's white armor flew in all directions. The crowned head fell and hit the metal floor with what would have been a mighty clangor had there been air to hear it. I had no time to reflect upon the death of so great a captain of our enemy. I followed Polino down the steps, spurring our men before me. Krim stopped to help one of the injured to his feet and carried him with one arm wrapped about his shoulders. We hadn't far to go. Down the steps and around a bend to the left, then down a hall that ran along just beneath the main body of the Collider's housing, to the tram platform. Sielsen stood in our way, but we cut them down as we came jogging and limping down the stairs. Twice I slashed Nahute from the air, and when one of the Sielsen dropped from the Collider track above, I took its legs out from under it with a single sweep of my blade. The tram lay dead ahead now. Two short cars, hanging from the overhead magnetic rail, bracketed to the underside of the colliders. Without concern for aerodynamics, they were ugly, square things, wrought of the same gunmetal as the refinery itself. My eye followed their track in a straight line, past where it exited, through an open arch in the refinery's outer wall, and vanished to a point on the horizon. "'Almost there,' Krim said to the man he carried. "'Get the men on board,' I said, gesturing sharply to Polino. "'We had perhaps forty minutes until the fleet arrived. "'If we could get as far as the nearest way station "'along the track of the Hadron Collider, we would make it. "'The foremost of our men already had the doors open "'and were piling inside. "'Krim made the threshold and pushed the injured man "'into the arms of two of the others "'and doubled back to hold the door. "'The voice of the tech, who'd powered down the particle accelerator, "'chimed in. "'We're ready to go here!' "'Take the first car and go,' I said to Krim, who nodded and ducked through the hatchway. Reaching the level of the second, I turned back. A full dozen of our men still came, stretched out across half a hundred yards of hall. Behind them rushed a small army of the Pale. The nearest Sielsin whirled Nahute above their heads like bolos, their brethren loping behind, long arms trailing almost to the ground. Then came a scream— a cry like grinding metal, so loud I felt it in my chest and through the soles of my boots. I froze where I stood, knowing the sound heralded some new evil. The Sielsin hurled their metal serpents, and the men at my side fired. One of the Nahute caught fire and bricked itself, crashing to the plated floor. Another caught the hindmost of our running men and dropped him. I felt my muscles spasm as I made to leap forward, but Polino caught me. "'It's too late, Hade,' he said, fingers tight on my arm. Behind me, a loud bang heralded the disengagement of the braking mechanism on the first car. The whole hall shook, and a faint hum and vibration shook the ductwork all around as electromagnets powered on. I had a brief glimpse of Krim as I looked back over my shoulder— and watched the hatch of the first tram car slide shut. The old assassin did not salute, only gave a perfunctory little wave with the first two fingers of his left hand. 
the rest still clutched one of his beloved knives. Then he was gone, and fully half our men slid away on silent accelerators, launched near instantaneously to 300 miles per hour. They cleared the wall of the refinery in seconds, and soon they were little more than a black dot, shrinking as it rocketed toward the horizon. And safety. The metallic shrieking resounded through the superstructure all around, and even the onrushing pale drew up short. Hurry! Damn your eyes! Polino spat, waving the other men on. In the distance, I discerned a pale shadow moving amidst the coming horde. Like the Cielsen it was, but greater, taller and narrower, its featureless turret of a head capped with a crown of silver spines. It was my turn to say, Impossible. The Vyadan general Hushansa parted the ranks of its men like a rock in the course of a black river, its clawed hands outspread. You are not the only one who can't be killed, it said, the same flat voice the same cold laughter. Another one? Polino asked. I shook my head. The same one. I felt the Kiliark grow tense. Crim's boys blew that fucker away, man. Evidently not. The Cielsen general must have given some signal to its men, for the other Cielsen drew back, allowing their master to pass them and come nearer me. It had to stoop beneath a stanchion, that buttressed the colliders as it came, lest the points of its crown scrape the metal. Mare Rose, O Okun, it said, straightening. I told you, you cannot escape. Hadrian, Polino tugged my arm. The general's intervention had allowed our men the chance they needed to clear the last few dozen yards to the tram. We were nearly free. Hadrian! Something in the force behind that second Hadrian made me turn my head. Another of the crowned chimeras stood at the far end of the hall, moving slowly toward us, identical to the first, and to the one Krim had slain upon the stair. Two Hushansas. Hushansa the many-handed, I said, looking from one copy to the other, understanding growing in me like a cancer. The creature Crim's grenadiers had dispatched above was not Hushansa, nor were either of the creatures before us in the hall. Neither, I guessed, was the thing that had attacked us on the stairs and died in the airlock when we blew the door of the command centre. The true Hushansa lay elsewhere, safe on some grounded shuttle, or even in the fleet above the refinery. These bodies, these hands, were its shadows its puppets, emanations of its vile will. There was nothing of the original flesh in them, as had been true of its brothers. They were no two alike, these Vyadan of the White Hand. The human magi who served the Cielsin had fashioned each according to its need. Yubalu had been a crawling horror, Bahude a giant thirty feet high. This Hushansa was a ghost flitting between bodies, possessing one or several at will. Turning my head so I could see either creature by turn, I said, I see. You cannot hope to win, it said, spreading its hands. What did you hope to accomplish coming here? We will take the fuel stores and destroy this place from orbit. What have you achieved? Beneath my mask I smiled. Seem yadanolo ne, I asked it. Can't you guess? The right thigh of the first of Hushansa's bodies opened up, and the general reached in and drew out a sword. The blade hinged open, unfolding to its full length. It looked short at the end of the creature's too long arm, but it was easily seven feet from pommel to point. Every fibre in me screamed to make a move for the tram car, but I knew the instant I turned my back it would be on me. And if I knew one thing, about the metal demons those traitorous scientists had crafted in the bowels of Array. It was that they were fast. Instead, I willed my mind to calm, to find that clear space beneath feeling, that quiet space within. The first Hushansa lunged at me with its sword. I twisted sideways, shoving Polino out of the way. 
as I'd expected, the second Hushansa had leapt as well, hands outstretched to seize me. Each moved faster than any mortal man could react, but slow enough to skate beneath the energy threshold of my shield. The blade should have pierced my chest, at least impacted my armor. Those taloned hands should have seized on me thigh and shoulder. But for every potential state where they succeeded, there were as many quantum positions where they failed. The blade that should have pierced me passed through me instead, and the taloned hands that should have seized on me closed on empty air. Understand. I was not insubstantial. I only interposed one reality on the other. Hushansa's blade and my chest occupied the same place in the universe, but with the power the quiet had given me, I willed the two not to meet. For a moment, the universe recognized a paradox. I ended it by stepping aside, stepping out of the blade and talons. My sword flashed, shearing up through the ceramic of the giant's blade and down deep into the joint at the back of one knee. The chimera's armor may have been proof against even high matter, but the common metal of its joint was not. The metal leg buckled, and one giant stumbled, crashed into the other. Go! I shouted to Polino, and almost shoved him onto the tramcar. I staggered against the doorframe, head swimming with the cost of what I'd just done. I felt sick, felt that I must vomit there in my helmet. It will pass, I told myself, and clambered after Polino. Behind us, the two Hushansas struggled to untangle themselves. The Sialsin soldiers behind them hurled Nahute at us. I spun on the threshold and hit the red button that slammed the tramway door on silent hydraulics. Launch, damn you! I hissed into the comm. Already my ill spell was passing, head and vision clearing, leaving only the dull tattoo of blood in my ears. The soldier at the tram controls did as he was ordered, and I felt the faint hum as the car's electromagnets powered on. We started moving, smooth as a ship on a mirrored pool. Through the alum glass window, I saw the uninjured Hushansa find its feet. That crown turret head swiveled, found us with unseen optics. We were surely moving half a hundred miles an hour already. The chimera ran. Using its long arms like legs, the unholy thing bounded after us, tearing along the edge of the tram platform at speeds no living creature could match. We accelerated, still it gained. Black Earth! I heard someone swear. The beast was running out of platform. The arched opening in the refinery wall was dead ahead. We would pass it in seconds. Beyond, the laser-straight track of the collider ran out above the desert and airless wastes of Verdi Planum, and vanished over the horizon. Get back! I shouted, shouldering my way to the rear of the car. Hushansa leaped. Its great mass and velocity carried it through the air like a missile, and the whole tram car rattled like a bell. I fell sideways against the wall of the compartment and had a brief glimpse of the thing's white torso through a rear window. Hushansa had caught onto the rear of the tram car, clung to it like an insect. A muffled bang reverberated through the tram car and the whole thing shook. Beyond the windows, black desert swept by. We had cleared the refinery and the tram car was rocketing toward its top speed, putting distance between us and the Sielsen horde in the refinery. Where is it? I ground my teeth, trying to figure out where our enemy had gone. I craned my neck, peering wildly out the windows. Another bang echoed up from my feet. An image of the chimera clinging to the bottom of the tram pod flashed in my mind, and for a moment I considered thrusting my sword through the floor. Lights, bracketed to the underbelly of the collider above, flashed by, marking out the miles as we streaked farther and faster from the refinery. I couldn't afford to miss. The whole tram began to rattle then, and an awful squealing whine conducted through the superstructure all around us. We lost power, the man at the control shouted. The magnets that ran along the overhead rail had been switched off. We were grinding to a halt then, bleeding speed as we squeaked along the last stretch of rail. The way station wasn't yet in sight, and behind, the refinery had been reduced to a pale blur of light on the far horizon. The pilot slapped the controls, cursing. Yet another bang resounded through the car, and we were falling, hurled from the rail above like a stone skipped across the surface of the lake. 
The low gravity worked in our favour and someone somewhere in the car screamed at us to brace for impact. The car struck stone and sand and bounced, tossing us head over heels. I caught a rail and held it, glad my suit's gel layer hardened to protect my joints. Still I hit the ceiling. My body and the others all hurled like fish in a barrel. The tram car tumbled wildly, throwing up sand and dust as it tumbled across the desert. We ground to a halt across hundreds of yards, rolled far out from the silver track of the Hadron Collider. Open the doors, I barked. We have to get out before it gets here. If the Chimera made it inside the crashed pod, it would carve us all to ribbons in seconds. Fully a third of the men sprawled on the tram seats or on the grey floor, dead or dazed, I wasn't sure. Each man's armour ought to have saved him, as I'd been saved, but there was no telling. And there was no time. We'd settled on an angle such that we had to climb toward the exit. Two of the men had the hatchway open, and one had leaped out onto the sands, his lance primed. Where was Hushansa? Radio the others, I snapped at one of them. Tell them what happened. I lingered a moment on the lip of the tram car, gaze sweeping the sands. The track of the Hadron Collider shimmered above us like an oversized aqueduct, its line of graceful arches marching toward eternity in each direction, the only monument to civilization in sight. How far had we travelled in so short a time, and how quickly? My head still rang from the fall. I'd lost track of how much time remained before the fleet arrived, and where was Hushansa? I leaped down onto the sands, glad of Ikana's gentler gravity. It had made what might have been a disastrous crash that much safer. Do you see it? One of the men asked another, scanning the horizon with Lance at the ready. The other legionnaire's reply was almost casual. Maybe it fell somewhere nearer the track? The other men were slowly pulling themselves out of the crashed car, the hail helping the injured. Several appeared to have broken limbs in the crash. Pure chance or some failure of their suits, I guessed. Our fall had carved a mighty wound in the face of Verdi Planum, a black scar dozens of yards long. It felt wrong for there to be no wind, no fires, no smoke or stink or burning. My lord! One of the men raised his voice and pointed back toward the collider. A white shape, stood tall beneath the arches, and even at this distance I could make out Hushansa's crown. Across those many hundred yards, my eyes met its optic sensors, and I knew it had seen me too. Beneath the mask, I grinned again. Everyone, get back! I raised my left hand to underscore the order. Fast as it was, Hushansa might kill any number of them on its way to me if they got in its way. It's after me! It would not kill me if it could. Its dark master wanted me alive, but it would come for me first of all the men in the company. Straight for me. The metal monster moved, bounding toward us across the level ground, loping on all fours like an ape in the lost jungles of earth. I settled into a low guard, the hilt of my sword unkindled in my right hand. Quiet as it was, and still, my vision came easily. Blood hammering still harder in my ears. Hushansa splintered as my reflection had, became not a creature but a quantum wave barreling toward me like the changing of the tide. I watched it come, watched lines of potential coverage like a hollow film of glass shattering in reverse. The Viadan general's body was armoured in adamant, proof against even the edge of my Jadian blade. Impenetrable, save for those rare, soft places where the titanium endoskeleton lay exposed. I might strike at my enemy a billion times, and a billion times I'd fail. My options narrowed as my enemy boiled closer, crossing a dozen yards for every bound. My focus wavered, a white pain flaring behind my eyes. Whole pieces of the spectrum vanished from my sight, blotted out as I struggled to stretch my still too human senses to encompass infinity. Let this be quick, I thought, and waited, fingers on the twin triggers that would kindle my blade, hand back, toe forward. There would be a way, one way in a billion, for my blade to strike true. 
The demon captain was upon me then and leaped, claws outstretched to seize me. Fingers tightened on the triggers, and liquid metal blossomed and shone brighter than the watchful stars. I lunged, all my possibilities collapsing in that clarion instant to a single perfect reality. The blade connected with Hushansa's leg on the outside of the knee, bit and cut, sliding upward, it found the ball and socket joint of the chimera's hip, and rising sheared through the left leg from groin to hip, and caught the left arm inside the elbow. The giant fell to pieces and tumbled to the dust about me. My blade completed its arc, and I stood unmoved, triumphant. All about me the men cheered. Half mortal, they called, and Marlo, Marlo! I turned slowly, found the remains of Hushansa's torso trying to right itself with its one remaining hand. There was no point trying to threaten it. It had no life in that body to lose. No part of the creature's brain or organic body was there. Only an echo, a copy of its ghost. Desperate, a panel opened in its shoulder and the harpoon lanced out. But its balance betrayed it in its crippled state and the shot went wide. It doesn't matter, the Viadan said, voice sounding in my suit speakers. We will have you in time. The Shiomu will have you in time. The Prophet. I stopped five paces from the ruined hulk. Hushansa leaned upon its one remaining arm. It angled its faceless head defiantly. And you have failed here. Kiana. It made that flat, shrill sound that passed for laughter among its kind. Run back to your emperor and tell him you failed. This world is ours. Is it? I asked. I took one more step forward to show I was unafraid. Run back to your master. Tell it I'm coming. Hushansa laughed again. Tsuareu! Sukadolo Nine! You still think you can win? I took a few steps back made a gesture with my left hand. My men got the message. Two grenadiers fired on the ruined general. The puppet body blew apart in a rosette of violet flame that cast my shadow far across the level sands. The rest was silence. We had nothing to do but wait. Not long after, a new sun flashed in the middle of the sky and faded. Another, a third that banished the stars, each faded in turn. Our fleet had come right on schedule. Before long, shuttles and lighter craft streaked across the sky and fired on the refinery. While we waited in the desert, we watched the lightning of their war play out as the brief Battle of Ekana unfolded. With the Collider neutralized, our forces were able to safely take the refinery. At last, the arrowhead shape of the Ascalon appeared on the horizon, just as the true sun was rising over Verdi Planum. And only when it landed and Krim emerged with the medical staff from two adjoining shuttles did young Leon approach. How did you do? He gestured at the ruins of Hushansa's third or fourth body, at the collider standing in the middle distance, at the spot where the distant refinery still lurked. All that? No, my lord. No, sir. I told you, I said. Some stories are true. Chapter 4 Nessus Since the day I died aboard the Demiurge, my dreams have haunted me. Even in fugue, since Annika, since those days upon the mountain top of that other world, I dreamed of what I'd seen. The quiet had revealed all of time to me, poured past and present and possible futures into my head, universes of events so unlikely they were indistinguishable from dream. I had supped of those waters like a man who drank the ocean, and though I'd swallowed it all, I could not hold it and spat it back again. Pieces of that total vision came back to me, sounds and images, 
sensations remembered by the unconscious mechanisms of my all-too-human brain. Chains bound me wrist and ankle, forced me to hobble like an old man. The Cielsin surrounded me, watching with unmasked faces, their black glass fangs glimmering as the guards at my back spurred me on with their spears. Ahead, a black dome rose like half an enormous egg, and upon its steps awaited a figure in black and azure, silver-crowned. You knew it would come to this, kinsman, said Siriani de Reica, black eyes on me. It raised one clawed hand and pointed at the sky. Time runs down. I followed the gesture skyward and cried out, Hadrian! Darkness. Light. A hand on my cheek, cool and dry. The scent of smoke and sandalwood. Valka. We were in bed. She turned on the lamp, a baroque piece of stained glass, and propped herself on one elbow. It took me a moment to remember where I was. My eyes wandered among the richly carved beams and plastered ceiling, soaked in the wood panelling and jadian carpets, and the high narrow windows that overlooked the balcony and the gardens. Modalo House. Sunan. Nessus. The old villa had begun its life as an abbey for Sid Arthurian monks in the years before the empire came to Nessus. It perched on a bluff overlooking the villages that surrounded the great city of Sanan. By night, the sky spires and the cyclopean outlines of the mile-high dry docks glowed with artificial light, and the air was thick with the song of cicadas. Gentle winds blew the pencil cypresses that fringed the bucolic grounds, reminding me of home. Home. It had been my prison for seventy years, and though it was a gilded cage, a cage it remained. For twelve years the Chantry tried me for treason and for heresy, and for twelve years they'd proved nothing. Recordings they'd collected and suppressed on the galactic data net of my miracle on Berenike could not be proved undoctored, and the scoliasts who had served in my defence fought the Inquisition tooth and nail. In the end, in desperation, the Chantry tried to kill me, just as Augustine Bourbon and the Empress had tried on Forum. They failed and botched their trial in the process. For their pains, and because I'd caused the Emperor too much pain, I'd been sent to Nessus, capital of the Magna Cut of Centaurus. With the Vale of Marinus lost, Centaurus had become the centre of our war with the Cielsin, and so it was to Nessus I'd been sent. The Tamerlane sat in orbit, its crew on ice, save for Volca, who'd been allowed to live with me in my comfortable prison for the past several decades. The Emperor had shuffled me off here to keep me out of trouble, to keep me away from Forum and out of the public eye. It might have been a good life, were I not bounded in a nutshell. Were it not that I had bad dreams. Are you all right? Valka asked, stroking my cheek with tattooed fingers. When I didn't answer, she added, The dreams again? I nodded and sat up, swung out of bed and naked crossed the thickly carpeted floor to the basin to fill a glass with clear water. When still I didn't speak, Valka asked, "'Tis not a canna, is it?' "'No,' I rasped. It had been three weeks since we'd returned from a aboard the Ascalon. I'd finished my report to the Magnarch's people and to the Legion Intelligence Office, and was enjoying a brief furlough on the villa's estates. Ikana was nothing. I didn't have to turn to know Valka was shaking her head. What was it? Nothing new, I said, and thought, time runs down. I had the dream a thousand times over the years, seen myself march toward the Black Dome in chains, seen the Cielsin Prince of Princes standing there. 
The scoliasts say that memory exists to impart lessons that protect us from injury. The memory of burning our hands teaches us not to play with fire. What then can be said of my memories of the future? If that was what they were. You've hardly slept since you got back, she said. You can take responsibility for some of that, I said, turning the crooked old Marlowe smile firmly in place. She matched that crooked smile with an asymmetric curling of her lips. It was not her old smile. The worm Urbane had loosed upon her mind had done its damage, and though Valka had recovered from her ordeal, she had never fully healed. Here and there the scars of what the Magus had done showed in the asymmetric stillness of some muscle or the faint tremor of a hand. "'Something is bothering you,' she insisted, pushing untidy red-black hair from her face. "'It's been so long,' I said at last. "'Since you fought?' "'Since I had the dream,' I said, and conceded, "'But that too.' I had slept for the nine-month return journey from Ekana, and for once my dreams had not followed me into cryonic fugue, and I keep thinking about something that General said. We'll have you in time. A crease formed between Valka's winged eyebrows. Doriek has been after you since before Berenike. Tis not news, Hadrian. I looked down at the water glass cradled in my hands, at my ghostly reflection in it. Then to Valka. Time had been kind to her, if Urbane's worm had not been. The long decades had made but few marks upon her face and body, yet she was Tavrosi and no Palatine. Faint creases marked the corners of her eyes, and the lines that marked the perimeter of her smile were set more deeply. But there was no frost in the dark fire of her hair, and when she smiled— and this time it was the full smile, not the uneven one. It was with the old electric spark that lit my own face. You're right, I said, eyes wandering the length of her. Of course you are. I drained my glass to disguise the moment necessary to gather my wits. But I can't shake these visions. Valka arched one eyebrow. Perhaps they are only dreams now. My smile flickered. She was right about that, too. If I was right, if the quiet had showed me all of time when I stood upon that mountaintop, then much of it would never be. Much of what haunted me might be as good as fiction. I dreamed myself seated on the solar throne with Princess Selene at my feet, or toiling in a field in chains alongside a girl who looked very much like Siren. Sometimes I saw myself standing naked, on the auction block, while men bid on me for the fighting pits sold by that pirate, Dimitri. Other times, I dreamed my first encounter with Uvanari, only we were standing amidst the green sea of a plantation and not in the tunnels of Kalagar. A boy named Switch died in my arms beneath a meshy skies, but he was not the Switch I knew, and I died beneath Gilliam's blade, beneath Uvanari's. Things that had never happened, that could never happen, I saw them all. Hadrian. Valka's voice reached me where I sat at the bottom of my thoughts. Come back to bed. I didn't answer her at once, but turned over all these thoughts and done memories one after another. Valka was right. Too many of the dreams were impossible. They would never be. Why then did I wake sweating in the night to this particular nightmare? My eyes flickered to the antique clock that glowed above the cold hearth. It was nearly dawn. I think I'll stay up, I said. I have to meet the Magnarch later this morning. Carol Vanantian was far from the picture of the Solon Magnarch one imagines. Not the barrel-chested former officer or stuffed-shirt politico. The supreme lord of every system in the centaurus arm of the galaxy, one of three men in all the human universe to hold the office of Magnarch and speak with the emperor's own voice. 
had the bearing of a scribe. Rapier-thin and stooped somewhat by his nearly six centuries, old Lord Venantian would not have looked out of place in the green robes of a scoliast. He wore the violent purple of his rank instead, a half-toga that left both arms free pinned at the left shoulder of his long white and gold jacket. The consortium delivered the uranium for Ramanu province on schedule, he said, surveying the landing field out the window of our flyer. Once the fuel barges arrive from Akana, the whole caravan will be ready to launch. Commandant Lynch tells me our Nipponese friends were quite pleased to find their refinery more or less intact. Talk of the Wong Hopper consortium and uranium put me in mind of home. Had some of that latest uranium shipment been mined on Delos, or in its system? I supposed I could ask the Magnarch, but it was better not to know. Better to imagine. Yamato estimates it'll be about eight months before the Akana fuel works are operable again, but that's much better than the timeline we were looking at before. Through the porthole at my right, I could see the grey-white face of the nearest Sanan shipyard building rising more than a mile into the sky. The tallest towers of the city seemed meagre things beneath it. Pale as it was, it reminded me of an old painting in the Peronine Palace of the City of London, burning in the shadow of the colossal pyramids of the Merikanii. Discomforted by the comparison, I turned to the Magnarch. There's always the possibility the Sielsen will return. We beat them but their general escaped and doubtless will have carried word of its defeat back to its master. Yes, quite. The Magnarch stroked his pointed chin. The Yamato are doubling their in-system security, but we will dispatch a legion to support them. You'd best dispatch a legion to every refinery in Centaurus, I said. The Magnarch's brows contracted. Has your time off world made you forget your place so quickly, Lord Marlow? Lord Venantian's tone betrayed the iron in the man, and for a moment he seemed no scribe at all. You're quite correct, of course. There's no telling what intelligence the Pale might have collected when they ascertained the location of the Akana fuel works. Possibly our entire refueling infrastructure is compromised. Possibly, I agreed. You heard the news about the Jadians, yes? Venantian asked. What news about the Jadians? Prince Aldia has promised us an army. Again? The Jadians had been promising support since I was a boy. A dozen times it seemed the principalities were on the verge of sending an armada. Thousands of ships and millions of soldiers. But every time the princes had seemed on the verge of launching their fleets, they'd pulled back preferring instead to send a token force, a fact-finding expedition such as the one the satrap governor Kalima di Saif had led to Imesh so long ago. From the look on his seamed face, I could tell the old magnarch was thinking the same thing. So it would seem, he said, a touch of acid in his tone. I had word from Forum that our Jadian friends have launched a fleet of some twenty thousand warships, under the command of Prince Aldia's grandson, Prince Kaim. Kaim du Otranto, I said, arching my eyebrows. Albadroscuro. Venantian snorted. Dark Moon, he said. What a truly ridiculous nickname. He's not a ridiculous man, I said. I'd never met the young Prince of Jad, nor seen a proper holograph of him. The men of the Ili Alakran, the Jadian Palatines, wore masks for all their public appearances, painted porcelain prostheses that moved with their expressions. They were meant to separate the man from his station, to symbolize the divide between personal and political, though whether they succeeded in this was a question for men other than me. The result of this was that though men like Aldia du Otranto and his warrior grandson were known across the galaxy, their faces were not, whereas the face of our Holy Emperor and his predecessors peered at us from official portraits and from the observe of every golden hurasam. The Magnarch seemed to chew something a moment, said, No, indeed. 
The War Office says he's bringing an army of 200 million Mamluk clones. I felt surely that I was wearing one of those Jadian masks then, and that the jaw had fallen off. 200 million? I repeated the figure, throat at once very dry. It was a staggering figure, nearly the equal of all the imperial legions and the armies of the greater and lesser houses in the Centaurine provinces. It was easy to forget why cloning, duplication, was one of the Chantry's most grievous sins. The illegal construction of clone armies had allowed the Jadians their independence in the first place, and before the Sielsin Wars it had been their militant maintaining of those same clone armies that had kept the 81 principalities of Jad free of imperial control. But if the Jadians were willing to commit their not inconsiderable resources to the war effort for true, their clone Mamluk slaves could be precisely the weapon we needed to turn the tide on the Zenobites for good and all. They ought to have the demons quaking in their boots, Benantian said, though they'll not arrive in these parts for decades yet. Still reeling, I nodded. Jad lay on the outermost edge of the galaxy, on the far side of the Solan Empire, tens of thousands of light years from Nessus and the front. Are you sure we can trust them? I asked. I, of all people, had no reason to mistrust the Jadians. Sir Lorin Milter, and his satrap master had been instrumental in ensuring the launch of my ill-fated expedition to find Vorgosos, but the mere mention of such staggering numbers was enough to chill the blood. Prince Aldia and his radiance have been friends for centuries, the magnarch said, leaning back in his seat as our flyer slowed over the landing pad, high on the exterior of the shipyard dry docks. I do not think we've anything to fear— We've increased levies across the outer provinces. It is the Emperor's wish we match that number by the end of the century, and that's to say nothing of the new naval personnel we'll need to train up for all these ships we're building. Our shuttle landed the moment after, and presently Lord Venantian rose. I was to join him in surveying the progress our shipwrights were making on the construction of components for the new dreadnought. When it was completed, the huntsman would be among the largest battleships in the Imperial service, a hundred-mile rival even to Khan Sagara's Demiurge, and the Sojourners of the Exalted. The ship's superstructure was being assembled in orbit above one of Nessus's five moons, but many of the mighty vessel's component parts were being assembled on the ground, where gravity was more boon to the construction worker than bane to the construction process. In time, the components would be lifted into space on impossibly long cables for final installation. The Magnarch's aides, silent for the duration of our flight, scurried down the open ramp ahead of us. Grey-suited logothetes and scoliasts alike. I followed on behind, keeping to the great lord's side. "'How did you find your reprieve, Lord Marlowe? the Magnarch asked, pausing at the base of the ramp. "'Your Grace?' I stopped beside him. The day stood fair, the wind quiet even so high above the ground. My black hair floated in the air between us, and I combed it back behind my ear. Ekana, he said. You've been with us, what, seventy years? Sixty-eight before Ekana, I replied. Old though he was, white hair and wizened, the magnarch of Centaurus yet looked down his nose at me. I've always been short for a palatine, if tall by the standards of common men. I raised my chin, certain that our entire meeting that morning existed so the magnarch, my jailer, could ask this one question. I squeezed the hem of my black cape in my left hand until ordinary bones would have ached from the strain. I have served the Empire all my life, I said. I will continue to be of service. The magnarch smoothed his porphyry-coloured toga with one ringed hand. There are those on my council who expected you to run. Despite the warmth of the white sun, I felt a chill creep into my bones, freeze my blood and soul. A flicker of the old Marlow anger passed through me, and I said, I'm sorry to have disappointed them. I'd not have relished sicking my dogs on you. That was as much a lie 
as it was not a figure of speech. On his rare off days, the Magnarch was famous for taking his wolfhounds into the highland forests north of Sunan to hunt foxes and the ten-legged fur salamanders who called the planet home. I'd have given them a merry chase, I'm sure, I said coolly, allowing a small smile to hint that I only meant it as humour. It was only desperation that had prompted Lord Venantian to send me to Ikana in the first place. Mine had been the only company with the force necessary to liberate the refinery within rapid response distance, the only one with ships fast enough and soldiers waiting. I'm sure, the Magnarch agreed with equal coolness. I could have hit him. The bastard had insisted Valka remain at Medallo House when I left precisely because he knew it prevented the very scenario he was describing. To suggest I would have fled without her was an insult I'd gladly break teeth to set right. I remain the Emperor's faithful servant, I said, effecting a short, punctilious bow my dancing master had taught me long, long ago. Good, Lord Venantian said. He will be delighted to hear that when he arrives. Chapter 5 The Sun Descending The music of silver trumpets filled the air about the landing field. To either side stood our countless soldiery, armoured red and white, their horsehair crests and feathered plumes rippling in the wind. They might all have been statues, so still they stood beneath their white banners, and their staffs tipped with the wrought icon of the imperial sun. Might have been statues, were it not that I felt the pressure of their eyes on me, and on the rest of the train that followed the old magnarch up the aisle toward the gilded frigate that like a dragon crouched upon the plain before us. The Emperor's Radiant Dawn Carol Venantian led us, bracketed by two lictors armoured in the bronze and white of his house, their cloaks fringed in violet to mark them as servants of the Magnarch. Valka walked beside me in a formal gown of dark lace that covered her plain right arm to the wrist, but bared the tattooed left. Behind us came the High Lords of the Magnarch's court, his Chancellor and scholiast advisers, among them Commandant Anders Lynch and the director of the Sanan shipyards. Behind us all marched two double lines of guardsmen, armoured and shielded, alternating columns of imperial legionnaires in white and red, and Venantian house soldiers in the white and bronze. Dressed as we both were in black, Valka and I could not have looked more out of place. The only other figures in black were the Chantry clergymen, distinguished by their tall white Egyptian crowns and matching stoles. These watched from stands in the rear like a line of vultures perched upon a rail, craning their stiff necks to see. The Emperor had come. Coolant jets sprayed the hull of the Imperial frigate, and great tongues of steam rose toward the eggshell sky. And amidst those trailing fingers marched forth the knight's excubitor, like mirrored scarabs, white crests, tall and silk capes floating in the warm breeze. They moved in perfect synchrony, and I watched our approach reflected in their breastplates as they formed ranks amid the steam beneath the golden shadows of the landed vessel. Valka's nails dug into my arm. "'Tis necessary, all this?' she asked, muttering in her native pantai, a language none of the others understood. I patted her hand in lieu of a reply. Valka was Tavrosi, and neither our lifetime together nor the torments her own people had put her through, exercising Urbane's diamond from her head, had changed that. All our imperial ceremony, the pomp and pageantry and martial awe, were nearly so alien to her as the Sielsen themselves. As if in answer to her question, the trumpet sounded again and distantly the Legion band took up the Imperial Anthem. And there he was. No float pallet or similar machine bore the Imperial person upon his throne. Instead, his Imperial Radiance, the Solon Emperor William the Twenty-Third of the Aventine House, 
rode atop a palanquin supported by two dozen androgyn homunculi in imperial livery, all in white wigs and white uniforms. The emperor himself wore a suit of armour in Roman fashion, muscled breastplate embossed with the imperial sunburst set amid a design of folded wings and lesser stars. Every inch of his armour was exquisitely sculpted and patterned of the purest snow-white ceramic, and his hands were red. The emperor wore no gauntlets, only the scarlet velvet gloves of state, each finger, save one, bedecked with a ring of yellow gold. A cloak of scarlet samite hung on his shoulders, red as his flaming hair, and the circle set upon his brow was fashioned of living gold. Behind him trailed the usual cluster of attendants and advisers, scoliasts in green, and logothetes in the dull grey of civil service trailed the throne, like flotsam pulled by the passage of a great wave. I was pleased not to see the face of Prince Alexander among them. I had been told my former squire was among those who had travelled with his father from Forum, but discretion or care on the part of the emperor or his staff had seen fit to leave the prince aside for this very public audience. The music swelled as he approached, fell silent as the magnarch knelt, dropping to both knees before his lord. As though a wave passed through our train, we knelt, though I had to half-drag Valka down after me. The homunculi brought the mobile throne to a halt and lowered it to the earth. Three times the magnarch pressed his face to the rich carpet that had been unrolled to greet the son of earth. "'Earth bless you and keep you, radiant majesty!' he exclaimed, not at all the same creature who had threatened me on the landing pad outside the shipyards a little over a month before. "'Welcome, welcome to Nessus. We pray your voyage from Forum was an easy one.' The emperor raised a hand, two fingers extended in salute and benediction. "'Well met, Magnarch. We must say the courtesy of your world is greater now than in our memory.' Here Caesar swept his emerald gaze across the gathered forces, the band and clergy. I trust construction of the new fleet is proceeding on schedule. Carol Venantian straightened as much as he could without standing. We lost time dealing with the Akana affair, Radiant Majesty, but we expect to recoup those losses over the next five years. The Magnarch kept talking, and as he did I scanned the retinue behind the imperial throne, looking for familiar faces among the drab ministers and green-robed scoliasts. I spied square-faced Sir Grey Reinhardt, the man who'd replaced the disgraced Lorcan Brethnak as head of Legion Intelligence, as well as mustachioed Lord Harren Bulsara, director of the colonial office. I noted the Emperor's confessor, a dour archprior called Leonora, stalking the emperor like a shadow sewn to the hem of his robe. Beside her, carrying that very hem in two gloved hands, was a man I had often seen but never spoken to. If man were the proper word. The butler was one of the imperial androgens, a eunuch homunculus bred to serve as the emperor's body servant and batman. Its face was utterly hairless, as all of the androgens were, but it wore no wig, and its white uniform distinguished itself from those of the others by the bloody sash it wore crosswise like a baldric before it wrapped about its slim waist. Lord Marlowe, the imperial voice cut across my examination of the retinue, and I bowed my head. It is our understanding that we are once more in your debt. It seems that even in exile your usefulness knows few limits. It took every ounce of Gibson's stoic instruction to smooth the smug smile from my face at the thought of what must be going on through the magnarch's mind in that moment. I didn't bend to kiss the earth. It was not expected of me. But neither did I raise my eyes as I said, Thank you, Honourable Caesar. From the way the shadows moved, I guessed the Emperor had stood. And indeed, a moment after, a pair of white boots entered my vision and a red-gloved hand that glittered with rings. I took the offered hand and kissed it, conscious and self-conscious of the statement the Emperor had just made. He had bypassed his own magnarch 
and had risen to greet me first of all the nobiles in the company. We regret we were unable to render assistance in the matter of your trial. It pleases us to find you well. Lifting my eyes, I released the Emperor's hand. It would not have done to touch his royal person a moment longer than the forms required. I found myself unsure as to how to respond to this statement of his radiances. It had been his own order that delivered me into the Magnarch's tender care. When the Chantry's assassins failed to kill me, and so end my years-long trial, it had been William Avent's own seal and signature beneath the order that mothballed the Tamerlane and locked me into an advisory role here on Nessus. For your own protection, the Emperor had said. To keep me out of trouble seemed more like it. In the end, I settled for a neutral. Thank you, Radiance. That seemed to satisfy the Emperor, whose attention turned away like the beam of a searchlight. And this must be your paramour. I don't believe we've been introduced. I blinked. I had met with His Radiance the Emperor more than a hundred times over the centuries, and on almost all of those occasions I'd been alone. It seemed impossible that Valka and the Emperor would not have crossed paths, and yet the red velvet glove descended once again for Valka to kiss. She did not. I felt her eyes burn the side of my head an instant, but held my tongue. At last, seeing no alternative, Valka kissed the imperial rings. Honorable Caesar, I said, already imagining what Valka would have to say about this exchange when we returned to the villa at Medallo House. This is Dr. Valka Ondira. I did not add the Vad Edda toponym. Valka and I had journeyed to her home after the Battle of Berenike, seeking a cure for her affliction. We found one, but Valka's clan had forced her into re-education, hoping to cure her of the outlander pollutants that her long sojourn amongst us barbarians had put in her mind. In the end, the Demarchists had opted to reconfigure her entirely, to wipe her mind with the aid of the machines that impregnated her brain and build a new woman on her ruins. She'd barely escaped with her mind. Still, something in the name must have jogged the Emperor's memory, for he said, The Tavrosi, of course. Taking a step back, the Emperor surveyed the whole of the Magnarch's party. Rise, he said. We stood, Valka once again taking my arm. Just then one of the Androgens, the thin butler who had held and tidied the Emperor's cloak, approached and whispered a word in its master's ear. Caesar gripped the homunculus by the shoulder and nodded. Thank you, Nicephorus, he said, and looked around for the kneeling Magnarch. On your feet, Magnarch Venantian. You must show us your great city and this fleet you are building for us. Please. Your radiance, the Magnarch said, rising with the help of one of his lictors. I've the tram prepared to bring us to the palace, if you will allow me. Of course, dear Magnarch, it's your world after all. Lead on. The Emperor and the Magnarch drew aside then as the Emperor's escort went ahead, paving the way back down the central aisle toward the train meant to carry us to the Magnarch's palace for the welcome feast. His radiance had travelled far, would travel farther still. Throughout the wars, the Emperor had seldom stirred from his halls in the Eternal City. He had made brief expeditions to various legion fortresses, to some of the provincial capitals, and once or twice so far as Nessus. But the last such trip had been before Vorgosos, before my knighthood. Centuries had passed since last the first-born son of Earth had come to the outer provinces, and never like this. Nessus was but the first stop on a tour of some thirty worlds. Vanaheim, Aulos, Cartier, Perfugium, some of them strategic assets, some of them sacked by the Pale. After the fall of Marinus and the loss of control in the Vale, the reinforcement of imperial territories in Centaurus had taken on a critical importance. Marinus had been a mighty blow, cutting off the newly minted Norman conquests. Dozens of worlds lost. 
We mean to set the frontier to order, his radiance said. We've prepared reports on the state of the frontier, said Carol Vanantian. The emperor was nodding, but there was a stony weight to his tone. Very good. But it is our understanding that you are undermanned, Carol. Though his back was to me, I heard the magnarch's frown. Not undermanned, Radiance, but our fleets have suffered greatly. We have the men ready in legion stores, Gododin, Perfugium, and so forth, but without the vessels to field them they are of little use. We are building as fast as we can. As he spoke, the pale monolith of the shipyard docks rose its mile into the sky beyond the landing field. Remote as the distant mountains in the way it impressed itself on the mind. The Sielsin have grown cunning in their war against us. They've destroyed two of my shipyards across the sector in the last eighty years. They might have destroyed fuel production had I not acted quickly in the matter of Ekana. Kun, Valka swore in my ear. Still in her native tongue, she added, What did he do exactly? Leave it, I said gently. Marlow! The sound of my name turned my head around. The rest of the Emperor's party was disembarking from the frigate behind the Sovereign. The usual panel of Logothetes and Scoliasts and Chantry clergy had taken their places in the Emperor's train, leaving the military advisers to bring up the rear in the red or white berets and formal dress blacks of naval officers. I thought I recognised a face or two from the Eternal City. Two of the strategoi had sat on the Intelligence Council with Augustine Bourbon and Lorcan Brethnak. The legates were almost unknown to me. Centaurine commanders come on the Emperor's invitation. But Tribune Basanda Lin I'd have known anywhere. The Mandari patrician officer leaned heavily on an ashwood cane and grimaced as he limped nearer. The man had broken nearly every bone in his body battling the Viadan General Bahude on Berenike, and not even the best imperial medicine could put him back together as he was. That he was back together at all was a testament to medical science. That he was still in service was a testament to Basanda Lin. Lin! I offered the man a short salute. I'm surprised to see you here. I understood the 347th was out past seat. The Tribune returned my salute. The 347th was reconfigured after Berenike. Hauptmann's replacement had Leonid Bartos reassigned and gave the legion to some legate from the Perseus I'd never heard of. I'd been moved to the 409th. And promoted, I see. I indicated the double star and oak clusters that marked his new rank. I didn't offer any congratulations. Lynn and I were not friends, had never been friends. I'd known the prickly officer since he was lieutenant, had served with him on the quest for Forgosos. It was thanks to him and the late Titus Hauptmann that peace talks with the Sielsin clan Otiolo had broken down, though not the reason they'd failed. I'd not been able to admit it at the time, that peace with the Sielsin was impossible. Lynn was a constant reminder that I'd been wrong. Lynn touched his rank insignia with his free hand. Yes, small blessings. His eyes found Valka a moment later, and he said, Doctor, I was glad to hear you've been healed of your affliction. He bobbed his head in greeting. And I yours she said. Shall we walk? Lynn asked, indicating the procession back across the field to the tram platform. I gestured for Bassander to take the lead, and Valka and I fell into step beside him, moving slow to keep pace with Lynn's limping gait. After a moment, the tribune cleared his throat. How'd you find Nessus, Marlow? No lord, no sir, Bassander Lynn had never been able to reconcile his holy terror of whatever I was with his contempt for the boy I'd been. He had seen me die aboard the Demiurge, and seen me return. Trying, I said, staring daggers at the back of Magnart Vanantian's head. I would have thought it suited you, Lynn said. So near the action and in a position to do something about it. 
In a position to tell other men what to do about it, you mean? I said. Valka interjected. And the rest of our companions have been in frozen orbit since we arrived. Tis lonely here. I nodded my agreement with her. After what happened on Thermon, the Emperor felt it was wiser that I be put somewhere where I'd not make a spectacle of myself. He ought to have put you on a flight bound out of the galaxy, then, Lynn said, causing Valka to choke back a laugh. Don't give his radiance any fine ideas, I said. I'm sure he has plenty of counsellors lined up saying much the same. When Lynn didn't reply at once, I asked more pointedly, Alexander is with you, is he not? The prince. Lynn's dark eyes caught mine. Aye, his radiance ordered him brought along for seasoning. Seasoning? Valka echoed the word, and I knew from the pointed quality of her tone that she was thinking the same thing I was thinking. Alexander was still the heir apparent, or not so apparent. He was one of the afterlings, the 107th child of the emperor, a child of his age. The elder children, like the crown prince Aurelian, were old, almost as the emperor himself. Should any of them come to rule, their reigns would be short as they were old. Alexander was young, though how young he was by then, how many years he'd spent in fugue, I could not say. And so it seemed he still was the emperor's favourite to succeed him. And he had seen my miracle at Berenike, had seen me weather a direct blast from the Cielsin's orbital laser without so much as a scratch on me. Did he still fear me, as his mother did? as did the lions of the imperial court, as did Mother Earth's holy Terran chantry. Lynn seemed to hesitate before asking his next question. He leaned in and whispered beneath the blaring of the trumpets, Is it true the chantry tried to poison you? I glanced at him and said nothing, which was answer enough, though not the whole answer. The chantry had sent an assassin to my cell, I'd made him take his own poison. The facts had not survived their journey across the stars. I'd heard it said that Hadrian Marlowe had taken poison, had drunk it on the stand before the praetor and the jurors, and had refused to die. The tribune seemed to get the message. "'You'll have to come visit us at the villa,' Valka said, speaking to cover the awkward silence for fear we might be heard. She lay a hand on Lynn's shoulder. Nessus is much nicer the farther you get from the city. It was not safe to have any conversations of that sort anywhere in the city, too many ears pricking and cameras prying. I may take you up on that, Lynn said, but I expect we'll be tied up in committee for some time, Marlowe and I. You heard about the Jadians, I assume? Prince Kaim and his army, I asked. Yes, I did. Lynn leaned in conspiratorially. The Emperor has not come here simply to check on Venantian's progress with the fleet. He was slated to do that on the end of his tour of the provinces. That piqued my interest, and I leaned in too. This stop wasn't on his itinerary. That would explain the suddenness with which Venantian had sprung the news on me, and the venomous mood he'd been in the day we'd inspected the shipyards together. The Tribune shook his head. He diverted the fleet five years out of its way to come here first. Five years? Valka asked. Why? It's only a rumour. I've overheard Sir Grey talking to my commander. Who's your commander? I asked, not sure if it was relevant. Sir Sendhil Massa, Legate, Lynn said, tone increasingly hushed. I didn't know him though there was another member of House Massa on the Intelligence Council. I couldn't remember his name, an acquaintance of Lorian Aristides. What did they say? That's just it, Lynn said. They said the Emperor was here for you. Chapter 6 Old Scars of all the places I have lived, Modalo House was among the most perfect. Had it been on Colchis, and not Nessus, it might have been the very best. 
The Cid Arthurians, who'd built it millennia before, had done so on the edge of the bluffs that overlooked the riverlands and hedged pastures that rolled over hills and ran between them toward the capital on the horizon. The exterior was all of lime-washed stone, and the peaked rooftops were each supported by wooden beams intricately sculpted in the geometric style so closely associated with that chivalric cult. It was not the grand palace of any great lord of the Imperium, but beautiful, in a way balancing humility and pride. The two wings of the former abbey enclosed a courtyard and a rock garden that once had encircled the customary anvil and sword of the Arthur Buddha. The chantry had had that cult icon removed and melted down when Nessus was conquered by the Imperium, and here and there the villa showed the signs of the Inquisition. A rough patch in the wood where a lotus or a grail had been chiselled off, a petrified stump where the sacred fig tree had been cut down. There were places on the walls where traditional artwork had been removed and replaced with artefacts that clearly didn't belong. A stuffed bull's head, the nude portrait of Palatine women reclining on a leather couch, and a sculpture that seemed to me no more than a gnarled mass of bronze, shapeless and ugly. I'd had the bull's head and the ugly sculpture removed, replaced with a bat-winged angel in the style of those gargoyles who'd protected my childhood home of Devil's Rest. Valka, not surprising me, had insisted on keeping the painting. It made me uncomfortable, and she found that amusing. The place was filled with the signs of our long occupation— Twin battle standards of the Red Company stood on pennon staffs, bracketed to either side of the grand staircase. Each bore the pitchfork and pentacle of my branch of House Marlow, bordered by the twisting labyrinth pattern that recalled my mother's family's Greek heritage. The library, a square tower on the southwest corner, contained nearly all the books that had travelled with me for so long on the Tamerlane. There, too, were housed the dozens of journals, white-paged and black, that I'd filled with sketches and snatches of poetry and favourite quotations over the long centuries. Valka had claimed one of the upper halls for a study, and there filled the place with phototypes and printouts of maps and scans of the various quiet sites she'd visited in her life. The revelation that the circular anaglyphs that covered the quiet's ruins were no glyphs at all, but the fingerprints in three-dimensional space of the higher-order dimensional mechanisms the quiet had left behind had broken her for years. But she was a xenologist, and language or no, she would unravel the mystery she'd set out to solve. I'd been given a small staff along with the place, of whom only old Anjou remained after seventy years. She'd started as a scullery maid when Valka and I first took up residence at Medallo House. Now she was the cook, and had been for nearly thirty years. She was terribly ancient for a plebeian, but was first to awaken every morning to prepare breakfast for myself and for the rest of the villa's small staff, the groundskeeper and two housekeepers. Often I would eat with them before taking my exercise in the vaulted gymnasium in the east wing. Once the place had rung to the sound of steel as the Cid Arthurians sparred with one another. The fencing gimbals with their target dummies and the holograph well were the only vestige of the monks that had not been scratched or painted over in some capacity. As I so often had in the morning those long decades, while Valka slept after a quiet night's labour, I stood in the centre of the fencing round, targets dancing about me on the end of articulated metal arms. Holograph projectors painted the images of men over those targets. The Cid Arthurians had designed and programmed the images of medieval knights in Gothic plate, their visors down, tunics bright and richly patterned. I felt shabby by comparison, barefoot, bare-chested, clad only in close-fitting trousers, the sword in my hand a weighted fiberglass rod. There were four of them, circling with blade or mace in hand. Holographs mapping neatly over the armatures at the end of each of the gimbal arms, so that each knight appeared connected to the circular device on the ceiling above us by an umbilical of elbowed steel. How the device could pass chantry inspection, I wasn't sure. 
nor could I guess at how the machine's iron will operated without recourse to artificial intelligence, yet operate it did, never once repeating itself. I had toyed with the thought of removing it. Its jointed arms too much recalled the limbs of the exalted, and of the chimeric half-machine soldiers that form the core of the Prophet's armies. But I never did. The Chantry had done enough harm to the old place when it tore out the old religious icons. I would do it no more harm. Moreover, I confess a certain attachment to the machine. The holographs recalled the images my own mother would paint in her holograph operas, and so, standing against those ancient knights in their metal armour, I felt I stood in one of her stories. The first knight lunged, red plume dipping as it thrust out the point of its sword. I parried the blade, slid the point of my sword inside and up under the knight's visor. The holograph faded, and the padded automation withdrew, dummy blade drooping as the gimbal retreated, pulling it into the air. One down. I leaped aside in time to dodge a blow from the next knight, whose false image wore a surcoat of blue and gold, with what looked like the fleur-de-lis of House Bourbon stitched upon it. The others came on, one in black and gold with a huge mace, and the other in lobstered steel with a helmet like a barrel, and bristles beneath the eye slits in imitation of a moustache. I parried a blow from the black knight and swung wide to put it between me and the other two. I had to control them to try to isolate one opponent at a time. My bare feet slid on the glassy floor as I backpedalled, retreating before the ferocious onslaught of the black knight. The blue one darted round toward my left, hoping to pincer me. I charged the black knight, batting its mace aside, and striking it a blow that rang its armet like a bell. The knight staggered, metal umbilical, whining as it went to one knee, according me the time I needed to turn and parry an overhead cut from the knight in blue. The mustachioed knight raised its great sword like an executioner. I lunged, kept the point of my weapon forward through a careful parry that pushed my enemy's blade aside. It struck the floor as I extended, the tip of my training sword passing through the illusion of plate to strike the target at centre mass. The knight vanished, a dummy skeleton lifting back into the air, circling round even as the first dummy deployed again, holograph painting the image of an ancient Nipponese samurai in lieu of the knight with the plume. By then, the black knight had recovered its feet, and both it and the blue moved together working as a unit. Their ghostly feet made no noise where they trod over the laser-smooth stone, nor did their armour rattle. They struck together, and though I struck the black in the head, the blue one's holographed sword walloped me across the back, leaving an angry welt. Snarling, I blocked the blue knight's sword arm with my left, felt little pain as my false bones bore the brunt of the impact. I whirled, blade whistling round to strike my mock opponent in the side of the head. It fell and faded, beaten. Knocking out three in such rapid succession had earned me a reprieve from respawning opponents, and I stood facing the samurai, sword raised in the forward line that had been my preferred guard since my days in the fighting pits of Emesh. The antique knight had a demonic mask that hid its face beneath the sloping kabuto. It advanced, blade flashing. I parried, sidestepping in a way that forced my point nearer the samurai's eyes. The simulacrum retreated, changing its guard. The curved blade came up, slashed down. I slackened my grip, allowed my sword to dip and flow out of the way as my opponent overcommitted, momentarily offering me its shoulder. As a boy, I had so often hesitated to strike when Sir Felix pitted me against my brother. I struck. The fourth drone's holograph faded, and all four of the gimbal arms rotated above me, dangling their combat dummies like evil fruit. I slowly rotated in the midst of them, watching as the automator touched down on the stone about me, brandishing padded batons that turned into the steel swords of ancient knights as the holographs flared back over their metal skeletons. I gritted my teeth, swept my attention round in a circle to assess my situation. I had a moment. Crooked Marlowe's smile reflected in the mirrored breastplate of the knight before me, knife-edged face, a determined mask. I was great then, great as I had ever been, great perhaps as I would ever be. 
The lead knight tapped its blade against its open palm, image producing no sound. Its fellows fanned out, circling about me like sharks in bloody water. Surrounded, no man could fight for at once. No ordinary man. I turned on the spot, knowing I could not keep all four in my sight, within the scope of my vision. Four became eight, became sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, hundreds, thousands. They struck and vanished as they struck, their possibilities snuffed out by time's relentless flood. One blade whistled by as I turned my shoulder, and I turned another aside as I pivoted, bringing my own weapon around to chop into one golem's shoulder. I didn't stay still, but hurried back, escaping the centre of the knot my enemies had made, blade held between myself and them. How many times had that hall rung to the clashing of our blades? How clearly I remember the colour of the sunlight through the wrought iron grates in the windows. How clearly I recall the smooth chill of the glassy floor beneath my horned feet. So many thousand such mornings lay behind me. So few were yet to come. Silence was coming to Medallo House. Silence and a shadow called Hadrian Marlowe, who would one day face smiling Sir Hector on that very glass and struggle even to hold his sword. The silver knight thrust its weapon at my eyes. Pause simulation. With a doppled whine, the servos in the gimbals and in the metal puppets ground to a halt. The silver knight's holograph soared inches from my face. I relaxed, turning to see Valka standing in the circular arch of the door, dressed in a loose sleeveless shirt and flared jodpers. Tribune Lin stood beside her, leaning on his cane and studiously looking anywhere but at the hideous deep scars that striped my left hand and arm, relic of the high matter sword that had nearly killed me in the Grand Colosseum on Forum. Still, surrounded by the holograph knights, I said, Lin, I'd not realised the time. The Tribune wore undress blacks beneath his great coat and carried his white tribune's beret beneath the arm opposite his cane. I'd not realised you'd kept that, he said, using his cane to point at the yellow flag that hung on the far wall of the gymnasium. It showed a black eight-winged angel with a skull for a face. It had belonged to Marius Went, the self-styled admiral whose dictatorship we toppled on our quest for Vorgosos. Looking up at it, I said, it's the one that flew above the state building. Jinan, Lieutenant Ajar, cut it down during the celebration. Jinan and I had climbed the spire ourselves. I still have his sword, Lin said and patted the weapon through his coat. Though not an imperial knight, Lin had carried the weapon ever since the Pharos affair. I was surprised no one had ever challenged him over it. Are those from the arena? What? I turned distractedly midway through the motion of handing my training sword to one of the automata. The antique knights flickered and the drones withdrew, pulled up toward the arched ceiling like puppets exiting the stage. He meant my scars. Ordinarily I wore a black leather glove buckled to the elbow to hide the worst of it. Yes, relic of the time before the last time the Chantry tried to kill me. They're bound to succeed if they keep going on like this. Don't say that, Valka said. I shrugged. Thanks to Valka's demarcist implants, we were quite certain the house was not bugged. Part of the reason I'd selected Medallo House for my own was its antiquity. Its one-time status as an abbey meant the old place's connection to the planet's data sphere was thin at best. There were no electronic locks on doors and windows, no security cameras, no integrated comm systems. If anything in the vicinity had been transmitting, Valka would have sensed it with her neural lace. How do you find Nessus, Lin? I asked, toweling myself off. Enjoying your meetings with the Magnarch? I'd sat in on several of Lord Venantian's advisory sessions with the Emperor, discussing the logistics of His Radiance's tour of the Outer Provinces. Frightfully dreary work. Lin shrugged. It's not so bad. You seem to be quite comfortable. The house? I looked round at the gymnasium, 
at the tall, narrow windows that overlook the grounds and the English garden safe within its high hedge walls. The house is the only part of my cage here that's any good, except my cellmate. Valka rolled her eyes. Still, Lynn said, stumping over to the windows to get a better view of the garden. You could do worse. I was surprised to get the invitation, truth be told. We mentioned it when you arrived, Valka interjected. Yes, but... He didn't turn to face us, but squared his shoulders as he surveyed the world below, drummed his fingers on the head of his cane, precisely as old Rain Smythe had done. We have not always seen eye to eye. As he spoke, it occurred to me those drumming fingers belonged to the hand I'd once cut off. After an uneasy silence, Lynn added, It has been a long campaign. His voice sounded drawn, tired, every note of it betraying the Tribune's several hundred years. I had to remind myself that he was patrician, that though we were close in age, his less noble blood was wearing on him more than mine. Lynn was not a young man. I am grateful that we are on the same side, Marlowe. Where was all this coming from? As am I, Lynn, I said, not sure what else to say. I never thanked you for getting me off that field on Berenike. You don't have to, I said, draping the towel about my shoulders. The tribute turned on his heel, inhaled sharply. I do. Receiving Bassander Lynn's gratitude was not the most comfortable experience of my life, so I stepped around it. Berenike was hard. Whatever happened to those Irktani soldiers of yours? Nearly two-thirds of them had died in the final assaults against Bahude, and the drill the Sielsin had sent against our fortress. Reassigned, I replied. Their commander, Barda, went to a legion fort on Zigana, I think it was. Took his men with him. I shifted posture, folded my arms almost offensively. They're training more of their kind to fight for us. At the funeral for Udax and the hundreds of dead Ektani, I had promised Bard of my loyalty to his people. It was a promise I'd done little to keep. Shaking myself from such guilty reflections, I said, Please, let me dress. I'll be back shortly. I withdrew to the safety of the bedchamber then, and quickly washed and clothed myself. A white tunic with loose sleeves belted above my customary black trousers and high boots. I lingered a moment to fuss over the silver fasteners of the leather gauntlet I wore to conceal the scars on my left arm. Violet eyes studying their own reflection in the mirror. An antique laving basin stood on the vanity before the mirror. It had belonged to Jinan, who had used every morning and evening to perform the ablutions her Jadian fire god asked of his faithful. She had left it with me when I left her. I had used it to hold certain valuables ever since. My rings lay in it, one of ivory, one of rhodium, one of yellow gold. Nestled amongst them was the piece of white shell the quiet had given me, and whose radiance had guided me out along the rivers of time from the howling dark, and the silver half-moon of the genetic phylactery Valka had made for me. There, too, was the silver cylinder that housed the inert pentaquark reservoir of the high matter blade that Augustine Bourbon had given to his picked assassin for that day in the Colosseum. I'd removed it before sending the empty hilt back to its owner so that he knew who it was that had encompassed his fate. I'd kept the core ever since. A reminder of what I was and what I should not become. This reminder I tried to square with the vision of me Bassander Lynn had his gratitude, his holy terror. The last buckle tightened on the cuff of my gauntlet, and I shook the white sleeve down over the glove. As I stepped away, the light reflected on the silver solder that held the smashed basin together. I had broken it, moving into my quarters aboard the Tamerlane, when the Emperor gifted me the old battleship, and its scars shone bright as my own did, without a glove to hide them. I thought of Lynn, his bones smashed and stitched back together with worn-out tools, and of Valka, her mind burned by Minos's virus. 
the war, had left its marks on each of us, as all time servants must. I found Lynn and Valker in the main hall, and coming down the grand staircase between the Marlow banners, I led Lynn on a tour of the house and grounds, the three of us talking of little things, old memories. We spoke of Rain Smythe, of Vorgosos, and of the time before Vorgosos. We spoke of Emesh and Sir Orlorin, and of Atavia Corvo, and the others who slumbered in icy crypts in the Tamburlaine above. I've not seen any of them properly since before Thermon, I said. Polino and Krim were with me on Ikana, and I spoke to Lorian and Corvo on calm after, but I've been cut off a long time. We both have, Valka said, reclining in her seat. The three of us had absconded to a table the housekeepers had brought out into the garden for the evening meal. Wine? She proffered the bottle of Carcassoni Blue. Lynn refused the vintage as he had refused it at the start of the meal. Just water. He refilled his amethyst glass from a matching pitcher to underscore his refusal. I imagine it's not been easy. Cut off from your people. And the Magnarch is not my greatest admirer, I said, cutting through what remained of my quail. Seeing Lynn's raised eyebrows, Valka put in, He is very devout. So am I, Lynn said coolly. She means that Lord Venantian considers me guilty of heresy and witchcraft and everything else the Inquisition brought against me at Thermon. I swallowed my bite of quail and watched Lynn closely for a reaction. The Mandari officer betrayed little feeling in his face, but shook his head furiously. Impossible. I saw what you did on Berenike and on that ship. If you were a machine or some experiment, the Inquisitors would have found out. They'd not have needed an assassin. I felt a frown slice across my face. Lynn's point was one I'd made to myself many times in the dead of night when the dreams came swift and silent. If I were anything but human, the Chantry would have found it. I was myself alone, and whatever the quiet had done to me, they had not changed me as Khan Sagara had changed, trading his body for another. A wind tousled the pencil cypresses and walnut trees beneath whose boughs there came the spark of fireflies in the fresh gloom of evening. That's the problem, I said at last. It would almost have been better if I was guilty. They would at least have known what to do with me in that case. I'd not be trapped here. I gestured at the garden, at Medallo House, at all of Nessus unrolled beneath the darkling sky. There are worse fates. Maybe, I agreed, and sipped my wine. You said the Emperor was here for us, Valka interjected, one hand settling on my arm. On the tarmac, you said you overheard Sir Grey Reinhardt and your legate talking. Despite having told us so much already, Bassander Lynn looked uncomfortable. The man was legion to his aching bones, and for him to engage in hearsay like a newly minted academy cadet was more than passing strange. Bassander set his amethyst drinking goblet on the table, eyes darting back beyond the garden and across the lawn to where his flyer cut a knife shadow against the sunset, as if afraid it might hear him. Sir Grey believes the Emperor means to name you an Orcta of the realm. I was glad I'd set my wine glass back on the table, for surely I would have dropped. Orkta? Me? What's an Orkta? Valka asked, gold eyes darting from the tribune to me. Bassander answered for me. It's an old office, one which hasn't been invoked since the Jadian Wars. Since the Oregon Wars, I corrected. I'd read Impatian's histories of the Empire a dozen times over the centuries. Turning to face Valka, I put a hand on her knee. You can't be serious. But Bassander was never unserious. In decades of knowing him, I'd hardly known him to smile. If you two don't answer my question... Valka put her own glass down and hid her left hand in her lap. I recognised the tension in her shoulder as she masked one of the occasional tremors. I raised a conciliatory hand, but it was Bassander who spoke. 
The Auctors were imperial proxies, co-emperors in all but name. They speak with the emperor's own voice, issue commands, draw up laws, command the legions. They were surrogates, I added. The old emperors used to appoint them and send them out in their stead to carry out their will. Hand-picked men, trusted. They'd exercise the emperor's office until their mission ended and then be done. After the Oregon Wars, the emperor, I want to say it was one of the Tituses, created the system of magnarchs and viceroys instead. That was a little more stable, a bit less centralised. Valka was nodding along, right hand massaging the left. You really think he'd resurrect this old office? Lynn shrugged. Like I said, he diverted the fleet five years off schedule to make this extra stop. Why do that if not for something like this? The tribune leaned over the ruins of his meal. Making you Okta would set you above the chantry. They'd not dare move against you. You'd be safe. Safe to leave this place. My eyes narrowed reflexively. What makes you so sure the Emperor wants me to leave this place? To hear Reinhardt tell it, the Emperor didn't want you sent here in the first place. Said you were wasted here. Lin lifted his amethyst cup and drank. I dwelt on this. Sir Grey Reinhardt was Director of Legion Intelligence, and by extension a man mere footsteps from the Imperial Council. Hearsay this Octa business might have been, but hearsay from the Imperial Spymaster was something much closer to fact than lesser rumour. For the first time in a long time, I felt an absurd twinge of hope, and suppressed the lopsided smile, concealed its spread by looking down at my plate. Octa, I said. Octa. It made sense. There were few things that would drive the Solon Emperor to divert his escort, to divert an entire battle fleet, over a hundred light years out of its way, adding years to the time his radiance was away from Forum. The appointment of an Imperial Octa was one. The first Octa in over nine thousand years. Valka laughed suddenly, a bright sound in the twilit air. Oh, your friend the Magnarch won't like this at all. Chapter 7 The King's Demon Weeks passed before the summons came. I spent most days in the Magnarch's palace, more often than not a silent accessory to the reports and inspections of the shipyards and the great cubicular where slept our waiting thousands, our soldiers awaiting the trumpet blast. The Empress spoke but little through all this, taking in Lord Carol Vanantian's news with the studious quiet of the lifelong monarch. Good rulers, in my experience, listen more than they speak. It had been so with Rain Smythe, and indeed with my father, who for all his callousness ran his prefecture with the ruthless efficiency of a thinking machine. As the days ran by, I began to imagine that Bassander's rumour was only that, a rumour. But for the odd remark in council, the Emperor made no more special notice of me than of any other member of the council, as if I were not the man who had delivered him the heads of two Cielsin clan chiefs and cut as many fingers off Siriani de Reica's white hand as if I were not the man who refused to die in the Grand Colosseum, as if I were not the man who stood unburned beneath laser fire before the gates of the storm wall on Berenike. That itself, I realise now, was a statement in itself, a reminder from his radiance that whatever I was, he was Caesar. But the summons did come. Just this way, please, said the Emperor's manservant, the androgyn whom Caesar had called Nicephorus. The homunculi's bald pate shone in the lamplight as it led the way up the narrow stair to the viaduct approaching the Chantry Sanctum, where the Magnarch had his private chapel. His radiance asked I bring you to him directly after you arrived. He's in the chapel? I asked. 
His radiance is in the custom of taking these private moments for prayerful contemplation come evenfall, Nicephorus replied. Particularly of late, the disposition of the provinces weighs heavily on his mind, you understand. I paused a step to permit Valka to go ahead of me up the narrow way and said, I do. I trust your time here on Nessus has been satisfactory, my lord, the servant asked, apparently just filling the silence. Save the part where we can't leave, yes, Valka replied. I caught her hand, and she glared down at me, mouthed the word, What? A servant Nicephorus might have been, but a servant with the emperor's ear, meaning the butler was the emperor's ears. Every word that passed between us I felt sure would be passed back to Caesar with no distortion. It is bittersweet to be back having been so briefly away, I said, thinking of the mission to Ikana. Siloed as I was aboard the Ascalon, I had not seen Otavia Corvo or Laurian Aristides, or most of my Red Company. They had fought the battle in orbit, and our imperial minders had made it quite clear we were to return directly to the provincial capital. Coming back felt like a man dreaming, thrust back into the grey and waking world. Or perhaps Nessus was the dream, a dull nightmare, and Decana true wakefulness. The old house, which had become home despite the unseen bars of the cage of Anantian and his ilk, maintained for Valkyr and for me, had become like home. But Ekana, and the brief time I'd had with Polino and with Krim, had reminded me that my home lay cold in orbit, its occupants once again immersed in icy dream. Nicephorus stopped at the top of the stair for Valkyr and me to join it. The androgyn smiled, but the light didn't quite reach its imperial emerald eyes. It brought his radiance no joy to order you here. It was as close to an imperial apology as any man in the galaxy might hope to get. Nicephorus extended a hand along the viaduct toward the sanctum, a tall, square building beneath a verdigree dome surrounded by its nine fluted prayer towers. Come, Caesar should not be made to wait. The excubitors parted, and two of the mirrored knights pushed the carved oak doors aside to admit me to the chapel. I had seldom entered the place in all my years at the palace, attending only those ceremonies which necessity compelled me to attend. The emperor knelt before the altar, his back to me, arms outstretched in prayer. About him stood his various attendants and hangers-on, the logothetes and scoliasts, heads bowed in mingled prayer and respectful silence. The archprior Leonora stood to one side like the watchful queen beside the king on his chessboard. Though with her black robes and white mitre, it was impossible to say whether she checked the emperor or protected him from check. The altar stood beneath the chapel's central dome, whose plastered surface was frescoed with the green and blue cloud-streaked face of earth. The scent of myrrh rose from thuribles hung in the arches that opened round the circumference of that dome, and the smoke of candles burning before the icons in their graven niches twined about the scent of food left before those same icons in offering to the virtues and powers that shaped mankind and her world. Prudence and justice, time and space, temperance and fortitude, and bloody-handed evolution. There were icons of death and fate and fury, too, and dozens more less well-known and less prayed to. I sensed Valka's unease boiling off her at my side and understood it. She was a daughter of the clans of Tavros, a witch in the eyes of the holy Terran Chantry for the machines that spider-webbed her brain. Stepping over the threshold of the chapel was like a sheep stepping into the lion's den, or a lion leaping in among armed shepherds. Of Bassander Lynn there was no sign, nor did I see Sir Grey or Sentil Massa the legate. The emperor didn't turn, and before Valka and I could make it five paces along the minutely tiled space between, a logo feet in the red piped charcoal of the civil service stepped in and, throwing out an arm, whispered, Lord Nicephorus, the emperor is at prayer. We can see that, 
Valka said, unable to curb the acid in her voice. She softened it with the sharp V of her smile. Too sharp. The man's eyes narrowed, and in lieu of answer, I bowed my head and waited, twisting the ring of yellow gold upon the first finger of my right hand. The Emperor's Ring. The ring that belonged on the conspicuously blank spot on his right hand. The ring he had given me, before banishing me from the Eternal City after Bourbon and the Empress's failed plot in the Colosseum. The Dragon Slayer's Ring. Moving with the smooth grace of a lifetime's courtly training, Nicephorus interposed itself between Valka and Logothete. Please wait here, it said. His radiance didn't stir for another several minutes, nor did his arms waver. Red gloved fingers spread wide to either side, the line of his shoulders straight and proud, despite the weight of centuries. It was only then I saw the violet-togued form of Lord Venantian bent not far off upon a velvet-cushioned kneeler, head bowed and hands clasped. On the altar before them the figure of William I, the God-Emperor, knelt himself beneath the painted dome of earth, knelt as he had upon the Aventine Hill of ancient Rome in the ashes of his victory over the machines. The statue held aloft a crown of twisted wires, prepared to rest it upon his sainted brow. In time, the red hands clasped above the emperor's red head, and making the sign of the sun disk, he stood, gathering his scarlet and gold cape over one arm as he turned. We had thought you would come alone. I did not bow, but went to one knee as was my right as a soldier and knight of the Imperium. I turned my face down, and so couldn't see if Valka bowed or knelt or gave any sign. Honourable Caesar, I began, using the address that too was my right as a soldier. My companion has been imprisoned here beside me these seventy years. She is not your subject, but I had hoped she might add her voice to mine in pleading for our release. I risked a glance upward to see how the Emperor would respond. His radiance turned fully as two attendants hurried forward and adjusted the drape of his cloak and straightened his regalia. He planted one foot on his kneeler and said, Is that why you are here? To plead? Was it not we who summoned you? I felt Valka's hand on my shoulder and from its angle guessed that she was standing. She didn't speak, but that contact gave me the strength necessary to raise my head entire. I may have been the Emperor's favourite servant for a time, but that time was long ago, and if Lin's rumour was wrong, there was great risk in boldness. And yet, your radiance, I said. I am your faithful servant, but I cannot well serve you here. I accomplished more for your empire in a single day on Ekana than I have in all these years on Nessus. If I must plead to better serve you, so be it. Reasonable as he was, the Emperor was not immune to flattery. Few great lords are. The Emperor's emerald eyes showed no emotion as he studied me for what felt the life age of a son. Rise, Sir Hadrian, he said at last, gesturing with one hand. His eyes swept the assembly in the chapel about us, and speaking to the congregation, he said, Leave us. At once the scoliasts and logothetes took their silent leave, slippered feet scraping over tile. I remembered the way cold dread used to ooze down my spine as my father's counsellors filtered from his conference chambers, the way anticipation had clamped iron fingers about my heart. But I'd been young then, was young no more, and though the emperor should have filled my veins with ice, I found there was little fear left in me. It was a dance nothing more. Leonora and the Magnarch evidently exempted themselves from the imperial order to vacate themselves, as did the watchful excubitors, who stood by with high-matter swords blazing and active in attentive hands. Even the Emperor's androgyn servants departed, save only hairless Nicephorus, who stood with head bowed beside a candlelit altar to two-faced time. When all the rest were gone, his radiance said, 
I do not know what to do with you, Lord Marlow. No royal we. I didn't know if I should take that as a good sign or a very bad one. He continued, speaking as if the Magnarch and Archprior were not present. Do you understand what you have done? I did not answer, but stood in the aisle with Valka, hands clasped before me, the gloved hand twisting the Emperor's ring. The Emperor began pacing, circling the great altar where the god-emperor's statue knelt amidst ten thousand burning candles, their bases all blurred into one, their points blazing like a little galaxy. Four times now you have performed miracles. At Vorgosos, you say you returned from the dead. At Aptica, you won a victory without spilling a single drop of human blood. In my Colosseum, you defy death again, and again on Berenike. I do not believe the first story. I know the second is not true. The third my inquisitors have disproved. Your false bones. But this fourth one, Berenike. I have seen the recordings. I was especially glad then that I had confiscated the suit camera recordings from the Battle of Ekana. It would not have done to add to my list of crimes. The Emperor had vanished around the rear of the statue then, and against my better judgment, I approached the altar where the Magnarch and Archprior stood. I have tolerated these stories for so long, not because I believed them or disbelieved them, but because I believed their usefulness was greater than the threat they posed. The people believe almost anything, and if what they believe is useful to our fight, I call that good. The Emperor re-emerged from the far side of the altar, continued pacing with hands clasped in front of him. My Chantry, here he nodded toward Leonora, believes differently. They believe you are a charlatan, and a threat to me. In pursuit of their belief, they have acted in accordance with what they believe to be my best interest, and the best interest of the Imperium, and of mankind as a whole. He spread his hands. Know this. In acting against you, they have acted without orders from me. "'Tis reassuring,' said Valka, arms crossed. I felt my heart leap into my throat, but the Emperor ignored her. "'Do you understand the situation you have put me in?' the Emperor asked. "'Will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest?' I intoned, speaking in classical English. The Emperor evidently understood that ancient tongue, for he arched one eyebrow. Just so. My left hand strikes at my right, and I have need of both. Understand, if I order you somewhere, here, say, for a period of some years, no, I do not act without reason. I have kept you and my chantry apart, kept you from those agencies who believe they know my mind even when I do not. He came to a halt before the statue of his ancestor, noble face creased with long care. When last we spoke face to face, you told me you had visions. I didn't quite believe you, but as I say, I have seen the recordings from Berenike. Millions have seen them. He turned away, stared up into the graven face of the god-emperor. They say you are the earth's chosen, that these miracles of yours prove as much. The Emperor stood straight as a laser beam, so still he might have been a statue himself but for the motion of his jaw. Perform your magic for me. I am not a sorcerer, I said carefully. Talk of magic and witchcraft conjured thoughts of forbidden machines, and it was important that I distance myself from such things as quickly as possible and you told me once that you do not believe in sorcery. "'Are you not my servant?' the Emperor asked. "'I gave you an order.' "'Ekana,' I said. "'Berenike, Nevermand, Aptuka, Vorgosos. "'I gave you victories, Radiance. "'Is this not magic enough?' "'Valka choked back decisive laughter. "'Curb your tongue, man!' Carol Vanantian spat. Unable to contain himself. 
you address the earth's anointed, added the archprior Leonora. William the twenty-third raised one ringed hand. Wisdom Virgilian and the Chantry Synod would have me kill you, Sir Hadrian, and there are those on my council who believe it would be best if I banished you to Belusia to live out your days rotting in exile. He turned, and for the first time I discerned the fractal gleam of the body shield he wore, flickering against the candlelight behind. It was no idle threat. Belusia was the most famous of the Empire's prison colonies, a frigid world beneath a dim and failing star where so many imperial embarrassments met their end. "'You wouldn't dare,' Valka said, unable to stop herself. "'Do you know how much he has given to you? How much he has fought?' I held out a hand to stop her, heart swelling with love and gratitude, even as it leaped into my heart with fear. The Emperor's lips pressed together. "'Silence, witch!' Leonora raised her hand to point at Valka. "'You're one to talk,' Valka thrust out her chin. "'Hadrian has done everything you've asked of him. Everything! And this is how you thank him? Threats of execution? Imprisonment?' "'Valka, that's enough,' I said, too aware of her danger. "'No, tis not!' The Empress' compressed expression had transmuted into a papery smile. In nearly six hundred waking years, madam, I cannot recall the last time anyone has taken such a tone with me. Perhaps they should start, she said. Valka! Silence found its place among us. I offered no apology, begged no pardon. The Empress' smile had not vanished. The female of her species is more deadly than the male he said, speaking in classical English. Valka made another derisive noise. Returning to Galstani, the Empress said, You two may be more dangerous than the Sielsin. He inhaled sharply through his nose, eyes shut in what I recognize was a scolias technique for clearing the mind. Which brings us to our present concern. Radiant Majesty, this cannot stand, Leonora said. The woman must be punished. The woman is not my subject. Nor am I yours, reverence. Be silent. The archprior bowed and retreated a step, though I caught the spark of flint in her black eyes. Besides, this is a private conversation. No public offence has been given. Lord Marlow is fortunate to be blessed with so zealous a defender. Not knowing what else to say, I said, Thank you, Radiance. I could sense the danger Valka and I were in too acutely. Another emperor might have ordered Valka killed then and there for such an outburst. I glanced at the score of excubitors, who yet held their posts about the chapel's perimeter. No matter. I have thought of a better use for you, Lord Marlow. The emperor fidgeted a moment with his rings. I shall be frank. You have remained here on Nessus so long for one reason. I do not waste tools that are of use to me, and you are of use. Charlatan or sorcerer, you have gotten results. You say your victories are magic enough. I agree. And while I have kept you here to keep you out of trouble, I believe you are right. You are more used to me off Nessus than on it. Earth and Emperor, Bassander Lynn had been right. Sir Grey and the Legate were right. Octa. The Emperor meant to name me an Octa of the Imperium after all. I braced myself for the news, for the tide of outraged fury that was sure to come from Magnarch and Archprior alike. I want more victories from you, the Emperor said, and so you will take your ship and go to Padmorak as our Apostle. You will head a delegation to the Lothrian Grand Conclave. What? I couldn't help myself. It was not at all what I had expected. Padmarak. Visions of Hadrian, Orcta of the Solon Empire, faded in a twinkling. I ought to have been relieved, and yet I felt a perverse melancholy. Not because I'd wanted the honour, 
but because it would have upset the Magnarch and the Chantry's representative far more than any outburst from Valka ever could. The Commonwealth has stood apart from this conflict for too long now, the Emperor said, brows raised at my outburst, though he withheld comment. With Prince Kaim committing the Jadians to the war effort, it is right and just that the Commonwealth should join us as well. You will secure their support. Our people have bled enough for mankind on their own. If the scourge of Earth insists on changing the nature of this war, then we shall insist as well. The royal we had returned, and with it the stoic impassivity of the Emperor's visage. It made sense. The Lothrian Commonwealth was, after the Solon Empire, the largest human nation in the galaxy. Their grand conclave, a body of party officials nominally elected by the people but really appointed from on high, ruled more than a hundred thousand worlds spread across the upper reaches of the Sagittarius arm of the galaxy, nearer the core in the galactic west. Each planet was ruled by its own conclave of party appointees, and each conclave nominated one of its members to represent it to the Grand Conclave on Padmarak. I smiled. This is another form of exile, isn't it? Another impossible task. The Emperor glanced at Venantian, and I wondered if the Magnarch had put him up to it. But no. The Emperor had still diverted his fleet years out of the way to come early to Nessus on his tour of the far provinces. This was important. And yes, I will not risk another Thermon. That is why I sent you here. That is why I am sending you to Padmarak. The Commonwealth can no longer be allowed to play the hermit. You will go to them and secure their military support. You will be empowered to make concessions to them, lift trade embargoes, and so forth. My counsellors will get you all you need. Magnarch Venantian? The old man nearly stumbled in his hurry to approach the imperial person. Radiance? The emperor's eyes never left my face. See to it that Lord Marlowe's ship is brought out of space dock and outfitted for its journey. I want him on his way at once. That's it, then? I asked. Those are your orders, the Emperor replied. Go and perform your magic, sorcerer. Chapter 8 Shattered Glass How long till rendezvous, pilot? I asked, wasting no time as I came through the portal to the bridge of the Ascalon. The chalice-class interceptor hummed beneath my feet as I took in the narrow bridge and the three men crewing it. The Ascalon could run with as few as one man at the controls. It had been designed to transport small numbers at great speed and in great secrecy. I'd added it to my list of assets before the Battle of Senuessa some years before Thermon, when the need to travel between the relatively close-knit worlds at the edge of the Vale had been great, and the Tamerlane's speed was insufficient. Ten minutes, my lord, said the chief pilot officer, a reddish woman with a shock of white hair. Her navigator spoke up. Should be able to see the old girl in about three, though, sir. She's coming round the day side. Valka entered as he was saying this, and said, Be sure to put it on screen, please. I'd like to watch our approach. Aye, ladyship. I felt Valka bristle at the honorific, but she didn't rebuke the man. Centuries spent among us Solon barbarians had worn down her defences, and at any rate our sojourn among her people had not more endeared her to the demarchists' way of life. A moment passed in professional silence as the three officers went about their work. The helmsman sat forward most of all, strapped into a chair, thrust out into the midst of an alum-glass geodesic blister, glass above and below and to all sides. It was the only true window on the bridge, used mostly to allow the helmsman to communicate by body language with ground crew whenever the ship was in dock. In space, it was less useful, though it eased the claustrophobic bottling effect common on so many Starcraft, especially the smaller ones. The other seats, 
those of the chief officer and the navigator, stood farther back beneath the low, sloping roof. It was between these I stood, ungloved hand resting on the back of the navigator's seat at my right, the Emperor's gold ring shining on my finger. I'd half expected him to demand its return, but before I'd left Nessus I'd seen his radiance the Emperor one more time. He'd insisted I keep it as a sign, so the Grand Conclave on Padmarac knew I represented him personally. "'Twill be good to see Octavia and the others again,' Valka said. "'It has been so long.' That was an understatement. But after so many decades, any statement would be. "'She said they'd all be waiting for us,' I said. I'd spoken to the old mercenary captain earlier that very same day to coordinate our pickup. The Ascalon had landed in the meadow outside Modalo House, and old Anju had overseen the house staff work to carry the crates Valka and I had earmarked for transport to the Tamerlane. Don't suppose I'll be seeing you again, master, the cook said, peering up at me with eyes half veiled with age. She'd been but a girl when she'd started. All elbows, those eyes sparkling with laughter. I'd watched three generations of her family come and go. Her great-grandson had just passed his examinations and entered the civil service, working for the Magnarch's office. Anju said he aspired to patrician uplift, and I'd promised to put in a good word. How strange the passage of time is. Generations for the old chef. A lifetime and my hair had yet to grey. Stranger still, as for Octavia Corvo and the others aboard the Tamerlane, it had been no time at all. Sixty-eight years had passed them by in less than a dream, and the familiar faces we rode to meet, whom we longed to see again after so lengthy a separation, had seen us merely yesterday. No man ever steps in the same river twice, I murmured, quoting, Everything flows. My lord? The chief pilot officer looked round. I had spoken in classical English, and that dead language was alien to the young man. I caught Valka looking at me, one brow raised. She'd understood me perfectly. Nothing, I said, and shut my eyes, thinking of the shimmering rivers of time, of whose strange waters and stranger shores I dreamed each night. The navigator cleared his throat. We have line of sight, Lordship, on the overhead. A false window blinked on the canted ceiling above the three officers, showing a contrast-boosted and greatly magnified view ahead. I had not seen her at Ikana, had not seen her in so many years. The Tamerlane crested above the cloud-streaked green and white face of Nessus like a city sailing. She flew inverted to us, her armoured dorsal hull facing the planet we orbited so that the spires and geometric holds and the organic swell of engine clusters that hung beneath that armoured top layer seemed the black towers and bastion of a dark castle wrought of steel. My castle. The five great cones of her fusion engines were dark, and only the faint points of ion drives shone like stars across her stern. She was flying away from us and we were overtaking her, our own ion drives sparking, pushing us to higher and higher orbits. More than a dozen miles she stretched from pointed forecastle to the arrowhead of her stern. Between the naval crew and officers, the infantry who slept frozen in her holds, and the aquilarii who manned her lighter craft, more than ninety thousand men called her home. None more than me. Not speaking, not needing to, Valka wrapped an arm about my waist. I smiled. We were home. In time the hangar doors were opened, and we passed through the static field into the launch bay. On approach, the pilot officer inverted the Ascalon, flipped it head over heels, so that we slid into the launch bay backward, relying on the ion drives and on common repulsors to bleed the momentum from our burn. Magnetic clamps embraced us, and the great bay doors slid closed. 
Valker and I were aware of this only as a distant clangor, for we waited by the hatch. She squeezed my hand and kissed me, hooked an arm around my neck to draw me down and close. The seventy years of our exile melted then and dripped away, and more than those years. The odorless recycled air and the brisk chill of the starship brought back the sense of ages past, and the Valka who kissed me was not the dark lady of Nessus, but the young xenologist I'd met on Emesh when I'd been little more than a boy. Back on the road again, she breathed, forehead pressed to mine. I matched her grin and kissed her in turn. The hatch opened, pale light streaming in. Good to see some things haven't changed, came a familiar voice. Hasn't it been like a hundred years for you two? Otavia Corvo stood at the end of the gangway, seven feet of corded muscle in her captain's blacks, floating coils of bleached hair twisting about her dark face. She uncrossed her arms and grinned. Valka and I sprang apart as First Officer Bastian Duran said, Welcome back to the Tamerlane, Lord Marlow, Dr. Ondera. He bowed, adjusted his arcane spectacles, tried his best to hide the wry amusement he shared with his commander. Seventy years, I said in answer, striding forward to clasp Batavia by the arm. She grinned wolfishly. You haven't aged a day. Otavia! Valka pushed past and embraced the taller woman. Valka! The captain returned the embrace, surprised by the fierceness of it. There is a part, I think, in those of us with augmented lifespans, which has never adjusted to them. It is as if our memory and our cells expect only to live the three score and ten of our mythic past. And so seeing Corvo and Durand again, after so long a separation, was meeting again a friend from childhood, in the twilight of deep age, and finding them unchanged. When Valka and the captain had come apart, Corvo said, White and Koskinen are prepared to take us out system as soon as we get clearance. The Commonwealth? Really? Have you ever been? I asked. Corvo shook her head. Heard stories. I sailed with a woman who came out of there before Pharos, Duran said, his old composure restored. The first officer had been distant and chilly before Annika and Berenike, but after he'd been almost remote as the stars. If my experiences with the quiet and my magic, to borrow the Emperor's term, had converted Bassander Lynn from adversary to friend, they had alienated Durand. I had forced the officer to shoot me, and watched the blood drain from his face when he saw the bullet had done me no harm. I'm not sure he had so much as looked at me since. She was strange, laconic, sort of spoke around what she wanted. The Lothrians don't have ways of referring to individual people, I said. No names or titles, no identity, no property. Sounds like hell, Polino said, appearing from round the corner at the end of the gangway tunnel, Ilara in tow. Pal! I clapped the man on the shoulder. I'd seen him far more recently than the others, but it was still too long. Ilara and I embraced. They were, besides Valka and I suppose Bassander Lynn, the last link I had to what I considered the true beginning of my life on Imesh. How long have you two been out of freeze? Only since yesterday, Ilara said. We'd have called, but the captain here said you were busy with the emperor. She smiled in an almost motherly way. Ilara had fallen into the role of quartermaster when we'd stolen the mistral and left Bassander and Jinan above Roostum. She and Polino had never married. They'd both been older when I'd met them in the fighting pits on Imesh, and though both of them had entered a second youth when I'd named them my armsmen and members of my house, I suppose neither of them felt the need to formalise their entanglement, as Valka and I had never done. Valka and I moved out of the gangway umbilical and into the hall overlooking the launch bay. Through high, narrow windows I could see the black and silver knife shape of the Ascalon clamped into its moorings. As I watched, 
the three nacelles and the wing on the near side folded against the hull of the ship. The Emperor? asked a small pale-eyed man with long hair so blonde it was nearly white. What's this, then? Good to see you too, Aristides. Commander Lorian Aristides returned my acknowledging nod, toyed with one silvered brace that kept his two long fingers in their proper places. Is the Emperor here? Valka interjected. He's on tour, visiting worlds across the front. He's who ordered this mission to the Commonwealth, I said. Lorian's skeletal face composed itself into a frown. Straight from the top, eh? I could hear the gears in his head starting to turn. Are they trying to push you out of the action again? It does certainly seem that way, I agreed. The little man had an unnerving habit of cutting straight to the heart of things. Turning to Corvo and Durand, I said, Will you have someone take our things to our quarters? Durand tapped his chest in salute and moved off, pressing past the others to find the stevedores. When he had gone, I asked Corvo, how long will it take us to reach Padmarac? The captain chewed the inside of her cheek. A little over forty-three years standard. Is Halford out of freeze? I asked, referring to the night captain, the man whose job it was to tend the Tamerlane while she sailed between the stars, with her primary crew in fugue. Corvo shook her head. I figure the ship's been offline so long we ought to take the first leg to shake her down. It's seven years to Gododin at top speed. We'll refuel there and cross the rest of the way to the Sagittarius before we turn Corward and make our way up the arm. Good, I said. Seven years. I'll stay awake as well. That way I'll be around if anything arises that requires my attention. Besides, it'll be nice to have some time with everyone. We'll wake Halford and the rest at Gododin. He can take us on to Padmarac. The thought occurred to me that travelling up the Sagittarius arm would mean passing near Colchis. Even if it were not possible to set into port there, I made a note to leave a message by intersystem relay for Siren and Gibson, assuming they were still alive. This will probably be Roderick's last voyage, Corvo said, meaning Commander Holford. He's over two hundred years active time now, three hundred by the time we make it back from the Commonwealth. Half his palatine life, I thought. I seldom thought of the night captain. Despite all the years he'd put into our company, I had spent but little time getting to know the man who had saved us all from pirates off the coast of Nagapur. I can hardly believe it's been so long. Oh no, Polino exclaimed. Seems like just yesterday we were dealing with that stick old Lin kept up his mandari arse. Tribune Lin sends his regards, by the way, I said to Corvo, who accepted this news with a nod. Everyone was quiet a moment, and I said, On the bright side, this is a diplomatic mission. We're moving away from the fighting for once. I don't expect there'll be much call for shore leave in the Commonwealth, but see we spring for the good stuff when we resupply in Gododin. You've all been under the ice a long time. Do you good to live a little? All they've got on Gododin's bromos, Polino groaned. I've eaten enough hyper oats for a hundred lifetimes. Valka laughed. Twill do you good. Believe me, Valka, I've had enough good done me by that shite to last till earth comes. I caught myself grinning, looking round at all the others. My friends. I have missed you all. Wish I could say the same, lad, Polino barked but they keep us nobodies froze up, so I saw your ugly mug day before last. Good, I snapped back, and for an instant I was not Hadrian but Hade, the Myrmidon again. That way you won't forget it. Old man like you needs reminding. Polino pointed a finger in my direction. Think that's funny, do you? I'll teach you to respect your elders, lad. You're not my elder any more, pal, I said and felt my grin die a little as Durand returned with the porters to take mine and Valka's effects to our cabin. I found new life for it again and continued. Maybe it's you who needs teaching. The old soldier beat his chest. Try that in the ring, son. It's a deal, I said, laughing along with the others. What's ship time? Fourteen hundred hours, 
Lorian answered. I took this information in with a curt nod. Good. Corvo, would you walk with us? I want to see everything get set up in the cabin proper and we'll all reconvene for dinner, yes? I paused, realising only then that we were short. Where are Krim and Ilex? Still in Medica, Durand answered. Started the thaw later than the rest of us. Okoyo says they'll be clear by end of day. Let's push dinner then, I said, brushing past Lorian with a gentle hand on the short Intus's shoulder. I'd rather see everyone together. The air felt dry and lifeless as the doors cycled and the ventilators kicked quietly on. The lights bloomed from dark to orange to golden. All was as we had left it. The wall was bare where Wentz's flag had been removed, and the bookshelves on the curved gallery on the level above yawned their emptiness. The books had all been taken to Medallo House, and in Medallo House they remained. Valka had gone with Corvo to the bridge, and left me to oversee the reordering of our lives. I drifted toward the couches and the low table that made up the central sitting area in the centre of the room, taking in the old dining table beside the wine cabinet and refrigeration unit, and the pocket door that led to the dumb waiter that descended to the officer's mess. There, too, were the old coat hooks above the sideboard where once I'd kept Jinan's laving basin. Something on the floor caught my eye, and I crossed to the sideboard, crouched beside it. Shards of glass littered the floor, shone in the soft overhead light. It took me a moment to realise what they were from. It was the remains of the glass bubble I'd ordered made to preserve my galleth blossom from the predations of time. When I'd left the Tamerlane at the start of my exile, it had seemed wrong somehow to take the flower with me. Perhaps it was because it was a symbol of the Empire, and the Empire had spurned me. Or perhaps it was only that it had come to mean little to me, like the Nipponese woodcuts that hung on one wall. The globe must have fallen with the motion of the ship, or perhaps one of the porters who had helped empty the chamber had shattered it by accident as we sealed the rooms. I'd no way of knowing, for surely security logs so old were purged from the ship's database. I poked through the smashed glass and found what I was looking for. The white flower had withered at last, its silver-edged petals wrinkled and grey. I lifted it by its desiccated stem, twirled it in my fingers, a frown coming unbidden to my face. My reflection glowered at me from out of the glass front of the sideboard. I might have been the same young man who'd first taken ownership of the Tamerlane, the pointed nose and high cheekbones were the same, as were the violet eyes and curtains of ink-dark hair. My age betrayed itself only in the deepened permanence of the creases at eyes and mouth, and in the tiredness of the spirit that clung to me. In the quiet of the chamber and unwatched, I reached for that second sight. I saw the flower across infinite variations. Dead, dead, and dead. Here a petal was missing, here the stem snapped. There I found it flattened, and in too many places found it not at all. I reached further and further, casting my eyes toward the very edges of the cone of light that described the boundaries of my sight, the boundaries of the possible. In not one of them were the flower and the glass made whole. They had broken long ago, and it was only the present I could change and the future with it. Only the past is written. Lord Marlow! I crushed the flower in my fist, looked round to find the stevedores had arrived with the first of mine and Valka's luggage on a float pallet. Yes, I stood. Let the dust of the flower fall. What is it? I... Where would you like this, sir? By the stairs, I pointed with my gloved hand. "'unless it's earmarked for our personal quarters. "'Carry that through.' "'Yes, my lord.' "'The men shunted their float pallet over the Tavrosi carpets "'and set about their work. "'And someone clean this up,' I said, "'indicating the shattered glass as I swept from the room "'to join Valker and Corvo on the bridge. "'My original task. Forgotten.'
Chapter 9 Kings and Pawns Have you looked in all the crash lockers? asked Lorian Aristides, lounging on one of the crash seats that lined the walls of the Ascalon's small hold. I paused midway through the act of searching through the crates that stood clamped to the floor in rows down the middle of that long, narrow chamber. The walls, slanted in at either side, narrowing toward a roof supported by raw metal struts like the ribs of an iron whale. With most of the little ship's systems powered down while it remained safely tucked away in the Tamerlane's hold, the air was cold and our breath frosted the air. Little more was being done than to maintain the atmosphere and the ship's little hydroponics garden. Unable to mask my irritation, I asked, why would my necklace be in someone else's fugue locker? The younger man shrugged. Valka's phylactery, the silver half-moon pendant she'd given me before the fighting on Berenike, had not been among the items brought from Modalo House. The pendant contained a complete copy of Valka's genetic and epigenetic information etched in quartz alongside a crystallized sample of her own blood. Among her people, such things were given as gifts when a clansman earned enough esteem in the eyes of his or her peers to be allowed the right to have a child. They had no families but the clan, and every man and woman parented alone. Marriage was forbidden, for to marry was to privilege one partner above all others, which the clansman called the vilest sort of prejudice. The Tavrosi forbid even the exchange of phylacteries, fearing that the existence of siblings would create something too like the exclusive family unit. Valka had made two phylacteries. She kept the other, wore it always on a chain about her neck. That one contained all that I was, as mine contained her. Such a trade would have had the both of us imprisoned where Valka came from, packed into the Demarquis' re-education centres. It had been her compromise, not a marriage as I'd wanted for us nor the dissolution of ties Valka's culture expected. How much of life consists of such mutual surrenders? I don't suppose it was simply left behind? Lorian asked, tucking his thin arms tighter across his chest. Earth and Emperor, it's cold. Standing, I shut the heavy metal lid of the crate I'd been examining and shoved hands into pockets. Possibly. Some of mine and Valka's possessions had yet to be sorted through, and the crates all rose about me. I'd sifted through most of the boxes already, found little but clothing and copies of Valka's many notes. Two armoured crates each contained suits of combat armour that had been crafted for me on forum. These we had not seen fit to transfer up to our quarters, and doubtless much of it would remain in place through to journey's end. It should have been in with my old wash basin the one I keep my effects in. I haven't seen the basin either, Lorian said unhelpfully. I know! I snapped, tossing back the tails of my greatcoat to sit upon the crate facing the smaller man. Lorian looked half a child huddled in his cape, his knees drawn up to his chest in the crash seat. Voice sour, I added, I had noticed it was missing too. Thank you. Not uncrossing his arms, Lorian shrugged a second time. You asked for my help. I'm helping. I grunted. I'll telegraph Nessus from Good Odin. I'll sleep easier on the trip to Padmarak once I know where it is. That meant enduring years of quiet anxiety about the phylactery, but it wasn't possible to send or receive quantum telegraphs while the Tamerlane remained at warp. I'm sorry. Lorian waved this aside. I hope it turns up, but like as not there's a crate or two still sitting on Nessa somewhere collecting dust. I just have to hope the Magnarch doesn't sell the villa while I'm away. He'd not do that, surely? Lorian scoffed. There was nothing to say to that. Lorian was probably right, and if the basin and Valka's phylactery were sitting beneath the mirror in our bedroom, beneath the carved beams of the roof, it would be all right. Anju and her people had probably already overseen the mothballing of the old place. Drop cloths like funeral shrouds draped over furniture and statuary, systems powered down, 
only the gardener still haunting the emptied grounds, tending the hedges and the fish. When we'd been quiet for the better part of a minute, Lorian, not a man known for his ability to keep from talking, said, Are we really going to Padmarak? I blinked at him once, twice, not sure how to interpret this question. As opposed to, I had the sudden suspicion that this was why Lorian had volunteered to accompany me as I searched through the boxes. I thought perhaps we might be going off book. Going renegade? I arched one eyebrow. What gave you that impression? The little man chewed the lining of one cheek a moment. Well, this is obviously another punishment mission. I don't know all that happened while I was taking the ice snap with the rest of the crew, but I thought there was a chance you had something in mind. Like after Colchis. You mean the Annika mission? I said, at last letting the eyebrow relax. No, Lorian. We're going to Padmarak. The good commander seemed to deflate a little at the news. Lorian let his legs down, feet dangling just above the floor. I only thought there might be something. Perhaps you and the doctor unravelled some mystery about your quiet friends in the Cielsin. Lorian, I spent about the last seventy years under house arrest because the Emperor couldn't trust the Chantry or his own wife not to try and kill me again. I spent the decade before that in custody, in case you've forgotten. There's no play here. No plan. We have a mission and a duty. I mean to perform that duty and remind the Emperor of the debt he owes me and my company. Here I gestured at Lorien. The Chantry believes I threaten their religious power. They think, I think, I'm some kind of prophet. False prophet, I suppose. And they saw what happened on Berenike. There's no hiding it any more. Alarmed, Lorien sat forward. Do they know about your... He drew a finger across his neck, miming decapitation. I'd almost forgotten Lorien had seen Polino's recording of my death aboard the Demiurge and my apparent resurrection. If they did, I'd be carved up on a slab on Vesperad or... somewhere. As things stand, I think they believe I fabricated Siriani's orbital strike. They can't be that stupid. On the contrary, I said. They think their doubt makes them clever. It was my turn to cross my arms then, fingers agitating one of the clasps on my glove through the thick wool of my sleeve. The Emperor knows better, does he? I swore if Lorian leaned any further forward he'd tumble right out of his chair. When one is enmeshed in a web of intrigue, my friend, the best course is often to tell the truth to the highest authority who will hear you and cling to his protection. Lorian combed one lank strand of almost white hair back behind one pointed ear and said, Cut through the swamp, eh? I guess that explains what we've been doing for the last century. Something in the tactical officer's tone sent a spasm of irritation flickering across my face. The Chantry nearly killed me, Lorian. The Empress and her lions nearly killed me. This isn't a punishment mission, or it isn't only a punishment mission. There is no Chantry in the Commonwealth. We're going somewhere we can do some good. We have managed to slip the political net a while longer. All the more reason to turn renegade, Lorian said, circling back round. When this is done, I mean. You've three legions worth of men in this company, you have the ship, and there's not a one of the officers who'd gainsay you. If we go back to Nessus, they'll put us on ice again and put you back in that villa. Emperor will probably make you Magnarch or something. The words tumbled out. Bersander Lynn said Director Reinhardt thought the Emperor meant to name me Orkta. Orkta? Lorian did fall out of his chair then, bounced up on his feet like a downed boxer eager for another round. I rose sympathetically, worried the Intus had hurt himself in his fall. The idiosyncrasies of his condition had Lorian's joints often slip out of place or caused him to lose function temporarily in whole branches of his peripheral nervous system. Orkta! Black Planet! Are you serious? Are you all right? 
I asked. Lorian glared scathingly up at me. I'm fine, Marlow. Don't fuss. He leaned back against the edge of the seat he'd so suddenly vacated. Octa. That would do it. He massaged one hand with the other, colourless pale eyes fixed suddenly far away. This is a test, then. Got it in one, I said, assuming Lynn's rumour is accurate. The realisation had been Valka's, had come to her about two months into our trip, and I'd not been able to shake the certainty of it ever since. Important as our envoy to the Commonwealth was, it was insufficient to explain the urgency of the Emperor's presence on Nessus. He had wanted to see me, to get a measure of me, after so many decades apart. On the edge of his seat, Lorian had crossed his arms again, using the gesture to draw his cape even more tightly about himself. Damn! And Lynn heard it from Reinhardt himself. So he says. Lorian's skeletal features sagged. He's director of Legion Intelligence. Surely he'd know. The Intus rubbed his jaw. By damn! I turned away from the other man and walked a few paces beneath the ribbed ceiling. At length I turned back. When the Emperor diverted to Nessus early, Lynn thought it was to make the appointment. But you got Padmarak instead. We got Padmarak instead. It could be a play for time on the Empress part, Lorian mused, still stroking his chin. Sending us all the way to the Commonwealth buys the Emperor nearly another century of real time, time he's spending in the freeze on this tour of his. I stopped in my pacing. He's taking his tour to extend his life, I said, realization flashing over me. He's not young. He's been Emperor more than a thousand years. There's no telling how old he is biologically. Someone must know, keeping track of all his fugue time. But he must be... Six, seven hundred? We Palatines didn't age like ordinary men. Our artificially lengthened telomeres held back the slow decay of age, pushed it off until the very end, when, as in the lab rats of uttermost antiquity, cancers and other mutations accumulated more and more rapidly in the absence of ordinary decay. Rare was the Palatine nobile who lived to see white hair and failing eyesight, such as old Gibson. And so, despite the Emperor's outward vitality, I felt sure I must be right. I am old, cousin, the Emperor once said to me. I would see this war end before my reign does. That's probably right, Lorian agreed. This could all be preparation for the transition. Has he named a successor? I've been out of it for a little while. No, I said. I'm sure the plans have been made, but... No. The Emperor had more than a hundred children. The eldest, Aurelian, was nearly so old as he. His birth ordered on the day of William's coronation more than a thousand years ago. The very youngest, I had lost count, couldn't be more than ten years old. The Aventine House had a habit of producing new reserve heirs to a schedule, of spreading them out across the Imperium to protect against dynastic collapse. Lorian chewed his tongue. If he names our friend Alexander, which I still think he will, this Orkta business would make sense. He'd essentially be setting you up as co-emperor. The hollow that had formed in my stomach when Lynn first shared his rumour grew deeper and more sour. I'd never forgotten the look in Alexander's eyes when I'd returned from the field of fire on Berenike. Unburnt. Like his father, Prince Alexander of the House Avent knew the stories they told of me were true, and he feared me for it. I had made an enemy of the young prince, treated his admiration with contempt. Co-emperor, I repeated, hands clenching and unclenching at my side. Going renegade doesn't sound so bad now. What doesn't sound so bad? came a new voice. Both Lorian and I turned our heads in time to see Alara ducking through the hatchway from the access umbilical leading out of the Ascalon and back onto the Tamerlane itself, Polino in tow. She smiled and by way of explanation said, Valka said you were down here. 
looking for something. It's starting to look like a box or two of my things were left on Nessus, I said, relaxing against a tower of crates bracketed together along the central aisle of the hold. Polino frowned. Did you check the fugue lockers? Catching sight of Lorian, he tapped his forehead in approximation of salute. Little man? Triclops, Lorian said, returning the salute. I didn't ask. Whole crates wouldn't fit in the fugue lockers, I said. I was just saying, I'll telegraph Nessus once we reach Gododin just to be sure. Inwardly, I'd resigned myself to be separated from the phylactery until we could return to Nessus, though it pained me. Ilara seated herself beside me and placed a reassuring hand on my arm. It'll turn up. I could feel her smiling at me and looked down at my hands in my lap. I felt a sudden warmth bud in my chest and all Lorian's dire predictions about the course of empire and my place in it seemed at once very far away. Smiles are catching and glancing at Alara, hers sparked mine. I am glad to have you all back, I said. I missed you. We missed you too, Ilara said, squeezing my arm. Empty words, but kind ones. She and the others had slept the long years since Thermon. They had missed much, but not been aware of it. Polino barked a laugh. I didn't. Ilara threw him a glance. Shut up, you. The old Kiliarch saluted. More properly this time. Yes, ma'am. Clearing my head, I looked from Elara to Polino, the last of the Myrmidons who had come with me out of the lands of Emesh. Did you need me for something? Like we said, Elara replied. Valka said you were searching for something. We thought you might like some help. The warm feeling spread a little more. I suppose it couldn't hurt to check out those few glockers anyway. Chapter 10 Paradise The world beneath us shone grey and white as a holograph plate tuned to a dead signal. What air Padmarak had was stale and lifeless, and Vidatharad, the great city, sprawled across snow-streaked tundra that had never known the touch of life. Each of the great city's districts stood sealed beneath mighty domes of common steel and alum glass, reminding me of nothing so much as the demon-haunted city of Vorgosos. Even from the air, the effect of the Commonwealth's capital was one of crumbling utilitarian efficiency, of brutal concrete blocks and right angles beneath mighty domes of glass soulless monuments to a godless scripture that made cogs of men and claimed to set them free not by breaking their chains, but by labelling those who forged the chains and held them as fellow workers. The Commonwealth claimed its wealth in common, and claimed there was no class, no hierarchy, no division between one man and the next. Its people had no names, so it was said, no stations, they dwelt in empty cells in the great hive towers that rose like the stacks of satanic mills about the perimeter of each of the vast city's domed arcologies. Hell of a place, Krim said, peering through the slit window in the side of the shuttle as we prepared to disembark. This is their capital. They couldn't put it on a world people can breathe on. It is rather telling, isn't it? I asked, peering out beside him. The sky above was grey as the planet, white clouds matching white snow. One of the outlying domes filled the sky before us, the lines of its black skeleton carving its order against the heavens. So unlike the eternal city it was, fencing out the sky. Helmets on, Polino ordered, taking charge of our little procession. I thumbed the trigger that deployed my helmet from its hiding place in the neck flange of my armour. The whole thing unfurled and clicked into place above my face, with jewel-like precision, while the others lowered their helmets into place. I heard the whine of pressure seals and hiss of air systems as the suit's air began to flow. 
Torvaro wore his scoliast's greens over the black environment suit, his face hidden behind a mask of featureless black glass. Valka's helmet was similar, black alum glass and jointed steel above the padded matte underlayment. But the rest more resembled my own. The breastplate she wore over her blood-red tunic was sculpted to evoke the female torso, the pitchfork and pentacle embossed over the sternum, just as mine. She was no soldier, and so wore no tarugas at shoulder and waist, nor any armour upon arms or legs. But the polymer of her left arm bore the fractal pattern of her salash, her clan tattoo, exact to the minutest detail, black against black. I hadn't seen her wear it in decades, and smiled beneath my mask. She carried her old Tavrosi service repeater strapped to one hip, partially concealed by the heavy brocade of her short cape, cousin to my own. What a pair we made. Helmets secure, Polino went up the line. His inspections complete, he rounded on the pilot officer and said, Go to equalise cabin pressure. A louder hiss accompanied the venting of the shuttle's air to balance the less wholesome air without, and an instant later the shuttle hatch opened on the ramp. The first of our guard went out, dressed in armour of imperial ivory, their lances tall and keen, shaming the shabby guards of the Commonwealth in their drab greys. Varro followed, then Krim and Polino ahead of Valka and myself, leading the knot of more heavily armoured hoplites who made up the core of our guard. We'd been instructed simply to march straight ahead across the field and toward the low, wide slit of the receiving bay that stood open across half a hundred yards of open tarmac. Why we hadn't been directed or permitted to taxi directly into the bay was a mystery to me. Perhaps the Commonwealth intended a subtle insult in the way they forced us to march. The Lothrian soldiery lifted their lances in salute on either side. There must have been two hundred of them, armour hung with medals and dripping with braided cords. Looks like they sent their best, eh? Polino asked, whispering despite the private comms channel. A thin wind cast about us, so insubstantial it barely lifted the heavy brocade of mine and Valka's capes. Varro answered him. It is an unusually high concentration of decorated men. They're trying to impress us, I said, as if the soldiery could compensate for the decaying urbanity of the starport. Above the rectangular lintel of the hangar mouth was carved a stylized relief of the Lothrian people working arm in arm, two columns marching toward one another to meet in the middle beneath the graven image of a book. Their postures were rigid, artless, and mechanical and their faces were carved with empty expressions aping joy and determination both, an unnatural mixture that I can't recall having ever seen on the faces of living men. Nodding at the graven book, Valka asked, "'Tis the Lothriad?' I returned her nod. "'Yes. I'm told we'll see it everywhere. The Lothriad formed the foundation of the Commonwealth. More than a code of laws, more than holy scripture— it contained the list of approved statements, the phrases and ideas which were permitted by the Grand Conclave for use by the people. Once the peoples of the Commonwealth had spoken freely, it was said, but as the partisans tightened their grip, they revised their dictionaries shorter and shorter, pruning out dangerous and unnecessary words. In the end, they outlawed even names and other words by which one man was identified from the next for it was said that to recognise distinctions was to foster inequity. If the clansmen of Tavros feared to prejudice one partner over another in questions of love and marriage, the men of the Commonwealth feared prejudice itself. In time, they published no dictionaries. In their place was printed not a list of approved words, but of approved thoughts. There would be only one way to express hunger or pain only one way to request assistance or address a comrade. Where once had been a language, there was to be a set of ideologically approved sentences, like hieroglyphs, unchanging. Or so it was said, so we were asked to believe. 
We passed beneath that graven lintel, and steel doors ground behind us, shutting out the pale and jaundiced sun. The light that shone from the flat ceiling overhead was utterly without colour. Indicators in the periphery of my vision told me that air was being pumped into the cavernous hangar, and on the receiving platform ahead I saw a portal open and admit a man in a grey suit, without emblem or device, bookended by men in armour of unassuming black. As we drew nearer the platform, the grey-suited man raised a hand. Diliyatya vatayem, he said, speaking the guttural Lothrian tongue. The delegation is welcome. On behalf of the conclave, a representative bids the delegation from the Solon Empire welcome to Padmarak and the people's city. I marked the earpiece the man wore and guessed that a panel of advisers, if not the machine itself, was feeding the man his lines, ensuring he stayed on book. I returned his bow. Curious, I tested the air and spoke in Galstani. Thank you for your warm welcome, representative. I am Lord Hadrian Marlow of the House Marlow Victorian, Apostle from His Radiance, Emperor William Twenty-Third. I am sent to treat with your masters, the chairs of the great conclave, that we might respond to the Sielsin threat in a way mutually beneficial to our two peoples. As I expected, the man paused a long moment before answering, waiting for his machine or the puppet masters behind it to censor and translate my meaning. I might have spoken Lothrian, but I sensed that to do so was a risk. I knew the language, but not the list of stock phrases approved by the conclave and its various ministries, and sensed that to try was to stagger blind and drunk into a minefield. That which is for the good of all men is good for each, the minister replied. This more clearly a quotation. He offered a weak smile. I wondered at the enormous complexity required to converse with an off-worlder not bound by Lothrian speech codes. I didn't envy the fellow his task, for surely the firing squad or the guillotine awaited failure. Let us hope so, I said, and realising my helmet was still on, reached up and removed it with a button press, the whole apparatus folding away like some Nipponese paper sculpture. Are you one of the conclave? The man shook his head. Each man must serve the good of the people, in fullness of ability. Even the smallest contribution to the good of the people is a benefit to all. I took that to mean that no, he was not one of the chairs, though I didn't doubt he was some manner of logothete, or secretary high in their service. The Lothrians could pretend to have no hierarchy, but that did not mean one did not exist. The man bowed, ushering us forward. Still speaking his native tongue, the man said, Cars have been brought for the delegation. We passed through the drab streets of Eleventh Dome and along grey boulevards unrelieved by the green of trees or grass. Nothing seemed to grow in that dreary city, and great stacks vented steam into the air where it condensed and dripped from the glass overhead like sad rain. I had the distinct impression, peering out through rain-streaked glass from the rear of the representative's motor car, that we were being taken down streets cleaned especially for our visit for we saw few people, and the brutal stone and concrete facades of buildings shone where hydraulic cleaners had scrubbed away so many years of grime. Bronze reliefs that showcased the virtue and exploits of the people were everywhere in evidence, and everywhere shining without patina or rust. "'Where are all the people?' Valka asked, watching two men and a woman in identical grey suits hurrying along the street beside us. The representative peered out the window of the car, blinking. He seemed to be looking for the very people Valka asked after, but he was only waiting for his prescribed reply. It came after but a second. Let each toil for the good of all. I could feel Polino longing to say something and directed a glare at the captain of my guard. The patrician fellow looked pointedly out the other window, watching the other cars of our motorcade following on behind. At length, we passed out of Eleventh Dome and along an underground highway that ran beneath the blasted tundra toward another of the domes. This journey only reaffirmed my suspicion that the city had been emptied ahead of our arrival, 
for six lanes stood open for our motorcade, and I guessed on any other day the traffic would be fierce. I found I had little desire to question our host, who had nothing of his own to say. Lights pulsed by, orange and sickly. They gave way to the pale yellow sunlight of another dome, this one mightier than the first. We'd come out under the heavy arch of steel gates that might be shut to isolate the dome should necessity arise, and onto a high bridge that ran across a churning reservoir. A mighty dam rose to one side, its sluices opened to let forth the flood in thunderous cataracts. Across that long bridge rose the crowded geometry at the heart of Vidatharad. Pile upon pile of cyclopean stone rose into the yellow day. The air about seemed thick with some haze, as of the steam that wafted from the stacks in the outer dome, and through the glass curtain of the dome itself I saw the windowless hulks of the blockhouses rising like factories. There were the people of the Commonwealth I knew, sealed in their hovels. There were more people as we approached the core of the city, men and women in the same dull grey uniforms, hurrying about beneath First Dome's bottled sky. Some alone, some huddled together beneath umbrellas to shield against the drip of water from the glass above. Still more wore medical masks over their faces, and everywhere there were guards. I was not unused to seeing military police. We had prefects on every imperial world. But the sheer number of them! A black-armoured man stood on every street corner, reminding me once more not of any imperial city, but of the city above the place of Khan Sagara on Vorgosos. And like Vorgosos, there was a darkness underneath. The People's Palace stood behind an encircling wall of concrete and steel, half a hundred feet thick and three times as high. Within its bounds, the central ziggurat rose in great steps like the pyramid of some false, forgotten god. Outbuildings, windowless and unadorned as tombstones, stood about the perimeter wall. Barracks and arsenals, and the offices of the secret police. Water played from abstract fountains or jetted in arcs above the main road, leaping from one pile to the next. Soldiers in the matte black of the conclave guard, or in the highly decorated grey and red of the formal service, stood at mechanical attention before doors and fountains, or looked out from the steps of the ziggurat that rose a thousand feet toward the apex of the dome above. The cars circled around the last fountain and came to a halt before the great stair. A red carpet flowed down those steps like magma, like the incarnadine rug Clytemnestra unrolled beneath the feet of Agamemnon the Great, when earth was young. Two armoured guards opened the clamshell doors, and the representative made a gesture to indicate that I should lead the way out. Polino went first, Krim was in the car ahead of us, and offered me a hand up. I returned the gesture to Volker, who took my arm. It reminds me of home, she said in Pantai. I hadn't wanted to say it. Where she had come from, beauty was subjective, and the world was subjective. At home among her people, Valka had seen what she wanted to see, what her implants painted over her world, illusions in her mind's eye cast like shadows on the real. She had seen rich gardens, where I had seen bare stone, imagined rich wooden floors and hand-carved furniture in place of laminate, tile, and nylon upholstery. The demarchists imagined riches and papered over ugliness, but the Commonwealth embraced that ugliness and imposed it on all they possessed. Are you all right? I asked her, leaning in. It seemed unlikely that any of the Lothrians about us should speak Valka's relatively obscure language, but there was always a chance. She smiled bravely. Fine. Tis nothing. A trio of camera drones took holos of us as we mounted the stairs. Security, perhaps, or perhaps the organs of some state propaganda broadcast, eager to spin some yarn about our visit. I flashed one a crooked smile, acknowledging the salutes of the pikemen on the stair. Ahead, 
Krim marched with the signifer who carried the diplomatic staff aloft, with its red banner, white striped where the red imperial sun shone bright. As we mounted the steps, and passed beneath gargantuan square pillars, toward false doors forever open, and carved like the open pages of a book, I saw ranks of shadowy figures standing to receive us. Grey-suited men and women, pale-faced and dark of hair. I expected us to be stopped and welcomed at the doors, but we were marched instead through security, scanners glowing. They would know about my sword and shield projector, and about the sidearm strapped to one thigh. They'd know too about my parrying dagger, and about the loadout of each and every one of the forty men in my guard, down to the smallest of crim's knives. Even the adamantine bones of my left arm were laid bare to them. Only Valka's implants might escape their notice, that and the monofilament coil Krim kept hidden among his dark hair. Our representative waved a stiff salute to two others, a man and a woman, who hastened across the atrium to greet us. Each was so like the first that I thought they must be brothers, grey-skinned, black-haired, and hollow-eyed. The three of them each seemed propped up by stimulants, though whether it was Verox or amphetamines or simple caffeine I couldn't say. Both wore earpieces identical to that worn by the first. "'The delegation is welcome,' they said in unison, waving their short salute. It was the precise phrasing the first man had used to welcome us in the hangar. "'We are honoured,' I replied, allowing them time for a translation to be heard and read to them. "'When will the Grand Conclave hear us? I am eager to meet with your masters.' The woman bowed slightly, hands clasped before. "'There are neither kings nor masters in the Commonwealth,' she spoke with the chiding edge of a schoolmaster, of a scoliast correcting a slow learner. "'The conclave is not in session this day. The delegation will be summoned when the chairs arrive.' A frown threatened to storm across my face, and I looked from Valka to Torvaro. "'Is there to be no reception?' I had hoped to begin at once. The two men and the women exchanged glances, each waiting for words to be put into their mouths by the correct authority. Already I felt my patience wearing. Silence I could endure, but this empty-headed passivity that passed for civic virtue was more than I could bear. I come on a mission of special significance from the soul and emperor himself. Am I not to be received? The woman, clearly the senior of the trio, though doubtless that observation would be met with the paean about each man serving the good in fullness of ability, fixed me with a stare and taut smile. Let each toil for the good of all. Let there be bread and board and good order for all who toil. Busy, eh? I hooked my thumbs through my belt and surveyed the cavernous blank space we had entered. Here the floor was not plain concrete or laminate, but marble tile, a white and black grid. Ahead, a low pool gleamed, lit from beneath, its surface perfectly smooth above dark stone. A black mirror. I felt the child's impulse to disturb that stillness, to shatter the illusion of perfect order all around. I knew what was happening. They were posturing pretending, as all lords must, that such great matters were of little moment to them, pretending that the arrival of an apostle from the Solon Empire was not a sign of the end of their world. War had come to Padmarak, whether its dark lords willed or no. Chapter 11 the Grand Conclave Night again, and dreams. Dreams of drowning and deep water. Pale hands trailing in the dark, caressing, dragging me down. I was dead, or nearly so, sealed inside my armour. Time ran backward, and I fell, fell upward toward red light, and sound and the chaos of battle. 
I stood upon a bridge of crumbling stone outside a city of grey towers. Ground cars burned about me and ragged men held guns. If, as some believe, time is without end, then in time all things are made true. I believe there must be a final end, as there are endings for so many lesser things. Empires, planets, men. But even the centuries of a man's life are time enough to make truth of mistruth. I had told Lorian once that I did not dream of the future. I hadn't known I could. The guns fired, muzzles flashed. I woke. Dawn had come to Padmarac, and the pale yellow sun shone sickly through the horizontal slits of window glass in one wall, showing cross-sections of the brutal Cyclopean city. From our penthouse atop the sky spire that housed the Imperial Embassy, I could make out the shapes of the other domes in the distance. Somewhere miles off lay the shuttle port. Beyond that lay the freight starport, Twice the night before I'd seen rockets flare across the sky. Beyond that was only tundra. Tundra and the endless factories and barracks and labour camps that made up the foundation of Lothrian society. I let Valka sleep, and washed in the waterless shower, scraped myself beneath the sonic jets, and watched as the shower pod flash incinerated whatever material remained within the stall. I donned my diplomatic best, white shirt and the trousers, with their double blood-red stripe along the seam. Over this I belted a tunic jacket in paisley black-on-black -black brocade, lined with crimson. I took my time fitting the leather gauntlet over the sleeve, clicking the fasteners into place. I screwed the Emperor's sovereign ring onto the first finger of my right hand, and tucked the pendant with the white shard of the quiet shell onto its chain. The boots fitted themselves, tightening about my calves. The sword clicked into place. The Grand Conclave awaited. Varro, Valka and I crossed the antechamber's black and white checked floor, bracketed by our guards and led by new representatives of the Commonwealth Government. Each day we saw new ones and never again the old faces. We were led round the reflecting pool and up an angled stair to a gallery that ran left and right along the width of the palace cigarette and overlooked the antechamber and the lower halls, or out upon the palace grounds. Ministers and functionaries in identical grey, with the black star of government service above their hearts, milled about. These were the Petrasnooks, the partisans who ruled the Lothrian Commonwealth in the name of their Zouk people. The inner wall of the gallery was all one mighty frieze depicting the people in triumph. Straight ahead of the main gates stood a square arch. Through this we marched past security, past more grey murals, and down a narrow hall whose ceiling was so high above it was lost to darkness. No side passage appeared, and I sensed that we approached the very heart of the ziggurat. The place reminded me of the unforgiving concrete fastness of the Chantry Bastille on Thermon, or the cell blocks on Borosivo on Imesh. I wondered if the Commonwealth had taken their inspiration from the Chantry so many thousand years before, had stolen their cold architecture for the terror it evoked. The hall opened on a round chamber, and looking up I found that we had walked out upon the pit of an amphitheatre, a Colosseum. Sheer walls encircled us, ten feet high, and above that lip, behind an iron rail, before us were seated the thirty-five chairs of the Lothrian Grand Conclave, forming an arc before us. The central chair stood empty, but the others, seventeen to either side, held the assembled grey-faced and grey-robed lords and ladies, each black-haired or white. Lesser functionaries sat behind and above them, and all around, above that central floor, faces half-veiled in the dingy shadows of that hall of power. The conclave recognises the delegation from the Solon Empire, said an elderly man seated to the right of the central seat, whom I took for their speaker. 
On behalf of the Conclave, it is hoped that the delegation's presence marks the beginning of a new era of cooperation between the Empire and the Commonwealth. The good of all is the good of each. He spoke these words with the weight of a priest at his ceremony, and indeed no sooner had he finished speaking than the other chairs and the congregation of lesser functionaries all intoned, The good of all is the good of each. After each pronouncement, a device embedded in the wall beneath the vacant chair in the centre of the bench above repeated their words in awkward, stilted Galstani, presumably for my benefit. In the dim air, I detected the shimmer of a prudent shield between us and the upper level, and without having to ask, I understood how it was we'd been admitted with our guards. No hand weapon we might bring to bear could penetrate that energy curtain. Sensing my cue, I stepped forward and bowed, one hand over my heart, the other thrown wide in the courtly manner expected for planetary rulers. Honourable chairs, I began straightening. I am Sir Hadrian Marlowe, Knight of the Royal Victorian Order. I am sent by my Imperial Master, William Twenty-Third of the House Avent, to request aid in our war against the Cielsin Xenobites, who have ravaged our worlds and the human universe for so long. I paused, allowed the Lord's earpieces time to translate my words, allowed time too for a response, but the chairs of the Grand Conclave all watched me with impassive eyes. I took a step forward. Our empire has borne the brunt of this offensive for more than a thousand years. Again I paused. I'd known in my heart that the war had raged so long, but to speak the words aloud was something else entirely. Inhaling, I pressed on. For more than a thousand years we have fought and bled, and died, to keep the enemy at bay. For more than a thousand years we have held the line. It is the blood of our people that has bought safety for your own. But the Cielsin have crossed the expanse in force. Their navies burn planets along the Centaurine frontier. We are attacked on more fronts, in more systems, than we can defend. We need ships. We need more men. This pronouncement met with stony silence from the men and women on the bench above. With a sidelong glance to Varro, I said, My Imperial Master asks that you join us in defending mankind from this unprecedented threat. Still the chairs made no sign. The elderly man at the right hand of the empty seat glanced about at his compatriots, looking for some sign from them. Presently the man in the ninth chair shifted forward in his seat. So young he seemed by comparison to the other, his short black hair oiled and neatly combed, grey eyes flinty above hollow cheeks. Who names others master or slave cannot know a man as comrade? Ask how equality may be practised by one who knows it not. I said nothing, turned this response over in my mind. I understood the Lothrian perfectly, but the machine translated Galstani repeated his words as I stood there. It was not a direct answer, but then I had not expected one. Was the ninth chair asking a question of me, or admonishing against the conclave for granting this audience? I marvelled at his age, and wondered how so young a man might rise to such a height in the Commonwealth. Perhaps mastery of the Lothriad was a greater asset than experience in the eyes of the Grand Conclave. Perhaps the young man was a scholar of some kind, a theologian of their godless faith. A moment passed, and I decided the ninth chair must have meant this statement for his fellows on the bench. For another, the woman in the thirteenth chair raised her nasal voice. A yearning for equality lies in the heart of all. Was she encouraging dialogue? I looked again at Varro. The scoliast's dark features were, as ever, entirely void of emotion, evincing none of the frustration I felt. They don't trust us. Varro said, leaning close to whisper into my ear. The gentleman on the left does not expect us to deal fairly. I believe he thinks we mean to capitalise on the situation. The woman disagrees. 
Nodding, I surveyed the chairs of the Grand Conclave, each minister overshadowed by the high, square back of his or her seat. A camera drone tracked through the air, sketching a circle about the rail that hemmed us in on the lower floor. I watched it go, staring down its lens. I am empowered to make concessions to the Commonwealth in the Empire's name. Starting with this. I drew a crystal storage chit from a pocket on my belt, a card perhaps an inch wide and twice as long. I held the device aloft for the bench to see. At a gesture from the elderly man in first chair, that to the right of the empty seat in the middle, a plinth rose from the floor at the focus of the arc of seated chairman, and I laid the crystal atop the glass surface. An instant later, a projection flowered in a cone of light cast by a holography suite lost in the darkness above and behind the seated lords. Embedded beneath a layer of fractal security stamps that confirmed the holograph's validity as an imperial document marched line upon line of legal text. As you can see, I began, one hand behind my back, the other raised as if offering something up on my palm. We're prepared to offer an immediate end to our embargo on the sale of refined uranium and antimatter. We will even allow certain corporations operating under imperial charters to deal with your colonies. There is no reason an arrangement between our peoples cannot be mutually beneficial. A murmur went down the line, and above and about the main bench where sat the group of thirty-four, the various lesser functionaries muttered and stirred. Presently, the woman in the sixth chair raised her hand. A man requests the voice, she said. Once more, I looked to Varro, eyes inquiring. The scoliast's pinched brows rose, and he shook his head. Slowly, very slowly, the various chairs turned to watch each other. Various leaning in or peering one to the next. Sixth chair kept her hand raised. At length, another joined hers, that of the square-jawed man in seventeenth chair, him at the leftmost extreme of the bench above us, the furthest at the right hand of the centre. The ice thusly broken, more hands rose. Ninth chair folded his arms, and seeing this a number of the others did likewise. The old man in first chair went up and down the line, counting. Twenty-one, he exclaimed, to thirteen. The voice is granted. I wondered what they did in the case of a tie. The sixth chair stood, one hand steadying the drape of her grey robe. Why now? The Empire has been an enemy of the people for thousands of years. The Empire has blocked trade. The Empire has blocked the establishment of colonies. The Empire now begs the people for aid. Why? The translator repeated her words in the same flat, sexless voice as it had the others. Thirty-four grey faces looked down on me. Sixth chair did not seat herself, but waited. I stared up at her, astonished. A man requests the voice, she'd said. She had requested the right to speak her mind, to speak off book, and the others had voted on it. Would she have spoken had they voted against her? I guess not, for who in all the Commonwealth would be watched more closely than this group of thirty-four? I glanced at ninth chair before responding to sixth. Worlds are burning across the Centaurine, I said. Hundreds of worlds. The Sielsen are moving now in numbers unlike any they've sent against us before. The front is too long in too many systems for even our forces to adequately defend. The regional governors and feudal lords are overrun. I spared a glance to Valka, who offered me the smallest smile of encouragement as I ploughed ahead. The Centaurine has acted as a bulwark against the enemy for centuries. If it is overrun, the Sielsin will be at your door. Our people have been a shield for yours since the war began. Even should we maintain control of the region, it is entirely possible the Pale will burn channels through our territory to yours. I tell you, the war has changed. Sixth chair seemed to mull this over a moment before answering. If the Rugier come here, it will be costly. 
the Rugia fleets will be overextended, weak. This remark elicited nods from several of the other chairs on the conclave's bench, including both the ninth and seventeenth chairs. Rugia was others in Lothrian. It was their word for the Sielsin. The Sielsin will be fat on plunder, their numbers replenished by so many years spent in transit, I said. The various studies Legion Intelligence had conducted on the few Sielsin ships we'd taken intact over the years had revealed no few crashes, and the many dissections and gene sequencings performed by scoliasts and their lay technicians on the bodies of the pale had hinted at monstrously long lives. The Prince Aranata Otiolo had once hinted to me that it was over a thousand years old, though how long a Sielsin year might be relative to our own was a mystery I'd yet to solve. The Sielsin were not idle as their migratory fleet clusters plied the dark between the stars. Generations were born, lives lived, so that the armies of the enemy were bred anew and stronger with each flight between worlds, between battles. It was thanks in no small part to this fact that the army Bahude had led when it raised Marinus had been so strong when it flew to assail Berenike. For humanity, a long flight across the stars meant stasis, meant sleep. But for the Pale, for the Sielsin, it spelled flourishing and strength. You do not understand them as I do, Honourable Chair. I locked eyes with her, willing her to understand. The Commonwealth is not prepared, and should it come to fighting in Lothrian space, my empire will not be in a position to fly to your aid. A threat, shouted one of the other chairs, a reedy man far up the left side of the bench speaking out of turn. The delegation threatens the people. The mechanical translator piped his words into the ensuing silence without translating his tone. His objection played out dead and spiritless on the air. First Chair's quavering voice intervened, saying, A man who speaks without correct speech elevates individual will above the will of the people. The Elder placed a hand on something in the vast empty seat in the centre of the bench. On behalf of the Conclave, the Twenty-Fifth Chair is to be censored. The Twenty-Fifth Chair blanched and regarded the hands twisting in his lap. He had spoken out of turn. In a small voice the fellow said, A man requests the voice. To my surprise he did not raise his own hand, though sixth chair, still standing, raised hers. As before, ninth chair crossed his arms, his lackeys with him, and again as before first chair counted hands. Seven, the first chair proclaimed, to twenty-seven. The voice is withheld. Twenty-fifth chair frowned but said no more. The sixth resumed her line of questioning. The delegate says the Commonwealth is not prepared, but the delegate asks for the assistance of the Commonwealth. This is confusing. Unable to help myself, I said, The good of each is the good of all. This evinced a rumble from the chairs and a muttering from the robed and suited congregation in the stands about and above us. What is good for my people is, in this case, good for yours. Or are we not people, in your opinion? When the sixth chair had no response to this, I took a rhetorical step forward, underscored by a literal one. I assure you, the Sielsin will make no distinction between yours and mine. Their dietary preferences are quite apolitical. To my surprise, Sixth Chair had no reply for this, but sank back to her seat. That broke the spell, or rekindled it, for she said, The good of all men is greater than the good of any one. Varro spoke for the first time. Does that mean you agree to our terms? I hadn't dared to think it would be so easy. Were the Lothrians so hungry for want of resources? I understood that, like my father. They worked their zook serfs to the bone, though unlike my father, they paid them only in bread and protein base. Seventeenth Chair interjected. The actions of the Commonwealth shall never be decided by one. 
He studied his compatriots thoughtfully, resting his chin on one fist, appearing almost bored. On behalf of the conclave, he paused, waited for a nod from two or three of the others before proceeding. For the first time I realized that phrase was a kind of marker, like the request for the voice, an indication that what followed adhered to no line of their beloved book. I suppose there must be unique statements required for such groundbreaking proceedings as ours. Indeed, this whole audience stretched the endurance of Lothrian correctness. We were on the borders of politically approved truth. Hence the requests for voice, hence the censure of the chair who'd spoken out of turn. On behalf of the conclave, this will not be decided at once. The conclave must review the delegation's proposal. As he spoke, his fellows nodded along. Abruptly, Seventeenth Chair cleared his throat. A man requests the voice. He raised his own hand. Again the hands went up. Again Ninth Chair and his coterie crossed their arms, the only ones not to raise their hands. Again First Chair tallied. Twenty-nine, he said, to five. The voice is granted. Seventeenth Chair smiled thinly before proceeding, standing as the Sixth had done. It struck me that the fellow was very tall, and wore his judge's robes with the air of a king, lordly and imperial. He didn't seem the representative avatar of an equal people at all. The sixth chair raises a fine point. The Empire's sudden clemency speaks of desperation. The delegation claims the power to make concessions. Further considerations beyond those drafted in this proposal from the Solon Empire must be considered. Amendments must be made. Amendments? I asked, relieved to once again be speaking to a man and not a mouthpiece. Such as? Varro put in. Valka remained quiet between us. She was no representative of the Imperium and had no right to plead on its behalf. She was my eyes, for the machine eyes her Travrosi clansmen had given her so long ago missed nothing, and the nematodes that ordered the grey matter of her brain forgot nothing just as Varro, with his centuries of mnemonic schooling, forgot nothing. As witnesses, they were indispensable. Settlement rights in the upper Perseus, he said, smiling as the auto-translator played out its message in the only tongue they knew I understood. Though the seventeenth chair didn't hesitate for an instant, told me that this had been planned from the start. I cast my eyes downward. Had I been sent to the Commonwealth to fail? Had the Imperial Council expected the Grand Conclave of the Commonwealth to make a request I could not grant? A request they would never grant. Had the Emperor given me another impossible task? Surely the Imperial Council and their advisers would have known this possibility would arise. We had blocked Lothrian expansion into the Perseus arm of the galaxy for millennia. Our last war with them had been fought to decide that state. Settlement rights. I shook my head. I will have to telegraph my imperial masters. Had I indeed been made an auctor, I might have granted it on the spot. It will take time to communicate properly. In the meantime, we may discuss the details of an arrangement. On a purely hypothetical basis, Torvaro added, ever the champion of precision. Another voice sounded in that dark hall. A man requests the voice. All heads turned to the speaker. The ninth chair raised his hand, a single finger extended. Having thrice voted against his compatriot's right to original speech, it shocked me to see him raise a hand so. Several hands rose at once, those of his coterie and the hands of the others. All the others. I was ignorant of the inner workings of conclave politics and so dared not guess at what this might mean. Thirty-four, first chair rasped, to zero. The voice is granted. The man called ninth chair did not stand, like an emperor himself, lordly as the still standing seventeenth chair, ninth chair sat back against the smooth granite of his seat, the high back like a grave monument. Why does the Solon Emperor send this man? Hadrian Marlowe is known, 
the delegate is a warrior. Why does the Red Emperor send a warrior to Padmarak? Because each man must serve the good of the people in fullness of ability, I said tartly, speaking for the first time in perfect Lothrian. The ninth chair clapped. Very good and quite correct, he said. But the question remains unanswered. Why this, delegate? The Lothrian habit of indirectness and the erosion of all identity save role or function was starting to grate on me. The Lothriad may have liberated the serfs from their masters, but in the empire even the meanest slave had the dignity of a name. I had had a belly full of Lothrian collectivism, but I clenched my jaw, let the frustration ebb away as I exhaled through my nose and reflected on one of Gibson's stoic aphorisms. I sensed a great many things hung upon my answer, though why I wasn't sure. I held Ninth Chair's gaze for several seconds before examining the others. The elderly First Chair, the Noble Seventeenth, the multitudes of near-faceless men rising in higher orbits behind the great conclave's bench, microphones and holographs on the tables before them, all of them clad in grey like a college of sorcerers. I know this, Yeltsin, I said, and for effect repeated myself in the tongue of the Commonwealth, working around the awkward, impersonal nature of their language. Din Conrad Vedayim Rugya. A man knows the others. There is no one in the Imperium better acquainted with the enemy, I said. I have killed two of their princes myself, a claim no other man may make. I have fought three fingers of the white hand who served the scourge of earth. It was I who negotiated the first surrender of the enemy at Emesh. The Emperor has sent me that I might advise your admirals in the tactics and nature of the enemy, of our enemy. Addressing my next words to the twenty-fifth chair, I said, My presence is not a threat, sir, nor are my words. They are a warning. The Sielsin are coming. And should we fall, they will come for you. They will crack the domes of your great city and use your people for meat. Aid us, and we will aid you. Ninth Chair smiled through my words, but when I had finished speaking he said nothing, only leaned back in his seat, his peace apparently said and done. The First Chair spoke instead. The Conclave will review the delegation's proposal. The audience is at an end. When he'd finished this declaration, the first chair reached down into the empty throne beside him and slammed something. Craning my neck, I could just make out the black leather cover of a book, a volume, perhaps a foot wide and a cubit tall, a little larger than one of my own folios. Standing, he lifted it above his head, showcasing the black star embossed upon the cover. I knew then that I was looking at a copy of the Lothriad itself. I had never seen one printed. I'd read it as a boy, of course. Every child of every great lord does, if only to understand the evils of it, but like so many of the texts I'd been given as part of my education on Delos, I'd only interacted with hollows. Seeing it somehow in its proper place, it struck me as an object of horror. A black book. The only book permitted in the Commonwealth. A fitting emblem, that. A fitting contradiction. They were a people who called slavery freedom, a nation that called narrative truth, a culture that glorified its people by destroying the very concept of personhood. How could they be anything but a nation of book burners founded on a book? Chapter 12. Commonwealth. Negotiations were long. I shall not rest on the weeks of hearings and conversations, nor mire you in the details and double-think and the quagmire that was negotiating with the Lothrians. Whole days were spent waiting for the quantum telegraph drip to transmit documents to the Imperial Council data flitting one bit at a time across the thousands of light-years between Padmarak and Forum. Days more passed while the Council communicated with the Emperor, 
who had long since left Nessus on his tour of the frontier. I gathered he had stopped on Vanaheim and would remain there for some months. The council and emperor both were unwilling to cede unsettled territory in the upper Perseus. The Commonwealth had spread across the upper reaches of the Sagittarius, forming a bulwark that kept our own settlers from lighting out across the galactic west. It was their presence, in the first place, that had forced imperial settlements to cross the second gulf by way of worlds like Gododin into the Centaurine in the first place. Access to the Perseus would not only open up new expanses for settlement by the Commonwealth and give them access to the Outer Arm and the Galaxy's Edge, but would bring the Lothrian frontier dangerously close to the Durantine Republic and the Principalities of Jad, a development that would not endear us to the Durantines or our Jadian allies. The Cielsin were the greatest threat humanity had known since Columbia and her daughters, but no threat justified such a betrayal of our allies. At the same time, we couldn't refuse. We needed Lothrian support, and I couldn't afford to return to Nessus and Caesar in anything but triumph. And so I too circled the subject of our arrangement with Lothrian imprecision. Other concessions were made. The possibility of Lothrian settlements in a reconquered Norman expanse were floated as a possibility and new borders were drawn across the Rossan Belt, the no-man's land between empire and commonwealth across the Sagittarius. It was dry work, and the details of it bear little on this accounting. Valka grew tired of the whole business in a matter of days, and I couldn't blame her. She had insisted on coming down to the city with me. She would not be left behind. I had long ago learned my lesson— Since Berenike, she and I were seldom parted, and then only because some other agency mandated it, such as had happened with Ekana, or because we agreed to go our own ways. She ceased to sit in on my talks with the various chairs after the first few days, preferring to remain in the lavish apartments in the palace complex our hosts had set aside for us. We spent many an evening dining with the various members of the Imperial Consulate staff. The chiefest of these was Lord Damon Argyris, chief consul to Padmarak. Argyris had spent the better part of the last fifty years in Vidatharad, nearly all of it within the walls of the embassy tower. They don't hold with foreigners in their cities, these Lothrians, he said. It's gotten worse. In any predecessor's day there was a foreign market past Eleventh Dome where off-world merchants were allowed to trade. Not ours, of course. Not since the Persian Wars. But off-worlders all the same. The consul rested his head against the minutely tiled wall of the sauna, dabbed his forehead with a corner of the towel he wore, draped about his muscled frame like a toga. Truth be told, I'm almost surprised the Grand Conclave had any interest in the Emperor's material concessions. The fuel, maybe. You never can have enough but I almost expected them to refuse the offers of trade. Perhaps things are different in the other Commonwealth systems, but Padmarak had become nearly so inaccessible as the Earth itself. I suppose we should be grateful, I said, admiring the high-resolution mosaic that dominated the wall behind the consul. It depicted the god-emperor as a hero of classic antiquity, muscled and nude, crushing an iron serpent beneath his heel. One hand clutched the mechanical demon about the throat, the other raised a flaming sword. So small were the individual tesserae, each as small or smaller than a grain of rice, that the mosaic appeared no mosaic at all, but a painted image that glistened with the steam of the baths. From the way Argyris's eyes had wandered, I knew he was admiring the other bathers. When the consul remained silent, I added, Since the Emperor will never allow Lothrian settlement of the Perseus, we should take what we can get. Still, Argyris said nothing. I cleared my throat. No, indeed, he said, smoothing his moustache with one hand. To do so would be to undo the work of centuries. His black eyes focused on me again, wrenched from the sight of so much nude flesh at great personal cost. 
I'm not comfortable with the potential redrawing of the borders in the Rasun Belt either. The Belt had formed a neutral zone between the Commonwealth and the Empire since the Persian Wars, a hundred light-year wide space that both powers agreed to leave unsettled. The new arrangement, if agreed upon, would close that space by half entirely on the Commonwealth side, allowing them to settle and prospect rank thousands of new solar systems. It was not access to the Perseus and the Jadian border, but it was something, a clear loss and concession on the part of the Empire. Nor am I, I said, falling silent. I gripped the edges of the stone bench on which I sat, as Argyris gestured for his serving girl to lave more water on the hot rocks between us. Her gold collar marked her for a slave, and I reminded myself that for my moral outrage at the strictures of the Lothriad, the Empire committed its own sins. Steam flowered between the consul and myself, and as the girl leaned forward to collect more water, Argyris reached up to touch one bare breast. The girl said nothing but flinched when the consul pinched her nipple. Enough, I snapped. Argyris glowered at me, but let her go. Give me the ladle, miss, I said to her, extending my left hand. Unintended, the hideous deep scars on my arm stood out silver white in the yellow light from the lamps, floating overhead. I saw her eyes go to the old injuries, felt the consul's gaze too. Impatient now, eager to get her gone and away from Argyris, if only for a time, I snapped my fingers at her. Wordless, she passed the instrument over. You may go. Hold on just one moment, Argyris said, glowering at me. You can't just... The girl was caught between her master and myself, and stood visibly torn, barefoot and wearing nothing but a silken breech clout and the gold costume jewellery the consul had dressed her in. Lord Argyris, we're having a serious conversation, I said dryly, brandishing the ladle like a schoolmaster's baton. Do try and focus. Both of us being palatine, I had no way to know Damon Argyris's age, or even if he were my junior or senior. After the first hundred years of living, I found diminishing returns on maturity to be the rule not the exception. Whether he was two hundred or five, Argyris was a creature of habit as surely as I was. It was only that I found his appetite grotesque. As a boy, I had nearly pressed one of my own servants to service me before realising what it was I was doing. I had thought it possible that she might love me. I would hoped she would. But there exists a gulf between master and servant, even more so between master and slave, that is wider than the Rasan belt, wider than the gulfs where no stars shine and the only avenue across it is coercion. And love does not coerce. I had realised my mistake in time. Had I not, I suppose it might have been me harassing slave girls in the consulary bathhouse. Reflecting on this, I ladled more water over the rocks, Amid the steam I said only, Let her go, Argyris. Remembering that I was the Emperor's Apostle and a Knight of the Royal Victorian Order, and the half-mortal besides, as my scars too obviously attested, Argyris swallowed and weighed the girl away. Swaying, she hurried off, and in her wake the Consul shrugged. Have it your way, then. Smiling my crooked smile, I circled back. You said things have changed here. Oh, yes, the consul grimaced. Like I say, they shut down the foreign market before my time here, but even when I was new, it was possible to walk down the street without a Lothrian escort. Now, he stretched luxuriantly, craning his neck to continue his observation of the room. Now Padmarac is a world of tunnels. Shuttle to motor car to building to tram to next building— chaperones all the way. I assume they don't want us to see their way of life. They don't want us to see how dirt poor they are, he said, dismissive. For all their talk about the good of the people, their perfect order is good for very few. 
Argyris wiped his face again with his towel. You can see it driving around if you look. They do their best to paper over the parts we get to see, but every now and then an accident on the highways will put you through the next block, and you'll see it. Crumbling roads, broken windows, shuttered hives. Hives. Those block houses the Zook workers live in around the perimeter of each dome, they call them vuli, hives. I couldn't help but stare at this. Like bees. I like bees. The consul chewed his lip. Damn it, Marlow, you sent my girl away and the steam's going. Obliging the fellow, I poured water over the black stones between us. That's better, he said. City's not crowded like it used to be. I've heard talk of the conclave redistributing the population. They're always worried about a mob here. The domes, you know. Very susceptible to sabotage. And there's the revolutionaries to mind. That caught my attention. I've never heard about Lothrian revolutionaries. That's how they like it, Argyris said coolly. But there are liberalist revolutionaries, if the Commonwealth broadcasts are to be believed. Liberalists? I raised one eyebrow. Republicans? Not sure if they've thought so far ahead. The consul groaned as another wave of steam rose about us. Not sure they exist, to be honest. Our intelligence boffins think they might be a party bogeyman. Pure propaganda. I felt myself getting confused and again set the ladle down. I thought you said they feared the mob. Of course they do. There are, best guess, 1.3 billion people on Padmarak, maybe 20, 25 million in Vidatharat but fewer than a million of those are proper Petrasnooks. The chairs in their ilk are outnumbered, and that makes them hostages to their own people. That, at least, was not so different from how things were in the Empire. A lord ruled only by consent of the governed, even if that consent was not enshrined in law. The threat of popular revolt was an eternal problem, one only solved by just rule. Lords who ruled harshly, as my father did, had no choice but to rule more harshly day by day to keep their people in line. Machiavelli had it wrong. Far better to be loved than feared. And better still to be both loved and feared. But of the obligation of kings I'd seen little in the Commonwealth. Beneath its veneer of fresh paint and buildings sprayed clean of grime, the city, and perhaps the entire Commonwealth, was crumbling with neglect. You should hear their broadcasts, Argyris continued. Pure poison. If it's not their liberalists blamed for stealing rations or blowing the air supply, it's us for blockading trade routes. Bread and circuses, I said knowingly, arms crossed. Mostly circuses. The bread goes to the partisans. Argyris assented with a sigh. Of course, they're the ones who closed the trade routes in the first place. We just won't reopen them. Always accuse the enemy of what you're doing. Into that pregnant silence, I laved another cup of water, struck by the cosmic irony of our circumstances. Two nobles of the Imperium, rich men by all accounts, enjoying the consul's lavish appointments while the city outside the embassy tower fell into neglect and disrepair. I mollified myself with thoughts of Anju and the staff at Medallo House, and of the pension I'd left for them. A small thing measured against the grinding poverty of the Commonwealth, but something. A young Logothete emerged from a nearby pool and collected his towel from a stone bench, bare feet slapping on the tile floor. Argyris watched him go with something like approval. I waited him out, and when at last the object of his interest had gone from sight, I said, The eleventh chair invited Dr. Ondera and myself to witness the ice harvest down south end of the week, and we're to visit the city farms tomorrow. Will you be joining us? No, my lord, Argyris said. Ghastly business, those ice mines, but it will give you a sense, I think, for what this place is really like. Likewise the farms, built like a fortress. I will be with you for the first ballet, however. That was three days before the polar expedition. 
I'm told they'll be performing Adamar's Earth of Fire in our honour. I can't say I expected theatre from the Lothrians, I said. Void as they are of colour? the consul asked, a knowing edge in his deep voice. No, they'll still find ways to surprise you. Don't tell anyone on forum I said it, but the Lothrian first ballet are the best I've ever seen. Better than anything the Emperor puts on. Circling back to the more immediate subject, I said, I'm surprised the Lothrians don't have a better source of water. Don't they recycle what they bring in from the ice? This return to less aesthetic pursuits clearly dimmed the light in Damon Argyris's eyes. Yes, well, they do, Sir Hadrian. You saw the dam and the sluice's gates on your way in? I told him I had. The domes are not the original city, or so my predecessor said. The Lothrians have been on Padmarak a long time. They dug tunnels first, whole networks below the surface. It's where they got the notion of hives, I'll warrant. After the domes went up, the tunnels were converted to infrastructure. Highways, ventilation, waterworks. But it's not enough. Even with the city shrinking, as I say, they still use more than they can take in. Padmarak lacks for water, aye, but what she really lacks, he gestured round at the baths, is air. Chapter 13 Still the Orchestra Plays Damon Argyris had not exaggerated. The Lothrian first ballet was sublime. I have little understanding of dance, perhaps less of music. But beauty is, and even the poorest poet among men knows it by its signs. A line of women in pale leotards moved like crystal clockwork upon a stage of glass, their ghostly reflections chasing them as they danced to music sweet and clear. The music swelled, filling the auditorium with the opening strains of Adamar Giallo's Earth of Fire. I counted the dancers. There were fifty-two. Watching them dance and spread across the star-strewn glass, I wondered if Adamar knew the significance of his figure, or else if the association between the Merikanii and the number 52 was lost even in his remote day. But I knew it. The answer was one of many things we'd learned in the archives Emperor Gabriel II had left beneath the great library on Colchis. There had been fifty-two daughters of Julian Felsenberg's revolution, fifty-two distinct artificial intelligences bred by his chief creation. The Columbia system, that had ruled old earth as the sun set on her golden age. In allegory, they danced before us, each daughter played by a Lothrian girl so like the next they might be clones of one another. Lithe, high-breasted, black hair pulled up. We could not see the audience beneath our box, and sat in whispering quiet, Valker and I, alongside Lord Argyris and certain of the consular staff. Our hosts sat about us, politely attentive. The ninth chair had not spoken all evening, leaving the duties of host to the gallant seventeenth chair, who leaned in to inquire, Is the delegate pleased? I was unclear on what subtle change in Lothrian protocol allowed the man the right to speak more freely, or if it were only that for him the rules were more flexible. A more cavalier attitude toward the niceties from the seventeenth chair might explain the stony silence on the part of the ninth, whose dedication toward Lothrian's brand of progress he guarded with an almost religious zeal. Valka answered for me. They are marvellous. They are impressive, I said, watching as the fifty-two daughters of Silicon, each in their own circle of light, seduced male counterparts in red leotards, with gold circlets about their foreheads. They were, I knew, the great kings of men who ruled the off-world colonies before their fall. They must train all their lives. May all who excel in one avenue of life offer that excellence to the people. The seventeenth chair agreed shifting back to the stilted language of formal Lothrian, perhaps responding to the silent pressure of the ninth chair not five seats away. May each bend that excellence to the service of the people. May each offer a life entire. 
Yes, I translated to myself. The white-clad girl in centre stage danced about one of the men, but he rebuffed her while all about the others fell. Nodding at him, I said, That's our god-emperor. The first Solon emperor had, when he was but a pretty king in exile on Avalon, rebuffed the advances of the Merikanii. They had wanted his world. On the other colonies they sublimated or built, as on earth herself. Mankind had been seduced by his own creation, and from that incestuous union had sprung all the horrors of machine rule. The great pyramids that rose above the cities of earth and her colonies, the dream worlds into which the machines led mankind and trapped them. The cancers whose ceaseless growth kept those men alive so the machines might crouch spider-like in their unused brains. The homunculi, grown to replace the few who died and to swell the ranks of captive men to replace him and to serve the machines he'd made to serve himself. I doubted that Adamar had known any of it when he'd composed his ballet. What had been history had turned to legend over the long millennia, and legend to fable and scripture. Few were the men who knew the names of Felsenberg and Columbia, and fewer still those who knew the horrors they had wrought. And of those who knew the god-emperor of old had received his visions and his authority from the quiet, the same alien thing whose unseen hand guided me, the same being who had redeemed me from the dead, two were seated in that box. I've never seen such precision, Valka admired. I leaned toward her and whispered, Because they kill the ones who fail. By then we were certain that neither chair understood Valka's native pantai, and I thought I'd spoken soft enough not to catch the ear of any of their retinue. Valka scratched me gently with long fingernails. She spoke Galstani to forestall reply, and so end the conversation there. And your lot don't? Even an exile and a fugitive from her clan, she was Tavrosi to her bones. I felt certain that some great lord of the Imperium had killed performers before, but I felt equally certain that the Chantry had punished many lords for such excesses. Of course we don't, I said, never want to back down from her challenge. And what do you mean, my lot? I don't see much difference, Valka said. They don't even have names, Valka, I hissed, squinting at her in the dark of the box. She weighed this aside. As you like it, but I... She broke off suddenly, her machine eyes unfocusing. Are you all right? I feared she was having another episode, another flashback caused by Urbane's worm. Her hand tightened on my arm and she shook her head as discreetly as was possible. "'Tis nothing," she said. When I didn't back down, she glared at me more intently. "'Tis nothing." Wholly unaware of Valka's distress, Lord Damon Argyris exclaimed, "'Did I not tell you they know their art here in the Commonwealth?' He leaned around Valka to look at me, missed Valka's nails like claws digging into my gloved left arm. You should have seen the display they put on for the Durantine Doxa. The holography alone shames anything in the Eternal City. You have been too long apart from the Empire, my Lord Consul, I said, eyes still watching Valka. Whatever had bothered her, it had not been nothing. You are too quick to discount the achievement of your countrymen. The seventeenth chair overhearing this cut in, Is the performance not to the delegate's liking? I realised I'd not answered the question myself when he'd first asked, and turned from contemplation of the stage to regard the man who seemed so lordly and imperial in that place which professed hatred for lords and empires. Oh, the delegate is quite impressed, I said in Lothrian, sparing a glance at Ninth Chair, who sat stone-faced to the far side of his associate. Before speaking, I drank from the nearly flavourless spirit our hosts had poured for me. Not knowing how to express myself with the limitations of Lothrian, I switched back to Imperial Standard. I only mean it is an Imperial ballet you perform for us, however impressive the performance. My friend the Consul forgets this. Beneath his bushy mustachios, Damon Argyris frowned. Fair point, Lord Marlowe, but mine stands. These Lothrians are capable of quite the performance. 
I should have liked to see the show you put on for the doctor, I said to the seventeenth chair. Privately, I was surprised the ruler of that most serene republic had come to a place like the Commonwealth. On the stage below, the dancers had traded white for red, and the women writhed in artful tumbles across the floor before the advance of the men, now in white, with the dancer playing the god-emperor at the centre. I had never seen a performance of Adamar's rendition of The Burning of Earth before, but I did not think the composer intended the way each male dancer, dressed in imperial white, I realised, stood above the female dancers like conquerors in a captured harem. I smiled at the implied insult, at the Lothrian ability to say so much without words. I'm sure it was quite a show. In time the curtains fell, and in the space where an applause ought to have been there was only the awkward clamour of our hands. The Lothrian audience below did not clap or give any sign. Uncomfortable, having stood to clap as was the imperial custom, I bowed and thanked our hosts. Here is a people without masters, the ninth chair intoned, staring up at me with flinty eyes, without gods, a people whose every action glorifies itself. I looked down at the little man in his grey robes, his eyes as grey beneath his cap of oiled black hair. Studying him, I was struck again at just how similar these Lothrians were to one another. The ninth chair kept watching me, and when I didn't respond, he continued quoting. Let there be hard labour for the strong. Let there be deep learning for the wise. Let there be great trials for the just. Let the skill of each be turned in service to the good of all. Your dancers served well, I said. Not asking, I wondered what service a man with no name might offer, not knowing himself or what he was worth. Let each be loyal to the conclave, the ninth chair replied. Let then the conclave be loyal to the book. This is order and justice. I bowed again. I know something of loyalty and of service myself. Chapter 14 Ghost of the Machine Dinner was served at a long black table in the middle of an empty room. We'd ridden a lift from the levels of the People's Palace to the marble terraces I'd spied from the streets below. The architecture of these rarefied climbs was just as brutal and cyclopean, but here the blocks shone white in the starlight that fell through the veined dome above. The floor of the dining room was of marble too, and the walls were faced with it. No curtains hung on the horizontal slit windows, nor was there any rug to relieve the pale utility of that chamber. Its only furnishing, besides the table and its attendant chairs, was a mighty globe of the planet Padmarac in magnetic suspension slowly turning above its stand in one corner. The walls bore little decoration. No paintings or artwork relieved the dour sconces. One wall held a holograph plate disguised as a mirror. There had been one in every room of the chair's apartments. I guess they were a part of the man's security and communications network. The food itself was plain but good. As Third Chair had said, there was no meat to be found in Lothrian cuisine. The meal centred instead about a stew of white beans and carrots in tomato sauce. There was bread and roast garlic to spread on it, but no butter, no eggs, no cheese or any other by-product of animal life. There were not even their imitations, grown in vats or synthesised. Are there not servants? I asked in Lothrian where there was no word for servant. Manyoka, I said. Helpers. Seventeenth chair deposited the last platter on the table. An idle hand is ever turned against the people. He brushed his hair back from his face as he took the seat opposite us. Let no hand be idle. Each must serve each. He gestured at the door through which he'd entered, indicating the direction of the kitchens where I was certain that, for all his civic piety, Seventeenth Chair had done nothing to aid the preparation of the meal. 
I translated this for Valka, whose Lothrian was limited. It all looks lovely. She smiled at the chair. Valka had worn her diplomatic best for the ballet, an understated black and ivory gown, as much business as fashion. Her red dark hair pulled up and pinned. The nearly black lipstick she wore called attention to that smile. You must be very proud. Our host returned the smile, pouring water for us each from an unassuming but well-made metal pitcher, serving me first, then Valka, then himself. The only true pride, he recited, is pride in the people. He lingered a moment, studying the spread. It struck me that without meat or fish, the meal was an oddly uncentered affair. There was no true entree with the other dishes supporting it or otherwise accompanying it, no sense of what should be eaten first or how. It's a pity the ninth chair could not join us, I said, noting the empty seat at seventeenth chair's left hand. Our host's progress slowed as he contemplated his answer. Let no hand be idle, he said again. Unseen beneath the table, Valka nudged me with a toe when I leaned in to whisper to her. I understood her all too well. I didn't fancy the prospect of an evening spent with so limited a conversation partner. Talking to the Lothrians was like trying to roll a stone uphill, only to have it roll back again, as though I were poor, doomed Sisyphus. Fortunately, unlike Sisyphus, I was not alone. Chairman, Volker began, ladling a measure of the bean stew into her bowl. I wonder about your language. Hadrian tells me you speak entirely by reciting quotations from your people's codex. Can that really be so? I translated this from Galstani into Lothrian for our host, using sentences that were doubtless not approved by the Lothriad. The chair still wore an earpiece, but I felt the need to editorialize. Seventeenth chair replied, Only correct speech serves the will of the people. Correct speech? Valka asked. What is correct speech? That which is for the good of the people, seventeenth chair replied. It was a deftly employed fragment of a sentence, used void of its original context. Failing to translate this for Valka, I said, The Lothrian taught in the Empire lacks this emphasis on quotation. I had to struggle to fit my thoughts into the Lothrian pattern. It was difficult to describe how my tutor had taught me in a way that referenced neither the tutor nor myself. I was sure I sounded half a fool. I'd had little occasion to practice this guttural language since I'd left Devil's Rest. Strange to think I spoke Sielsin better than this tongue of man. It is incorrect, the chair said. Only the Lothriad is correct. Surely that has limitations, Valka said when I translated this for her. Or are there correct ways to ask for the toilet? Seventeenth chair only laughed. Or supposing you encountered something you have no words for, how could you discuss it? Valka leaned over her plate, eager to have answers to these questions after so many weeks in the Commonwealth, and to have the opportunity to grill a Petrasnuk of the Grand Conclave at last. Suppose you encountered a race of Xenobites. What then? Rugya, I said, reaching her answer. To Valka, I added, it only means the others. To the Lothrian, ordinary words were forced to carry the weight of a dozen others. There was so much context, so much subtext, depended on for clarity of communication. Valka toyed with her spoon. But that doesn't address the problem. You have no way to discuss new things if your words are written out in advance. You can't adapt. Our host nodded along as I translated this and paused to chew a mouthful of his stew. He tore a piece of bread off his portion and dunked it in his bowl. The will of the conclave is the will of the people. A good man is to the conclave as a son is to a father. A father gives voice to a son. How? By teaching, Seventeenth Chair replied, and again I suspected his answer was the fragment of some other sentence. Voice, I said, repeating the word I'd seen used to such great effect in the conclave's arena. Halas. The conclave writes new sentences as time goes on. 
and you're the only ones permitted use of the voice? Da, our host replied. And why man? Valka asked. A good man is to the conclave. What of women? The seventeenth chair studied her a moment before replying. There are no women, he said, though the word he used for women, samkanka, was more precisely rendered as females. Nor men. This, of course, was untrue. The third chair and the sixth were women, and several of the others besides. We had seen women by the dozen in the urban farms, and the ballerinas had been women as well. There are no females, Seventeenth Chair repeated. No males. There is only the people. Only man. I had wondered at the Lothriad's aggressive sexlessness. Their word for man, ovuk, which showed clear ties to the word for worker, zuk, meant only human, implying neither sex. Thus their language was half like our own, where woman has no true companion, and the word man means man and human both. How we survive such confusion is difficult enough to fathom. How the Lothrians theirs, I could not begin to comprehend. But your eyes know the difference. Whatever your words, I said, encouraged by Valka's objections, there are things stronger than our words, sir. Language cannot change reality, only stretch it. And it only stretches so far, Valka appended, evidently as confounded by this Lothrian way of thinking as I was. Seventeenth chair studied the both of us over his half-eaten meal for a long moment. He lifted his water cup to his lips. There was no wine, nor any of that colourless spirit we'd been given at the theatre, and drank. Not answering, he rose and plodded over to the globe of Padmarac, revolving in its magnetic field. He gripped the rail that encircled the display, fiddling with his hair. Not his hair, I realised an instant later, half turned in my seat. His earpiece. Seventeenth chair removed his auto-translator and set it dead on the lip about the globe. Perhaps for now it is so, Lord Marlow, my lady, he said, speaking perfect Galstani, but in time even this will change. You speak the standard? Valka asked, dark lips twisting into something neither smile nor frown. The standard? the chairman barked. That too is true only for now. But we all speak your language. I was schooled in your empire, at Tukros. So many are. I took this sudden change in stride. Often I had seen Palatine lords disable their own security systems to speak unobserved. My own mother had done it in her summer palace, as we planned my escape from home so long ago. I had done it myself aboard the Tamerlane time and time again, and so this revelation came as little shock. I had expected that beneath the rigid adherence to Lothrian civic scripture was an agnosticism little different than the false piety of so many imperial lords. So it is all an act, I said. The Lothriad, your speech codes, all this talk of equity and community, and yet you are governed by different laws than your zooks as in your empire. My empire doesn't pretend to be something it's not, I said, eager at last to have someone I could hold to account for the world I'd been witness to then for the better part of a month. Nor do we, the chairman said. I am only a handmaid. When the Lothriad is perfected, the conclave will no longer be necessary. Perfected? Valka echoed, glad, I think, to no longer be barred from direct conversation by her ignorance of the Lothrian tongue. She turned fully in her seat to look at the stately man in his plain grey judicial robes. Perfected how? Our host's smile didn't falter, and there was a light in his black eyes such as I had seen in the Vates, who pray naked atop pillars in city squares and howl at the sky for Earth's return. The old monsters shall be swept away. Old customs, old culture, old habits, old thoughts. But the ancients did not go far enough. They kept their language, they kept their names. These things tied them to the past. True progress, true perfection demands more. 
You sound like the extrasolarians, I said. The extrasolarians have vice, not vision. They shape themselves in accordance only with the disorder of their natures. We impose our nature on nature, the chairman declared. Uncomfortably half-turned in my seat, I stood. Is hubris not vice, then? You can only push men so far. With eyes for Valker, I added, and women. Old thoughts, old bodies, old natures, too, will be swept away. He shut his eyes, recited in Lothrian as though it were a mantra. How shall old thoughts be expunged by eliminating old desires? How shall old desires be expunged by eliminating old natures? How shall old natures be expunged by eliminating old bodies? Still Gibson's keen disciple, I asked, New bodies are... what? Neither male nor female? Of course, the chair replied, slipping back into his native Lothrian to quote, Where there is distinction, there is disparity. Where there is disparity, suffering. How shall suffering be overcome? By overcoming disparity. How shall disparity be overcome? By overcoming difference. I met him, quotation for quotation, saying, Each angel knows his place. It is in hell that all are equal. My gloved hand went reflexively to the red company pentacle pinned to my lapel, my mind to the old Marlowe devil I had not worn in centuries. Hadrian, Valka put a hand on my arm. Valrowan, be careful. Why have you not done it, then? There are hermaphrodite homunculi among the Mandari. The technology exists. Seventeenth chair didn't answer, only narrowed those black Lothrian eyes. I see, I said after a moment's silence, believing I understood. Your people fought back. A brittle smile creased the bureaucrat's handsome face. They are not yet ready. To be replaced? No, I think not. Valka tightened her grip on my arm. The chair had called himself a handmaid, and so I imagined him, pictured him, standing in a stark surgical theatre to watch his children being born. A new generation to replace the old, to supplant nature. They had already removed the words for man and woman, but that wasn't enough. They had introduced their new bodies, their new men, but the Zooks had not accepted them. The conclave could not replace the trillions of people in their commonwealth, not from an assembly line. Not even the great clone manufactories of Jad were up to that task. Had the conclave expected its people to breed with its new men, to breed the old out of existence? It seemed they had been disappointed. The Lothrian people had rejected the conclave's new men, if I understood the chair correctly. We will try again, Seventeen said into the silence. Old natures die hard, I said. You are Solon, Seventeen said. You are a creature of the old. It is in your nature to think this. Doubtless you were schooled by a scoliast. Scoliasts are creatures of the old too. They have no place in the future. One hand on the back of my seat, I lifted my water glass to the chairman. And yet you yourself were schooled in the Imperium. By scoliasts. Sweeping away the old is like knocking the foundations of a tower out from under your feet. Tradition grounds a man. Even for you Lothrians it is so. I took a short drink. You've been building your new world for thousands of years. The seventeenth chair barked a laugh. I am but a steward. I will not live to see my paradise made real, but I will die building it. I say it is the cruel law of art that all things must die, and that we ourselves must die after we have exhausted every suffering so. So that the grass, not of oblivion, but of eternal life, should grow, the chairman said, finishing the old quotation, his polished voice sliding over mine like a fencer's blade. Fertilized by works, I see you know your Proust. I had a good teacher, I said in answer. Indeed, you must have done, he said. 
you understand me perfectly. Did I? I wasn't sure. The whole meal I'd felt as though the chair was trying to teach me a lesson. No, it was more than that. He was trying to impress me, to impress upon me the total superiority of Lothrian resolve, just as the ballet had been designed to convince me of the superiority of Lothrian art, as it had so evidently convinced Lord Argyris. But Argyris was a fool. Me, I echoed the little word. It was a word no Lothrian, certainly no one at the Grand Conclave, should ever use. Do you have a name, sir? I am a steward of the Lothriad. I'm serious, I said. Do you still have names? You must have used one when you studied in the Imperium. Shall I call you steward? Talag, he said. Lorth Talag. Valka cut in. I knew you all must have names. It was simply no way. Talag's tight smile returned. Only those of us in the party have proper names. He toyed with the discarded earpiece on the table. The Zooks have none. How is that possible? I asked. We make it possible, came the reply. Four words, just four words. So little to fill so many graves. You hypocrite, Valka said, taking her hand from my arm. So strange for us both to be on the same side of an argument. Despite her Tavrosi collectivism, Valka's people still valued the individual, still valued the human soul. Lorth Talek's smile vanished. Not at all. As I say, I am a handmaid of the Lothriad, a shepherd. It is my role, the conclave's role, to bring humanity under the Lothriad, not to live under it myself, and to reduce mankind to Eloi. I said. To what? the chairman asked. Having established the chairman was only a middling student of literature, I joined him by his globe. Padmarak was a sad pale world of ice and snow and naked stone, its airless surface unrelieved by seas or lakes, grey face scarred by glacial action in the planet's far past. It did not want for water, but what it had lay frozen in massive caps to either pole. Mountains were short and uninspiring, for the planet, while not tectonically dead, was unenergetic in the extreme. Examining the artifact, I was unsurprised to find the coastlines and lines of latitude and longitude were inlaid with platinum wire, a subtle mark of wealth. I had to remind myself that despite the apparent Spartanness of the man's apartments, here was one of the men who commanded the Commonwealth. Talig was one of a group of thirty-four who presided over a hundred thousand settled worlds. It doesn't matter, I said. It's an old word, from an old book. The word old hung heavy on the air between us, twisting like a knife. Are you always like this? Talig asked, eyeing me intently. Oh, yes, I replied, glancing up from my study of the globe. Ask anyone who knows me. Talig's eyes must have shifted to Valka for confirmation, for her clear voice answered a moment later. Try spending a century with him. Our host's smile vanished in his transition from seventeenth chair to Lorth Talig, returned for a trifle. You hate us, don't you? I do. I said, sitting straight, feeling myself almost on trial. We have slaves in the Empire to our shame, but here all men are slaves. Is that what you think of us? The chairman asked, leaning against the window frame. A nation of slaves. But you forget, Lord Marlow, I studied in your Empire. You keep whole armies in chains, imprison entire worlds. You yourself were ordered to come here. Are you then a slave? He scoffed, a look of disgust colouring his handsome face. Speak not to me of freedom. Freedom is like the sea. I froze, eyes pulled to Valka, who sat watching, still half turned round, in her high-backed seat. Lorth Talig had said he was schooled on Teucros. That could only have been at Nov Semba. The very Athenaeum I had failed to reach when I fled Delos as a boy. His teachers had been scoliasts, 
It was a scoliast aphorism he quoted at me. To be truly free is to be like one who is adrift on a raft in the middle of the sea. One can sail anywhere, in any direction. It was Valka who had spoken, quoting Imora in the Book of the Mind. No, I realized, not quoting Imora. She was quoting me, quoting my own imperfect rendition of Imora's words as I'd recited them in that chilly dungeon beside the lake where brethren slumbered beneath the ice and the gardens of Vorgosus. Talig was smiling again, nodding along with her. But what good is that by itself? he asked, finishing the quotation. Freedom is no virtue, Lord Marlow. It is an obstacle to it. Had I not argued that same thing to Valka so long ago when I defended the Empire from her attacks? I had not argued that same thing to Valka. So what? I asked our host. You have drained that ocean dry. We have given the people one voice, one goal, one golden path to follow, Talig answered me. And it is one where man is free, free from poverty, free from pain, no gods, no kings, no masters. Except yourself, I said. Talig came off the wall, one finger pointed squarely at my chest. I told you, I am only a handmaid. The purpose of the conclave is to dissolve the conclave. This last he said in Lothrian, and I knew whence it must come. Only the Lothriad could contain so bald a contradiction. That day will never come, I said, and released the globe, thus setting Padmarak to spinning once again. Your commonwealth is a desert, and a desert is nothing. Everything in it has turned to stone. And what of your empire? The empire is a river, I said in answer. It has currents and a course, and while our movement may be limited, we are always limited. By our bodies, as you correctly noted, by our minds, by nature itself, freedom is accepting those limitations and responding to them with humility. We cannot change nature. We can, Talig said, and his eyes were the eyes of a fanatic, bright and deadly as the eyes of his cohort, the ninth chair. Not all of it, Valka said, voice cutting across our back and forth as a gunshot stuns the duelists to stillness. Time does not run backward, Lord Talek, nor entropy. Lorth Talek rounded on Valka. I am no lord, lady. The title had clearly rankled him. She shook her head. I am only a clanswoman of the Wisp, she said. Both your worlds are strange to me, but I would sooner die in Hadrian's empire than live in your commonwealth. She stood then, and came round her chair, leaning heavily on the arm. Only then did I notice the tension in that face I loved best in all the worlds, mark the dilation in the left pupil unmatched by the right. Why did you invite us here, chairman? Or do you insult all your guests? We never did get the answer to that question. Valka collapsed in the next instant, and no answer Talig might have given would have mattered a steel bit to me. Too late to catch her, I hurried to her side, cradled her head. It's all right, I said, brushing her dark hair from her brow. Her left pupil had fully dilated, tracked independent of the right, and she'd begun sweating. You're all right. But she wasn't. The worm Urbane had set loose in her mind had woken up, triggered by elevated stress, perhaps, or some special feature of the conversation, or by nothing at all. She had gone so long without an episode that I had almost begun to hope they were behind her. Too well I remembered those black nights on Edda when I had first taken Valka to seek the help of her people. The way she would bite her cheeks, her lips, the way her fingers scratched at her face, tore at her flesh until the doctors had to restrain and sedate her. Too well I remembered how that hand had reached for her throat while she ate. She hadn't even noticed it as if it was some other will that moved the tattooed fingers, not her own. "'What's wrong with her?' Talag asked, shadow falling over us. Not answering him, I seized her left hand in mine, squeezed unfeeling fingers. On Edda, the Tavrosi had done all they could, 
short of destroying her mind entire, to destroy Urbane's virus. Their efforts had neutered the worm, dismembered it, stopped it trying to kill her. But they had failed to wholly purge the thing from her mind. What remained was only a shadow of what had been before, a chronic but fading terror that came upon her in bursts. "'What's wrong?' Talag asked again. "'Seizure,' I said flatly, not wanting to explain. Talag took a step back. "'I was sent for my physicians.' "'Your physicians,' I thought. "'Yours. Not a lord indeed. But I said, "'No need. She's quite safe. But I must take her back to the embassy. I am sorry, but I must cut our conversation short.' Valka shook as I helped her into the ground car Argyris had sent for us, an ugly black Lothrian vehicle whose native driver didn't so much as nod at us as I helped Valka inside. Sheltering her head to keep her from striking on the doorframe, I bundled her into the rear compartment, noting the inch-thick alum glass of the window and the starship-grade adamant and titanium armor in the door itself. I lingered a moment in the damp, peered up at the soft fall of mist in the street lamps, and out at the spray of the abstract fountains on the approach to the people's palace. Talig's words lingered, and the dome above pressed closer and closer still. We'd made so little progress in months of negotiating, and no wonder. The Lothrian Commonwealth was not a nation, but an experiment in human lives. Hadrian, get in. Valka's voice came from within, thin and thready. I climbed in after her and held her left hand as it shook. She lay her head on my shoulder, the other fist clenched in her lap. We did not speak for some time after that, permitting the driver to take us on in silence. The car was of imperial make, red leather seats and gilt fittings. It was like a raft of home in that sea of unmixed grey. Condensation dripped like rain on the windows and ran down. I can't believe this place, Valka murmured, speaking Pantai. I thought your empire was bad enough. Matching her language, I said, so did I once, really. I could feel her sceptical eyes without having to turn back. The muscles in her arm spasmed, and she clenched them to keep them under control. I did, but every time I leave it, I realize I was wrong. The extras, the Commonwealth, at least the Empire protects humanity. I turned to study the rainy city through the window pane and thought, humanity and mankind. The Commonwealth's ideals were as toxic to the human animal as the surgeries and augmentations the extracellarians enjoyed. Each people saw humanity as a problem to solve. What do you mean? I told her, and added, the Empire isn't a solution. It accepts the human condition, ugliness and all, and does not force its idealism onto the world. Doesn't force its idealism? Valka repeated, nestling closer against me. Her tremors were dying down. Whatever vestigial process the Minos virus had left in her were running down their programming, or else were being blocked by subsystems in Valka's neural lace. What do you call you palatines? Firstly, I thank you for the compliment, I said smilingly. She turned her head away with a groan. And secondly, the High College has not made us something other than human, only stretched our humanity a little further. You heard what Talek said. They tried to replace their whole people with homunculi, just like the Merikanii. Valka shuddered. Though whether it was with remembrance of the images and the monographs we'd seen in Gabriel's archives and the revelations Horizon had made, or only another of her tremors, I couldn't say. I peered out at the city with its stark, monolithic architecture, watched blockhouses and spiritless government buildings slide past like mountains in the early dark of Padmarak's long night. The whole place is like a dream, I said, still reflecting on Talig's words and the dreams fading. A nightmare, more like, Valka answered, peering past me. Like I said, it reminds me of home once you strip away. She tapped her forehead with black nails, 
indicating the illusory world that Tavrosi painted over the utilitarian starkness of their lives. In Tavros, they lived a kind of waking dream, painted their personal artificial utopias over their colourless lives. Or a memory, I said. The Commonwealth and the Demarchy were each in their own ways reflections of the Merikanii Empire that had ruled man's first stars. It was their dream I saw when I looked out the window at the great city of Vidatharad, their dream I had seen reflected in the canyon cities of Edda and in the sanitary halls of the asylum I'd rescued Valka from. I had even seen its vestiges in the state cult of the Chantry, whose Merikanii antecedents had venerated Felsenberg as we venerated the god-emperor and who placed mankind at the centre of the universe. Ghosts of the Machine I think it is passing, Valka said but didn't take her head from my shoulder. So long together. We were slow to part. You're all right. I squeezed her hand and remembered. Are they getting more frequent? Your seizures? Valka paused, consulting some mental record. No. The last one was when we were on the Tamerlane, before we stopped at Gododin. Then... I paused, not sure exactly what to say. What was that in the theatre? What? You froze up at one point. Told me it was nothing. I thought you were having another of your... I trailed off, feeling I had used the word seizure enough for one conversation. Valka opened her mouth, eyes glassy as she ran back. Oh, I thought... She shook her head. I thought for a moment I sensed another neural lace. But it must have been another flashback. Another neural lace? I asked. The Lothrians don't use them, do they? She shook her head. I don't think so. I haven't sensed anything like that since we arrived. Not even with the conclave. I imagine if anyone here had one, one of their secretaries must. She raised her right hand to shade her eyes. It was nothing, Hadrian. Truly. The virus just manifests fingerprints sometimes. She swallowed. Tis like he's still in my head. I did not have to ask to know that he was the extrasolarian magus, Urbane. Let's go back, she said and said again was nothing. I'm all right. I promise. Chapter 15 By Fire My tour of the water harvesting facility in the South Polar regions had been unremarkable. Valka had remained in our suite in the Solon Embassy under the watchful eyes of Damon Argyris and the consular staff. Her seizure had been one of the worst in recent years. She'd recovered, but the thought of travelling from the great city and across the wastes by train to a place the Lothrians called Lahe Wenelokta, Everfrost Station, was more than she could bear. The journey had taken nearly two days by train, packed into Spartan accommodations with Polino and Krim and twenty guards for company. Of the camp itself, I shall say little. But I saw a Zook, a woman, forced to stand naked on the ice beneath the station's dome for some crime. They would not tell me what it was or let me approach. She had no hair and little flesh on her bones. Her feet were turning blue. But I could not have seen it. There are no women on Padmarak, I was told, and no men either. I am no prophet. The visions of all our futures that the quiet poured into my head are unsorted, and I lack the wit to sift wheat from chaff. I know only what can happen, what may happen, and only a little of that. So I shall not prophesy, but I know the Commonwealth will fall, whether by sword or by beast, by famine or thirst, I know not, but I know it will. What gods there may be, mine or any other, 
cannot long tolerate such crimes. So too our empire will fall. It is falling already. I have knocked its pillars down, torn out its heart with the heart of my star. The world is changing, and as Valka said, time does not run backward, nor entropy turn back. We remained at La Haye Wenelokta for but two days. I dined with the commandant, who was indistinguishable from every partisan and military person of the Commonwealth I had met. I cannot even recall his face, though I recall every line of the woman's. It was her face I drew in the little sketchbook I secreted in a pocket of the heavy coat I wore. The train put in near 13th Dome, near the southernmost tip of Vidatharad. A representative escort chivied us from the train into a fleet of black motor cars that seated five men each. With traffic cleared along the route ahead, we were expected to pass along the underground highway through Eighth Dome on our return to the Imperial Embassy. Our drivers were Lothrians. Only their partisans were allowed to drive vehicles in the great city. It simply would not do to give outsiders much latitude in exploring the capital in all its ruined splendour. Besides, only those raised in Vidatharad stood a chance of navigating the circuitry dense streets that honeycombed the bedrock beneath the domed arcologies of the city. You heard from her? Polino asked, eyeing me with his customary paternal concern. No signal yet, I said in answer, realizing as I spoke why the Lothrians had decided on a metal skeleton for their great domes. Each bubble was a Faraday shield an iron net that blocked standard radio and tight beam transmissions. The denizens of each of the city's domes were cut off from the next, unable to communicate, unable to coordinate. Polino chewed his lip and looked for all the worlds like he meant to spit in the Lothrian vehicle. Thought she was getting better. She was, I said sparing a moment's notice for our Lothrian representative and the three other hoplites of my guard who joined us. I didn't wish to discuss Valka's condition in front of any Commonwealth partisan, or to give any details about her implants, for such things were frowned upon even in that far country. Nor did I wish to discuss her reference to the other neural lace she'd sensed in the theatre, assuming it was not only Urbane's shadow. But it's not the sort of thing that ever really heals. Beyond the window, grey towers rose almost to the level of the dome, three thousand feet above. Vaguely, I recalled this stretch of highway from our journey out to Everfrost Station. Our track skirted the perimeter of the dome, past bridge after bridge, that turned inward and ran across the lower district and the dense network of canals and waterways that shot through it toward the towers in the dome's heart. We had only to follow the perimeter and this road would dip back and braid itself into another of the underground thoroughfares that would carry us direct to First Dome and the Embassy. Only wish her people had done more to actually help instead of try to fry her head, Polino said. She's all right, I said, unwilling to agree. To say that Valka was damaged was to betray her victories. My mind went to my old basin, its shards held together by silver solder. Was I too not scarred? Valka had never spurned my wounds, not even my death. How could I not return what she had given me? Over the rail to our left, the road fell off quickly, plunged a thousand feet or more, to streets and water channels, where fresh floods newly arrived from places like Everfrost burst from sluices below us into the city. "'I'm surprised there's any open water here,' I said. "'Let there be provision for all the people,' our representative intoned, responding to the translation of my remarks through his earpiece. "'Let there be water and food and rest for all that labour. Polino leaned across to me. "'The hell did he say?' Our Lothrian escort had of course spoken in his own native tongue. Nothing, I told Polino. And that was true. Polino sat a little straighter then. He was seated facing forward and so had a view of the road ahead. He leaned against the window trying to get a better view of something. 
What is it? Gone was the fellow's casual air, and from the way his lips moved I could tell he was sub-vocalising with his lieutenants in the other vehicles. I craned my neck to look, but whatever Polino saw I couldn't see. Military police in the road. Flares. Polino looked around at our Lothrian escort, who sat blinking at the sudden change in my lictor's demeanour. The hell is this? I felt certain, then, that our Lothrian friend understood Galstani perfectly, for he looked round like a man in pursuit of an answer even as his earpiece murmured its translation. The enemies of the people are everywhere, he recited. Details, man, Polino hissed, when I'd rendered this translation. How do these brain-dead fuckers get anything done? When our backs are turned, I said dryly, not caring what our host might think, and made the thumb and pointed forefinger gesture that meant stay alert. No sooner had I said this did our car begin to slow. Through the heavy doors and armoured windows, I heard shouting in Lothrian, though the specific words and quotations used were lost. They're directing us over the bridge, Polino said. Rome must be out. He glowered at the Lothrian sitting beside me. Hey, Greyface, why is the road out? The Lothrian only blinked at him. Polino leaned across the compartment, blue eyes flashing. I asked you a question. Why is the road blocked? Laying a hand on Polino's arm, I repeated the question in the Lothrian's own language. The Lothrian representative tilted his head, listening to some message from the powers that held his strings. On behalf of the conclave, he said, marking his next words for an actual response. There has been a disturbance along the N4 connecting to First Dome. A collision has blocked traffic in the tunnel. The delegation and escort must reroute to the C7. Polino turned to me for translation. Traffic accident in the tunnel, I said. They're sending us another way. Peering out the window, I watched the black beetle shapes of the Lothrian motor cars marching along behind us as we began to roll again. Despite the inconvenience and the faint thrill of concern, after so many years a soldier and so strange a life, any deviation from the plan was an occasion for worry. I could not help but feel a spike of curiosity at the prospect of turning off the carpet which the Lothrian government had unrolled for our arrival. I half expected the windows to turn opaque, but they never did. Not as we turned across the bridge over the lower district toward the grey towers at the heart of the dome, nor when we reached the far side. Like the other Cooper, the other domes we'd passed through, Eighth Dome's most developed urban spaces lay in the centre, where the steel and glass false sky was highest. In First Dome, the central buildings were all party government buildings, with the ziggurat of the People's Palace standing above all. There was no comparable central structure here, only tower after square tower, rising dark and nearly windowless into the grey and misty air. Seen better days, eh? Polino asked, watching broken glass facades and crowds of men in tatty grey overcoats clustered about oil drum fires. I saw more men, more zooks here than in the parts of Vidatharad we'd been meant to see, but the impression was still of emptiness. If this is their capital, I'd hate to see what the colonies must be like. Thinking of the woman I had seen standing barefoot on the ice, I said, more like Everfrost Station, I imagine. Reckon they blame us blocking trade, Polino said, speaking as though our Lothrian tagalong were not present. Figured they'd be happier with your terms. Don't know why it's taken so long. Our talks had not been going well. Like the Cielsin, the Lothrians were limited by their language. They struggled to express or incorporate novelty into a system so frozen by the need for correct thought, and the process for approving new thoughts outside the limited context of the use of voice was a slow and arduous one. No one ever said it would be easy, I said, spotting a line of men and women standing in line outside the busted front of a dispensary marked with a black star and the word paishka, rations, marked in phosphorescent letters. We came through the inner district, past the rusted hulks of long-abandoned ground cars. 
Down one street, a black-armoured personnel carrier slowly rolled, blue klaxons flashing but silent. In silence, then, we skirted the perimeter of the inner district, travelling counterclockwise toward another bridge that would carry us over the watercourses and canals and squat buildings of the outer ring. Turning to peer out the window, I had a clear vision of its grey span, where it rose on concrete pilings, the tallest of which rose nearly a thousand feet above the canals and the rooftops below. Our line of cars slowed as we approached, for the conclave's careful scrubbing of the streets had come too late, and the traffic ahead of us thickened with the trucks and ground cars of the great city's everyday life. On behalf of the conclave, this route will add some eighty minutes to our travel time. Great, Polino said. More of this. In time, we pulled out onto the bridge and into six lanes of traffic. They're clearing the way ahead, Krim says, Polino said, two fingers to the compatch behind his ear. Krim was riding in the foremost car, with the rest of us strung out between the other five vehicles, pushing the cars to each side. Still, our progress was slow. A klaxon blared from the foremost vehicle, and an amplified voice rang out in flattened Lothrian. Clear the way, it said. Clear the way. We ground to a halt. Polino swore under his breath. Uncomfortable silence filled the cab like water, my hoplites shifting in their seats. The Lothrian man sat there unmoving as a stone, eyes fixed on a point out the far window, mind lost somewhere in the curling mist above the low district, hundreds of feet below us. I watched with him, looking back at the grey towers like headstones beneath the centre of Eighth Dome. It looked strangely familiar to me, as though I'd been there before. Was it Vorgosos again? The memory of Khan's ancient city has never left me, so powerful was its first dark impression. We'd sat there, unmoving, for the better part of ten minutes, before the shouting began. What's that? I turned to see. Polino's craggy, revitalized face turned down in an expression of grave alertness. Turning to our escort, he barked, What's going on? The representative shook his head and didn't answer. Polino seized the man by the front of his drab grey tunic. Let him go, I hissed. When Polino did not, I reached out and laid a hand on his wrist once more. I won't have you starting an international incident over a traffic jam, Polino. Stand down. But the last word caught in my throat, cancelled by a soft and distant popping. The crack of gunfire. Polino's grip tightened on the representative's lapels. What the hell is going on? Seeming to understand his meaning, if not his words, the representative replied, The... He froze, clamped his jaw shut. The liberalists, I said, stringing two and two together. I turned to the representative and repeated the statement. Bodanukni. Paustani. Rebels? Before he could think about an answer and self-censor, the representative nodded. Tell Krim and the others to get sharp, I said and worked the elastic quaff free of my suit's collar baffle. I pulled it over my head and tucked my long hair in and away from my face before I keyed the command to don my helmet. The segmented cask unfolded and closed about my head. The entoptics flicked on a moment later. All the while I heard distant gunshots. Screams. Crim's voice came over the line then. Won't be getting far in these cars. Anyone have eyes on the enemy? None behind, said one. Not yet, said another. The Norman Jadian commander replied, Eyes forward. Watch the cars on either side. I don't want us outflanked. Tone, tone, came a distant cry. That was quickly in Lothrian. Another gunshot. Not the crackling discharge of phase disruptors, nor the blaze of plasma. Is that a shotgun? Polino asked. I could only nod. Rounding on the Lothrian representative, I said, Summon your prefects. Where are the conclave guard? The man's frown deepened, and he said, On behalf of the conclave, the delegate is requested to stay in the vehicle. Help is on the way. Bah! I pressed the compatch behind my own ear. I want men posted on either rail. We need to outflank them, commander. Crim's reply was terse. Aye, lord. 
He relayed the orders down chain, tagging two men from each vehicle, ordering one right and one left. The two in ours moved to open the door, and the representative shouted, The delegate is requested to stay in the vehicle. Help is on the way. The second hoplite out the door made a rude gesture. A shot rang out the moment his boots hit the pavement, and his shield flashed, making him stagger. He slammed the door, dropped into a half-crouch as he snapped his short-stock plasma burner to attention and moved for the cover of the stopped cars. What the grey-faced Lothrian peasantry must have thought to see Solon legionnaires in ivory plate and red tabards spilling from their party's ground cars was any man's guess. The men moved with quiet efficiency, signalling for the Zooks to abandon their vehicles and run. Many did, spilling back along the bridge for the inner portions of the district. I remember being remarkably calm. Can we get word to the embassy? I asked. Not through the fucking dome, Polino said. More shouting. A gunshot shattered the window of the car opposite us. Help is on the way, the Lothrian stooge repeated. Stay in the vehicle. Something whistled on the air, and a moment later the whole car shook and lifted into the air, flipped clean over. Relatively safe in my armour, I threw an arm across the Lothrian to help pin him in place as the armoured vehicle skidded upside down along the road. Rocket, Polino swore, escaping his restraints and falling to the ceiling beneath us. He kicked the door open. You have to stay, the Lothrian man exclaimed, speaking Galstani as I dropped to follow my guards. I wasn't shocked to find he spoke our language. I guessed every man the conclave set to watch as must. You stay, I said, and slammed the door behind. Mist and smoke mingled and orange flames lit the grey day from places where cars were burning. Men and women in the dull grey coveralls of the Zook class ran past. Two cursed at me as they went by. Still more went wide-eyed with fear. Nebahovni! Nebahovni! One shouted and spat. No gods, no masters. Still more shouted, Zara, Zara! That was king, Caesar. On their lips it had the weight of a slur. They blame us for this, I said, and flinched as a bullet broke against my shield. Fuck them! Earth rot their bones! Polino hissed and raised his disruptor to fire. One of the liberalist guerrillas had appeared from behind one of the cars. She fell in a tangle of limbs and grey fabric, her allegiance to some other order betrayed only by a red and white armband. I stared at her body a moment, wondering what lies or desperation had led her mutinous hand to turn on me. I had no time to dwell on it. "'Where's that grenadier?' I asked. "'No sign,' came Crim's reply. "'Polino, get his lordship under cover!' The swordsman tugged one of his throwing knives from its bandolier and drew his ceramic sword. It shone white as milk as he turned. I drew my own sword but didn't kindle it. A hail of bullets fell about us, pockmarked the face of the upturned car. More men in grey with armbands or headbands striped red and white appeared, not charging but advancing slowly, methodically between the cars ahead. They didn't move like revolutionaries like anarchists or liberalists or whatever they call themselves, but like professional soldiers. One of my guards fired, and his disruptor bolt caught, not on a shield, but on some insulating garment worn beneath the grey coveralls. The man flinched and turned under cover. Krim caught another as he emerged from the sidelines, having evidently dispatched one of our men by the rail. The white Norman sword flashed as Krim shoved the man's rifle up and out of the way. The offhand knife flashed, blood flowered. Krim spun away, hurled his knife in a tumbling arc that caught another man behind the eyes. He fell like a Nipponese marionette, his shotgun discharging with a noise to shame the thunder. The others opened fire, bullets tearing the air between us. Car windows shattered and the fleeing people cried out and fell, bleeding. We returned fire, hoplites crouched behind the government motor cars for added protection. We need to find whoever was behind that rocket, I said to Polino, gripping the old soldier by the upper arm. Polino nodded once, relayed my order over broadband comm to the rest of my guard. Where were the Lothrian prefects? Surely they had flyers inside the dome for rapid response. They should have been there already, filling the air to either side. 
Polino fired around the rear of the car and hooted as he felled one of the enemy. A bullet pinged the glass between our heads, and looking up, I saw nearly half a dozen of the liberalists closing in from the other end of the bridge, each with a pistol leveled at our heads. Grateful for my shield, I almost laughed. It seemed innocent bystanders had not been the only people streaming past us. Well done, I muttered under my breath. Not waiting to allow Polino the chance to gainsay me, I leaped away from the vehicle and pounded down the road toward them. Crossing the empty space between the rear of our motorcade and these new assailants, the liberalists were picking their shots carefully, mindful of their fellows on the other side. A shot pinged off my shield, bullet dashed to flinders. I kindled my blade, high matter flowing like mercury, as I reached the nearest man. He stood bravely through it all, hoping my body shield might fail with each successive shot. The fellow's eyes were wide by the time I reached him, conviction shading to panic. He must have had little experience with Royce Fields, had hoped to break my guard with so small an effort. An energy lance might, might have depleted the barrier in time. But common bullets? He fell in two pieces. Five men swiveled and fired on me, the shrapnel of their rounds filling the air around. I threw a hand over my face and dove sideways behind a parked van, still venting steam from its fuel cell. I felt the crunch of sheet metal and crack of glass as bullets riddled the hulk. The civilian vehicle lacked the armour of the government motorcade, and I feared a stray shot or an expert one might breach that fuel cell. I couldn't stay still. One of the gunmen came round the side of the van, a shotgun in his hands. He wasn't of the five. Those all had held small arms. He must have come down the side by the rail. He thrust the muzzle forward like a bayonet, hoping to get the aperture inside the energy curtain of my shield before I could react. I slammed his head into the car beside us. Dazed, the fellow pulled the trigger by reflex, shots flashing off my shield and peppering the street beside us. The man staggered back, bleeding from his head. Another shot pinged off my shield above my head, and I turned, distracted. Another of the liberalists had taken cover behind a low-slung car, had fired over the hood. Seeing his chance, the shotgunner darted forward with a yell. Too slow. The high matter sword flashed once through a rising arc that cut the stock of the weapon in two and severed both the man's arms. He fell back as a shot from one of my hoplites claimed the man who had shot me. I saw another target among the vehicles by the rail and ran toward him, heedless of the shots falling all around, the way they smote the concrete about my feet. At my back, Krim held the bulk of the liberalists at bay, knives flying and blade flashing. I plunged toward the rail, blade hewing through a lamppost that toppled and fell with a splash into the waterway a thousand feet below. Another mighty explosion shook the bridge, and a nimbus of red flame flared where the fuel cell of one van stood burning. Scarlet light cast all the world in bloody colours, and I turned back to see black figures framed against the flames. Once more their precision struck me. Not a ragtag collection of desperate freedom fighters, no, these were soldiers trained and outfitted. I remembered what Damon Argyris had said. Our intelligence boffins think the rebels are a party bogeyman, a scapegoat. A scapegoat. Or a puppet. As I stood there at the rail, I saw Polino and his men make short work of the last of the liberalist rear guard. They turned to join Krim. We were winning. I thrust my sword up and raised my voice to rally the men for the final effort. Earth and Empire! I shouted. Not for piety or patriotism, but as a pronouncement of identity in that hideous place. And then I understood. I remembered. Remembered why the bridge looked so familiar. The grey towers that rose from the heart of Eighth Dome, seen from that spot on the bridge, were precisely those I'd seen, those I'd remembered from a future that had not happened. In my dream the night before I first met the Grand Conclave. A future that had not happened yet. If memories exist to instruct us on past failings, my memories of the future are signposts to warn me off future errors. 
As a familiar scent or sound triggers memories, so my arrival in Vidatharad for the first time had triggered nightmares of things which might happen there. Things my body and brain remembered from that day upon the mountain when the quiet poured all of time through my head. I remembered falling a second too late. The third rocket struck the car nearest me. I had no time to focus my sight, no time to cry out. If Polino swore and Krim shouted, I didn't hear them. I flew back and struck the rail with enough force to drive the air from my lungs. The last thing I remember was the headlong rush of air and darkness that came before the crash. Chapter 16 Vultures In the dream I fell again, saw again the bridge, the burning, heard again the guns, the shouting. My head rang like a temple bell. I clenched my teeth, even though that motion brought pain. Arms moved, legs moved, nothing was broken. My suit must have saved me, the gel layer hardening to protect my limbs as I fell. Something sticky and sucking pulled at me. Mud. I was lying face down in mud. Something jabbed me in the ribs, not hard. Feeling it, I felt certain I'd been jabbed already once before, that it was that jab which had awakened me. Jivo, came a hoarse whisper. My brain was as muddy as my suit. My head throbbed. It took me the better part of a minute to remember that Givon was Lothrian for alive. Lothrian, I told myself. I am in the Commonwealth. I was on Padmarak. Valka! I tried to rise, but my hands carved deep furrows in the mud, and I fell back into the mire with a wet smack. How long I lay there was any man's guess. That something jabbed me again. Givon? This time a question. I tried to turn. Mud caked the optic threads in my suit's mask, and it was a struggle to smear it away. A tall, grey-faced man loomed over me, leaning on a long wooden pole. He had the bald pate and hollow cheeks common to nearly every zook I'd seen, though he wore rubberized boots that went to mid-thigh over his faded coveralls. The drowned man breathes! Carry! said another voice this one higher, the voice of a woman or young boy. Quiet, the man said, nudging me with his pole. The drowned man is not drowned. The big man crouched, both hands still on his pole. Where is this drowned man from? They were not quoting the Lothriad at all, though they spoke the tongue of the Commonwealth. A man is of the Solon Empire, I managed to croak. The other straightened and staggered back a step. Solnechni? The drowned man is a knight, the other voice said. Again I tried to rise, again I fell. My head swam and pounded, and at last I settled for rolling over in the muck. I'd lost my cape in my fall. And my sword. My sword! I felt for the magnetic clasp at my hip. There was nothing. I had lost a Lorin sword, and the feeling drove my head deeper into the mire. Two faces peered down at me. One was a man's. The other was as indeterminate as the voice that belonged to it, that of either a strong-jawed girl or an effeminate boy. What should be done? The second asked, glancing at the taller man. The child could not have been older than fifteen standard. Living men are not salvage. Quiet. Look up, the man said thudding his stick into the mud after each word. A man thinks. A man visits Padmarak, I said, my Lothrian halting in my current state. I prayed I didn't have a concussion. A man was attacked by the Bahovni. A man fell into the river, the child called Luca said. The man carry frowned. Bahovni? His frown worsened. Are you rebels too? I asked looking from one to the next. Rebels? Looker repeated. There are no rebels, drowned man. Everybody knows this. A small R 
escaped me, and I felt myself sink even farther into the mud. That explained the absence of the Lothrian prefects. They'd been called off. Snatches of the battle on the bridge rebounded across the dark interior of my mind. The way the rebels had disguised themselves among the retreating mob, the precise way they'd moved, their disruptor shielding. They'd been as Lothrian as our escort. Why would the Lothrian government want me killed? They must know that to kill an imperial apostle was to court war. They couldn't seriously want war with the Imperium. And over what? The Rossan Belt? Persian expansion? They couldn't hope to win. Though the Commonwealth commanded great territory, they surely lacked the hardware and the manpower necessary to stand against our legions. Nothing in the crumbling brutalism of Vidatharad spoke to a nation that was master of a war machine to shake the stars. The Lothrians were ragged, starving, poor. Unless that too were a posture carefully cultivated, a moth-eaten cloak to hide tempered steel. With so much of the Empire's might concentrated in the centaurine marches, the Conclave surely imagined our defences in the outer Perseus and across the Rassan belt would be diminished. That in dividing the Imperial attention between two fronts, the Commonwealth might stand a chance at victory. They may have been right. That they would buy their victory by allowing the Sielsin to grow stronger in the Galactic East turned my stomach. The drowned man is dead? The man, Carrie, asked. I realized I had been still and quiet a long time. The child prodded at me with something short and silver, body tense as if to leap away at the slightest moment. Recognizing the weapon, I seized Looker by the wrist and half pulled myself into a seated position. Let go! Looker cried out. Let go! The big man struck me across the head with the butt of his pole, but my suit took the impact. Still, my rattled skull ached from the blow, and I held on tighter, slipping my hand from Looker's wrist to the hilt of the high matter sword. My sword. My fingers found the twin triggers, and the pentaquark barians that made up the blade lanced out, blue-white in the gloom. Looker yelped and let go, and it was only a mad backward scramble that kept the Lothrian from falling. Before Carrie could strike me again, I pointed the blade up at him. It was a nearly empty threat. I could hardly hope to stand as I was. From the pain in my head and the blurriness of my vision, I guessed I had a concussion. Stand down, I said, struggling with Lothrian's stilted grammar. A man is not another man's enemy. Liar, the child shouted, clutching a bruised wrist. I unkindled my weapon but kept the hilt ready in my hand. With the same hand, I thumped my chest. Hadrian, I said. There was no way to say my name is. I did it again. Hadrian. Apparently my point had gotten through, for the big man pointed at his own face and said, Carry. He pointed at his counterpart, who, wild-eyed and tight-fisted, looked now more like an angry boy than a young lady. Looker. You have names. I said, slipping into Galstani by reflex. It was all I could do not to laugh. What I'd have given to see Lorth Talig's face in that moment, to know for all his intellectual utopianism, his dream of a perfected Lothriad, that humanity was like a weed in cement. His ideals, and ideal future, may have been a boot stamping on human nature and dignity, but man's roots ran deeper still and would not be ground out. Sto? Carrie asked. What? There was no Lothrian word for name, no word for you or your. I pointed up at the man with my empty hand. Carrie, I pointed at myself. Hadrian. Hey, Drian, he repeated. My head swam badly, and I half fell back against the earth. I stayed that way a moment, vision clearing, my surroundings swimming themselves into sharper and sharper focus. I lay upon a kind of artificial shore, my feet still trailing in the brown water. There was no sky above, only a rust and lichen-streaked concrete roof bracketed with pipes. 
What light there was came in the form of antique diode lamps, dull and orange. A man's words are, Ne loth tara, I said, not correct. The relation between the word loth tara, correct, and the word lothriad were plain to see. I hoped whichever enterprising partisan had rewritten the Lothrian dictionary to form that particular association had been rewarded handsomely. More likely, he had met a firing squad and so transmuted his revision to eternal truth. To my astonishment, Carrie spat. Lothtara, Lothriad, he said. These are for the Pitrasnukni. The partisans, I said. These men... I gestured to Carrie and look at both. Azukni, Zooks? Carrie nodded. Looker padded around to stand beside the bigger worker. Let no man be idle, the big man said, a pathos and a bitterness in his tone that astonished me. It was the first line of the Lothriad I'd heard pass his lips. He gestured to a vehicle equal parts boat and sledge, laden with what looked like scrap, that lay half mired in the slime in which I myself lay caught. Looker and Carrie run salvage in wastewater tunnels. Scavengers. Wastewater. I looked round at the muck I lay in, glad then my suit's integrity had held. Insterquilinus in Wenitor. In filth it will be found. I tried to laugh. The bottom of the world indeed. Can the drowned man stand? Carrie asked. I tried again and Carrie threw out a hand to steady me. He was stronger than he looked. Not bulky, but wiry. It was enough to free me from the filth, but my vision blurred again, and I staggered forward up the concrete slope. I collapsed again, hands and knees, blood pounding in my ears. I clutched a Lorin's sword tight, mindful of the way the twin shadows of the man and his child loomed over me. I had to get back to the embassy, had to get back to Valka, to Krim and Polino, but I couldn't stand. I could hardly see. Must warn the others, I said, struggling to shove my thoughts into Lothrian's limited vocabulary. How could I explain that my friends were in danger if I couldn't express our relationship? People will die. Hadrian will die. Carrie said, crouching next to me. Hadrian is hurt. Lucas spoke up then. Magda could help. Magda? The big man echoed almost thoughtfully. Who is Magda? I asked, twisting to look up at my newfound companions. My vision swam. I was certain by then that I had a concussion. Carrie extended a hand. Doctor. Had I been fully conscious, I might have marvelled at how the method these Zooks had devised for working around the limitations of their language. The elimination of pronouns and direct address, of identity itself, was to give one another names. I would have wondered, too, at Magda. Looker and Carrie both were simple names, almost job descriptions. Magda was something else. It had an antique sound to it, not Lothrian at all. I took the big man's hand and, leaning on his staff for leverage, he hauled me to my feet. I tottered, forced him to steady me as I nearly swooned again, my right hand desperately clinging to a Lorin's sword. Must find water valve and hose drowned man off, Carrie exclaimed, laughing. The smell is foul. Safe inside my helmet, I couldn't smell it, but I was sure he was right. The slime that caked my armour and clung to me was, I felt certain, equal parts oil and sewage. Strangely, the big Zook seemed not to mind, but then I supposed he and the child spent their time in these tunnels and waterways, poling for scrap. We were beneath Vidatharad, deep in the tunnels that connected and predated the building of the domes. The ancestors of the ancestors of the Lothrians, who had first settled on Padmarak during the great outward expansion of mankind millennia ago, had carved these tunnels with explosives and cutting lasers and great machines. They had filled them and smoothed them with cement and steel and packed into them like ants, like the Sielsin in the dark dawn of their existence. Perhaps the very harshness of the tunnels and Padmarak's airless environment 
had forced them to turn to so extreme a set of social controls. Reflecting on those tunnels now, I cannot help but think of the Vuli, the blockhouses that dominated the cityscape, wherein dwelt the Commonwealth's uncounted trillions on this and a hundred thousand colony worlds. Hives indeed. Empty now, those tunnels were little more than bones, the fossilized remnants of what the Commonwealth had been in its beginnings. Its only inhabitants, the grave beetles and vultures, like Looker and Carrie, who fled there to escape the world above. Better to pick the bones of that awful place than live beneath the boot of the conclave and the Lothriad. There are no rebels, Carrie had said. That was not strictly true. He was one, his child another, though they fought no battles. Magda will help, Carrie said wrapping one of my arms over his shoulder to help me toward his boat sledge. Magda will help you. Chapter 17 The Adorator Carrie made good on his threat about the water valve. After he pulled us down the channel for some time, he took us up another slower waterway, relying on an outboard motor for thrust and his long staff for steering. There we stopped long enough for the big man to douse me in the jet from a fresh water main, to spray my armour and tunic clean of filth. I remember falling as the jet hit me. I don't remember being hauled back to Carrie's boat. In my damaged state, I drifted, addled mind confusing the dark sewer pipes for the rivers of light and time. There was another jet, another series of pipes, water draining, an ocean draining, a lake. I lay on the ground at Carrie's feet, feeling the torrent wash over me. I felt bones crunch beneath my feet, remembered hurrying down a slope as the tide retreated before me, heard the awful screaming of some monstrous creature of the deep. Its bloated mass loomed before me, tendrils flailing as it died. Innumerable bleary eyes focused on me and a trembling hand reached out, imploring. I reached out to take that hand and knew the monster in that moment. I blinked, gasped as Looker turned the wheel to stop the flood and the vision memory alike. Carrie hauled me to my feet. It was his hand I'd taken, and no monsters. I was on Padmarak. Padmarak. I had to tell Valka and the Council, had to warn them, had to save them. The Conclave was trying to kill us. They wanted to start a war. Would they be safe in the Embassy? Would the Commonwealth risk so flagrant an assault? It's not far now, Luca said, crouching near me by the gunwale. Not far. Dimly I was aware of the boat, of Luca watching me and Carrie looking down as he guided us down another channel. Twice we passed other zooks working on the pipes, or else plying their own way in the dark and doubtless foul-smelling waters. Jinan glared at me from across the small boat, eyes white with fury, the azure ribbon in her hair. I sat upright, tangled in the sheets of my bed aboard the Tamerlane, the smashed Myrmidon's helmet watching me from the bedside table. The woman beside me moved, and looking down I saw the bronze length of Otavia Corvo tangled at my side, naked as I was. She blinked blearily up at me. Can't sleep. She rested one warm, strong hand on my thigh. Corvo rose and kissed me. So startled was I that I sat there, paralysed, her tongue in my mouth, her floating hair all about my face. I awoke again, this time blearily, my vision thick and fuzzy as my thoughts. Other memories. Other lives. Dazed as I was and damaged, my mind flickered from memory to memory. Things that never happened and never would. I feared I would never find myself again, would wander lost in the memory of those other lives, other Hadrians, and never come back to that little boat. I needn't have feared. Help take this mask off, came a gentle feminine voice. 
I felt my helmet hiss open, felt warm, wet air on my face. A bright light tracked left, right across my eyes. Concussion, the voice said. Carrie says you are off Welder? She was speaking Gaustani. I am, I said. I am an emissary from the Solon Empire. We were attacked by... by liberalists. There are no liberalists, the voice answered. I know that now. A woman's face, smiling and matronly, emerged from the harsh pale light. She had a round face beneath a cap of short grey and black hair, not shaved like the other Zooks I'd seen. But she was a Zook. She had the familiar Lothrian black eyes, the same grey pallor. She wore the same grey coveralls. You must rest. I must get back and warn the others. Valka, the consulate, she pushed me down with firm hands. You must rest by God. She kept her hand on my chest. It will take days before you're fit to go anywhere. I don't have days, I said. Valka doesn't have days. If you go, Carrie and Luca will be fishing you out of the drains again before sunrise. She turned away and busied herself, spraying down a series of tiny, exquisitely sculpted fruit trees that stood in stepped rows beneath lamps. Despite their diminutive size, the fruit borne by a few of these trees was ordinary. Two apples ripened on one and three oranges on another. A third held a single pomegranate. Not that there is a sunrise down here. The room, blurred though my vision was, wasn't much larger than a city tramcar. A line of cots, each little more than a foam roll and a plank atop a metal frame, marched down one side. All but mine were empty. The side opposite was given over to the trees, which glowed beneath their pointed lamps. The walls were concrete, buried beneath layers of overlapping metal pipe and rubberized conduits. There were doors at either end. The place gave the impression not of a hospital ward, but of a power station or steam tunnel. What is this place? She looked at me, all Lothrian terseness. Clinic. You're Magda, I said. She did not deny it, nor had she really answered my question. Words slow and stumbling, I tried again. Why this place? The Lothrian woman cradled her spray bottle. Why down here, you mean? It hurt to nod. The guard don't come here, she said. Too deep, too old. They don't know the ways. As she spoke, she busied herself with a black plastic crate that had lain beneath the next cot. People come down. Nowhere else to go on Padmarak. They all drain down here. Some of them washouts like you. Some of them outcasts like your friends. Some of them just run away. Which were you? I was called, she said, and stopped fiddling with the crate to touch something through the front of her grey tunic. From the look of things, she had altered the Lothrian fatigues common to all the zooks I'd seen into a long tunic or loose dress that hung on her stick frame like burlap to a scarecrow. She reached into the box and drew out a white pill bottle. Magda opened it and shook three small pills into her hand. Take these. A Lauren's sword was still in my hand. What are they? Painkillers, she said. They'll help. I held her gaze so long as I could, but had to shut my eyes. I extended my free hand and palmed the pills dry the moment she gave them to me. Your... Palatine, yes? My eyes opened to mere slits, cautious. I decided a moment later that it was too late for caution. I had taken the woman's medicine after all. I am. My name is Hadrian. Palatines heal fast. Two days, maybe three. You'll be right as rain. Unable to help myself, I echoed, Right as rain? It was an old idiom, one that had survived to our time from the days of classical English. It had no place on this world that had never known English, or rain. Are you Lothrian? She had the look, 
The Lothrians were so distinctive, so monolithic, an ethnic group with their black hair and ashen skin, that I knew the answer before she said it. Yes. Where did you learn Gaustani? I asked. The Grand Conclave could not possibly want many of its people learning languages not censored and pruned by their ministries. Magda glanced toward the door in the back of the little ward. Father Dias, she said. God rest his soul. Twice now she had mentioned God, a word I'd never thought to hear from a Lothrian and certainly not a word I ever thought to hear on Padmarak, not least so deep in the warrens of the great city. Your father, I asked. No. She reached down the front of her dress and drew out a pendant on a thin chain. It was a cross made from two nails crudely welded together. He was a priest. Came here to... to help us. To help me help us. A priest? I asked, uncomprehending. Why would a chantry priest come to Padmarak? And what had he to do with a cross? I thought perhaps her Galstani was not so good. I remembered only slowly recognizing the antique symbol for what it was, the emblem of an ancient cult, one of the adorator faiths protected in the empire by ancient law. You're a museum Catholic? There were museum Catholics back home on Delos, but I had never seen them, never encountered their symbols in the flesh. I knew a little of their faith, had read the books of Dante and Milton on Gibson's orders as a boy, and though I knew enough to recognize the cross for what it was, I knew little of their ways then. Magda shook her head. I tried to be. Father Dias was. Here was truly a marvel, that twenty-five thousand light-years from Earth and twenty thousand years hence should be found beneath the domes of Vidatharada's single solitary devotee of a god who had been old when the god-emperor was young. By ancient decree, made to dwell on reserves like that which stood in the mountains above Maidwa. The empire had long tolerated, long segregated, such pagan mystagogues as the Catholics, the Vaishnavites, and the Theravada. The accords which protected them in the empire ran back to the Great Charter, millennia before the formation of the Holy Terran Chantry. Though why the Chantry had not moved to abolish these adorators, I dare not speculate. But we were not in the Empire. He's dead, then? I asked, too abruptly in my adult state. Magda nodded. He built this place, saved me, baptized me, gave me my name. She indicated the clinic all around. So I carry on. Help the poor rats carry and his like drag in. Helped carry too, him and his child. Her reticence as good as confirmed my guess that Looker was one of the Lothrian new men. Aren't you afraid you'll be found out? I asked. Magda fixed me with a glinty gaze, all iron. I'll not be the first to die in his name. I could only assume she meant her old god. Like your priest. Father Dias was baptizing us, giving us names, teaching us to speak the standard. Conclave didn't like that. Caught him when he went above to treat the sick. She glanced down at the crate beside me. They rounded him up, sent him away with the others. To the camps? I asked, thinking of Everfrost Station. He was a physician. Magda chewed her lip. He was. And I guess people disappear all the time, families, entire hives, could be the camps. She studied my face carefully, as if gauging me for my reaction. Could be they sell them to your empire. They say you palatines drink blood, that that is how you live so long. What? I almost burst out laughing. They say the blood of children keeps you young. It doesn't. I did laugh then and regretted it instantly as pain flowered in my skull. Genetic engineering does that. But Magda was smiling. Were you having me for a laugh? She bared crooked teeth, her smile lighting up her aging features. There are those who think the conclaves sell us off-world. They do take people then, I asked, 
thinking of how empty Vidatharat had seemed. All the time, she said. More and more. But it is only to settle new worlds. If he was not killed, Father Dias was sent to a Lacha offworld, a camp colony. She laughed softly. I do not think you a blood drinker. I winced, touched my exposed face with my gloved hand. You should let me take that armour off, Magda said, rising from the next cot to lean over me, her hands seeking my suit seals. Let me have a look at you. Acting almost without thought, I seized her wrist. It took me two attempts to succeed, and pointed the emitter of the high matter sword at her. No. Magda only blinked at me. There was little fear in her eyes. You may have other injuries. No, I said, voice flat, final. I'm fine. I'd have known by then if I had broken any bones, would certainly have known if I was bleeding into my suit. There would have been alarms, notifications on my helmet's display, and on my wrist terminal. There were none. I would have seen them when I tried to signal the others. Let me help you. I'm fine, damn you. The strain of half sitting up set the blood to pounding in my head. My vision blurred and I fell backward. Felt the sword tumble from fingers, suddenly nerveless. I whited out. Lost in white darkness, I could sense nothing. Even the pain was gone, muted. The effect of Magda's painkillers, I don't doubt. I existed as little more than one of Descartes' sad solipsists, aware of nothing but myself. It was like being dead, like nothing so much as my experience of the howling dark through which my soul had wandered before the quiet sent me back. How long I lay like that in Magda's clinic I dare not guess. Hours? Days? Time meant little through that pale haze. Once or twice I woke and found the Lothrian doctor watching me from the next cot, or else tending to her little fruit trees. Once or twice I heard her sing, though she thought me dead to the waking world. From all that terror teaches, from lies of tongue and pen, from all the easy speeches that comfort cruel men, from sale and profanation of honour and the sword, from sleep and from damnation, Deliver us, good Lord. The words were in English. That was the strangest thing. Did he teach you that? I think I asked her. Your priest. He must have done, though I cannot remember her reply. It seemed an appropriate song for the Lothriad. A prayer for a world that knew too much of lies and terror. Too much. I awoke screaming clutching my side. Blood soaked my fingers where I'd torn crude stitches open, sheeted down my side. When had I been wounded? When had I been stabbed? Magda emerged from the back room, already rolling her sleeves back. Lie flat, she shouted, slipping into her native Lothrian with panic as she scrambled for the plastic medical kit beneath the next bed. A man will die if not. It took an act of will to prise my hand away from the wound in my side. The wound, I had been sure, was not there a moment before. I pressed my head back against the pillows, jaw clenched, the fibres in my neck straining. Magda paused as she approached. What did you do? She peered at the wound. Nothing, I said honestly. I had no memory of her removing my armour, but I felt certain I'd have remembered so deep a wound in my side. This wasn't here before, she exclaimed applying pressure. I yelled. You tried to close this yourself, she said, examining the sutures. She looked around, face drained of colour. What have you done to me? I asked, remembering her story about the Palatines drinking blood. I rasped. What did you take? The pagan adorator meant to harvest my organs. That much was plain. Luca and Carrie had not brought me to Magna to save me but to kill me instead. Magnus stepped back, hands bare. Nothing. I was in the back. I heard you scream. My sword lay on the bedside table just at the edge of my reach. Why hadn't she taken it? 
I reached out to seize it, causing an ecstatic flash of pain to spasm through me as torn muscle pulled apart. Magda's hands seized me, trying to steady me, but it was too late. Mother of God! I heard her swear. But I was already fading. When I awoke next, Magda was nowhere in sight. Carrie sat against the wall beneath the ranks of little trees, arms crossed, head tucked against his chest. He was snoring. Fresh bandages wound about my chest from sternum to navel, so tight it hurt to breathe. I must have made a sound, for Carrie cracked an eye. A man wakes, he said. Magda says a man cut himself. A man did no such thing, I managed to grunt out, looking round. My sword still lay on the bedside table. Why hadn't they taken it away? If they meant to hurt me, as I thought, surely they would have taken away my arms as they had my armour. But there was my armour on the next bed. Catching me looking at it, Carrie said, Carrie had look a cleaner man's armour. Forgetting my Lothrian, I nodded weakly. Thank you. That too was not the action of an enemy. What was going on? Stiffly, I moved a hand to my wounded side, felt for the injury. What had happened? Magda says a man must stay longer. A man is unfit to travel. I took my hand away from my side and stared at it as though I'd never seen it before. What? I hadn't properly heard the man. His words caught up to me a moment after. No, no, I can't stay. I'd been speaking Galstani again and Carrie hadn't understood me. He shook his head, ran a hand over his prickly scalp. Magda brings food. A man has slept now for three days. Three days? I managed to prop myself on my elbows and was surprised when I felt no pain. Anything could have happened in three days. Had Krim and Polino made it safely to the embassy? Was Valka safe with Daemon Argyris? Was the Tamerlane safe in orbit? Carrie moved swiftly to my bedside and helped me to sit up. I waved him away. I'm all right, I said, and switched to Lothrian. A man must bring a man to the surface, to First Dome. Not until Magda says, Carrie said. I seized him by the front of his grey fatigues, all bleariness and pain forgotten. Please, a man's people will die. The big Zook peeled my fingers off his clothing with steady hands. A man must wait. He stumped away, vanishing through the outer door with a shout. Looker! Come and watch the drowned man! Alone a moment, I felt my dressings again, fingertips parting the pale linen. I expected to find the black tape of a medical corrective beneath, or sutures such as I'd found when last I'd woken up. But I was mistaken. There was no wound on the unblemished flesh. There was nothing at all. Chapter 18 Up Acheron Never seen a man heal so quickly, Magda said, finding me already in my suit and sitting up when she returned. Like its father, Luca had dozed off while it kept watch snoring softly beneath the fruit trees. It had been time enough for me to don my suit's black underlayment, the garment tightening into place as I activated its seals, smart material contracting until it formed a second skin. Thus the healer found me when she returned with four cups of egg noodles in some brown and subtly fungal broth. These I ate gustily, discovering I was starving, and small wonder— I hadn't eaten since the morning of the battle on the bridge, and not eaten well since we left the embassy for Everfrost Station more than a week before. Like I said, I said around an eager mouthful, we Palatines are genetically engineered to be... I almost said superior, but stopped myself. Well, to heal quickly. I wish you'd let me look at it, she said, pointing at my side with her plastic fork. I'll survive, I said mindful of the uncertainty in the woman's black eyes. She'd been watchful ever since I'd awoken her screaming with a fresh wound in my side. I knew she believed I'd harmed myself, 
as I had at first suspected some foul play on her part. When pressed, she'd produced a medical scanner, proved my kidneys and liver, my spleen, and all the rest were where they ought to be. Ever after, she acted as though I'd struck her, as though her fears were ludicrous and cause for offence. I'd apologised so much as I could, but maintained a careful distance. I couldn't let her examine my wound. I couldn't let her know it was gone. Vanished as readily and as without warning as it had appeared. I would have thought it only another product of my damaged brain and fevered dreams, like my vision of myself with Atavia, were it not for the bandages and the dried blood on my sheets. Unthinking, I felt my side with my hand. My right hand. The hand I'd lost and regained. Had something similar happened? Had my consciousness, my will, reached out across the parallel bands of time and seized another? Had I shut my eyes on one universe and opened them on the next? I imagined consciousness like the beam of a torchlight swept back and forth along a bookshelf, stopping to select one title, one narrative, and then the next. It was how the quiet had saved me aboard the Demiurge, trading the dead Hadrian for the living one, the man who had lost right arm and head for the man who had lost the left. My memories remained constant. I remembered my death not because the past had changed, the past cannot be changed, but because the present had been. The quiet had conjured up a state of Hadrian lost to entropy and cast it back into the world, produced it from behind the stage, from a potential state the universe would never have seen otherwise. The quiet had only nudged probability, altered the wave function about me until what had been lost in potential replaced what was. I had lived again. So too had I traded the concussed Hadrian for the wounded one, called out in my delirium, and found my wounded self. I'd made a mistake. That was how I knew I was responsible. The quiet did not make mistakes. When it left me without my left arm, it had known I would need bones of adamant there to survive my duel with Urshan. It had showed me all of time, but my human mind could not encompass it. But it had left me with a measure of its power and a fraction of its sight, however limited I was by my body. Seeing the gesture, Carrie asked, A man is all right? I took my hand away from my side. How had I done it? Was it some feature of the medicine I'd taken? Or had my trauma brought it on? I... I realized I was speaking the standard and switched to Lothrian. Duh. Let them think it was my palatine biology that had saved me. It was so much easier that way. There was too much I didn't understand, and more they would not. Turning to Magda, I spoke again in Galstani. Long ago another woman helped me as you have. I had nothing to give her. I have nothing to give you now. But I am grateful. I set the empty box of noodles down. How had this woman obtained them? Extra rations couldn't be easy to obtain, and despite the opulence of the greenhouses third chair had shown me, I found it difficult to believe all those beneath the conclave's bench ate well. Thank you. It was the right thing to do, Magda said. I stood suddenly, head clear. There was no pain. Whatever I had done in my delirium, I had escaped concussion and injury both, though I wasn't sure I could do it again. My suit gauntlets lay on the little metal table, and I clicked them into place. God sent you to me, Magda said, and touched her cross, as he has sent all the others. My tunic was a total loss, but my armour was clean again. I looked smaller reflected in the glass front of a medicine cabinet, without tunic or cape, with only my armour and the form-fitting combat skin beneath it. But I looked like myself, at least. Magda wasn't finished. You say you are a great lord of the Empire. Perhaps you are why he called me here to serve. To save you. I do not believe in your God, I said too harshly. But Magna did not balk or so much as blink. He does not need you to. Magda, 
I looked down on the pagan woman with a sad smile. I have not come to destroy your conclave. I am here to save my own people. To stop the Rugya. The what? She cocked her head. In spite of myself, I laughed. A weak, hollow sound in that place of metal and stone. She hadn't even heard of the Rugya, of the war that raged across nearly a third of the settled universe. And why should she? The Conclave would not wish the people to know what passed beyond their borders, for to them there was nothing beyond their borders. Could be nothing. The Lothriad was all, and though they knew of the Solon Empire of Jad and the Durantines, they understood these places only as fictions written by their Pitrasnuk masters. How could I begin to explain? I decided not to even try. I must go, I said, and taking her hands in mine, stooped and kissed them. You saved my life. I will not forget you. She accepted this without despair, and as I turned to follow, carry out the side door, she said, Lord Hadrian? I froze and turned to look back. I said no word. He has a plan for you, I think. My God. Why should those words haunt me so? There were bodies in the water. The slow current moved them toward us as Carrie's little boat carried us upstream. Once or twice the big Zook lifted his pole and shunted one aside as it drew near. Some were men, others women, others too far gone to say. One wore a black skin suit beneath torn grey fatigues. There was a band tied about his arm, white and red. I fancied that here was one of my attackers from the bridge, but he could have easily been from some other altercation in the city above. Conclave guard, Carrie said, jerking his chin at the man. Secret police. Often such men are wearing the colours of liberators. Why? Panovni. Rebels shoot people. Party protects. People love party. He shrugged. We sailed on quietly for some time after that. The only sound, the faint whine of the boat's engine. Luca trailed a length of pipe in the water, watching its little wake. Once we passed a pair of men wading across a broad waterway on stilts and carrying large nets on the end of poles. Carrie saluted with his staff and they returned the gesture, but no words were exchanged. Mean though their existence was, there was hope in it, in people like Magda and in her faith to her old god, hope that all that mighty edifice of cement and brutal steel might one day come crashing down. For all their ingenuity, the architects of the Commonwealth and authors of the Lothriad had not broken the human spirit. Their boot might tramp on men's faces for a day, a year, or an age, but in the end, it would be the foot that broke. How many live down here? I asked the ferryman. Carrie thought about this a long while. No man knows, he said. Thousands? More? Many? He shrugged again, his usual gesture when frustrated by the limitations of his crippled tongue. Less than when Carrie was young. Patrols come through main tunnels, clear men out, take men away. Magda said the patrols take people to the work camps. More and more, came the reply. The trolls used to take one man, too, for re-education, for off-world. Shrug. Now patrols take ten, twenty. Take men from above, too. I nodded, ran a hand over my eyes. Little could I remember being so tired or so sick with worry. I prayed to Mother Earth or Magda's God or to some other power I couldn't say, prayed that Valka and the others were safe. Polino and Krim might have won the battle on the bridge, might have driven the convoy back to the embassy themselves. They might be dead, said another, softer voice. It was all too easy to picture the embassy tower afire, all too easy to imagine the telegraph broadcast by a fleeing Tamburlaine. 
Lord M. missing, presumed dead, embassy destroyed, consul dead or captured. War. War. War, I muttered. A truly ancient word, unchanged from the golden age of classical English, and hardly changed since the Hyperborean times, when man was young and dragons ruled the earth. Stop, Luca asked, turning to look at me. Voin, I said in answer. If the conclave has attacked the Solon embassy, it is war. I reflected that despite my words to Magda, my visit might spell the beginning of the end of the Commonwealth. Another accidental prophecy. The child frowned at me and asked in broken standard, Your people kill conclave? I looked at the hermaphrodite in surprise. It was the first time either Luca or Carrie had shown any signs of speaking Galstani. Perhaps Magda had shared a word or two. I studied Luca's face for a moment. The child still trailed its length of pipe in the water, but was not looking at it. Luca's Lothrian black eyes blazed with a light I had not seen there before, the fires of revolution and of hope. Maybe, I answered. Maybe not, Carrie grunted, having evidently understood enough of the standard. His voice was thick with the pessimistic realism of age, in stark contrast to that of his child. He pointed then over our heads, up the dark tunnel before us. Slipping back into his native Lothrian, he said, First dome is not far. Ahead, a low, broad arch opened on a broader watercourse, and the darkness seemed more grey than black. Wall sconces flickered dull and orange, and the slime of eons shone wet and black on the walls and on the curved ceiling above. A man must watch for patrols, Luca said, shifting to look back at me. On the surface, eyes will be everywhere. It would be no easy feat finding the embassy once I was in the city proper. The Lothrians had done all in their power to obscure the plan of their city from foreign visitors. I envied Valka her perfect memory and wished terribly that she were with me. I dared not try to contact her, for any transmission I might send was sure to be overheard by the Lothrian police. And, if what Carrie and Magda said were true, if it was the Lothrian government itself and not their liberalist bogeyman who had attacked my party on the bridge, I could not afford to be overheard. I would have to move quickly. I knew the look of the embassy tower. It was one of the tallest buildings in First Dome, and close to the People's Palace in the centre of the district. But the nature of the streets was strange to me, and I had no way of knowing if I were climbing up right beneath it or on the dome's far side. Almost I thought I should abandon my armour, travel in the greys of a common zook. But to pass for one of the low-caste workers, I would need also to shave my head, and I had no way of doing that then and there. As Carrie pulled us closer to a rickety metal strand on the far side of the arch, I tugged my suit's coif up over my grease-matted hair. It cinched tight. The bigger zook killed his boat's motor, and he pulled us the rest of the way to the dock. Rope in hand, Luca leaped onto the dock and tied the boat in place. I clambered over after the child, less steady on my feet. My boots clanked on the metal decking, and I looked round. Not far beyond our little dock, the water came rushing down the gentle incline of a spillway, through an opening far above that might have been a hundred feet wide, where the waters of the artificial lakes of First Dome drained below. For a moment I stood there, looking to neither Looker nor Carrie. I was remembering another waterway, another city, another life. Tell me a story, would you? One last time. Wet cement, lichen, rot, refuse. The smell was the same, the same as that awful culvert in Borisivo where Cat had died. For the moment I stood there. The stench drew a bright, straight line from Padmarak to Emesh, and I was a boy again, and Cat was dying in my arms. Adrian Mann, 
Carrie's voice intruded, and looking round I saw him pointing along the narrow path that chased the wall of that vast culvert to the base of the spillway. There is a door. The stairs will take a man to the city. Thank you, I replied in Galstani, certain then the man knew that much at least. The big fellow raised a hand. Peace be with you. Those words were English, and were certainly words he'd learned from Magda or from her priest. I had not stopped to consider the man and his half-homunculus child were members of the doctor's ancient faith. I suppose they must have been. Not knowing what to say, knowing there was little peace on my road, I only echoed him, saying, Peace be with you. Then, alone again, I turned away and made my way back to the world above. My own story was not yet done. Chapter 19 The Turn of the Screw Grey darkness lay on the great city, and the sky beyond the Arcology Dome was thick with cloud. Compared to a Norman or an Imperial city, it was remarkable how dark that darkness was. Few lights shone in windows, and fewer on street corners. Here and there a ground car trundled past, or one of the military police vans. I took to the shadows, never stopping, never standing still. I felt certain it would be only a matter of time before city security noticed me. And I felt more certain still the Zooks and Pitrasnooks alike were the subjects of a curfew whose threshold was long past. Carrie's stare had brought me to a kind of park on the edge of the dome. I hurried along the edge of the reservoir lake beneath the shadows of block monuments carved with relief images of the people at their work. Farmers with hand scythes and builders with mallets. Factory workers with wrenches and welding masks. The mouth of the spillway yawned behind, a literal gate to the underworld, to the old world whence the Commonwealth had sprung. Two times patrolmen saw me. I lost the first one leaping down a stair between two hive buildings, and the second by hiding myself among bags of refuse that lay in a back alley awaiting the street sweepers. There I hunkered a long time, not wishing to kill the man who'd seen me. I knew I needed to move toward the palace ziggurat in the centre of the dome, where the greatest towers stood. But in the dark, and at that distance, I couldn't recognise the Solon embassy. It was going to be harder than I thought. I could not risk the use of my suit's comms. Someone was bound to intercept and overhear, and to backtrace my signal to its origin. To me. Hiding among the trash, I remembered another night in Borisivo. I remembered Rain and Cat calling out to me from the rooftop. Memories so remote, so ancient, they felt almost to have happened to someone else, as though my own history were the life of some character on a page. At length I hurried on, jogging through the dark. My helmet sealed once more, my suit forced air into my lungs. I half crouched as I moved from the shadow of one pillar to the next one hand ever on the catch, to activate my shield. An unmarked car slowed on the road beyond the colonnade, and two men got out. They weren't revolutionaries in red and white, but conclave guardsmen in matte black, armoured and faceless. They were hunting me, I knew. City security had got its bead on me at last. The cameras were everywhere. It was possible they didn't know it was Hadrian Marlowe they hunted. Possible they thought me some true insurgent in breach of curfew on some seditious errand. Possible, but not likely. Fear is a poison, I told myself, tamping down my quickening heart. Adrenaline, cortisol, all the toxins of fear and stress. Perhaps they couldn't see me, veiled as I was in the shadow of the square columns. A shot flared, disruptor fire fizzling against the stone at my left ear. Too much to hope for. I thumbed my shield catch and ran. Shouts in Lothrian chased me, echoing down the colonnade, and shots crackled against the stone as the guardsmen pursued. 
The streets ahead stood empty as I burst from the end of the colonnade, though barriers high as a man divided the two sides of the highway from each other. I skidded to a halt in the end of the colonnade, scanning frantically to either side. Spied a step bridge at my right that crossed the highway and led deeper toward the heart of the central district. Booted feet pounded up the walkway behind me, and I took the stairs two and three at a time, stumbling in my exhaustion and ill-fed state. Making the top of the bridge, I slumped a moment against the rail, and looking back saw the black shapes of three conclave guardsmen approaching from the other end. Not truly having a plan, I tugged a Lauren sword free of its hasp and hurried across the narrow bridge, long shadow flapping on the empty highway below. The bridge comprised a single span of paved steel without arch or pillar to support it. As I neared the far side, I kindled my Jadian blade, high matter throwing white-blue light in the lamp-lit gloom. The police had made the top of the bridge behind. A disruptor bolt caught on my shield and died. I raised the sword and slashed through the narrow span, carving through rail and paved top and the steel beams that supported it. The Lothrian prefects yelled as the bridge bent and crashed to the highway below. I wasted no time. I leaped the stairs entire, fell thirty feet to the street on the far side of the highway. I unkindled my sword without flourish and padded on. Dead ahead, the palace rose like Bruegel's tower, level upon level until it touched the glassed in sky, its marble heights ghostly pale in the cloud-bound night. Water dripped from gutters and collected on the naked masonry of buildings. Litter papered the streets. Here was part of the district we off-worlders were never meant to see. Unlighted signs promised coffee and liquor rations. Above another sombre door was writ the word Lothtarsemya, right birth. A board beside the door promised obstetrics, state prostitutes, women and new men, and disposal. I did not linger to dwell on these questions. Ahead the buildings grew taller, Square towers, windowless or with flat slits, no more than a handspan wide. A broad avenue arced round to either side, encircling the palace. The embassies were all on such a circular avenue, though I had no way of knowing if it were this street or any other. How I wished then that I might run my vision forward, following some other Hadrian from my place to the proper door. When I had stood upon the quiet's mountain, I had seen all of time, every moment possible and actual. Standing there, I must have seen the way I had to go through that grey city, but I had only memories left, broken and insufficient, and though various storefronts or street corners felt familiar, I didn't know the way. I was not on the Quiet's Mountain. I was in Vidatharad, and the clear path was lost. What visions of the future remained to me were buried in unconscious memory, Fragments burned there by amygdala and prelimbic cortex, as my vision of the battle on the bridge had been, by memory of expected crisis. I turned left, tore across the beltway at an angle. Before I'd gone a hundred yards, I heard a siren wail in the distance, and the street lamps flared brighter, shading from orange to vivid white. They were meant to blind me, but my suit's end optics cut the glare. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Every shadow was banished by that blinding light, as though I stood upon the margin of an atomic's blast radius. They'd found me, which meant one thing. I'd nothing to lose. Marlow to embassy! Marlow to embassy! Valka! Argyris! Anyone! I kept running, fingers fumbling with the controls on my suit's wrist terminal. It was possible the Lothrians were jamming all signals, but I felt certain that so near the embassy, inside the same dome, I had to get through. Marlow to embassy! I'm on Avenue... I spied a passing sign. J! Avenue J and 138th Street, moving clockwise. Pursued by the Conclave Guard. Is anybody there? The wail of the siren came closer. I kept running, waiting, straining for a friendly word on the comm. They're all dead, a little voice whispered. Ahead, two of the prefect vans swerved into sight. Lord Marlow? A clipped tone sounded in my ear. The legionary polish clear in his voice. 
Turn right next chance you get. We're at Avenue H and 137th. You're close. Close. I almost laughed, and seizing the next lamppost, used it to slingshot myself around a corner. I heard the grind of the police van's spherical wheels as they yawed around, overshooting my street. The empty fronts of what looked like cafes yawned at my side. Here, I imagined, were false shops and eateries propped up for foreign visitors, more fresh paint tossed over decay. But the buildings all were empty. I reached Avenue I as one of the riot vans skidded to a halt before me and a half-dozen guards spilled out, grasping disruptor ones in armoured fists. I didn't stop, only changed angles to run round behind the van. One of the lawmen moved to block my path. I leaped, pointed my knee to slam him in the chin. He toppled back and I tumbled into a messy roll and regained my feet before the other guards could close. The other vans barreled after me, sirens screaming in the night. I wasn't going to make it. Images of being rammed from behind by the guard's van played in me, and I hurled my shoulder at the nearest door. The plate glass cracked, shattered on the third attempt, and I fell over the threshold into an empty cafe. Scrabbling to my feet, I staggered around the bar and into an empty kitchen. White floor, white walls, steel counters and benches. There had to be a back door. There! Shouting and the sound of feet filled the room behind, but I burst out through the door and turned left along the back alley toward Avenue H. Strange to see a back alley in such a city so clean, but there would be no trash, as there had been no people. Magda's and Carrie's words about how many had vanished into the camps or into starships bound off world played in my head, and I steadied myself against the wall of the far buildings as I limped on. I had only to turn right on the avenue and hurry back counterclockwise several blocks. Valka, I rasped. Is Valka? I've sent a man to fetch her, Lord, the embassy man said over the comm. Lord Damon's on his way down to the lobby. You have to run. Thank you, soldier, I said, unable to keep the razor's edge from my tone. The man went quiet. I turned right. A solitary light shone at street level six blocks away along the bend of the avenue. I broke into a dead run. Not far. There were armoured soldiers in the white and red of Solon Legionnaires in the door. I didn't stop or turn back. Here! I shouted, voice amplified by my suit's chest speakers. Here! Here! The men hurried forward, their lances tucked and ready as they moved to meet me. I thought I heard the sound of feet on the sidewalk behind, fancied I'd heard the squeal of wheels as the guards' vans swerved onto the avenue. I clapped one of our men on the shoulder as I hurried by, and I stumbled climbing the short stair to the doors of the Solon Embassy so that I fell across the threshold, chest heaving, burning from the effort. Rolling over, I looked back out through the open doors. There was no one on the street behind save our door guards. The vans were nowhere to be seen nor any man of the conclave guard. Avenue H stood empty, as if there had been no pursuit at all. My lord, came the unctuous tones of the consul Argyris, his words and address and an imprecation both. What in earth's holy name is going on? Ask the conclave, I gasped, finding my knees again. We were attacked returning from the ice mines. Argyris put his hands in the pockets of his velvet robe. We know... Your man Polino told us all. Polino's alive, I asked. And Krim? And the others? Six dead in your guard, but the two officers are here. More came from your ship when you went missing. We've been trying to coordinate with the Conclave Guard to search the city, but they've been stonewalling us. They would, I said, triggering my helmet to unseal. They're behind it. I peeled my quaff back from my hair and glowered up at the man, ragged in my fury. Argyris stuttered. Lord Marlow, that is, that is a dangerous accusation. You're damn right it is, Argyris. Now be silent, I bellowed. And such was the force of my voice and my conviction that the hairy giant of a man stepped back as if I'd struck him. Even gasping on the tile, my reputation could freeze the blood. In much quieter tones, a trick I'd learned from my lord father, I said, I know what this means, but I know I'm right. They were trained men on the bridge. The consul waved this away. The liberalists. There are no liberalists, 
I sneered. You know that as well as any on this planet, and don't play the fool. Hadrian! I looked up at the familiar voice in time to see a black streak speed across the checkerboard floor. Valka went to her knees beside me, arms about my neck. I embraced her in return. You're alive, she said, and kissed me full on the mouth. We thought... I know. She didn't have to say it. I returned her kiss, more gently on the cheek. Squeezing her hand, I said again, I know. Looking over her shoulder, I saw more figures standing in the arch that led to the lift lobby. Polino stood there in red company fatigues, looking tired and more like the old Myrmidon I'd met on Emesh than the patrician soldier he'd become. Krim stood beside him in matching undress reds, his black boots half-fastened. The swordsman had evidently just woken up. Between them in red and black, her tunic jacket over one shoulder, her floating yellow hair, its customary cloud above her chiselled face, was Captain Corvo. "'Brought in the cavalry, I see,' I said to the room at large. Valka nodded and sat back on her heels. "'When you... when we thought... I called Otavia down. We've been trying to work with the Lothrians to find you, but, like Argyris said, they wouldn't let us out to search.' I chewed on my tongue a moment, deciding how best to carry matters forward. I realized I'd bent so much of my efforts on returning to my people that I'd left little thought for what I'd do if I made it there. I had no proof the conclave was behind my attack, except... The guard followed me all across town, shot at me. It was all I could do to find my feet then. Valka helped me rise, and they drew back before I got in sight of the embassy. It was evidence of a kind, if not a kind satisfying to men like Damon Argyris. Yet it was a tacit admission of guilt. If the guard had thought they were pursuing an ordinary breach of curfew, they would have pursued me to the gates of the embassy. And would they have sent such force? Would an ordinary jaywalker or young lover out for a tryst merit so many men? They knew it was me they were chasing. You can't be serious. Argyris said, taking a few steps nearer. What earthly reason could they have for such a thing? Attacking an imperial apostle. It's an act of war. I fixed Argyris with my flintiest glare. I'd had time to ruminate on this and more on my boat ride through the waterways beneath Vidatharad, and I'd reached no true answer, only more troubling questions. War, I said patting Valka on the arm to extricate myself from her embrace. If they wanted war, Lord Consul, they'd simply firebomb this building and send a fleet across the Russian belt. I turned away. They may still do that. There'd be no cause for this ruse with the terrorists if their object was war, said Otavia Corvo, pushing into the lobby. Why bother? I shook my head. I was meant to disappear. This is about me. Valka and the others were silent. Argyris held my attention with wide eyes as if waiting for me to say more. When I only stood there, letting the silence stretch, the consul, ever the sort of man uncomfortable with quietude, cleared his throat. About you, what possible reason could the Grand Conclave have for kidnapping you? Perhaps they've heard the stories about me, I said, thinking of the footage of my miracle at Berenike. Perhaps they believe they are true. I felt certain that recording had found its way across the light years to Padmarak. In the Empire it was said that Lothrian scientists were ever prying into the secrets of the human mind, chasing sensory mechanisms whereby the ancient dreams of telepathy and psychokinesis might be realized. The Scoliasts were quick to deride their efforts as pseudoscience, but all the same, it was no stretch to imagine the Lothrian Navkaburu. Their science ministry might be all too happy to dissect my body and brain in an effort to learn my secrets. Had not the emperor himself told me, after Thermon, that much of his reason for sending me to Nessus in semi-exile was to prevent me meeting a similar fate under the knives of the Chantry's choir and its cathars? For a moment, I wondered if the Chantry itself might be behind this latest attempt as well. It was said they had some influence even in the Commonwealth, though how that might be I could only guess. 
Perhaps they traded secrets with the conclave, acting in their role as scientists and researchers, not as priests and judges. Or perhaps I'd become paranoid in my old age, if it was paranoia to suspect the hand of an institution that had conspired to kill me on no fewer than four occasions of abetting a fifth. But no, suspecting the Chantry's hand in this, so far from earth and forum, didn't pass Occam's razor. I recall Ninth Chair's question from our first meeting with the Grand Conclave. Why does the Solon Emperor send this man, he'd asked, his voice given the unanimous consent of the chairs. Why does the Red Emperor send a warrior to Padmarak? How could I have been so blind? Damon Argyris dabbed at sweat, beading on his forehead with a silk kerchief produced from one sleeve. What are we to do? My mission is a failure, I said simply, turning my gaze on Otavia. We will make sail for Nessus immediately. You mustn't, the consul exclaimed. I only glared at him. I will telegraph the Emperor myself. The Commonwealth will not help us. They are not to be trusted. Polino! I turned my attention to my old companion, who stood straighter, his training taking over. Have your men pack our effects. We return to the Tamerlane at once. At once? Argyris said, taking a step nearer. My lord, it is the middle of the night. At least wait till morning. My lord, I said, repeating the style not out of politeness, but with an edge to emphasize our difference in rank. I will not wait on this world a moment longer than necessary. You would be wise to do the same. Argyris threw out a hand to store Polino's departure. Ever obedient, the old soldier lingered in the marble arch that led back to the lifts. But this is madness. We must speak with the conclave. Surely there is some explanation for all this. Go, Polino, I said, overriding the consul's objections. The one-time Myrmidon saluted and vanished through the arch to the lifts. Turning to Otavia, I said, How many men did you bring with you? She didn't hesitate. Twenty. The remnant of my guard makes thirty-four, plus Krim and Polino. Then you, Valka, myself. Where's Torvaro? Return to the Tamerlane, Corvo answered, with two guards. I did the arithmetic. Lord Consul, you will arrange vehicles for thirty-seven. Now. But, my lord, this is so irregular. It's the middle of the night. You've only just returned. You're still rattled from your experience on the bridge. Shell shock. Shell shock, I repeated, and might have spit acid on the tile there and then. Shell shock. Hear this now. You will find me those transports, Argyris, and you will find them now. I stopped just short of threatening the man. Argyris was already shaking and sweating furiously. Had I put so great a terror on the man? The Lord Consul began nodding, but changed to start shaking his head as he started to speak. But, my Lord, we have no vehicles. The Commonwealth does not permit off-worlders free travel within the city. You know this. Rage is blindness, I told myself, and checked my breathing. You mean to tell me that you've no vehicles, no ground cars, no flyers, no chariots at all? Commonwealth law does not permit it, he said. I told you, no one travels in Vidatharad without an escort. I had to shut my eyes, hooked my thumbs through my shield belt. Then it seems you get your wish after all, Lord Consul. Contact the Lothrians, tell them we need transport. I drummed my fingers against the belt and the hasp that held my sword in place. I did not hear feet. Now! From the shuffle of slippers on tile, I knew Lord Damon Argyris had gone. You're sure it was the Lothrians behind the attack? Valka asked. In answer, I gestured Krim close and said, I want your men ready. We may have to seize their vehicles. If they don't attack us first, the assassin replied. Siege the embassy? I said. How many men are on station here? In the embassy? Krim frowned. Five hundred legionnaires on staff, another fifty in Argyris's personal guard. I felt myself shaking my head. They'd not try anything so flagrant. Certainly not with the Tamerlane in high orbit. Though saying that aloud, I felt certain the Lothrian home fleet would be more than sufficient to overmatch one imperial battleship. 
even one so formidable as the Tamerlane. Something of that thought was written in Captain Corvo's face. Krim rummaged a moment in a pocket of his fatigues and handed me a slim black phase disruptor, its firing slit dark and quiescent. What's this? I asked. You lost your sidearm, boss. He cocked one canted brow and glanced at the empty gun holster on my right leg, behind the sword hasp. I hadn't even noticed. Must have lost it in the fall. I took the offered weapon. Don't you need it? Krim tapped the side of his nose. Oh, I've spares. Before I could holster the weapon, the former mercenary proffered a dark red something wrapped in wax paper. It was one of his gel candies. Cherry boss, he whispered conspiratorially. For your breath. I'd of course not been in any condition to care for my teeth, not in several days. Suddenly self-conscious, I took the candy. Argyris will be back before long, I said. Krim, rouse the men and help Polino get everything in order. I want the whole party ready to move in twenty minutes. When he, too, was gone, I sank into a high-backed chair at the base of a fluted column. Are you all right? Valka stood over me. She was dressed plainly, loose trousers and an old pullover shirt, blazoned with the marks of some Tavrosi musical act in faded phosphorescent colour. She'd not been sleeping. You should get ready to move, I said, and spread the injunction over her and Corvo alike. You'll need your suits if we're to make the shuttles. I'll go, Corvo said, laying a hand on Valka's shoulder for a moment. Valka gripped it with a strained smile. Thank you, Tavi. The captain vanished with Krim and Polino. Alone a moment, Valka said, I thought I'd lost you this time. Reaching up, I tugged on the chain that held Valka's phylactery about her neck, the one that contained a sample of my own crystallized blood. Never. Polino returned first with our luggage and five of our men. No longer alone, Valka returned up the lift to ready herself. More of the soldiers reported in, with Krim and Corvo bringing up the rear. Typical civil service, Polino grumbled. Always bringing up the rear. Figures we'd have the whole unit ready to roll before the consul flounced back down here. It won't be long, I said. You sure it would a conclave on that bridge? Polino asked. Rather than answer him, I said, Something's not right here. Can't you feel it? There's a lot not right here, the old Myrmidon replied. With a sigh that betrayed every one of my 340 years, I found my feet. Where is Argyris? He's been gone long enough. We hadn't long to wait for the answer to that question. The consul emerged from the lift, still sweating and puffing like a man three times his weight, a trio of aides in tow. He seemed surprised to find my people together and outfitted for the journey so quickly, but took it in stride, pausing only to dab at his beaded forehead. The Lothrians are sending a convoy. They'll be at the back gate in twenty minutes. I checked the time. It was nearing the fifth hour past midnight. The sun would be rising before long. The back gate, I asked. City curfew ends in about ten minutes. Traffic is about to pick up. They don't want us blocking the road while we load up so many. Damon Argyris cast his eye over the assembled Red Company legionnaires. Otavia Corvo spoke up. We'd best get down there, then. Krim and Polino took charge of organising our retreat through the lobby of the embassy, past the reception desk, empty at that hour, and the blast doors to the guard station behind. The men were grumbling and making jokes the while, carting the luggage or shouldering packs of their own. "'Ain't nothing to see on this rock, Otho,' said one. "'Would have liked some fresh air is all,' said Otho. The first answered him, "'Ain't you heard? No fresh air neither. That's recycled lovery and wind you're huffing. Shut up, Galba, not in front of his lordship and the lady.' Valka hid a smile behind her hand. "'Can it, the lot of you!' Polino barked when we descended an escalator and passed through the broad main hall of the conference centre. We'd arrived at the embassy following our first visit to the People's Palace and the Conclave's arena by the same route. Ahead stood a series of glass doors that opened on an underground carport, accessed by a winding ramp that allowed vehicles on and off the avenue above. 
Past the last conference rooms to either side, the hall split left and right, and ran the length of the great building, leading to lavatories and side stairs that fed back to the lobby above and to the higher floors. I've radioed your shuttle pilots and alerted them, Argyris was saying, shuffling along just ahead of me in his slippers. They'll be ready for you when you arrive. He paused a moment, turned back, nearly causing me to slam into him. Are you sure I can't persuade you to stay, Lord Marlow? You've hardly been here a month. Progress is slow on Padmarak. I'm sure the chairs can be brought around. I didn't stop, but brushed past the console toward the glass doors. I will not stay on Padmarak a minute longer than I need, I said. The conclave had tried to capture me, had tried to kill my men. I hoped, by hurrying to leave quickly, I could clear the city before my enemies had time to act. I was being reactionary, I knew that. But whoever had ordered the attack on the bridge, and my arrest as I crossed Vidatharad that night, had not counted on me reaching the embassy. They would be reacting too. But there must be some explanation for all this, Argyris exclaimed. My lord, I have lived here for decades. At the head of the column then I was nearly to the door. Valka and Corvo at my sides, Polino just behind. I rushed past the last set of conference room doors and reached the carport lobby. That was when I heard it. The unmistakable whine of stunners being primed. I felt iron fingers tighten about my heart and squeeze adrenaline into my system. Thus heightened, I looked to either side in disbelief. Thirty Solon legionnaires stood in either branch of the hall, disruptors set to stun. They were fully shielded. Knowing I was trapped in the crossfire, and worse, knowing Valka was too, I did the only thing I could. I raised my hands. I'm sorry, said Lord Damon Argyris, Imperial Consul on Padmarak. I have my own people to think of. They said if I didn't turn you over, they'd torch the building. Without turning, I said, They're still going to torch the building, Argyris, you damn fool. They won't, Argyris said. Tell your men to put their guns down. Very slowly, I rotated on the spot, found the bulk of my men armed and shielded and drawn into defensive triasses in the hall behind. Not in the direct line of fire as I was. They'd have more time to react. But even as I turned, I saw more legionnaires in embassy livery hurrying down the hall from the front lobby. We were well and truly surrounded. You're dead, traitor, I said to the consul. The emperor will not stand for this. The emperor need never know, Argyris said, strangely less nervous now his deception was in the open air. I will write for him and say that you were killed in a terrorist attack. Nasty bunch, those liberalists. Through the doors behind I heard the rumble of ground cars. Knew the sound well enough by then to know it was not the quiet purr of diplomatic vehicles. It was the heavy grind of Lothrian armoured vans. They're early, Argyris said almost brightly. He clapped his hands once and advanced for the doors. What did they offer you, Argyris? I asked, turning to follow the Cyberite's path, dropping my hands. All this for your harem? Your slaves? Your comfortable little life? Argyris spread his hands. Not so little. I told you I've lived here for decades. I understood. This was no spur-of-the-moment betrayal, no mad scramble of the desperate civil servant to safeguard his position and his life. How long since they bought you? I asked, looking round at the consul's men. Do they know? What did you tell them? Don't talk about things you don't understand, my dear lord, he said, but gave neither answer nor excuse. Beyond the glass doors, conclave guardsmen came pouring out. There must have been a hundred of them, at least so many as there were soldiers in Argyris's retinue. You are a dangerous man, Lord Marlow. Is it true you wish to seize the throne for yourself? So that was it. That was how Argyris had convinced his men to turn on the Emperor's own apostle. He'd convinced them I was the traitor, not himself. Always accuse the enemy of what you're doing.
I snarled and moving with palatine agility, faster than the consul's plebeian guards could track, I drew Crim's pistol and fired. The disruptor crackled, its red bolt striking Argyris full in the face. The energy burned his nerves to carbon, tore skin and scorched it. The treasonous consul fell dead without ceremony or another word. Drop your weapon! Drop your weapon now! A dozen of the embassy guards cried at once. Sure that the stunner bolts would start flying at any moment, I did just that and placed my hands on my head as a knot of the soldiers hurried forward to secure me. Near enough to the traitor's corpse, I spat on it. Chapter 20 The Amazon They forced me to my knees. One soldier stripped me of my sword while another stood with the slit of his stunner pressed to the back of my head. Beside me, Valka was similarly relieved of her plasma repeater and made to kneel. Corvo sank to both knees without protest, hands on the back of her head. I thought this mission was taking us away from the combat, Marlow, she said dryly. So did I. I could not imagine what the Lothrian government would want with me, but I felt certain it was me they wanted. I suppose they could have sent my corpse and footage of my execution back with a declaration of war, but... Like I told Argyris, realising it all too late, if war had been their aim, they'd have done as well to torch the embassy and there'd have been no cause to go to all this trouble apprehending me. Order your men to stand down, the man at my back said and jostled me with his weapon. Through the doors ahead I watched the Lothrians square up, standing at attention while their imperial puppets attended to their prisoners. I said, order your men to stand down. Not turning my head, I said, You're making a mistake, soldier. You killed the consul, the man barked. Traitor! Traitor? Your consul betrayed the empire. What I did was justice. While I spoke, I stared at the disruptor-scarred corpse that had been Damon Argyris moments before. I was too angry to regret my actions. I spoke fast, all the while fearing a blow or a stunner blast. You're the one about to turn a royal Victorian knight over to the Commonwealth. Look in a mirror, you damn fool. That seemed to catch the fellow's tongue a moment, and in his hesitation I saw a glimmer of hope. Ahead, the glass doors slid silently open, admitting the damp of early morning. A man entered flanked by two of the conclave guard. He wore the formal grey and red of the Lothrian military. High black boots, grey tunic and trousers with red piping and cords, and a long grey coat that trailed almost to the floor. He wore a ceramic helm in lieu of a hat, its brow painted with the Lothrian black star. Without having to be told, I knew the man was a party commissar, as like to our knights as anything in the Commonwealth. He surveyed us coolly with those familiar black Lothrian eyes. The enemies of the people will be brought low by unity and resolve, he pronounced in his native tongue. By charade and subversion, more like, I thought. On behalf of the conclave, the delegation from the Solon Empire is under arrest. He peered down at me, lifted my chin with one hand. Here, I guessed, was the man who had commanded the attempt to catch me that very night. He glanced down at the body of Damon Argyris. Koyatranya, he said. What a waste. The Lothrians had called off their pursuit as I drew too near the embassy, doubtless to maintain an air of deniability regarding my account. But when Argyris had called and made his offer, my head for his continued comfort, I could only assume, he had removed the need for such deniability. And I had removed Argyris. The commissar barked an order to his own men to disarm mine and take us into custody. The conclave guardsmen advanced toward Valka and Corvo and myself, while the embassy guards still tried to disarm our column. Take the delegate and the delegate's companions to the car, the commissar said. The chair will want to speak with the delegate at once. Guards moved forward with manacles for me and the two women. In Galstani, hoping the commissar wouldn't understand, I addressed the legionnaire with the stunner to my head. He's going to have you all killed. I said. 
The man's stunner dug into the back of my neck, but he didn't fire. The only way you have off this planet is with me. Lothrian soldiers forced Captain Corvo to stand. Two patted her down, duplicating the efforts of the legionnaires who had disarmed her already. They moved to shackle her, even as I was dragged to my feet. Otavia Corvo was having none of it. Since she joined on Pharos, Corvo had been a bridge officer, captain of the Mistral when Bassander had run the Red Company, and captain of the Tamerlane after my ascension to knighthood. I had not seen her in a fight since the Pharos affair. The giantess slammed her forehead down into the Lothrian's face with enough force to stagger him even through his helmet. I heard the fellow swear even as Corvo gripped his head in both hands and smashed her knee up into the officer's face with enough force to crack the tempered glass. The man hit the ground before any of the others had the sense to train stunners on the captain. But Corvo was only getting started. Whirling, she seized a second Lothrian by the throat and lifted him bodily into the air hurled him squeaking across the tiled floor. A stunner bolt struck her, fired by the Lothrian or Legionnaire, I couldn't say, but Otavia didn't stop. She struck another of the Lothrians with a precise elbow to the face. He went sprawling, his disruptor rifle skittering away. The commissar reached for his own sidearm, but Corvo snapped a kick that caught the fellow's hand as he raised it to fire on her. A second stunner bolt caught her between the shoulder blades, but Corvo only snarled. Turning, she keyed the switch to activate her shield. I did the same. I had long suspected that Otavia Corvo was not truly human, that somewhere in her family's Norman past someone had bedded a homunculus, some giant bred for labour or for sport. Here was the proof. No ordinary human could take direct fire from a stunner like that at such close range. I had weathered glancing blows in my time, but not even a palatine could withstand such a shot. The myelin insulating Corvo's nerve cells must have been truly something. Shields up! I shouted to Volker and to all who'd hear me, and I snatched up the disruptor I'd used to kill the consul. Spinning, I rounded on the man who'd taken my sword. Give it to me, I said, pointing the weapon. I don't want to hurt you. The soldier hesitated head tracking between me and the Lothrian commissar, locked in a hand-to-hand -hand contest with my Amazon of a captain. I do not have time to argue, soldier. Give me my sword. When still the fellow didn't move, I shouted, They are going to kill all of you if you do not stand with me. Now! I holstered Krim's sidearm, extended an empty hand. About us, chaos was circling in wider and wider spirals. Confusion tugged at the embassy guards as they were torn between their consul's final orders and the obvious reality. Between the Empire and the Commonwealth. Strel, Strel! the commissar exclaimed, staggering back from Otavia's onslaught. In so doing, he made up the legionnaires' minds for them. Shoot! The conclave guard trained weapons on the shielded legionnaires, and fired. My captor and I stood for a nanosecond in the eye of a terrible storm beneath his cloud of indecision. It broke. He handed me my sword. Turning, I keyed the command that closed my helmet up over my face and kindled the high matter blade. Polino, Krim, I shouted over the general line. To the vans! They're our only way out of here! A Lothrian soldier ran at me and fell dead with a knife in his throat. Aye, boss, came Krim's reassuring tone, and glancing briefly back I saw the Norman standing fast by Polino and a knot of our men. He'd drawn his sword. Ahead, Corvo lifted the commissar by the lapels of his long coat and tackled him to the ground. Her fists fell like hammer blows, and when she stood again, breast heaving, it was with blood on her hands. Captain! I tossed her Crim's disruptor. Sword in hand, I didn't need it. Corvo caught the weapon and offered me a short salute. Forward, your dogs! Polino shouted, a voice lifted above the din. Side by side, Corvo and I pressed for the door. The Norman giant tugged her suit's coif up over her hair as she went, ducking as shots streaked over her head. The Lothrians pushed forward, shattering the glass with handheld rams. One of the conclave guard rushed forward, eager to get inside my shield curtain, his rifle raised. Perhaps he had never seen High Matter before. I raised my sword. He fell. For earth and empire, I cried out. 
seeking to stoke the same flames of patriotism Argyrus had abused. For the Emperor! But the Lothrians had made the embassy guard's choice for them. They fired without discrimination, without care, and where before there had been two imperial companies at one another's throats, there was but one. To the right, Krim said, slicing through the neck of a man who'd come too close. Front of their convoy! Valkus, stay with me. I reached out a hand for her, afraid the stress might trigger another of Urbane's seizures. She swatted my hand aside and shot a Lothrian peltast in the chest. She'd recovered her old Tavrosi service repeater, and the weapon chimed as it fired three plasma rounds into the man's unshielded chest. Many of the Lothrians wore no ceramic, but ballistic jackets over anti-disruptor skins. Unshielded as most of them were, a cost-saving measure, I guessed, they were almost defenceless against plasma fire. Teeth clenched, Valka shot another. I'm fine, she gasped, following after me. Watch those stunners. Down, down! Shouts in standard and in Lothrian filled the hall and the echoing carport beyond. Corvo, Valka, and I made it through the doors, shattered glass crunching beneath our heels. I took the arm of a Lothrian officer who came too near, stabbed another through the heart as he moved to tackle Valka. The Lothrians had come in more than a dozen of the blocky armoured vans that had pursued me through the streets. Each was painted matte black and was large enough to field ten men, two in front and eight on benches. Their rear doors all stood open and a line of soldiers with ceramic tower shields held the ground between. I'll take them, I said. Imposing as those shields were, they were no match for high matter. All around the Lothrian police were firing gas canisters and the air was filled with smoke, where plasma had set the building afire. Corvo grunted and stuck fast by my side. As we closed on the Lothrian line, she ducked her shoulder and struck one of the shield-bearers with such force the man flew ten feet and slammed into the nearest van, knocking the wind from him. My high-matter blade sheared through the nearest riot shield and the man behind it. Shock and terror welled in the men about, faceless though they were. They staggered back, realizing their heavy medieval shields were useless before Corvo and myself. One man dropped his and fired on me, disruptor bolts crackling in the air between us. A shot caught him in the side, and looking back I saw Polino with a knot of our Red Company men pushing out into the carport. We need to radio the shuttles, he said. Tell them to be on their guard. We can't get a signal out of this dome. We need to evacuate the embassy, I countered. All these men are dead. Our Jiris may as well have shot them himself. No time, Polino replied. My job's to get you to safety, Haid. The old soldier drew up beside me and jerking his head in the direction of the foremost van said, We have to go. I lingered, torn as my captor had been between hard choices. I don't know the way to the shuttle port. Do you? I do, Valka said and tapped her forehead. Tis all here. Where's Krim? I asked. As if in answer a knife felled another of the conclave guard not twenty feet away and looking back, I saw a huge wave of imperial soldiery force its way out of the embassy basement. The last line of Lothrian resistance started to break and run for their vans. A hail of plasma and disruptor fire chased them across the carport. Corvo seized me by the shoulder. We have to go. Into the first car, now. No, sir. No, my lord. All business. I unkindled my blade and followed, taking Valka by the wrist. Corvo leaped into the open rear doors of the police van and shouldered her away into the front compartment. I heard a muffled cry and the faint cough of disruptor discharge. Then the body of the driver was booted without ceremony through the hatch to the pavement. Corvo's coiffed head re-emerged from the front compartment as I leaped into the rear of the van. I'll drive. I'll help, Valka answered and squirmed through to take the passenger seat beside the captain. I turned to give Polino a hand up as Krim piled him beside with half a dozen men in tow. I'll try to raise the ship and the shuttles once we clear the dome. The tunnels may be insulated, but it's worth a try. Very good, I said, and lingered a moment at the hatch. Our men were fighting their way aboard several other of the vans, but just as many were in Lothrian hands, and no help was coming for the rest of the embassy. They're going to die. We have to go, boss. Krim said, reaching out to close the door. We have to go now! 
I raised a hand to stop him slamming the door, but Polino put a hand on my shoulder. There's nothing we can do with a hundred men, lad. I swore and turned away even as the van surged to life beneath us. Up and right, came Valka's voice from the front, then left onto the avenue. Crim and Polino slammed the doors on madness and dead men. I had to take hold of one of the straps hanging from the ceiling to steady myself as Corvo took us screaming round the ramp. The van yawed wildly, skewing on its spherical wheels, and slammed into the wall of the ramp as we cornered. We're fine, Corvo insisted, taking us onto the street. The rear compartment had no windows, though there were firing slits in the back doors. Narrow, horizontal hatches, just wide enough for an officer to poke the muzzle of a rifle or phase disruptor through. I slid one of these back and watched a second police van lumber out of the ramp tunnel and onto Avenue H. Take this to 87th Street and turn right, Valka shouted. That'll take us out to the edge of the ring district, then left toward the bridge. I pushed through the press of bodies to peer into the driver's compartment. Corvo sat to the right, both hands on the wheel. Valka half crouched in the seat beside her, pointing out through the windscreen. The others won't know how to get out without us, I said, meaning the other vans. Tell them it's right onto 87th until we hit the reservoir, Valka shouted. On it, Krim said. Polino put a hand on my shoulder and turned me. What the hell is going on? I sagged against the bulkhead that separated the driver's compartment from the rear and removed my helmet. Shaking my head, I said, The Lothrians want me. I can only imagine it's... Something to do with... with what I can do. They know about all that. The other man put a hand on my shoulder, steadied me as the van swerved through traffic. I looked from Polino to Krim to the half-dozen faceless soldiers watching through their helmets. They asked why I was sent of all the Emperor's men. They must know something or suspect. They might just want to hold you hostage, Krim put in. Keep you on the table for some counter-offer. Keep negotiating. Maybe, I said, bracing myself against the wall as the van shook. I think their ambitions run deeper than that. I held Polino's gaze a long moment. The Myrmidon had been one of a precious few who had seen me die. Valka and Basandolin had been present by that lakeside on Khan Sagara's ship when Prince Aranata Otiolo had cut off my head. I think they know what I can do and I think they want it for themselves. I had no way of knowing if the changes the quiet had wrought in me were something a surgeon could glean from my bones, much less replicate. I had not been willing to submit to medical examination since the mountain on Annika, precisely for fear they might discover something too tempting for the Empire or the Chantry to resist. If the Emperor had marginalised me for my own good, exiled me to Nessus, the Lothrians had no cause for similar forbearance. Well, we can't let them get you, then, Polino clapped me on the shoulder. Bang! Something struck the van with enough force to hurl us men against the far side. Polino pushed me off him, swearing as only Polino could. The hell was that? Krim asked, adjusting his bandolier. I pushed my way past the others and slid one of the firing slits open. I could only see directly behind us, but there was the crouching black shape of another police van closing in. What hit us? Krim asked, coming up beside me. Not the van. I strained to look sideways, caught sight of the rear of a smaller black vehicle keeping pace with ours. It must have rammed us from the side. Trying to drive us off the road, I muttered. What? Krim asked, straining to see himself. Before I could answer, a high-pitched whine filled the air outside, and despite the roof above our heads, I felt the instinct to duck. Bright light, white and cold, shone through the open slit. I threw an arm across my face and squinted. I could just barely make out the pinpoint diodes of running lights as the small aircraft hove into pursuit. Men stood on flying platforms, hands gripping the control bar, feet bracketed into stirrups. Chariots, I hissed. The chariots kept spotlights trained on us, as they opened fire. The armoured van shook. We're not going to last long like this, I said. Half the city's after us. Chapter 21 
Hero's End. Hold on! Otavia growled, slamming on the brakes and slewing the van to the left along another of the great avenues that encircled the palace at the heart of the city. What are you doing? Valka asked. The waterfront was that way. We're not going to last two minutes on the straightaway, the captain said, teeth audibly clenched. Otavia's gamble paid off. The armoured van pursuing us overshot our turn, and only one of the smaller cruisers managed it. The second collided head-on with a civilian vehicle. The men on the chariots braked hard, repulsors flaring as they backpedalled and hurried after us. Move over, Polino said, thrusting the muzzle of his plasma burner through the slit and taking careful aim. He fired and a shot of violet plasma streaked out, illuminating the still dark street. For an instant, the nearest flying charioteer vanished in a nimbus of white and gold as the plasma cooled on impact. But the flyer came on. Earth's tits, he swore, firing again. Bastards shielded. The charioteers opened fire, peppering the hull. A stray shot passed through the open slit and blew apart against one of the legionnaire's shields. The man swore and ducked, covering his face. Wish we brought a lance, Polino said dourly. Next right, next right, Valka exclaimed, voice going high. Two of the men caught me as I turned to peer through the hatch to the front compartment and nearly fell. As I stood, I heard Corvo say, That was close. What happened? I thrust my head out between Corvo and Valka's seats. Hit someone, came Valka's answer. I had to brace myself in the hatchway as Corvo talked us round the bend, feeling the ball wheels grind underfoot as we rotated 90 degrees onto what I guessed was 85th Street. Except... That traffic was rushing toward us. Neunjetat, I swore. Quiet, Corvo said, voice dangerously calm. Ahead of us, the mounting traffic of the early morning's commute panicked and parted to either side. Warning horns filled the air. Rather than argue, I reassured myself that our van's armour would be sufficient to weather any impact. Surely they won't fire, Volka said. They'd hit their own people. As if on cue... Another hail of bullets fell from the chariots behind us. Evidently that the good of all was the good of each was a maxim that ran in only one direction. We hadn't far to go. I could see the steel fencing that marked the waterfront and the overlook to the great reservoir that made up the outer regions of First Dome. Ahead, the line of a monorail that connected the Vuli blockhouses about the outer perimeter to the central district slashed across our street at an angle and it was only another five blocks to the end. Another hail of bullets peppered the rear of the van. A stray shot slammed against the inside of the windscreen, making Valka jump. "'Man down!' said one of the soldiers, and turning I saw another of the legionnaires had collapsed with a bullet in his throat, leaving a red streak down the inner wall. His suit had tightened automatically to staunch the bleeding, but it was too late. "'Barrow?' said one of the others, crouching over his fellow. In the wounded man I recognised a soldier I'd fought with a dozen times. He'd done time as one of my personal guard on and off for decades. I crouched beside him and took his hand. "'Shield must have failed,' said the other soldier, and I recognised the man, Galba. "'Anyone got a beta canister? We can stop the bleeding!' But it was too late. The bullet had torn through his windpipe and out the far side, lodged in the far side of his suit's underlayment. He was beyond saving. I tried to calm myself, to find the quiet clarity that allowed me to see time unfolded. For a moment I saw two barrows, four, eight, sixteen, but there was no river of time down which the fellow's lifeblood was staunched. I quested farther, looking for something, anything that might avail. I tried to reach out as I had in my concussed state and change the world entire, to find a barrow who had not been shot. Each passing fraction of each passing second drove those lines of potential farther from the shores of the reel. I glimpsed far off along the shoreline where reality broke like a wave, a point where the bullet had struck just an inch to the left and spared his breathing. I reached for it, but even as I did it slipped away, further and further as the wounds set in. I was not the quiet only its hand. Small as I was, I could not save him. 
like the galleth blossom that withered, Barrow's life was gone. We need to do something about those damn chariots. Corvo's words brought me crashing back to the present. The single present. Polino was looking at me, brows drawn down. What? I asked him. He shook his head. Another hail of bullets struck the van and Crim slammed the firing slit shut, too late to save Barrow. If we open the doors, I might be able to get a knife in one, he said. No good, I said, standing. We'd be wide open. I cast about the rear compartment looking for something, anything to avail us. There wasn't much. Benches ran down either side, each with the space to seat five officers. A rack that once had held the guardsmen's rifles stood behind the driver. But behind Valka's chair, above Barrow's body, there were rungs. Rungs and a hatch in the roof. A terrible idea formed in my mind, terrible but so mad it might work. Help me get this hatch open, I said, nodding to it. What are you going to do? I'm going to climb onto the roof and draw fire. I tapped my belt. My shield's rated for three kilotons. I've got the charge. Should keep them off the van for a while. Krim threw out a hand to stop me. What are you going to do, boss? Wave your sword around? Something like that, I said. Valka poked her head around from the front. Have you lost your mind? I'm not letting anyone else die over this, I said. Did not say over me. Thrusting a finger at Barrow's rapidly cooling corpse, I said, All those men we left at the embassy are dead. Everyone is dead. You don't know that, Valka said. The van shook. Corvo swore again. Almost there. She meant the waterfront. If they're not dead, they'll be shipped to labor camps. The Commonwealth can't leave any witnesses to this. They tried to make me disappear, but it didn't work. They've overplayed their hand. They're desperate. Let me do this. I did not wait for her to object, but leaned forward and kissed her. I paid no mind to the others for a fleeting instant. A single sterling second. For that narrow space of time, everything dropped away. The deaths, the Commonwealth, the Cielsin. Everything. I drew back and nodded out the windscreen. Help Corvo drive. I'll be back. And then I turned and leaped over poor Barrow's corpse and opened the hatch. The wind of our passage whipped at me and knocked my coif loose. Black hair streamed in the wind as I tugged myself up onto the broad, flat surface of the roof. Crouching like a boxer to steady myself, I stood tall and defiant as I was able. I had not said I love you. That was the worst part. A wave of bullets shattered against my body shield, sending fractal coruscations flickering in the grey air. All about us, the roofs of lesser vehicles, grey and white and tan, rushed by. I threw an arm across my face as another barrage flashed about me. Atavia struck a passing commuter, and I lurched to one knee. For a moment, all was still, and looking up I saw the two charioteers draw back, contemplating their plan of attack. They knew I was shielded, knew their guns were useless. They'd have to adjust tactics. I had not drawn my sword. I didn't want them taking into account the fact that I wanted them to come closer. I felt sure they'd try. Where had the other van gone? The rest of the conclave guard? There was no time to ask such questions. One of the charioteers accelerated, swooping toward me. He meant to ram me, to knock me clean off the roof of the van and onto the street below, precisely as I'd expected. Precisely as I'd hoped. I leaped as my enemy closed and wrapped my arms around him and the control column of his chariot. The impact was enough to knock the wind out of me, but I held on tighter. My feet dangled free, and I fought to overcome the sensation of falling. My quarry was not so level-headed. The chariot depended on balance, relied on the placement of hands and feet to keep the craft stable and upright. As the charioteer flailed to disentangle himself from my clench, he released the yoke and the whole chariot tumbled down. I managed to land on top, the yoke and control column between us. Only then did I unsheath Sir Aloran's blade, and moving quickly, placed the emitter against the side of the charioteer's armoured head. His visor had shattered in the fall. 
I remembered his solitary black eye, shining at first, then dull. The pedestrians about me screamed and drew back, and it was only then I realized they were there at all. Petrasnooks, to judge by their suits and robes. They watched in horror at the murder in their midst, and at the off-wilder in his finery. I had confirmed in that moment so many of the fables the party told of the Solon Empire. I had even stooped over the poor fellow like a vampire drinking blood. I had no time for soliloquies. The other charioteer had not peeled off to catch me, and our van was speeding away at several miles an hour. I kicked the chariot free of its owner's body and got my feet in the stirrups. The repulsors whined as I leaped into the air in pursuit. At rest, a man could stand upright in a chariot, his feet in the stirrups, controlling direction by his lean. At full bore, I leaned forward as on a skiff or bicycle, hands pushing the yoke as far as it would go. I'd not ridden one in eons, but the things were built to be intuitive. By pointing my toes, I drove myself upward, and so came down on the other charioteer from below. The poor fellow never stood a chance. Wounded, he flew at a sharp angle and crashed into the face of the nearest tower. Ahead, Atavia had made the waterfront. I overshot on reaching the end of the street and wrestled a powerful sense of vertigo as I flew out over the reservoir a hundred feet below the level of the street. In the distance, I thought I saw the opening of the spillway by the perimeter of the dome, and beyond that, the awful tundra and the wastes of Padmarak. Above it all, I had a moment to contemplate the lay of things. Corvo had perhaps less than a mile of road between her and the entrance to the tunnel back toward Eleventh Dome and the starport. The bridge was near, the same lonely span of concrete that passed the mighty sluiceways that had run fat with water to impress us when we'd arrived. The water was barely a trickle then, a thin, sad stream like the spit of a long-neglected fountain. It was not the bridge I'd fallen from, but it was as good as. Looking back, I could see all the way down the radial street to the high wall that surrounded the People's Palace, and I could see the palace itself, a narrow slice of it at least, surrounded by the high square towers of Vidatharad. I half expected to see smoke from the burning embassy, but if the Lothrians meant to firebomb the block, they'd not done so as yet. I never learned the fate of the men we left behind. I pray at least one made it to the warrens beneath the city. A man who could speak Galstani plainly might be precisely the kind of man Padmarak needed most. A man who had a name. I dove hard after the van, marking as I fell the trio of black cruisers in pursuit. To my astonishment, there were none ahead, nor any on the bridge as Atavia turned. I fired on the cruisers and broke their tight formation. They scrambled over the pavement, struggling to ascertain the source of their threat. I looped around, took aim at their tyres. The smaller vehicles had ordinary wheels and not the huge spherical ones the vans relied on. I caught one and the car flipped, rolling, bouncing like a cast-off shoe. One eye shut, I squinted through the reticle and fired again. Click. Empty. Nothing for it. Spurring the machine forward, I dropped low until I was almost at road level, streaking just above the tops of the passing cars. Corvo had made the bridge, and was turning at last onto that straightaway and the approach to the steel arch and the gates that led to the highway and freedom. Only then did I understand why the guard had not moved to cordon off our escape. I had forgotten the gates, and the gates were closing. Why they were not closed already, I couldn't begin to guess. Perhaps the guard had been overconfident when their commissar brought his men to the Solon Embassy on Argyris's invitation. Perhaps word had been slow to reach the keepers of the gate. Perhaps they had not known how we planned to make our escape until that very moment. I can't say. But the gates were closing. Go! Without my helmet or the ability to touch my wrist terminal, I couldn't communicate with the others. Go, go, go! I was not sure if I spoke to Corvo and Valka or to the iron horse I rode, but hardly ever in my life had I prayed so fervently for so little. For so much. Go! I was gaining. The mighty portal was grinding shut on mechanisms little oiled and much neglected. 
I dropped then to the level of the pavement, pushing the chariot hard as it would go to close the gap between the van and me. The conclave guard came hard behind, sirens screaming in the pale dawn like the loose hounds of some pagan hell. The whine of the repulsors drowned out everything, even my scream. A thousand feet. It might have been light years. Corvo pushed the van to its limits. The mighty armoured beast ground over the pavement, leaving black stripes where it passed. She was so close. They were so close. The doors were nearly shut. A slim sliver of orange light stood between their jaws, a narrow slit growing narrower still. It was the eye of a giant's needle, but a needle all the same. And Atavia Corvo threaded it. The van scraped by, leaving paint, I felt certain, on either side. They'd made it. Go! I screamed, and knew that I screamed for Valka and the others, because I knew I would not. Still, I leaned almost flat, driving the chariot forward fast as any arrow. I let my vision stretch, blood pounding in my ears as a million million gates ground shut before me. On I stared, seeking one somewhere in time that stalled, faltered, failed. My chariot struck the bridge beneath me, jarring me back to myself. The whole platform wobbled beneath me and I clenched my teeth. The vision collapsed like a pane of shattered glass, leaving only the blood music and a dull ache behind my eyes. No use, I thought. Too late. I was going too fast. A thousand feet remained. Three seconds. Not enough. The door ground shut. I could not turn away in time or tilt to break. I leapt free of the chariot instead, momentum carrying me into the heavy steel door with a noise like a terrible gong. The chariot struck the door below and a dozen feet to my left. Relatively light without a driver, it bounced and caromed over the side and into the water far below. Dazed, I slid to the tarmac, my back against the door. I'd taken too long to get my bearings in the air. I'd wasted too much time. Damn your eyes, Marlow, I cursed, keying my terminal. Valka, Valka, it's me. But there was no answer. Could be no answer. The dome was sealed. No signal was getting in or out. For a moment, I entertained the thought of leaping into the reservoir again but I knew that with prefects on chariots, they'd track me before I could swim a hundred yards. There was nowhere to go, and so I did the only thing that seemed suitable. I stood up and drew my sword. Half a dozen of the smaller conclave guard cars screamed toward me, one of the riot vans in hot pursuit, and further off I saw the glare of four charioteers knifing through the air above. If I could get to one of them, I might win free. I entertained thoughts of carving my way out through the dome and driving the chariot to the shuttle port. It was the only way I saw. Always forward, I muttered to myself, tugging the coif back over my head and tapping the button inside the neck of my breastplate to tighten the metamaterial before I put on my helm once more. There was no point trying to cut through the gate. I knew its thickness, and knew also that if I carved a piece of it large enough to admit me, that I wouldn't have the strength to move it, much less the strength to run the length of that subterranean highway to catch up to Volker and the others. I had only to pray they might escape, and to pray also the Lothrians truly did want me alive. From the Tamerlane, Corvo and Valka might launch a true attempt to rescue me with ninety thousand soldiers at their back. But I would not go quietly. I would not go gentle. The masks and helms of Nipponese knights were fashioned like snarling demons, like ogres and other fell beasts, with feathered mustachios and eyebrows, their helms bristling with horns. The Sielsin, often as not, wore masks that left their horns exposed to vacuum, for their bony hide was bred to endure the titanic emptiness of the dark between the stars. On earth of old, it was said a thousand tribes and kingdoms put on the skins of lions and wolves, or painted their faces unholy colours to frighten the enemy. We Solans, like the Romans, our forebears, 
had chosen the serene faces of gods. It was with just so serene a visage that I stood alone upon the bridge, my grim face concealed behind my mirror-black mask. I checked my shield in the corner of my eye. All systems still blue. Good. Every second I stood upon the bridge was a second I diverted at least part of their attention from the others. If I truly was the object of their desire, then all the better. The cars all ground to a halt, half turning to fan out across the width of the roadway ahead. Men in the faceless matte black of the guard piled out, levelling stunners at me. Others pumped gas launchers and fired canisters in arcs over the heads of their brothers. They clattered about me, hissing like a den of snakes, belching their poisonous fumes into the oppressive air in noxious grey-green clouds. Safe in my suit, I smiled. One fell at my feet, and I kicked it scornfully aside, kindling my sword with a flourish. They all opened fire at once. Breaking left, I charged the line, weathering stunner fire as I came. Two men hunkered behind the right-hand door of the nearest car, using its armoured steel plate for cover. I raised the high matter sword and brought it down like a headsman. The pentaquark blade sheared through steel and ceramic and flesh alike, and the two men fell. Turning away, I dragged my blade through the front of their car, chewing through frame and fuel reservoir. I had only seconds to leap away as the fuel cell ignited and the blast wave hurled me back, slammed against my shield as the whole vehicle went up in flames. The blast carried me into the bridge's rail, and this time I didn't fall over but stood, shaking off the ringing in my ears. Between the others and myself, the flaming hulk of the destroyed car stood burning, belching black smoke to mingle with the white and poisonous green of their gas. Through that noxious fog, a stray shot caromed off my shield, and I lurched behind the burning car. I heard muffled shouts in Lothrian, but I couldn't make them out. Crouched behind the rear of the burning vehicle, I saw the shadow of one of the guards cast dancing on the pavement before me, and with a roar I stood, blade cleaving the stock of his stunner in two and severing his left hand. The man staggered back and fell, and before I could follow through, two of his fellows leaped at me. One seized me about the waist and the other grappled with my sword arm, trying to immobilise my wrist. Struggling thus over high matter was often lethal to both parties. It was so easy to talk one's hand and drive the peerless blade through self and enemy alike. But my left arm was free, and I drove my elbow up and back and cracked the man who held my waist in the visor, rattling him. With him momentarily stunned, I dragged my knife from its belt sheath and punched it into the man's padded flank. His armour weave took the brunt of the blow, but the blade was sharp enough and wielded with enough force to pierce the soft flesh beneath the floating ribs. It was enough to slacken his hold, enough to gain a moment to bring the knife to bear on the other man. There was no armour in the joint of his arm, and the blood ran free as he released his grip on my sword hand. The high matter fell like the hand of fate, and spinning I cut through the first man as four more came around to face me. I leaped and slid across the hood of the next cruiser, blades slashing through the windscreen and the far door as I went. The man there avoided being decapitated by mere inches as he fell backward, crawling away. Ignoring him, I cut the car's wheel in half with a single stroke and advanced, half ducking as another barrage crackled against my shield. Stunner fire. They were still not trying to kill me. I worked my way up the line, moving from the left side of the bridge to the next, sketching a scarlet maze on the drab grey pavement. Three more men fell in another of the vehicles before the others started to retreat. Peeling off down the line, retreating up the bridge, I raised my sword. Run, you dogs! I shouted fury for Barrow, and the other dead, hot in me as my fear for Valka and the others ran cold but they had run to a purpose. A hail of bullets rained about me, pocking the cracked road top. The charioteers had closed in, and the shine of their drive lights came so bright, my suit's optics had to polarise the glare. I weathered the onslaught a moment and dove behind the nearest parked car. I heard the noise of safety glass crunch and metal deform beneath that heavy rain, then the whine of repulsors dopplered as the charioteers streaked overhead. They would be shielded, and I had no weapons save knife and sword, 
and neither would avail. But there was one of the dead men near to hand, his armoured fist still clutching his disruptor rifle. Unkindling my sword and sheathing it, I leaped for the dropped weapon and snatched it up, left hand fumbling with the face settings, still holding the knife. The indicator swapped blue for red, and tucking the thing to my shoulder I squeezed the trigger, aiming the best I could. The charioteer slew to one side, Crimson Bolt missing him by whole feet as he returned fire. My shield's charge indicator shaded blue to yellow in the corner of my vision. I grimaced. Strong though the Royce barrier was, it would not hold forever. The nearest charioteer had slowed, orbiting me as he fired. I fired back. The red charge of the disruptor washed over the man's shield. Useless. Swearing, I cast the thing aside. I was never going to defeat four shielded flying charioteers with a disruptor rifle. Not in a million years. But I could still render them impotent. Cavalier though their fellows had been about firing on the people, I felt confident these fine fellows would not fire on their own. Slamming the dagger back into its sheath, I swept free my sword and charged after the retreating members of the guard. Palatine as I was, I gained swiftly, but before I'd closed half the distance I drew up short. Not one, but three of the riot vans had parked further down the bridge, their back ends facing me, their doors thrown wide. Thirty members of the Conclave Guard stood firm, advancing as a block behind their tower shields. Though I knew my sword could make short work of them, I couldn't stop the sense of numb terror that rose in me. So formidable was that sight. They advanced in lockstep, each man carrying neither stunner nor gun, but a heavy ceramic baton with a head like a medieval mace. These they beat against their shields, creating a din like the noise of drums. I settled into a low guard and thrust my sword in line. I couldn't fight thirty men and win, but I might engage them all the same. The words of an oath I'd sworn so long ago floated back to me in the Emperor's voice. Do you swear to see its end, any course begun? I do. I shifted my footing mindful of the chariots circling me. They held their fire now, operating, I guessed, under new orders. Looking past the block of men advancing to me, to the white-lit interiors of the van, I saw the jacketed and helmeted figure of another Lothrian commissar, standing arms crossed and admiring. He was indistinguishable from the one Otavia had killed, as though our defiance at the embassy had never occurred. I was alone. But I had stood alone on Berenike, on Are, and, before that, before Prince Aranata. I had not forgotten how to die. I had not forgotten how to stand, either. When the battle line had come to within twenty of me, I charged. No Lothrian I'd seen had worn adamantine armour or carried high matter themselves. The shields I could see were carbon fibre and ceramic, as the ones the men in the embassy carport had used. I slashed them to ribbons, but even as I did, the edges of the block rushed forward to entrap me. I was surrounded. By dead men. Outnumbered as I was, outpositioned as I was, the Lothrians could not face my sword. They fell around me in awful pieces, or staggered back slashed inches deep. The space about me was a charnel horse, the pavement slick with gore. Behind me, one of the conclave guards smote me with his mace, and so terrific was the blow that I went to one knee, head ringing. My helm had spared me the worst of the trauma, but still I saw double. There were hands on my arms, my shoulders. Howling, I stood and whirled, and three men fell dead. Still more leaped on me, and I slipped on the blood-soaked concrete. My blade scored the road top, and I tried to roll. "'Hold the man!' came a distant voice in shrill Lothrian. The commissar? Hold the man down! Boom. A titanic blow rang my helmet like a bell. Indeed, I heard bells, the deep, temple-hushed tolling of the bells of devil's rest. Was I going mad? My helmet's vision sparked and fizzed, and top ticks damaged. Valka! I cried out, reaching for that quiet place in my soul. I couldn't find it. Valka. 
It took every ounce and fibre to find hands and knees. Where was my sword? There it was, still in my hand. But the act of striking out with it, slashing wildly to strike the foes on my right, only allowed the left wing to crush me to the pavement. Boom! Again the hammer fell. My suit's vision sparked again and went dead. I was alone in the dark closeness of my armour, blind and bruised. I prayed for a miracle, but none came. A boot, I think, stamped upon my face, and all my sinews went numb. I had a dim understanding of hands on me, many, many hands. Valka, I said at the last, or thought, or screamed. The boot pressed my armoured face into the pavement, and a third blow wiped me out. Chapter 22 There in the Silence The world passed by through a cottony blanket. Someone had removed my helm, and the blood pounded like distant timpani in my ears. Only the vaguest sense of my surroundings was left to me. I remember falling and muffled shouts in Lothrian. Semi-conscious, I sank in and out of that quagmire which lies beneath sleep, here and there rising long enough to catch a glimpse of black-armoured guardsmen or the inside of a van. Darkness. Two men dragged me, my arms over their shoulders, feet trailing like those of a puppet. One cursed, and I fell again, knees striking stone. Eyes unfocused, I stared at the ground between my hands. Greenish stone, pale dust. Something rattled, and abruptly a chain I had not known was fixed to a collar about my neck pulled taut, and I lurched, gasping to my feet. The creature holding my chain bared glass fangs in a vicious smile. The Sielsen said nothing, and its brothers at my shoulders pushed me on, their white swords held flat against their shoulders in the crooks of their right arms. I stopped, feeling the wind rip at my hair and snap at the black cape of alien silk they had fixed about my shoulders. I was not on Padmarak at all. Padmarak had no wind, not in the domes, and the black pillars that rose like topless trees all around me into the grey, dead sky, were like nothing I had seen in the Commonwealth. Was I dreaming? Had I not seen those pillars before? Aita! barked an alien voice. Aita! Aita! A king, a king! Looking round, I saw my danger. A sea of Sielsin stood all around, stretching away to either side, filling what seemed to me a valley between the arms of a mountain, blurry and angular at the margins of my sight. Each of the pale wore a mask whose slitted eyes blocked the one sunlight. Many carried staves, spears from which flew the silken banners of a hundred, hundred clans. Aita, Aita, Aita by Yukajim! The king of vermin, the king of rats, they cried their voices like the harsh music of crows. They were pointing at me, I realised, laughing at me. I staggered forward, half dragged by my keeper with its chain. I knew where I was, knew what waited in the great black dome ahead. I fixed my eyes forward, deaf to the cries of Aita. Oimbelu, still others cried, dark one. It was a name Aranata Otiolo had called me once. Ahead, I saw the cruel lances and crooked scimitars of the enemy flashing in the sun, and I realised I was being led in triumph as I had led the smashed ruin of General Yubalu through the cloud-crowned streets of the Eternal City. I spied the white armour of the demons of Are, the hybrid Sielsin machines wrought by the traitorous post-human sorcerers of Minos, and thought I spied a trio of slender figures, crowned and escorting a floating white eye. Hushansa! And those other figures, the winged one and the colossus and the warrior with the white crest, those were the other generals, his other generals, 
the other fingers of his white hand. The Yedir Yamani, the holy slaves and guardians of the Prince of Princes, Siriani Doryeika itself. I knew where I was, knew that beneath the arch of the black dome my chain would be threaded through an iron loop as the scourge of earth clapped its clawed hands. How many times had I dreamed this dream? How many times had I seen what was coming? Heard the screams. I screamed. One of the guards at my side dropped me, struck me, or so it seemed, but he was only human. That grim plain with its black pillars, set in spirals about the dome, vanished, and the Sielsen with it. I was in a cell. There were no Sielsen, there was no black dome, no sea of pillars. Another vision, a waking dream. The Lothrians had taken not only my helmet, but my armour, stripped me down to my underlayment. Before I could rise, a plated knee rose and cracked me in the side of the head. I skidded across the floor and struck the wall, spitting blood and the broken fragments of a tooth. The next blow caught me in the stomach, and it was only grace that kept me from vomiting. Through the next flurry of blows, I slowly managed to get my hands up to shield my head. It wasn't enough. My hands ached. I tried to move them, but I couldn't. Blearily, I became aware of the fact that they were fixed above my head. I tried to lower them and winced at the pain that coruscated down my arms and shoulders. Chains rattled. I was manacled. My hands in cuffs attached to a length of chain bolted high in the wall. The rest of me was free so that I might stand and so relieve my arms. But I couldn't sit or sleep without raising them again and so tormenting myself. What a terrible fate, a hoarse voice said. It took me minutes to realize the words my new acquaintance had spoken were Galstani, which would have been unremarkable except that I was sure I was still on Padmarak, had never left Padmarak, sure that this, at least, was no dream. It took a force of will to raise my head. I was in the same low-ceilinged cell, the only illumination a single red sconce gleaming in the crumbling mortar by the square steel door. My wrists chafed from my bonds, and even the faintest motion made the thews and fibres of my arms shriek with pain. My body ached, and beneath the underlayment I guessed my flesh was a welter of bruises. I could not blame the Lothrian guards— I had killed so many of their fellows on the bridge alone. I probed the spot where my tooth used to be with my tongue and spat, and only then found my cellmate. An old man sat in the corner, his bony hands in his lap unchained. He wore nothing save a ragged breech clout, and his skin was pale and faintly jaundiced, his body covered with scars. His hair fell almost to his waist in oily curtains that shadowed his face, the matted black streaked liberally with white. He had no beard, and I could count each rib and trace each vein through the papery skin. Starvation had withered his muscles, and his nails were like claws. "'This must be,' he said. "'This must be, remember?' "'What did you say?' Thought we could escape. Thought we were too old already. His accent was strangely familiar. Beneath the brittle qualities of starvation and pain yet remained the polish of class and old breeding. It was an imperial accent. The accent of the scion of some antique imperial house. What such a man was doing, mouldering in a Lothrian dungeon, I felt sure might fill several books. "'Do I know you?' I asked. "'Though he slay me, I will trust in him,' the stranger replied, and lifted violet eyes to mine. "'And he has slain us before.' I recoiled. Deep sunken were those violet eyes, and far away their stare, yet I knew them still, and knew intimately then the scars that marred the flesh of the other man's arm. I knew every scar, remembered the mark beneath his left eye where our father's ring had torn my cheek, 
recalled the bright spots on my right arm from the brace I'd worn as a boy, and the marks of war and crime and colosso. But there were fresh wounds on his left cheek, the mark of talons red and terrible. And he was thin, so thin, and so bruised I thought his skin must burst in places. Do you know of whom I speak? the other Hadrian asked. I was going mad, or else here was another vision. The quiet? Hadrian nodded. We are on the shortest path now. We must be, he said, and Scrooge shut his eyes to make of his words a prayer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry for what? He had no answer, though the look in his eyes was enough. Find us in you, he said, and pointed a finger at me. I don't understand. I tried to get my feet under me, tried to stand to approach my other self if I could. What horrors had wrought that other Hadrian in such an image? I thought I could guess. I had walked that path not long before, bound in chains. A king, a king. One way, said Hadrian Marlowe, raising a hand for emphasis, one finger extended. I recoiled. The last two fingers of that hand were gone. Only scarred and ragged stumps remained. There is but one way through the needle. It was one of Gibson's old aphorisms, and the memory of it and of Gibson in that wretched place were like the memory of sunlight on a world without a star. Always forward, always down, never left or right, Hadrian said again. Find us. I said I don't understand. The red light beside the door went out, and with a buzzing loud as raid sirens, it cycled blue and the door hissed open. My attention flickered from my counterpart to the scrawny jailer who entered with a plastic dinner tray. A man must eat, he said, setting the tray on the floor before removing the control wand to uncouple my wrists from their chain. Still manacled, my hands fell to my lap. The other Hadrian was gone. Chapter 23 Who Holds the Strings? Days passed before they came for me. How many I cannot say for certain, for they had taken my terminal with my armour. I had only the coming and going of my jailer to mark the time. The scrawny Zook, hook-nosed, hairless, and black-eyed, never said a word. He never undid the manacles that bound my wrists together, but neither did he chain me back to the wall. Twice daily he entered my cell to deposit a fresh meal tray and to clear away the ruin of the old. He never lingered long nor entertained any of my questions, and no wonder. The fisheye lens of a camera eye watched from high in one corner, and it never blinked. The food was foul. Every day a brick of white and putrid-seeming protein paste alongside some greenish mush and a heel of stale bread. They had not taken the underlayment of my suit, and its waste processing and water reclamation still worked. Thus I had more water and cleaner than I could get from the greasy tap that thrust from the far wall. I counted sixty-seven meals before the guard came for me. Thirty-four days, assuming the meals had come at regular intervals as they almost certainly had not. Once I had dined with a junior commandant of the imperial prison world of Pagus Minor, who told me it was common practice in his profession to stagger a prisoner's mealtimes, serving meals too close together and then too far apart. Deprived also of the light of the sun and all other external indicators of the passage of time, the client becomes uncoupled from the basic rhythms that provide his body and mind with the structure upon which his comfort and his sanity depend. This increases his anxiety, triggers a depression response, and robs him of sleep. To say nothing of the dysregulation of the bowels and discomfort of the stomach caused by irregular eating and poor fare. These are subtle tortures, and subtler indignities, compounded by the fact that for those thirty-four days the manacles remained a part of me. 
a man will stand, the guardsman decreed, his arrival trumpeted by the blast of the alarm. He tapped his truncheon against his thigh. Standing was an agony in itself. Cramped muscles spasmed from malnutrition, from my beating and from my month of sleeping on the bare stone floor. They beat me again, more cursorily this time, and took great pains to avoid my head. When they were done, they half marched, half dragged me through a maze of corridors, so starkly lit I fancied I could hear the buzzing of the lights in their fixtures. The lift buzzed more loudly still and rattled to a halt. The heavy door rolled open, and still more of the guard pulled back the iron grill that blocked the opening. We emerged into a security checkpoint, teeming with the black-clad conclave guard, and exited behind a bank of security scanners into a marble-tiled hall whose walls bore cement freezers of the Lothrian people marching arm in arm. I knew where I was. It was the tunnel that pierced the heart of the palace ziggurat, that ran from the lobby and the fountains to the floor of the conclave's arena. I was being taken to the very heart of Lothrian power. As we drew near the great doors, I did my best to get my bare feet under me again. I was not going to be dragged before the conclave a broken man, bruised and freshly bloodied, so I dressed myself in the vestments of empire, invisible to all, and raised my chin to come in chains before the gathered lords of the commonwealth. The lights within were dim, tuned to their lowest, reddest setting. My bare feet slapped against the tile, and the noise of my tread and of the boots of my escort clattered against the vaults and the empty stands that rose in circles all around. Ahead, the tall backs of the thirty-four chairs that stood to either side of the Lothriad on its great throne rose like funeral markers, their occupants watching my approach in ringing silence. I caught the eye of the first chair, white-haired and solemn, but what he saw in me must have unsettled him, for he looked away. The third chair watched me too, she who had led Valker and me on our tour of the party's farms. There sat the sixth, who first of all the grand conclave had questioned me under the power of voice. Of the ninth chair there was no sign, but there sat the twenty-fifth, who had been censured by the conclave the day I had arrived on Padmarak. And there was Lorth Talig, watching from his place to the far left, smiling to see me brought so low. But for a few lesser functionaries seated immediately behind the great bench about the square entryway by which the conclave entered and the guards posted on the perimeter doors, the great space stood empty. The army of clerks and secretaries and logothete partisans who had filled the chamber like spectators at Colosso were nowhere to be seen. I was, evidently, to be tried with as few witnesses as possible. When I'd approached within earshot of the bench, my guards shoved me, and I fell to my knees at the focus of the ark along which the chairs were seated, and just under half their seats stood empty. Few witnesses indeed. The conclave recognises the delegate from the Solon Empire, the first chair said, keeping to the prescribed forms, speaking in his native tongue his voice soft and quavering. Ushdim. Rise. I did not move. Ushdim. At the sound of my guards approaching, I raised my manacle hands and stood. Still, the two guards seized me roughly and held me fast. First chair's hushed tones rose again and filled that echoing space. On behalf of the conclave, the delegate stands accused of fomenting war with the people of the Commonwealth, of conspiring with revolutionary agencies against the people of the Commonwealth, of travelling and treating under false pretenses with the people of the Commonwealth, of the murder of a foreign diplomat on Commonwealth soil, of the murder of a commissar of the people of the Commonwealth, of the murder of officers in the service of the Commonwealth, of doing violence against the people of the Commonwealth, of destroying the property of the people of the Commonwealth, of stealing the property of the people of the Commonwealth, and of failure to comply with officers acting in the defence of the Commonwealth. Diavinatva. 
These last words were strange to me, though I had studied Lothrian as a boy. Focusing through the pain, I tried to make sense of them. Javi Natva, the first chair asked again. Vinatva, Vinat was fault, error, guilt. Vinatva then was faulty, guilty, but Dia. Dia Vinatva, the first chair asked again, and added, Panaka, confess. The last piece clicked into place and I understood. Dia was you. The Lothrians had, publicly, abolished names, abolished I and we, he and she, us and them. They clumsily addressed people by their functions. The delegate, or a worker, or in general terms, a man. But they had retained as an archaism or artifact of legal formality this solitary word, this singular way to separate the lamb from their flock of goats. You. I felt certain I understood correctly. Are you guilty? the first chair asked, and then the order. Confess! They had abolished every identity save guilt. The word you remained, atrophied but still potent, as an organ for singling out the enemy for punishment. I raised my chin, a lord still despite my almost nakedness. Let us speak plainly, my lords, I said and I was pleased to find my voice neither broken nor strained. I spoke in Gaustani in the language of men whose minds at least were their own. The translator did not speak for me. The great room's recording suite was not engaged. There would be no record of my trial, only of my death. I had died upon the bridge, died a terrorist attempting to start a war. You have done this, not I. Those were your men who attacked us as we returned from our tour of your polar camps. Argyris was your man, and it was on your orders that he detained my party in our embassy. You might have let us leave peaceably, but you did not. Your agencies ensured there would be violence. Your orders. The first chair slapped his hand against the arm of his throne. Dear Panaka! No! I shouted. I do not confess. A blow caught me in the back of one knee and I fell with a crash. Panaka! the first chair commanded. Steadily, I found my feet once more, half turning to see the guard who had struck me. He held his truncheon ready at his side. The question is, why? I raised my hands to forestall the guardsman's blow. Why bother with this charade? If it is war with the Imperium you desire, you might have done so before I ever came here. Why force this pretext? I turned then and took two steps toward the seventeenth chair. Lorth Talik. The use of the man's right name sent a murmur along the bench and forestalled any retribution. Tell me why. Lorth Talig of the seventeenth chair peered down at me. Slowly he leaned forward in his seat until he peered over the rail like a sentry from between the merlons of his castle wall. He looked out with the air of a man watching the throes of an especially close contest. Confess! the first chair's dusty voice implored, overriding any response from Talag. Another blow caught me in the lower back and I struck the stone wall beneath the conclave's bench. I was permitted once more to stand, though I had to use the wall to lever myself back to bare and calloused feet. I understood the game well enough. They did not mean to kill me, as any lord of the empire might have done. They wanted me to relent, wanted to break me, wanted me to say what they told me to say. By such small surrenders they would secure my compliance, and they meant to secure it by the oldest methods imaginable. Obedience through fear of pain. They would send Hadrian Marlowe back to the Imperium, not as himself, not as a man, but as their man, a dancer trained as surely as those who performed Giallo's ballet for us upon the stage. They wanted the half-mortal remade in their image, rebuilt as a Lothrian creature. But you did kill our men, did you not, my lord? Lorth Talig inquired, confirming my suspicions. Small truths. 
They would ask me to agree to small truths first, make me speak their words one step at a time. Had Talig given me his name only to play my friend now? I defended myself, I said, and glowered at the guard that had followed me to the end of the bench. He didn't move. Hit me, coward, or do you only strike a man when his back is turned? Still he made no sign, so I addressed myself to Talig and the others. I will not play your games. Kill me or release me. You waste my time and yours with this dumb show. But you did kill them, did you not? Talig inquired mildly, speaking my own language. And you did kill poor Argyris, did you not? Talig had not stirred from his place on the rail. What I did, I did for the good of my people. I froze, ready for the guard to charge and strike me. Where are my people, Talig? The Solon Embassy has been liquidated, came the response in Lothrian, and turning my head, I beheld the speaker standing on the level above the level of the bench, his hands clasped neatly behind his back, grey suit neatly ordered, grey eyes flashing with triumphant delight. It was the ninth chair, his slight figure framed against the blackness of the hall by which he'd entered the congressional arena. All dead. He allowed these words to hang in the air like gun smoke, while behind him the other absent chairs filtered in, hovering about the ninth chair like satellites to his Jove. What was it about the little man that commanded such terror and obedience in the other chairman? I had but little time to contemplate that question, for the little man's words hung over me. Dead, I repeated, thinking of the guards we'd abandoned in the carport, of the hundreds of personnel who lived and worked in the embassy complex, of Argyris's poor slaves, of Polino, of Corvo and the rest, of Valka. When the ninth chair didn't reply nor any other intervene, I said, You cannot win. Kill me if you wish. Destroy my people if you can. You will not win the war. My empire will tear your planets from the sky. You should not threaten, the first chair said, speaking in Galstani for the first time. Any man who comes to Padmarak begging aid has come in no position to threaten. The ninth chair overrode him, raising one hand. The delegate's threats are empty. The survival of the Commonwealth has already been assured. He surveyed the floor of the arena where I stood, barely standing with four guards close about me. He seemed to take notice of my state for the first time, and a flicker of rage moved beneath the grey paper skin of his face. The ninth chair let out an exasperated sigh, and all the wind went out of him. The conclave was asked to keep the prisoner in good health. "'The delegate must be punished!' cried one of the seated chairmen. The conclave renders to the enemies of the people what is due the enemies of the people, declared another, sparking a riot of noise from the seated members of the grand conclave. First chair struck the arm of his throne, but the councilman didn't cease. Third chair shouted at the eighth, and the eighth at twenty-fourth. All the while Talig leaned forward upon the rail, looking not down on me, but up toward the ninth chair, who stood above it all as Julian Felsenberg must once have stood above the mobs of earth, untouched by the tableau beneath him. The ninth chair raised a hand, and silence fell. In a soft voice the occupant of the ninth chair said, I am sorry to have kept you all waiting. Evidently you cannot be left alone with my prisoner even for a day. To my shock, he spoke the words in Galstani, his voice theatrically hushed in the sudden stillness. "'Your prisoner, Jovan, the sixth chair exclaimed in standard, turning in her seat. "'My prisoner, yes,' the ninth chair replied. "'Was it not I who arranged for his capture? Was it not I who arranged for the capture of his ship?' "'What?' I staggered forward. "'You lie!' The little man looked down on me but didn't answer me. It could not be true. 
The Tamerlane could not be lost. I confess my mind went blank, went white with shock and rage. What had happened to Valka, to Corvo and the others? Had they made it to the ship? Had they lingered to stage some escape, some abortive rescue? I screwed shut my eyes to block the tears. No, 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 no. My master will not appreciate you playing with his new pet, the ninth chair said. Tell them he is not our master, the sixth chair replied. We have a deal, Jovan. Tell them yourself, said Jovan of the ninth chair. The sixth chair nearly fell against the rail. Lord, Lord Vati is coming here. Indeed I am, came a new voice deep and sepulchral, as though it issued from the ground. I had heard such a voice only once before, on Berenike, and the black music of it tore the heart from me. I heard the demon before it appeared, its armour clinking, servos whining in the dark of the tunnel. Everything came crashing together then, every little piece found its place. The Lothrians had no desire to make me one of their puppets, they had designs on imperial territory and desires for war, but I was not to be their scapegoat, their casus belli. They had bent all their will to capture me to make me a gift, to the Sielsin. That was why the chamber was empty but for the great lords who knew the Commonwealth's most terrible secret. That was why the lights in the conclave's arena were turned down low and red. The creature that appeared in the black arch above the level of the conclave was decidedly inhuman. It had to stoop to enter the high hall, for the crest of its iron skull stood fully ten feet from the ground. I knew it at once for one of the Yedir, for its armour and its iron skeleton were of a kind with Yabalu, with Bahude, and Hushansa. The same flanged plating, the same graceful organic lines, no scrap of the alien flesh was visible as though it were one of the medieval knights in Medallo's house's combat hollows. Featureless and smooth was its opalescent mask, with a braided queue of false hair bound at the nape of its neck to evoke the Cielsin style. Where the others had been fashioned into shapes different from the bodies they'd been born to, this Vati's shape was little different from that of any Cielsin, save that it was taller. Its style recalled that of the Nipponese knights I have seen, with banded pauldrons and two stylized horns above the place where the eyes should be. And on its chest, in faded silver, was the print of a pale hand. Behind it came a dozen Skahari warriors in traditional Sielsin in black and blue, the cloaks above the fleshy contours of their armour embroidered with interlocking circular runes, their white scimitars drawn and held at the ready, as in my vision in the crooks of their right arms. They dwarfed Ninth Chair Jovan and his coterie, appearing as men among children. Words fled me. When Valka and I had eaten with Lorth Talig, I had accused the Commonwealth of reducing mankind to Eloi, to sheep. How right I'd been. Here then were the Morlocks, the dwellers in darkness, the creatures the shepherds were fattening their sheep to feed the Cielsin. At once Argyris's sombre ode to the decline of the great city, and Carrie and Magda's tales of patrols rounding up men for deportment off-world, took on a sinister cast. Fifty years, Argyris had said, fifty years. How many men had this conclave sold to its inhuman masters? How many women and children? My bare feet felt fused to the ground, and I watched in wide-eyed horror as the pale night descended on cloven feet from the platform to the level of the bench. At last, it said, regarding me with its faceless face. I felt the presence of a million tiny faceted eyes on me and took a step backward, skin crawling. I should slay you for what you have done to my sister brothers, but my master has forbidden it. The creature's artificial voice seemed to shake the dust from the red lights above, so deep was its resonance. Do you know who I am? Raising my chin, I answered, You're one of the white hand. I am Vati Inamna, 
first slave of the Prophet. Implants the sorcerers of Minos had installed in the creature's brain translated its native tongue to standard. The general stalked round the circumference of the stands about me, moving toward one of the narrow stairs by which men might reach the floor. I hoped I would be the one to catch you. The gods have heard my prayers. Up close, the giant towered over me, its head cocked at an angle. Its heavy black cloak fluttered from pointed shoulders as it raised an arm. I had had occasion to examine the bodies of Yubalu and Bahude both, and marked the same stamp of handicraft in the design of that arm and hand. The artificers who had designed the metal body had given it the look of an anatomical sketch. The corded texture of the adamantine plate evoked sheets of muscle, the fibrous polymers beneath tendons shifting over metal bones. The segmented and six-fingered metal hand gave the impression of a flayed man. Vati touched my face, hard fingers closing over my mouth as it turned my head like a buyer examining the teeth of some Norman slave boy on the auction block. The blank white face peered down at me. The sensation of crawling eyes grew stronger. I recoiled, but the fingers only tightened until I thought my jaw might crack. He has waited for this, Vati said, for such a long time. The creature released me and traced the line of my nose with one blunt ceramic fingertip. They say you are chosen by your god. The quiet, I said. The giant twitched its iron hand. I barely saw it. The blow caught me beneath the chin and sent me flying through the air to crash against a wall beneath the Lothrian bench. My head rang, and I had to shut my eyes to keep the world from spinning. Only a man, Vati said, dismissing me. The pale night's shadow fell across me. There are no gods but ours. For once in my life I didn't argue. Vati had called itself Dorayeika's first slave. The Vyadayan were slaves, as all Sielsin who were not Ita were slaves. Here then was the Grand Vyadan, the first finger of Syriani Dorayeika's white hand, chief of the Yedi Yamani, captain of its armies, master of its hosts. Before it, in chains, I was only a man, a rat, Yukaji. The pain in me kept my vision cloudy, and even I could have stood before that metal monster. I could not stand against the Commonwealth, who had placed all their hideous strength at the service of mankind's greatest enemy. Talek, I shouted, how can you allow this? The good of all is the good of each, my lord, Talek replied. Their sacrifice for the security of the Commonwealth. Somehow I'd found the strength to stand. Your people are your Commonwealth, you fool! I shouted. A nation is its people, and you sold yours for meat! The Grand Viadan threw back its head and let out a sound like tearing metal. It was an inhuman laugh. Vati turned to its escort and in its own tongue barked, Gore, take our guest to the ship and prepare him for his journey. High above a sea else I assumed was Gore leaped to obey. The ninth chair hurried to join it. Why the little minister should accompany the Xenobites I'd no idea, but three of the ninth chair's coterie and fully half a dozen of the sea descended to join their master on the arena's floor. The desert is nothing, Lord Talig, I cried recalling our dinner conversation. Nothing! I had to make him see, to make someone in this republic of monsters understand. The world they sold their souls and their people to build would never be. Like every Faustian pretender, they had not realised the very act of purchasing their desire had put that desire forever out of reach. Their pound of flesh might buy a place in the sun from their new masters, but the Lothrians would be only tenants there. The conclave was selling its own people for food, 
just as they had accused the Solon Palatines of capturing Lothrian peasants and devouring them to extend their lives. What was it Argyris had said? Always accuse the enemy of what you are doing. Chapter 24 The Sorcerer My Sielsen captors marched me through the palace halls, their clawed hands clamped tight above my elbows, claws pressing against the armor weave of my skin suit. We moved in stages, the conclave guard clearing zones ahead of us, securing doors to preserve their secret alliance with that arch-nemesis of mankind. Jovan of the Ninth Chair marched on ahead of me, accompanied by one of his coterie, a woman. Had she been the Fourteenth Chair? The Thirteenth. My head still swam, and my whole body ached from the blow Lord Vati had delivered me. It won't work, I said, lifting manacled hands to test the bruise blossoming on my jaw. When your people find out what you... what you've done... They won't accept it. Jovan halted, turned to my alien escort. Tajaga o Tajunne, he snapped, ordering the Xenobites in their own tongue. Gag him. I'll have no more of his prattle. To my astonishment, the Sielsen obeyed. One produced a length of silken cord and wound it between my teeth. That accomplished, Jovan lay a hand on my shoulder in mock affection. He smiled, grey eyes alight. Don't want you causing a scene now, do we? A short lift ride later, we found ourselves exiting onto a loading dock. Members of the Conclave Guard stood at entrances and at vantage points all around, ensuring the place was secure. An armoured van of the kind we'd stolen from the embassy awaited us, and it was into its rear compartment the Xenobites loaded me securing my manacles to a length of chain attached to an iron ring in the floor. My inhuman guards seated themselves to either side, neither saying a word. Outside, Jovan shouted orders in Lothrian to the driver and the guards before climbing in himself, the thirteenth chair on his heels. I wasn't surprised when he hove into the seat opposite mine as his men shut the doors. He was smiling ear to ear, but said nothing as the van groaned to life and began to move. I could not speak, and so contented myself with a narrowing of the eyes. We stayed that way for what felt like minutes, the car bouncing and rolling beneath us. Black-robed, armoured and white-masked, the Sielsen officer Gore watched over us from its place by the door, its sword still unsheathed in the crook of its arm. When it seemed the silence might stretch no more without breaking, Jovan said, You wouldn't believe how difficult I found it giving the order to bring you in. He spoke Galstani, studying my face as though I were some specimen on a slide. When you escaped us on the bridge, I thought we'd lost you. I almost let you go after that. To lose an adversary like yourself, after all these years... It's a tragedy, the woman finished for him. Jovan nodded soberly. I kept staring. He spoke as one who knew me, and I was certain I did not know him. Jovan was Lothrian through and through. He had the Lothrian grey pallor, the black Lothrian hair, the blunt features and black eyes. But no. Jovan's eyes were grey and seemed to glow in the dim light of the cabin in the same glassy, reflective way Valka's eyes did in the right light. They weren't real. Seeing confusion writ on my face, Jovan said teasingly, You don't remember? I'm hurt. We've met before, the woman put in, and her eyes were the same flashing grey. On Arai said the man. Your dog shot me. Arai. I felt my eyes grow wide as the pieces all ticked into place. Arai. It was on Arai that we had first encountered signs of any alliance between mankind and the Sielsen. 
it was on Arai that the sorcerers of Minos had forged the first Sielsen machine hybrids. It was on Arai, likely, that the Yedi Yamani themselves had been designed, their iron limbs manufactured. The sorcerers themselves had all committed suicide rather than be taken alive, each transmitting an image of his or her mind across the dark to a ship that had slumbered undetected in deep orbit. Siren and I had chased one of their number to a foundry deep beneath the earth, and there battled her and her pet monster, a lesser demon, a prototype of the hybrids that had led the Shiomu's armies ever since. Siren had shot the witch, but she had been a woman. What had her name been? You really don't remember? Jovan asked. The woman smacked her forehead. Ah, but that was Severine's memory. It is we who are confused. Severine. That was her name. The name of the witch on Arai. Urbane himself had used that name on Berenike as well in the crawler. Oh, but this is no fun, the woman said, and reaching out, tugged the silken cords from between my teeth. I worked my lips and tongue, tasted blood where the Sielsin bonds had torn flesh. After a long moment, I gasped. It was you. The two sorcerers surveyed me with sparks in those dead mechanical eyes. Valka said she sensed another. I spat pink. Another neural lace. She thought it was a flashback, but it was you. Ah, your Tavrosi concubine. Jovan nodded primly. Her implants do pose a problem. One that... The woman overrode him. Urbane fucked her good, didn't he? I'll bet there are days she still can't walk straight. Snarling, I made it halfway out of my seat before the Sielsen restrained me. Even chained, I might have made it across the van and shattered the woman's toothy smile. Hadaja! The Sielsen commander barked. Restrain him. For a moment, I struggled against the Xenobites who held me back, but malnourished and beaten as I was, I was not up to the challenge. I collapsed back into my seat, chest heaving. The thirteenth chair tittered, and Jovan exclaimed, Still fighting you? Good. I was worried they'd broken you. Here he reached out and tapped me on the nose with a forefinger. Jovan smiled. Our employer will be pleased. The Sielsens don't have employees, I said. They have slaves. Know them so well, do you? Both sorcerers said in unison. I blinked. The words, the rhythm and the inflection had all been identical. My mind went back to Arai, to the circle of corpses we'd found tethered into the transmitter that had broadcast their images across space. Those sorcerers had shed their bodies as a snake sheds its skin. They were not men at all, but ghosts, thought form programs that infested and possessed one shell and then another, not so unlike Khan Sagara himself. I looked from one to the next and wondered if they were sharing thoughts between one another, or if Jovan were both the man and the woman. Realising I'd been silent longer than the question really demanded, I answered, I do. I glanced toward the inhuman commander, Gore. Unsure if it understood our tongue, I said, The Sielsen are using you. They will keep you around so long as you are useful. Gore gave no sign our human babble meant anything. And why should it? Humans were slaves. Vermin. Food. Jovan leaned toward me and raised his eyebrows. It is well. We are of much use. The thirteenth shook her head, and watching her do so, it struck me how detached, how singular was every gesture, as though each of the two's expressions were the result of careful consideration as though the mind that animated the puppet flesh were far removed. It won't matter, I said. The Lothrian people won't stand for this once they discover what you're doing. The Lothrian people are well in hand, Jovan replied. The conclave were all too willing to sell their precious proles out from under them if it kept them off the menu. It wasn't even hard. Three generations I've been here. They die so fast. Three generations to subvert the conclave to our aims. 
he sat back, a smug expression colouring his grey face as he affected the attitude and severity of the ninth chair. "'And the will of the conclave is the will of the people.' His solemn mask slipped again. "'Like it or not, Hadrian? May I call you Hadrian? The Commonwealth is suzerain to the Cielsin prince. You've lost.' He lay a hand on the woman's shoulder. "'And I was the one who beat you.' The woman's smile flickered into place mere instants behind the man's. "'The hour is far later than you know,' she said. "'Your empire is doomed.' I blinked at her. "'You're doing this to destroy the empire?' Jovan pulled a face. "'Well, yes. Your empire has crushed humanity. The galaxy has changed, but we have not.' or you have not. Your chantry has kept us in a dark age for thousands of years, thousands of years wasted, kneeling to your red emperor and his golden throne. No more! It is time for change. Do you see? He shifted eager in his seat, one hand to his breast. With the other he seized my hands, grey eyes fixed on mine. The things I've seen, you cannot begin to imagine. I can imagine more than you think. I said quietly. Both Jovan and the woman laughed. Fatty did not exaggerate, Jovan said. Their gods are real. Beings you couldn't begin to comprehend. Kaihanarin, I said, using the Cielsin word. The Watchers. If I had expected this word to ruffle the two sorcerers, I was disappointed. You know a word, and you think you know them. You know nothing, Hadrian. Nothing of what is out there. Jovan pointed through the roof of the van. We shall be like gods ourselves. Like them. The empire will vanish, and mankind will be free, the woman said, free to evolve again, to transcend. Like you, I said inclining my head to indicate the machines that filled their heads. We, both the ninth and thirteenth chairs intoned, are only the beginning. Netan Sujawo, Gore barked, ordering us to silence. It was unsettled, I guessed, to hear the name of its gods on my tongue. Jovan and his counterpart each fell silent then, peering up at the hulking commander where it stooped just inside the rear of the van. Noting their meek obedience, I held the man's grey gaze a moment and mouthed a single word. Slaves. Still in chains, they dragged me from the van and into the pale light of a hangar cousin to the one in which we'd been greeted when we first landed on Padmarak. Naked steel arched above us and the bones of catwalks and gantries hung overhead, lending the place an oppressive, industrial weight. The shuttle that awaited us could not have been more out of place, in that place of right angles and hard lines, its long fuselage crooked like the head of an old man's cane, its surface striated and ribbed as some anatomical sketch, raw and organic as the design of Vati's body had been. It had no ramp, but a lift platform lowered into place as we approached, the commander, Gore, shouted orders to the two Xenobites who manned that lift. It spoke quickly and with a thick accent that blurred my understanding of the alien tongue. But I caught the word Wanana. Prepare. In response, I saw one of the Cielsin mount a ladder and climb one of the struts on which the lift had descended and vanished back into the ship above. My escort forced me onto the platform, pausing only to hiss at the lift operator. Psana! Jovan called, ordering my guards to halt. The Cielsin forced me into position on the lift platform and turned me round. Jovan and his nameless companion, his fellow sorcerer, stood arm in arm, each wearing identical plastic smiles. It is a pity I can't go the whole way with you, the woman said, twining her fingers through the man's. I want to see what the prince will do to you. He has such interesting ideas. We shall have to wait until we can synchronise with the others, the man said, and kissed the woman's hand, his smile hardly faltering. Say hello to them when you see them. 
he disentangled himself from the woman and approached, mounting the lip of the lift platform. He made a show of smoothing the already taut shoulders of my skin suit like a concerned parent adjusting the uniform of a son they meant to send to war. I meant what I said. It really was difficult ordering your capture. I don't want the game to end. But I am glad, so, so glad, that I was the one who beat you. You haven't beaten me, I said. No? Jovan leaned forward and inexplicably kissed me on the forehead. I slammed my face down into the little man's nose, felt the satisfying crunch of cartilage. Jovan staggered back, tumbled off the lift platform to the hangar floor, laughing all the while. I wondered if the sorcerer's fleshly puppet felt pain. Urbane had not, nor had Urbane died when Udax had taken his head. The Sielsen held me more tightly, their talons straining to pierce the skin suit's weave. Hooting, Jovan found his feet, one hand clutching his dripping nose. Save some of that spirit for the prince. You'll need it on Darantun. It was the first time I'd heard that name spoken aloud. The dark world and black fortress of the enemy. Citadel of the scourge of earth. It was a petty victory I'd scored on Jovan. He was right. He had won. He had beaten me. And if what he said was true, he had beaten us. If what he'd said was true, if the Tamerlane itself had fallen, then all was lost. But despair is the deepest sin and the final failure. I gritted my teeth and glared down at the little sorcerer. Salua Yanne! Gore shouted to the others. I heard the breathy sound that passed for yes among the Xenobites. Eya! The lift rattled as it ascended and pulled me into the stinking darkness above. Chapter 25 Rebirth I couldn't remember falling, but I was on the ground. I scrabbled hands and knees, tried to kneel, to stand, to breathe. Coughed instead, spat gobbets of pink fluid on the stone beneath me. Struck my head. The blood rushed and pounded in my ears like the approach of a stampede, and it was all I could do to weather clenching muscles as every fibre heaved to vomit up the bile in stomach and lungs. They were supposed to drain you before they pulled you out of fugue. I could hardly remember ever feeling so cold. Trying once more to stand, my foot slipped in the amniotic fluid, and I cracked my skull on the earth. There, there, a softly musical voice said. There, there, gentle lord, there, there. Those were hands on my face, cradling my head. My chest felt fit to burst or tear from the pain of coughing, spitting. I couldn't see, couldn't speak. The sound of my coughing and retching was all I knew, all I knew but that angelic, feminine voice. Valka? The woman hushed me even as my coughing began to subside. No, no, the woman crooned, it's just us. Hush now. Breathe. It could not be Magda. They could not have got her, too. Was I still on Padmarak? No. No, I remembered, remembered Gore stripping me of my skin suit, forcing me into the pod. They had taken my shackles, strapped me into the creche. Valka! I managed to scream that time, and lurched to my knees. One faltering step set me falling once again, hard. Where? Dead, I fear, came the reply. No, I said, voice hollow and weak. No. Your ship was taken, destroyed with all hands. I heard the soft slap of feet in puddles, felt again the cool hands. You are what is left, my lord. Those same hands half rolled me over, and I sensed, rather than saw, a woman crouch beside me and pillow my head on her thighs. For an absurd moment I thought it was my mother, and then I remembered my mother was dead, a victim of those long years I'd spent frozen between the stars. Still I thought I heard her voice. 
you are my son. Another voice, higher and colder than that of the woman, intruded on my blindness and my still galloping heart. What is the matter with him? When the woman spoke, I could hear her smile. I awoke him without draining his lungs. He will recover, the cold voice asked. Something familiar in that voice, something I could not quite remember. It will pass, she answered, stroking my face. The woman crooned and made gentle hushing noises. It is more amusing this way. The sound of hard soles on metal. I want him alive, doctor. I... Another fit of coughing seized me, and the woman pushed me upright. Blue-green sputum spattered my lap, a blur against my pale nakedness. I can't see. It was not strictly true. The world revealed itself to me as a smear of light and shadow, the only colour the bluish-green of the slime that covered me and the floor about. It will pass, the woman said again. Those jitatan profanoi who did your freezing made rather a mess of you, I fear. Something cold pressed against my back, and I heard the faint whine and beep of some medical instrument. Still some fluid in the lungs. That will take time. A white light shone in my left eye, tracked to my right. I winced. I hoped Jovan would have put you in fugue himself. More footsteps sounded on the metal circling us. I turned my head, tried to point my ears to track the source of that noise. I asked for Hadrian Marlowe, Doctor, not his corpse. He's alive, the woman replied, and I thought I could hear terror beneath the motherly sound of her voice. Core temperature is rising. EEG is... Is what? the frozen voice demanded. It's... strange. If your colleague's inattention has caused my kinsman permanent damage, Dr. Severine, I shall be most disappointed. Yes, great one, the woman demurred. It's not that. His action potential rates are off the charts. I caught her hand, adrenaline tightening my chest. Severine? I squeezed her hand until I thought the bones might break, felt ridges there on the printed bones so like the false bones of my own left hand. Images flickered, a white metal hand punching the armoured glass of a tank the hulking shape of our colossus marching bow-legged across salt pans toward a looming mountain. Men dead and wired to a transmitter. Siren. A shot in the dark. You're one of them. Again I tried to stand, shoving the witch Severine away from myself. Again I slipped. Again I fell, rolling onto my back in the slime of my rebirth. The darkness swam about me, lights orbiting overhead. Slowly I became aware of the way the fluid plastered my hair to my face, and of the aching pain in my fingers and at my throat. My rings. They had not taken my rings, had not removed them when they strapped me into their extracellarian-built fugue crash. The skin beneath had frozen to the metal and ivory and burned away. As my body warmed, the pain seeped in and blood dripped from my fingers and ran from similar wounds where the chain and the piece of the quiet shell had burned my neck and chest. I could just barely make out my hands, palms and blood-streaked fingers resolving from smears to mere blurs. Shakily I worked Prince Aranata Otiolo's old ring from my left thumb, biting back a cry as the flesh beneath peeled back, bearing meat and cord. Your poor hands, Severine said, taking my hands in hers. We'll have to fix that. For the first time I realized she was wearing gloves and a medic's shapeless, glossy coveralls. The face behind the transparent visor was not the one I remembered from Arai long ago. She had spoken Jadian, but the face that looked down on me was Mandari, narrow-eyed and high-cheekboned. She had not been Mandari on Arai, had she? I snatched my hand away, wincing as the freezing air whistled against the exposed flesh. Not taking my eyes off Severine, I held the injured limb close, red rings seeping blood from thumb and third finger and the first finger of my right hand. They would scar something fierce. I'd had such a cryo-burn scar on my left thumb, my original left thumb. That realization sent a laugh, small and fragile, past my teeth. I clamped it back. 
that I should have lived so long and travelled so far to gain the same injury again was an irony more bitter than any I could then imagine. The absurdity and the horror of my situation impressed itself on me. Sitting naked and cross-legged on the floor before my empty few crash, covered in blood and bluish fluid. I remember you, I said, though as I say the face she wore was not the same as the one I remembered, but she was the same witch of Minos I'd encountered on Arai so long ago. Thought Siren killed you at first. Severine smiled thinly. Had she aimed for the head, she might have succeeded. She extended her hand. Hand it over. She meant Aranata's ring. I looked down at the bloody thing. The red stone leered at me like an evil eye from rhodium moulded, like so much else in art to evoke naked muscle. Taking advantage of my fugue sick state, she plucked it from my fingers. Let me see that, the other voice said. The woman stood, left me on the floor and turned, crossing the puddles of slime I'd made falling from my crash and knelt. I tried to turn my head but couldn't see past the kneeling woman. My crash stood in the centre of a pool of pale light amidst greater darkness. Faint illumination, red as hell, shone on walls of webbed stone whose organic arches put me in mind of the intestines of some petrified giant. So it is true, the voice said. It really was you who liberated Violotiolo. I had heard the story, but stories are lies. The tap of feet on metal resumed, and a figure in ribbed enameled armour and black robes emerged from the darkness, pausing to rest a possessive hand on Dr. Severine's head. I felt my breath catch and cursed my cold adult brain for not realising, not recognising sooner. Prince Siriani Doreica stepped carefully onto the wet floor, one jewelled and taloned hand clutching the hem of its robes to keep it from the clinging slime. Tall and terrible it was, tall almost as its iron servant Vati, though in the planes of its face and the lines of its body there was no sign of the machine. Here was a lord of the Sielsin such as had been bred in the dark chasms of their birth, its limbs clean and unaltered by Minos's electric sorcery. As it moved, silver threads in the black robes shimmered, highlighting the shape of runes that glittered like stars reflected in waters black as space. A silver pin fashioned in the shape of a grasping hand secured the folds of that imperial garment at the left shoulder. In imitation, I realized with growing horror of the togas of our own Caesars. Its armor was decorated with a motif of twining arms, ornate as any emperor's. Its face was a screaming horror, smooth as glass, white as marble, with eyes darker even than its robes, and large as eggs beneath its crown of horn. Delicate silver chains hung across its brow, decorated with the deep blue of tiny sapphires, the greatest of which shone in the midst of its forehead like a third unseeing eye. The horns themselves, swept back from that royal brow, were chased in silver. It didn't squint as it stepped into the light, as did so many of its kind, but looked down on me in my nakedness like the avatar of some Stygian god. At last you have come, honoured kinsman! It spoke the standard perfectly, and stooping presented Prince Aranata's bloody ring on its palm. Welcome to this, my home, my Darantun. I have been waiting for you for such a long time. I found I couldn't speak. I could hardly think. It was as though my mind could not accept the reality of my situation. It was as if I'd awoken not merely on another world, but in another world. As if the universe I'd known, that of the Solon Empire, of the Red Company, of Padmarak and Nessus, Forum and Vorgosus, and Imesh, was gone. Severine had said the Tamerlane was destroyed, that all my people, all my friends, were dead. I could not accept that could not even take it in. The thought that everyone I knew, everyone I loved, everyone I'd fought beside for so long, the thought that they were dead. Durand and Ilex, 
Koskinen and White, Ilara, who had come up with me out of the pits of Emesh, and Lorian Aristides, the whole Red Company, and Corvo and Krim, and Polino, and Valka. Valka. Valka could not be dead. It simply wasn't possible. I would know. I would speak with you the prophet said, tilting its huge horned head, still offering Aranata's ring. It added, Take it! Speak! Quaking still from cold, I reached out and took the ring from Siriani's white hand. Not taking my eyes from its face, I fumbled the ring onto my right thumb, leaving the left to weep blood. And say what? I managed, swaying where I sat. Siriani straightened, regained its full height. "'You have taken two of my servants,' it said. "'Yubalu and Buhude were dear to me, and you destroyed them.' The Prince of Princes turned, robes fluttering in the slight gravity, and stalked to the edge of the pool of light. "'What is more, kinsman, you have broken my armies, stymied my conquests,' interfered in my efforts in your commonwealth, murdered our kinsmen, though for this I should honour you, though it is not Namnaran, not our way. What is more, your very existence is a blasphemy. You are Dunyasu, accursed and Atanta, blessed, and you are its creature. The giant Xenobite, slender as a sabre, flexed narrow shoulders, releasing the hem of its robe it turned. Think you your trick on Berenike has unfanged me? Think you your god can prevail? It tilted its head right, the Ciels in answer to a shake of the head. Ve! No! Utanash is fickle! False! It will betray you! Abandon you! I don't understand, I said. What is Utanash? The prophet spoke as if it had not heard me. When you call for it, it will be quiet. What do you want from me? I asked, the question of every prisoner in every age. Raising its white hands, still smeared with the blood from my ring, it pointed at me. Twelve and four times twelve generations of my clan have passed since the days of Elu. Twelve and four times twelve generations of suffering, of squalor. The hand dropped. No more! I looked on in silence, aching hands curling into fists. The other two rings, still on their cryo-burned fingers, bit and tore the flesh. Hissing, I summoned all my strength and stood. My head spun, but I am proud to say I did not fall. Feet apart for balance. I said, that is nothing to do with us. You are in the way, Siriani de Reica said. You, your god, you must be swept aside. My empire shall stretch from star to farthest star so that they might see me. I took two steps forward, finding my strength at last. Then kill me, I spat. A Nahute hung strapped to the prince's belt, a coil of bright silver. Doraica would have only to unspool it to end my life. It did no such thing. The prince only smiled, its lipless mouth peeling back to reveal glassy teeth in black gums. I was struck by just how much there was redolent of the grave in the Sielsen species, as if evolution in her caprice had crafted a species out of human nightmare and sent them against us. The Sielsen smile was a kind of snarl, not a smile at all. It is not enough that you should die, kinsman, the prince said. You should die well. That said, it turned and, gathering up its robes once more, swept from the pool of light. Its braided queue vanished last of all, a white serpent slithering into the night. Clean him up, doctor, and find a place for him, and fit him with a collar. We have a long...
long way to travel. And then it was gone. Somewhere in the dim distance, a door hissed. Severine plodded forward, rubber boots squelching in the slime and blood. Come, Lord Marlowe, she said, gesturing. Let us see to your poor hands. I slapped her hand away, staggered, swore as the pain in my fingers worsened. The very air hurt. Where are you taking me? She blinked at me through her mask. To Medica? Where is it taking me? I snarled. Severine only smiled. Chapter 26 The Cave Severine washed me and taped correctives to my wounded hands and chest. The bruises and bruised bones from my beatings on Padmarac had not healed in fugue. She taped these as well. Her ministrations watched by Cielsen guards in a medica that seemed tailored for human use, its instruments out of place in a chamber that appeared little more than a cave melted out of solid rock. I was fed as well, bland porridge made from bromos and a heel of brown bread. Better fare, somehow, than the Lothrians had offered me in their prison. Though that was not to last. These ministrations accomplished, the Minos witch handed me over to the Pale, who beat me and held me down as the smallest among them fixed a metal collar about my neck. Something in the collar whined as it clamped shut, and a faint red light gleamed. Dumb as I was and fugue-sick, I little remember the winding stairs and twisted corridors, the lifts and rattling chains of that horrid bastion. I am not Valka, and never was. My memory fails, fades, forgets. For that, more than anything, I am grateful. But I will not forget the smell, the stench of Darantun, iron and sulphur, blood and fire, rot and death. For all the pandemonic glamour of the Prince of Princes, its dominion was a horror of iron and raw stone. It was a kingdom in exile, a kingdom on the move, rough-hewn and hideous in the hollows of a wandering moon. How vast it was, I could never be sure. Vaster than the moons of Imesh, vaster than some planets. Darantun was an entire world, a planet driven by engines huge as the empires of old Earth and powerful as suns. And though its surface was dark and cold and rhymed with frost, Beneath its icy cap, in tunnels and in halls fit to outdo mythic Nidavalir in their scope, teemed millions, perhaps billions, of the Cielsen and their thralls. But where there were tunnels and halls, there were caverns too, dungeons and pits. The door hissed and sealed shut behind me, its lock panel glowing a faint ugly red, I had stopped shivering by then, but still I crossed my arms. Severine had given me a loose garment, a colourless kind of cassock, tight-sleeved but loose in the body so that it flapped about my ankles. Still barefoot, I stepped into the darkness of my new home, squinting to see by the light of the door panel. The dark stared back. Slowly, advancing on bare and calloused feet, I pressed forward into the gloom, testing the ground with my toes. The air felt warmer here than in the cubiculum where Severine had awakened me, warmer than the medica where she had bound my wounds. The air smelled of moist decay, fungal and earthy and strangely sweet. Something splashed in the darkness. "'Who's there?' I called out, feeling my way along the wall with one bandaged hand. The stone felt glassy beneath my fingers, as if shaped with plasma or a cutting beam. After only a few steps, I had to stop. Injured as I was, starving and fugue-sick, my head swam. Severine had kept me in Medica, a drab stone room that beeped with instruments, for what felt like more than a day. I couldn't be sure. 
The lesser gravity, the darkness and the sense of dislocation all mingled with the weight of the one thing I'd struggled with since the moment I crashed my chariot on the bridge. Grief. Another splash. Shutting my eyes a moment and screwing grief to the back of my mind, I shuffled forward. Hello? Absurdly, I almost expected to hear Brethren's chorus of voices rising from the darkness, almost expected to see its bloated arms waving through the gloom ahead. But there was nothing. Looking back, I saw the red glow of the door lock, faint and far away as a star, it seemed, though the short hall could not have been more than ten feet long. Ahead, the chamber opened to either side, its dimensions shrouded in dark, Show yourself. Quiet. The quiet stretched. Another splash. I'd made it perhaps a dozen paces from the end of the hall when my foot found water. A puddle? A pool. Hiking up my loose garment, I waded up to my knees, gritting my teeth against the cold. I was suddenly conscious of the throbbing of my injured hands and stopped careful to keep the robe out of the water. Something brushed against my leg. I lurched backward, splashing back toward the shore. Whatever manner of sightless creature dwelt in those alien waters, I did not desire to meet it. I sank onto the shelf, my back against the rough wall just inside the hall. It was just a fish, I told myself. Just a fish. Alone in the dark, I drew my damp legs close. Alone at last. At last the darkness closed in around me. The darkness and the reality of my imprisonment. The reality that the Tamerlane was lost. That Valka was dead. That everyone I knew and loved was gone. My red company. My people. Hot tears fell and I clenched my screaming fists, heedless of the pain that blossomed from beneath the black corrective tape. I wanted the pain, needed it, deserved it. I clenched my fists until the pain of those flayed fingers was enough to fill that pitch-dark cave with my ragged screams. Jovan's smile seemed to split the darkness, his evil, grey-skinned face leering at me, false eyes flashing. I understood a piece, then, of how Valka must feel, haunted as she was by Urbane's spectre. A sob escaped me, and its passage was like the falling of the first chips of stone that herald the breaking of a dam. What was the last thing I'd said to her? I'd leaned in to kiss her before mounting the ladder to the roof of that evil van. Leaned in and said, I'll be back. But I would never be back could never go back. I had lied to her in the end, in a way. Valka was dead. Had to be dead. You don't know that. Her voice, that bright Tavrosi voice, sounded so clear in the darkness of my cave that she might have been sitting across from me, sharing my cell as we had shared a cell in the dungeons of Khan Sagara. You don't know that. They had been her last words to me, a reminder that I was not always right. I almost laughed. What better epitaph might there be for Valka Ondera Vad Edda, once of Tavros? The memory pulled on another, and Jovan's smiling eyes seemed to shine at me from the shadows. Your Tavrosi concubine, he'd said. Her implants do pose a problem, one that... One that what? I sat a little straighter. Jovan had not spoken of Valka as one dead. She'd been alive when I'd boarded the shuttle that brought me to this place. How long ago had that been? How long had I been frozen on my journey from Padmarak to Daruntun? Hope and fury in me both, I stood and scraped my cheeks with the heels of my hands. I hurried back down the little hall away from the pool and pounded on the door, crying out for Severine, for Siriani. But no one came. I must have beaten on that portal for an hour before I staggered back against the wall, robe flapping about my heels. 
Focusing my vision, I peered across the vast infinitude of possibility, peering for a world where I opened the door and escaped. There were none. Reading this account, you might think my vision boundless, but it is hemmed in by what I know. In relying on my technician to power down the antimatter foundries on Ikana, I relied on his skills, only shepherding us along currents of time opened by his ability. I had no understanding of the mechanisms governing that Cielsin door, no knowledge whether the lock was electrical or mechanical, or where the controls might be. From my limited perspective, the door was as good as wall, and try as I might, the door as it presented itself to the limited prism of my consciousness would not open. I was Pandora's cat, neither living nor dead, and powerless to escape my prison. Powerless to escape my collar, too. I dug my fingers beneath the lip of the collar and pulled, straining to hear the scrape of locking mechanisms. It wouldn't budge, not in mine or any universe. I couldn't see my way to choices I didn't understand. At length, I returned to the shelf by the black pool and listened to the trickle of water flowing over distant stone. How long I lay awake, no man can say, for time itself dissolved in that darkness. Days, I think, passed without event. By the end of the first day, the inward gnawing of my stomach became difficult to ignore, and the desire for water drove me to drink from the pool. I had no way of knowing if the water was safe enough to drink, but the taste, at least, was not so evil. Bitter, yes, but not poisonous. I would know soon enough. If I had made some error, it wouldn't be long before some water-borne animalcule turned my bowels to water and twisted my guts. I thought of Cat dying in her gutter. What an end it would be if Hadrian half-mortal, whom men said could not be killed, who caught high matter in his hand, who had stood unburnt beneath the lance on Berenike, was struck down by some alien dysentery in a dungeon in the dark. But I would die of thirst elsewise. The door opened, admitted a bloody flow of light. You look comfortable came a drawling human voice. Two shadows stood in the arched portal. After what I guessed were days in darkness, even the dying ember's glow of Cielsin lighting was blinding. From the sneer, I guessed that these were no thralls of Syrianis, no collared slaves, and as they drew nearer, one kindled a lamp in the form of a slaved glow sphere that hung close to her shoulder. The white light, harsher than the red by far, blinded me for true. But as my tortured eyes adjusted, I recognized the face of Dr. Severine, her grey eyes, the same as Jovan's, twinkling down at me. But it was her companion who had spoken. His voice and face were unfamiliar, though something of the ensemble spoke to me of old acquaintance. Milk pale and hairless he was, tall and thin as if in imitation of his Cielsin masters. His eyes the familiar machine grey. He wore a knee-length brocade jacket, cut Mandari fashion, with high collar and knotted closures, so deep a purple it was almost charcoal with slippers to match, his legs sheathed in white hose. Eyes aching from disuse, I cast my gaze around the chamber. Stalactites hung from above, spires of milky stone shot through with dark veins so like the stone of our necropolis beneath Devil's Rest, on Delos, far away. The rough floor of the shelf carved a crescent shape against the shore of the pool, which stretched perhaps two hundred feet to the far wall, where the limestone rose in tumbled steps above the surface of the water. A narrow trough, perhaps six inches wide, ran along the far wall to a culvert of raw iron caked with grime. Water from the pool spilled down into it in a miserable trickle, a primitive latrine. There were no other amenities, unless it were the iron rings hammered into the walls at intervals. Noting my interest in the rough toilet, the man said, Oh, gave you one of the better cells, did they? 
He glanced at Severine, who said nothing. "'What do you want?' I asked, voice hoarse. In the presence of other people, I was suddenly aware of how grimy I felt, of the oil on my face and hands. I felt an overwhelming urge to climb into that pool and scrub myself clean. But even my meagre movements had set my stomach groaning. The man exhaled. To feed you. What else? The prince asked us to keep his guest comfortable. Is that what you call it? I'm glad to find your experience with Jovan has not taken the temper out of your imperial spine, the man said, coming from the hall onto the shelf proper. That will make watching your time with the prince all the more gratifying. He is an artist, you know. As he spoke, a crate floated in from the hall, carried by a gleaming drone held up on humming repulsors. It deposited the box and flew away, back out the open door. For a fleeting instant, I wondered if I might overpower the two sorcerers and make a dash for it. I knew I couldn't. The bald man sighed, massaged his neck. It is a pity your bird men are not with you. One owes me a head. My stomach turned over and knotted with old fury. Your... Urbane! The very same. The Mino sorcerer who crawled inside Valka's mind and crippled her bowed a mocking bow. I'd hoped you were dead, I said, though what a thin and feeble hope it proved. Urbane gave a thin-lipped smile. You are not the only man in the galaxy to whom death does not come easy. He looked me up and down. I would love to test the limits of your legend, my lord. I understand some in the Empire believe you are some kind of god. Even the prince, bless him, thinks you sent by one. But there are no gods. There is no magic, only mysteries we have not yet solved. As he spoke, he opened the lid of the crate and drew out a foil-wrapped packet. He tossed it at me with the air of a man tossing scraps at a dog. It slid across the floor. It was a legion-style ration bar. I didn't move to take it. I would give neither Urbane nor Severine the satisfaction of seeing me desperate. I would not beg or scramble for scraps, as they so clearly hoped. Severine spoke. There should be enough to last you, about a standard year, assuming you pace yourself. Her smile could have drawn blood. I matched it. How did you survive? I asked Urbane. The sorcerer gestured to his heart with two fingers. You missed my secondary transceiver. Broadcast an image of my demon here while you were busy with poor Bahude. I thought you needed a larger transmitter. Like the one on Are. He smiled and seated himself on the rations crate. You missed us by minutes that time. No, on Are we had to transmit several dozen demon images about half a light year, and we had to do it quickly. On Berenike there was only me, and I only needed to get to orbit. Urbane's face grew sardonic. You don't know much about machines, do you? I shrugged, and using the rough wall for a handhold pushed myself to my feet my already grimy robe clinging about me. Enough to know what you are. Severine's smile had not faltered. And what are we, Lord Marlow? Ghosts, I said. You died with your original bodies. The woman snorted and laughing, Urbane said, Primitive nonsense. It's not, I said, knowing too well the depth of the intrinsic linkage between consciousness and flesh. You're just an image, to use your word, a shadow of whoever you once were. We were shadows once, Severine said cryptically. We are more than human now. I studied their faces. Severine appeared human enough, a Mandari woman, as I've said, but Urbane had clearly left pieces of his humanity behind. His nose was flat and broad, not quite the slits of his Sielsin masters, and his ears 
were they fused to the sides of his skull? I met someone once who believed as you do. He was so abstracted from his humanity, I think he could no longer even understand what he'd lost. Nonsense. Urbane dismissed this with a hand. It's not, I said again. If it were nonsense, I felt sure I would have met one post-human chimera not given to moral insanity. You cannot become more than human by making yourself less human in the first place. Urbane stood smoothly. There is no such thing as human. We are data, genes, thoughts. The form is irrelevant. The form creates the function, I said. Change the body, change the mind. We did not come here to debate philosophy. No, I agreed. You came to gloat. I spread my hands, fingers flexing without pain. The correctives had been hard at work while I languished in the dark, evidence that at last several days had passed. Get on with it. I had gained some semblance of solid footing despite my collar and my cage. Urbane seemed to have noticed, for he snarled. You're the one locked in here, Marlowe. You've lost. I am, I said. I have. I turned away, peered down into the water at my feet. In a distant voice, not really meaning to speak, I continued, Your friend Jovan said you meant to destroy the Empire. To set humanity free, Urbane replied, spreading pale, long-fingered hands. By enslaving them to the Cielsin, I countered. The sorcerers looked at one another. It was the woman who answered. New paradigms, she said, new growth. The Cielsin offer opportunities not previously available. I snapped my gaze back onto the two sorcerers. Such as the dissolution of the Empire. Such as, Severine said, humanity has grown fat in your Empire's care. When was the last great invention? The last industrial revolution? The last new idea? Your lords are perfectly willing to play-act medieval darkness as though the golden age never ended. I turned my back on the wizards and paced toward the shore of my pool. There were fish in it, whole shoals of little silver leapers, no longer than my hand. The Cielsin wants to wipe us out. They want to wipe out the Yukajim, Urbane agreed. We are not Yukajim. You would not be Yukajim if you but knelt. My reflection stared back at me. It's a cast, I said, unable to scrub the shock from my voice. Long ago, when I'd met with Prince Aranata Otiolo, he had spoken of the human Yukajim in such a way that seemed to refer exclusively to the Solan Empire. Khan Sagara had been exempt. I had not thought much of it at the time. There had been so much more to consider. But the distinction and the importance of it crystallized. Sagara had subordinated himself to that prince in order to maintain a kind of peace and to trade with it. In doing so, he had signed himself onto the lowest rung of a ladder on whose highest stood the prince itself. And no wonder. Oaths were meaningless to the Dark Lord of Orgosos, who served only himself. The Cielsin didn't want to eradicate all of humanity. They wanted to eradicate every man who would not kneel to them. You are Aita yourself, Urbane said, a human Aita. A Yukajim Aita, Severine added. It's a cast, I said again dumbly, still looking out at the waters. So you will force mankind to kneel to her conquerors? We will force change, Urbane replied. Progress. Those are not the same thing. They are, Urbane countered, and I saw his shadow flickering on the wall across the water. Under the prophet's hand, humanity will spread across the galaxy. Across galaxies, we will fight in his armies, build his cities. 
we will ascend, we will evolve. Humanity will become more. We must. I turned to look at the wizard, at the clear imitation of his alien masters styled on his flesh. Examining his inhuman face, I understood him. He craved power. All his talk of uplifting mankind he directed at himself. He would sell trillions into bondage and the abattoir if it brought him prestige. At minimum, he meant to serve as the vizier of a new and inhuman emperor. But it was more than that. Urbane was a believer, whatever his protestations. You are a man of science, sorcerer, I said, sparing a glance for the other who had gone strangely silent. You say there are no gods. I say that religion and science are each journeys of faith. Each quests for something. The same something, in my experience. Urbain snorted. You're a fool. We are building a better world. Paradise, I said to him. Enlightenment? Call it what you will. The slap of that repost wrong-footed the two sorcerers, and I pressed on. Speaking only in terms of science, most change is evil. All change increases entropy, and all entropy is loss. As I spoke, I thought of my final apocalyptic vision of the darkness at the end of time, of the last stars winking out like candles as dark energy sundered light from light. The only good comes in preserving those things, peoples, institutions, whatever, which are good themselves. Severine sniffed. And who defines good? You? There are trillions of people in the Empire, trillions who will die defending it. I turned at last and glowered at Urbane and Severine. How many are you? I felt the sting take hold. Like the revolutionaries who penned the Lothriad, the Magi of Minos were doubtless few in number. Revolutionaries are always few, always forcing their vision on the disinterested masses, caring little for how those masses suffered in the execution of their dreams. Oh, we have people everywhere, Severine sneered. Not trillions, then. I managed a derisive sniff of my own. Urbane's face had gone grave as stone. I would not be so proud if I were you, he said. You think it is only the Commonwealth we've suborned. Our fingers are everywhere, in everything. The principalities, the republic, the small kingdoms. What's left of the freeholds? And the empire itself, I don't doubt. I no longer had the energy to be surprised. I should have killed you when I had the chance. I had no guarantee that carving the heart out of the wizard would have destroyed him for good. There was always the chance some backup of Urbane's image, his demon, remained on some faraway world. But it would not be the same demon, not the same man. How could one vanquish an enemy for whom death meant so little? Urbane's smile revealed a set of entirely canine teeth. And now you never will. He drew a step nearer. It is a pity your woman was lost. I would have liked to have her as well. The things we might have done with those implants of hers. He cackled then and licked his lips. My vision went white and I hurled myself at the sorcerer, aiming to knock those pointed teeth from his face. Weak though I was, my overhand still caught the magus on the side of his jaw, and he folded like paper, like a bundle of dry twigs. For an instant, I stood over the man whose worm had chewed through Valka's brain, the man who had crippled her for a time, had nearly killed her. For a moment I stood triumphant, fist raised for the second blow. Pain flooded my sensorium, as if lightning had struck every nerve ending and every synapse at once. It was as if I'd been encased in white-hot metal, as if my bones had been packed with glowing coals. 
I felt my skin blister and peel away, my cords snap and curl. If I screamed, and I must have screamed, I couldn't hear it over the pure liquid agony my universe had become. No acid, no poison, no virus. Not even the vile dysphalide of the chantry priests could burn with such heat. And then it was done, switched off as smartly as a lamp. When I recovered, I found I had fallen on my back, my rags and hair soaked by the water's edge. The pain had gone entirely, but its memory remained like a boot print on my heart. Severine and Urbane were staring down at me. The latter was grinning, his imitation Sielsen smile. His teeth were red. I pointed up at him. Got you. The pain flared again, brief and bright. When it passed, my throat was raw from screaming. I coughed, choked, would have retched if I had eaten the rations Urbane had tossed my way. I only heaved instead. You think this is one of your stories, the sorcerer said. You think you yourself some kind of hero. You think you are fighting evil. He shook his head. Your empire has kept you simple. There are no heroes. There is no good or evil. Stories are for children, and children have to be made to grow up. I understood what had happened then. The collar. I could still hardly speak without coughing. One of the sorcerers had activated the device by way of their implants. I couldn't have fought back if I tried. Nerve induction, Urbane explained, touching the back of his own neck. Applied directly to your spinal cord. Not pleasant, is it? I wrote the configuration myself. I've sampled every sensation the human brain is capable of feeling. Believe me when I say it can get worse. He turned to go and paused to kick the ration packet toward me with a pointed gesture. Eat, Lord Marlowe. You will need your strength. Severine followed in his wake, her hard shoes clacking after his mandari slippers. The last thing I heard before the door squealed shut was her voice saying, We'll leave the light. Chapter 27 The White Hand I mark time in meals, starting from the moment Urbane and Severine left me lying on the margins of the pool. The packet contained a humble ration bar with a pasty chemical flavour and a texture equal parts rawhide and sand. One bar was not enough to satisfy, though the nutritional content was calculated to keep me alive and healthy on two a day. Urbane had played a cruel joke giving the box to me, not only had giving me control of my own eating prevented me gaining any sense of the passage of time a jailer's visits might have engendered, it put me in charge of how quickly I ran out of food. But I wouldn't play their games, and held myself to two a day, or to what felt approximately like a day. With each meal I carved a notch on one wall with a bit of loose stone, crossed it to form an X as each day passed. The foil I carefully placed back into the crate, which was where I also placed my spent correctives when my cryoburn had healed, leaving raw white scars. Beneath the light of the solitary glow sphere, which I felt certain must also have been a camera through which Minos and Siriani alike kept watch on my imprisonment, I explored the confines of my cell. It was by far the largest cell I'd ever been confined to, with the special exception of Medallo House, but it was the most foul. Even the cell beneath the People's Palace in Vidatharad had had plumbing. In the dark beneath the surface of Darantun, I had no water but the bitter water of the pool that trickled down through cracks in the high ceiling, leaving stalactites, like Sielsin fingers reaching down. My only company were the strange extra tyrannic fish, eyeless and blind. The only sound, their occasional splashing and the metronomic drip, drip, drip of water. I explored every crack, 
every corner, even dove into the icy waters of the pool in an attempt to find any means of escape. There were none, and even if I could escape that chamber, where would I go? I was alone and as good as naked, miles beneath the surface of an alien world, and Urbane's collar yet hung about my neck. I entertained dreams of overpowering the guards, of using the mouth of an ahute to grind the collar down and make my escape into the bowels of that dark world, as I had made my way along the tunnels beneath Vidatharad. But they were only dreams. Guards never came. A score of X marks marched along the wall. Two score. Three. No one came. I talked to myself, told stories, recounted tales of Simeon the Red, of Kaja Soulier and the Sid Arthur. I recited passages from the Romance of Alexander, from Meditations and the Book of the Mind. I sang songs I'd learned from Polino and Switch and Colosso, even some of Valka's I'd learned by years of long exposure. Anything to pass the time, to fill the silence. But the silence came on anyway, and though I couldn't be idle and pace the confines of my cage like the very tigers whose story I'd shared on Padmarak, I grew quiet in time, muttering to myself. Sleep came less and less, and though my wounds healed, I felt a grey sickness settle upon me, mingling with the grief that all my friends were dead or captured, and the last terrible parcel of hope that denied that same grief. But I would not accept it. I would not choose. The door opened, its squeal hounding me from some lonely place between waking and dreaming. Oui, ma otajoun, came the rough voice of a Sielsin. I stirred slowly, sluggish from lack of sleep. Five of the Prophet's guards entered, striated black armour gleaming, the badge of the white hand imprinted over their hearts. Ijanama, otajoun, junewo. Hold him down. The one whose deep blue surcoat marked it for an officer stood by while the others held my face to the stone floor and affixed binders to my wrists. I did not resist, and the soldiers hauled me roughly to my feet, their taloned hands carving shallow scratches into my flesh. It took a measure of doing to find my tongue after I knew not how many days or weeks of disuse. Where are you taking me? I asked. The Zenobites blinked at me. One shoved me by the head. I repeated the question in its own tongue. The officer bared its glassy teeth but gave no answer. You're sure the Great One said we can't have our play? asked one of the guards before me, tilting its horned head. Sujawo! barked the officer, shoving its underling away from me. This one's for the prince. You heard our orders. Unharmed, he said. And you ask about play. The Sielsen's nose slits flared. Can't you see it's the wrong kind anyhow? You'd kill it and lose your spawn. And then where'd we be, Gurana? The Great One would grind us up for meal. It shoved its subordinate again. I'm carrying is all, said the one called Gurana. Its commander snarled. Then you find somewhere else to shove it. This one's for the prince. Even after more than three centuries of life, my grasp of the Xenobites' language was tenuous. Though I was undoubtedly by then one of the Imperium's premier experts, there was so much of the Sielsen culture we simply did not know. Without cities to plunder and libraries to raid, much of Sielsen tradition was oral, preserved by Baitayan, like Tanaran. The niceties remained mysterious even to me. Still, I could guess the sort of play Garana had in mind. Carrying, it had said. Starved and starved for sleep as I was, I looked on my captors with new horror. The Sielsen were hermaphrodites, monosexed, but with twin roles. The Akaranta, active, and Yetumna, passive. Early in the war, we believed the Sielsen reproduced as we did, one impregnating the other. But it was not simple. 
the Cielsin were parthenogenetic, so that any one might conceive a child on its own, a genetic duplicate. Rather than impregnating a partner, the gravid Cielsin might implant its self-made embryo in another of the species, whereupon the genetic makeup of the host would change the developing fetus via something our magi called conjugation, so that the resulting child, which had begun as a genetic duplicate of the first parent, would take on the traits of both. What was more, provided it acted quickly, this second parent might avoid implantation and pass the child to another, so that the embryo was the product not of one parent or two, but three perhaps more. I had never imagined that the host might not need to be a member of their own species. I felt sick, and said nothing as the officer frog-marched me from my cell. The sound of screaming resonated up the hall as we hurried on, passing a Cielsin in an iron mask, who led a column of human slaves, chained collar to collar. In the dim red light, I might have been forgiven for thinking I'd died, and gone to hell. My guards were mostly silent as they marched me up a winding stair carved in the living rock, its pale walls gleaming orange in the light of low sconces. Higher and higher we climbed. The nature of the corridors changed. Gone was the graven rock, the burrows and sealed tunnel mouths. Reaching the top of another stair, we passed between two sculpted horrors, three-headed Cielsin figures with faces peering across the archway, and in either direction, their black glass eyes concealing cameras that watched all who came and went. Beyond, we stepped out into an echoing hall whose high-ribbed arches stretched above us like black bones. Other Cielsin paused in their business to watch us pass, or else hurried out of our way. Many wore the dark, organic-looking armour I'd grown accustomed to. These marched in units, or stood sentinel, their white-masked faces and horned crests proud in the bloody light. Still more wore silken robes or sleeveless suits, in whites or greys or blues, with here and there a green or violet. Among them, naked or dressed in rags, moved human slaves, hollow-eyed and underfed. A group of them carried one Cielsin master on a litter, while another, laden with a heavy pack like some bipedal mule, delivered goods from the mouth of one side passage to another. It was a street. I was on a Cielsin street. The boy I'd been wanted to stop in wonder, but my guards wouldn't allow it. They pushed me along, past a pack of staring human slaves, from their pallor, I took many of them for Lothrians, but there was one grey-haired man with clear green eyes who might have been of the Imperium. I held his gaze a moment, long enough to see him mouth a single word. Palatine. I nodded. He averted his eyes. Garana and the other guards shoved me past the line of inhuman guards and through a passage that opened onto a truly massive space. Vaster than any of the domes of Vidatharad, vaster than the hollow places of Vorgosos. I did stop in wonder then, and earned a beating from Garana. Ahead of us stretched a narrow bridge across a vast pit, one of many like the spokes of a great wheel that converged on the far side before the gnarled edifice of the Daryagon, the fortress palace at the heart of Darantun, whose tall and pointed gates yawned to admit me lit by the molten gleam of magma from the exposed mantle far below. A shrill cry went up as we approached within sight of the gate, and the mighty doors swung outward. Half carried by the inhuman soldiers who held me, my calloused feet scraping the smooth stone, we passed beneath the arch, and along a mighty hall dominated left and right by monstrous carvings. They were not carvings of Cielsin, my escort raised their faces in gestures of submission, baring their throats, as we passed beneath their monolithic shadows. I couldn't help but emulate them, turning my face to stare in horror and in awe. I didn't mark the strangeness of the contrast then, that the Cielsin bowed their heads to signal a willingness to do violence and raised their chins in submission, where we men bow in deference and raise our chins to provoke. 
What was to them a gesture of reverence to the things carved on those mighty plinths was to me a last vain gesture of defiance to those dark gods whom my captors praised. I caught sight of the shapes of curling tendrils, of membranous wings worked in stone, of faces folded and wrinkled as tonsils of eyes and arms too numerous and misshapen to count. One had the shape of a mighty serpent, and another a form like a brain with many hands. Another bat-like thing clung to a graven pillar, while a shapeless horror of rippling stone boiled beneath the next arch. Watchers, I breathed, still looking on. But my escort didn't speak the tongues of men and paid me no mind. Still more guards showed us to a lift, and we ascended to another hall, this one greater than the first, and supported by arched and slanting columns. Throngs of the pale watched from either side as my hosts shunted me along, my bare feet soiling rich carpets. The scent of incense filled the air, and the crackle of burning. We ascended a shallow stair to a round arch where guards in black and white armed with polished glaives, stood sentinel. Coming to the top of that stair, I beheld what I knew must be our final destination. Violet light fell through windows high above, and I recognized the fractal distortions of warp travel. The blurred and stretched stars ahead blew shifted by the speed of our travel. That distortion set ripples to playing on the jet-black floor. The unholy geometries of iron archways and pointed windows were like no human building. The floor ridged and uneven. The surfaces of the walls and pillars knurled like spurs of seals in bone. Like a throne room, it seemed to me, but there was no throne. Instead, a hemisphere of white stone dominated the space beneath the high and narrow windows, a round door in its front. Its only approach, a narrow span of naked stone that jutted out across a pit whose depths none had fathomed and survived. Boom. The moment I crossed the threshold into that black chamber, a deep drum sounded. Boom dum. Beyond the arch, about incense braziers burning low and smoky to either side, a crowd of Cielsen retainers in silks of purest white gathered and lay one by one with their faces to the ground. Teke! cried a herald, and the gathered retainers replied, Teke, teke, tekeli! It was not a Cielsen word, though to the uninitiated it had the sound of their language. I puzzled over it, turning the sounds in my head as I turned my head from side to side. I had heard it before, on Berenike, but I did not know its meaning. Boom dum. A Cielsen holding the heraldic spear rattled its silver chimes. Raka atanta, aita ba ajun, ikor shu ba elu, it proclaimed. Blessed be our clan chief, blood shoot of elu. Yayato! came the reply. Blessed be our clan chief who holds in his hands our world fleet and blood clan. Yayato. Blessed be our clan chief, the white-handed god-killer. Yayato. Blessed be the prince of the princes of Yue. Yayato. Blessed be the prince Siriani Doreika, our master, our keeper, our father, our mother. The herald's mantra had reached some kind of crescendo, and with each pronouncement, the crowd replied with the yayato, each coming faster and faster with the drum beats. The soldiers beat their butts of their glaives against the stone floor in time with that drumming, until the whole of the palace of Dar Yagon shook with their thunder. The black door in the white dome across the narrow bridge opened on a deeper darkness, and the shiomu appeared. Doreika wore the same sculpted black armor it had worn on our first meeting, the same black and silver toga and cape, the same chaste silver shone in its crown, and its long cord of braided white hair hung over one shoulder to its waist. Unbidden, Gibson's ancient rebuke rose in my mind. Must everything you say sound like it's straight out of a Eudoran melodrama? Despite the horror of my circumstances, I almost laughed. 
but it was a nervous laughter. The laughter of the condemned. Siriani Dereica placed one foot in front of the other and crossed that narrow way. The bridge could not have been wider than the fingers of my outstretched hand, but the prophet seemed not to mind. It raised its hands for silence, and silence fell. Tekeli, it said, repeating the strange word, which the prostrate inhuman crowd echoed without raising their eyes. I am the Shiomu, the prophet Siriani who has brought you out of the darkness. I am the prince whom Elu foretold, who will lead our people through that darkness to new life. I am the sword that will wipe clean the universe. I am the hand that will make it anew. Yayato, the crowd intoned, rising to their knees. Yayato. I stood even straighter before this pronouncement until the prophet's eyes found me. Sielusin Bakaun, it proclaimed. My people. The fire is kindled, the clan chiefs of our blood kin gather, and Ayatavani has been called for. I have called for it. Ayatavani. Vanuri was to meet. Vani then was a meeting. Ayatavani, a meeting of Aita, of clan chiefs, of war princes, a king's mute. Not for the first time my blood ran cold. Siriani's huge black eyes had not left my face throughout this entire monologue. I understood then why I was being kept alive. I was to be paraded in triumph before the princes of the Sielsin, as I had paraded Yubalu's chimeric hulk before Caesar and the great houses of the Imperium. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I wondered if the Sielsin had always practiced such public humiliations, or if it were another thing, like the Togarit War, that Siriani had acquired from its study of mankind. Yetada, Yubalu, O Yum, Ikan Kairi, O Manasia, I said, raising my voice to challenge the prophets for that silent hall, speaking Sielsin so that those listening would understand. Yubalu said I was to be a sacrifice. You dare speak her name! A high voice wailed. Among the ribbed columns and kneeling suppliants, red light shone. I knew the voice at once. I'd heard it before. On Ekana. The eye descended from the emptiness above. A red spark in a white metal sphere no more than a cubit in diameter. Okunne. Hushansa, the true Hushansa, the mind and inhuman brain that controlled the iron puppets I had battled on Verdi Planum, peered down at me from within its floating chassis. In the rear of the room, statues moved. Siriani raised a hand. Quiet, Ushan Belu! Onana! The prophet drew near one hand securing the drape of its garments. Switching from its native tongue to Galstani, Siriani Doreica said, Without you, Marlowe, I could never be. It stooped over me, its breath a fetid poison in that place of sweet-smelling smoke. With one clawed hand it reached up and combed my knotted hair back behind one ear. All that I do, I do through you. You are my soil, my bedrock. All I build, I build on you. It drew back, bearing glass fangs. It gestured at the white dome and the black door. Narrow is the way to rule. Narrow is still the path which is ordained for me. Which path? I asked. I shall become a god. The prophet answered, I shall make an offering of your people to the gods who dwell in the darkness beyond the father sons, and in so doing I will destroy Utanash. 
I will destroy the lie. The quiet. I frowned in spite of myself, a pit forming in my chest. Siriani had some kind of vision, it seemed, for it seemed to know the quiet dwelt among our possible futures, a creature whose creation depended on the survival of mankind. Siriani hissed, So you call it! It drew back, moving to within a few bare paces of the precipice. My head swam with fantasies of breaking free of the guards that held me, of making a last desperate rush at the prophet and sending us both to our deaths far below. But something of that thought must have written itself on my face, for no sooner had the thought entered my mind than a metallic ring as of spurs sounded, and a white-armoured figure appeared from behind a pillar. The Vyadan general Vati stood far to one side, but I knew the Chimera could move fast as thinking. I'd never make it, even if I could escape my guards and an experimental effort to try earned me a sharp knee to my guts. Shackled, I knelt on the floor not a dozen paces from the Dark Lord. Siriani, perhaps eight feet tall and crowned in silver, said, Utanash is the lie, the author of this lying universe, this prison. It is false. Its powers will fail you, and when they do, you will see the truth. As it spoke, a giant shape moved in the shadows to one side. Turning my head, I saw a hulking shape crawling along the aisle beyond the nearest row of pillars behind the kneeling courtiers. Six-legged it was, like one of the walking tanks deployed by our legions. Its head swung like a turret, one-eyed as Hushansa, its white carapace lit red beneath in the gloom by the light of the incense braziers. There are no gods but ours, the prophet said, raising its voice to the whole chamber. There are no gods but ours, the court echoed, high voices scratching at the ribbed vaults. Lowering its voice once more, speaking only to me, Siriani Doreica said, I will destroy it, and you, and everything. Then kill me, I said. And remembering my audience, I raised my voice and said it again. Shusa bika oka unwo. The great prince made a gesture, and Garana or one of the others cuffed me about the ears. I struck the stone floor face first and lay there. In my weakened state, it was almost too much to contemplate standing. Still, in my own language, the clan chief hissed. You do not give the orders here, kinsman. Think you that I am a fool? Think you that you might goad me to error? No, your death is appointed. It will occur, but it will occur in its time. At your moot, I said. The Aitavani. Siriani made the breathy sound that passed for an affirmative in its native tongue. I see you understand me perfectly. Your time is running down. It's not hard to understand, I countered. You mean to make a spectacle of me, to impress the other Aita into kneeling before you. I was aware suddenly of how still was the congregation about us, the functionaries of Dereica's court, all kneeling on the hard floor, unmoving as stone. A high keening noise escaped the prince's throat. It was a Sielsen laugh. Impress them! Yes! Yes, indeed! A rush of wind battered the air, and looking up I saw a pale shape alight on a spar that stretched between two pillars. Its body was whip-slender, an articulate metal serpent with two thin legs and shoulders barely broader than a boy's. Its armoured white head bore a horned crown like the ones on Hushansa's puppet bodies. As I watched, it folded huge gossamer wings and slid down the column even as the spider thing advanced on six legs to join Vati and Hushansa about their lord. Four of them. There had been six. Counting them, I knew I beheld the four remaining figures of the white hand, the four surviving members of the Yede Yamani, the exalted 
holy slaves who served the prophet. As I drank in this revelation, the winged creature shrilled, This Yukaji killed Bahude! The creature prostrated itself before its lord, wings folding into its back. It killed Yubalu! We must have blood! Silence, Aulam! Siriani said, sweeping its gaze over the throng. Rakayu uelekir udanta! The time is not right. We were on stage. The prophet was performing for its court. I was the centerpiece in a pageant of tribal justice. The Vyadayan of the Yedi Yamani had entered in line with a script. Twice now the prophet had silenced its hand, twice it had refused to hear their pleas. The huge six-legged thing swiveled its turret head, and a voice deep as the pit at Doraica's back said, Yabalu and Bahude were our sister brothers. This creature must be punished. Its life is Dunyasu, an affront. Each breath it takes, it stole from your most holy slaves. For a third time, Siriani Doraica said, Silence! Then Vati knelt, and kneeling the chimera was almost as tall as its lord. Its horned and feathered crest tipped back as the machine bared its throat in gesture of submission. It alone of the four fingers of the white hand had not spoken. Tayanu speaks the truth, great one. The Dunyasu Malo has profaned the blood clan. We are dishonored. Only blood may wash our blood. Life for life, the winged one Aulam exclaimed. Uja raka aita wo, the prophet replied. It is aita, and an aita vani has been called. By the laws of Elu, it is protected. The huge creature called to Yanu, countered, By the laws of Elu, it is forsworn. The prophet and its Yedir had reached some form of impasse. I thought I understood. By the ancient laws that govern Sielsen society, no prince might kill another under the flag of truce, and the act of calling for this Aitavani had raised that flag. But those selfsame laws, and perhaps older laws, the laws of the jungle, of the cave tunnels, of the birds and fishes, decreed that any who attacked the Itani, the Blood Clan, and the Skianda, the World Fleet, was forfeit. Honor demanded Dereica destroy me, and Honor demanded it protect my life. It was the tension between these two demands that had arranged this pageant, and it was likely the tension between these demands that had caused me to be kept in myself for so long. The powers in Dereica's clan, its Vyadayan and Baitayan, its warriors and priests and close counsellors, must have deliberated over this moment for weeks to confect this performance. Speaking for the gathered courtiers, its voice raised. The Prince of Princes said, No Aita may kill Aita when the fire is lit. We sail for Aktarumu, where Elu the Great met the whispering gods. Would you have me break our sacred laws? They, the courtiers proclaimed, this Yelsin word for no. Speaking for the hand, Vati, still kneeling, still baring its throat, asked, But this Dunyasu has slain two of our sister brothers, two of our bondmates and bedmates. Should it be spared? Should we then break our sacred laws? They, the throng cried once more. Speaking in its appointed time, Siriani asked, What then is to be done? It must be chastised answered Alum. It must be mortified, replied Hushansa. And Tayanu added, It must be punished. I hardly heard any of this, for all my attention was given over to a single word. Akhtarumu. Siriani had said we were sailing for Akhtarumu. It was a word I'd heard but twice before, from Tanaran, the baitan of Prince Aranata Otiolo, who had said that it and the Achakta captain Uvanari had discovered the location of Imesh and its quiet ruins from Akhtarumu, and again in my dreams chanted beneath the shadow of the Black Dome. 
Slowly, I eased myself back to my knees. Speaking then in a stage whisper in Galstani, so that only I might hear and understand, Siriani said, It grieves me that it must come to this, kinsman. But my slaves speak truly. You have assaulted my blood clan, killed two of my mates. This I cannot abide. This I cannot forgive. Mates. I could not help myself, and looked round at the iron horrors standing or fallen about their lord. Tall Vati with its pale crest and banded armour, the winged terror Aulam, still prostrate before the prophet. The hulking Tiyanu, six-legged and larger than any ground car, and Hushansa, Hushansa the many-handed, whose nucleus orbited the gathering like an evil satellite. I had wondered how it was the Aita kept its pet giants in thrall, why the Chimeras didn't simply slaughter their prophet and each other in a mad scramble for the top. Could it truly be love, obedience out of devotion? Could the Sielsen feel such a thing? Stunned to silence, I watched the Aita with its retainers, and despite everything I felt a glimmer of the hope I'd known as a boy. The hope that conciliation might be possible between their race and ours. The spark blew out in the next instant. There would be no conciliation between our two races. I am no conciliator. At a gesture from the prophet, my guards clamped clawed hands on my shoulders and held me fast. Siriani drew nearer, its huge face descending as it bowed toward me. Give me your hands, kinsman. I made no move, and Garana seized me by the hair and tipped my head back, bearing my throat in forced submission. I gritted my teeth and clenched my fists as the prophet seized my right hand with its cold, damp ones, dragging the left along with it in its manacle. Slowly, inexorably, Siriani worked its clawed fingers around my own and forced my right hand to open. We are Aita! You and I, it said, still speaking my own tongue. Holding my right hand in its left, it displayed its right, fingers spread. But you have taken two fingers from my hand. And curling one digit down and then another, it said, Yubalu, Bahude. What it did next, I have never forgotten. Siriani did not move quickly but moved instead with deliberate strength to place the two fingers of my right hand in its mouth. So stunned was I, so horrified, I forgot to react for an instant. An instant was long enough. The Xenobite's jaw clenched as it clamped down and bit off my last two fingers. Howling, I pulled my hand away, trying to rise, to run, to fall away from the monster that had taken half my good hand. I felt my heart beating in those wounded fingers, saw red blood dripping from the ruined stumps and down the prophet's chin. For another single, obscene instant, I saw the red ends of my fingers still between Siriani's teeth. Then it tipped its head back and swallowed them whole. For one of very few times in my life, I was struck speechless. I clutched the ruined appendage to my chest, blood soaking my robe. The prophet smiled down at me, teeth red with my own blood. It laughed then, laughed the high-wailing laughter of its kind. I felt shame rise in me. It was all a joke, all a hideous joke. Fingers for fingers. Taguta o tashunwo, Siriani ordered. Garana's hand seized the neck of my robe and rent the garment in two. Then, raising its voice for the crowd, Siriani proclaimed, Shiaba! Ute Aita by Yukajim! Behold the King of Men! I wanted to say that it was not true, that I was not the Emperor. But to be Aita was not quite the same thing. The Aita must be warriors, and our Caesar fought from the rear, commanding others to bloody their hands in his name. Siriani doubtless understood this fact, understood that to humanize 
I was only a knight, but I had bested Aranata and Ularani both. With my men I had bested Yubalu and Behude. I was Aita, the only human to carry that title, and so I was, to the Sielsin, the prince of the princes of man. It was no wonder the prophet wanted me for its triumph. Killing me before the Aitavani in Akterumu would be a coup to end all coups. All that I do, Siriani had said, I do through you. Through me. Through my death. It would solidify its claim to be the Aita Beatani, the prince of princes and high king of the Sielsin. Siriani raised its white hand and gave a sign. I heard the whip snap before I felt it, the red pain burning my back. I felt hot blood well and run as skin tore and split. The whip snapped again and I choked off my cry and slumped as my handlers propped me up. I wouldn't scream. Gibson had not screamed. The lash fell a third time. A fourth. Blood soaked my torn gown and ran down my thighs and I screwed my eyes shut. What is pain? the teacher asked his student. It is an illusion, the student answered. The teacher struck his student across the face. Urbane had believed the phantom pain he'd administered to be a masterpiece of sadism, and perhaps it was. Perhaps the sensations he'd engineered were exquisite in their intricate cruelty. But nothing is worth the real thing. Pain, I have said, forms the basis of all morality, for no man who suffers pain doubts that it is evil. No one who experiences pain can even question it. How many times did the lash fall? A dozen? Three? When it was over, my jailers released me, and I fell to the bloody floor at Siriani's feet. What I do to this? Siriani said, and from the shadow that fell across me where I lay, I knew it pointed down at me. I will do to every one of its kind. It gathered up its robes and pitched its voice to address my escort. Take it to the wall and hang it, it decreed. Let the slaves see their king. Chapter 28 Hadrian Bound The pain drowned everything, even itself. Every inch of me was numb, though with each subtle motion of my body the agony flared white-hot and new within me. I opened my eyes. The world resolved slowly. I wished it had not resolved at all. Beneath and before me lay a cyclopean city of iron and black stone. Cruel towers rose beside rivers of glowing magma, or else hung like stalactites from the metal roof of the world, thousands of feet above. Crude metal stacks carried the fumes of industry from evil mills and foundries fed by those same rivers, and the whole place stank of burning and of brimstone. As I watched, I could see the shapes of men in the distance, hauling steel beams into place laboring at the construction of some new tower or monument beneath the watchful eyes of their pale masters. So vast was that subterranean space that it might have swallowed whole two of the great domes of Vidatharad, and yet had room for a third, and from my high vantage I could see the openings of arched passages to other caverns and tunnels equally immense. Never before had I seen so great and terrible a city of the enemy. Indeed, no greater city of the Sielsin was there in creation, save one, and that they did not build. Only slowly did I recognize that I was in the same cavernous vaults through which I'd marched on my approach to the Dar Yagun and the Prophet's throne, the black city of Darantun. I tried to crane my neck to see, and realized I was falling. With a shout, I looked down to rough flagstones a hundred feet below, bare feet dangling over nothing. Movement sent a flaring agony up my arm to my throbbing hand, and full understanding came only steadily, as if reality wouldn't fit itself, could not fit itself into my brain. 
I was hanging on a chain, strung up by my right arm, the other arm and both legs free. My sudden movement had set me swinging like the pendulum of an old clock, and I struck the wall, impact sending waves of pain shooting up my arm and across my tortured back. It was only then that I remembered the whipping, and looking down saw dried blood streaking my naked legs. They'd taken my gown from me, and I hung unclothed for all to see, my mutilated right hand permanently raised as a sign and warning to all who saw me. I had defied the Prince of Princes, and all would see the consequences of that defiance. How long I hung there I never knew, nor could guess how long I'd been unconscious. Sielsin passed in the plaza below, stopped and pointed. What human thralls there came averted their eyes and hurried past, chains rattling. It would not be until later that I realized precisely where I was, hanging from the wall beyond the arched outer entrance to the gates of Dar Yagon. When had I last tasted water? Last eaten? With a titanic effort I reached up with my free hand and seized the chain above the binder that held my wrist. Pulling upward I managed to take the tension off my tortured arm, though I shut my eyes to block out the sight of my mangled hand and the memory of my fingers caught between Siriani's teeth. Blood welled up where the manacle cut flesh and dribbled down my arm. One pain traded for another, as the act of pulling lit up my tortured back, even as my arm and shoulder cried with relief. Stunned, I let go of the chain, returning my weight entirely to the tortured limb. The short drop and sudden stop whited out my vision, and when I came to once more it was to the sound of a winch, of rattling chains, and to the sensation of rough stone scraping my torn back. Rough hands pulled me over the lip and into a close, low-ceilinged chamber, whose open face looked down on the plaza below. Dazed as I was, mind blurred by the numb agony in my tormented arm and shoulder, I was only dimly aware of the foul-tasting rag my inhuman captors had shoved into my mouth. So parched was I that I sucked at the rag's contents without thinking, and gagged at the taste, foul, salty, and alkaline. The hollow chamber filled with the harsh sound of alien laughter. I recognized the taste of urine too late, and coughed, spat the rag out on the floor. Peter tone you, Ede you, one of the jailers barked. I don't know what's good for it. Pale hands held me down while they forced the foul rag back between my teeth and squeezed. I choked, tried in vain to fend the Sielsin off, but ultimately I failed. They left me lying on the bare stone, still chained by my wrist, alone. I fantasized about looping the chain about my neck and leaping from the open face of the chamber, but it took every effort, every ounce of energy left, just to roll onto my side and spare my back. That was how he found me. The door opened some time later. I did not even try to move, not even when something cool burned my back. I smelled antiseptic, alcohol. An old man's face peered down at me, skin leathered by torment and by time. He had a plebeian's blunt features, dull eyes, flat nose, jug ears, and his jaw quavered as he went about his ministry, cleaning my wounds with a sponge and a bucket of what I took for antiseptic. Why bother? I managed to grunt. The old man didn't answer, but produced a squeeze bottle and tipped clear water down my throat. I spit it out, expecting another trick. I could still taste the Sielsin urine, and eyed the fellow with suspicion. He shook his head, jowls quavering. Who are you? In answer, the man pointed to my collar, then to his own. You don't speak standard? I asked. The man shook his head, opened his mouth to reveal a black hole where tongue and teeth once had been. I'm sorry. He shrugged, then proffered the water again. I took it with my left hand and managed to drink, 
clenched my teeth as the alcohol burned the marks the lash had made. I lay there in silence, permitting the slave to do what he was ordered to do, to treat my wounds, to see that I survived for another day's torment. His work finished on my back, he moved to my wrist and mangled hand. As he did so, I caught sight of the sunburst tattoo on his neck and the faded number opposite it. One, one, one. You were a soldier, I murmured, gesturing weakly at the mark. They were a legionnaire's tattoos. He had been taken in battle or else taken in fugue. He would have been a young man when that happened, and so had lived his life in bondage. A knot twisted in my guts at the thought. What's to be done with me? The man paused in his ministrations to point squarely at his ruined mouth again, eyes narrow. I felt shame and looked away. I felt a hand on mine a moment later and flinched away, but the fellow caught my arm and pressed his sponge to the stumps of my fingers. I almost whited out from the pain and cursed, trying to flinch away, but the soldier held me fast. I tried to pull my hand free, but he held me, and when I found his face again through tears, I found his eyes captured by something he saw on my hand. It was the Emperor's ring. The mute slave's eyes darted to my face, back to the ring, and as the poor slave in the street had done, the fellow mouthed the word, Palatine. Yes, I said roughly. Hadrian. My name is Hadrian. The slave nodded, eyes darting to my hand again. He seemed to be thinking about something. He sucked on the inside of his cheek. What that something was I realized too late. He seized the Emperor's ring and tugged it off my finger, and when I cried out, he stood sharply, upsetting the bucket of disaffectant in his haste to be gone. I tried to rise, but my healer struck me with his heel, and I fell back stunned. The little man leaped on me, and before I could resist, he seized the chain about my neck, the chain from which hung the quiet shell. No! I hissed and threw the man off me. The chain snapped in his fingers, and the pendant rolled across the floor. Injured as I was, I couldn't stand, and the man found his feet before me. God! I shouted, and remembering just where I was, shouted again. Shwindu! I had little hope of the Sielsen coming to save me. Now the thought almost makes me laugh. But it might have frightened the slave all the same. The little man scrabbled for the pendant and snatched it up. He glared down at me and made a cursing sign first and last fingers extended, as he mouthed the word again, Palatine. I tried to rise. I failed. The mute slave's heel cracked out again, and the world went dark. The Sielsen returned, the noise of their coming a thunder that shattered my fitful sleep. Before I could get word out or get my bearings, they seized me wrist and ankle and tossed me over the ledge and out into the stinking air. I felt my shoulder pop as the chain went taut and the manacle tore my wrist. The pain was unbearable, and howling darkness like warm black ink flooded my eyes. It was the fourth time they'd suspended me from that chain. Five, counting that first experience— Five days, or what passed for days, on Darantoon, and when each day was done, when I could scarcely breathe, they would haul me back into the cell, torment me, and leave me to another mute slave, a woman who salved my wounds and nursed me on clean water and porridge. What had befallen the man who had stolen the Emperor's ring, I never knew, nor learned why he had not taken the others. The woman could not say. Her tongue had also been cut out. All I suffered I shall not recount, for some things do not bear repeating. I opened my eyes again, the pain in my shoulder louder than the unheard burning of the stars. The great city of the Sielsen lay before me. It didn't seem real. It was some nightmare out of Milton or Bosch or Chambers, a painting of hell. You're not going to die here, you know, a cool voice said. 
A shadow fell across my sight, and turning, I saw my brother Crispin standing on the wall beside me as though it were the floor. He took a bite of an apple and grinned down at me, looking for all the world like he had been when I'd left him on the floor at Haspida. A boy of fifteen. You're going to die there. Shut up, Crispin, I groaned. But when I looked back, he was gone. I missed him at once and felt myself begin to cry, stupidly, for a brother who had hated me and a home I'd never loved. But he was right. I wasn't going to die here. I was going to act a rumu to die. This was only hell. Death came later. He's going mad, the cool voice said. It took an effort of will to realise the voice had never been Crispin's. Urbane was standing in the square below me, dressed in his violet mandari silks, his bald and unnaturally tall crown hidden beneath a dome-shaped cap. Beside him, Severine nodded. That didn't take long. I must say I'm disappointed, my Lord Marlow, Urbane called out. They say you are the Earth's Chosen. Surely the Chosen need not suffer so, he laughed. I had tried already. A thousand times I'd reached for my second sight, my vision of the collapsing waveform of potential. And a thousand times I'd failed. The vision wouldn't come. Starved and tormented as I was, I couldn't reach the rivers of time any more than I could reach up with my left hand and lift myself to save my tortured right. Delirious, I could not summon the focus necessary to free myself. In the distance a gang of men dragged stones. I could not free myself, or fly. Whatever power I had, it was sundered from me. The quiet had gone quiet indeed, just as Siriani had said it would. "'Come down, my lord,' Urbane mocked. "'Come down among us mortals. Will you not come down?' "'Come up instead,' I groaned, swaying on my chain and making the cords of my shoulder ache. "'You're missing the view!' Urbane's laughter filled the square below. "'I much prefer this one.' I will kill you, I shouted, sending paroxysms racing up my arm. Against my best wishes, I cried out, turning the shriek into a threat. By earth, I will kill you. Blood pounded in my ears, and I fantasized about tearing my own arm from its socket and falling on the black sorcerer. Urbane's pale face never stopped smiling. I was sorry to miss your meeting with the Great One he called, meaning Prince Siriani. I heard it was quite the performance. I said nothing. My scream had taken all my strength from me, and I hung there in a grey haze. Urbane faded beneath me, and Severine with him. A warm wind buffeted my face, and looking up, I saw a great bird stooping over me, its dark pinions spread. Udax? I asked reaching out with my left hand to clap the Irktani on the shoulder. But Udax was dead, had died fighting Behude on the fields of Berenike. It was an eagle I saw, the very bird that Jove had set to torment Prometheus. It watched me with dark reptilian eyes. "'They are going to kill him like this,' said a woman's voice far away. "'Valka? No.' That was Severine. Valka was dead. Was Valka dead? She was not dead. She couldn't be. That was a lie Jovan and the other sorcerers had told me. Prometheus had begged Heracles to slay him, and that bastard son of Jove had asked his father, the old Titan's jailer, to speed his arrow and release Prometheus from torment. But Jove, in his caprice, sent instead the eagle who tormented Prometheus to bear Heracles to the titan's side. But it was a trick Jove played, for not even Heracles could break the chain the father of the gods had used to bind Prometheus, and Jove laughed at him from the peak of Mount Caucasus. But Heracles was undaunted, and struck not the chain, but struck off the mad titan's arm, 
and fled with him from the god's dark mountain. So it was by many trials that Heracles brought the maimed Prometheus to his son, Deucalion, in the days before Jove sent his flood to wash away the world. Jove's arrogance had been his undoing, for it came to pass that it was Prometheus's fire in the hands of Deucalion that delivered mankind from the waters Jove sent to unmake them. But there was no Heracles nor any eagle. The chain was torment enough itself. Like Urbane had said, my story was no story at all. There was no hero coming to save me, no good to prevail. But there was evil. There is always evil. And the Sielsin were a flood come to wash mankind away. I blinked. There was no eagle. Only Urbane and Severine looking up at me, one grinning, the other stone-faced. They must cut him down. Severine was saying. Not yet, Urbane said to her. He's not done yet. Chapter 29 Marking Time Time is the mercy of eternity, or so the poets say. But the mind makes eternity of time. When Milton's monster said the mind might make heaven of hell, it was the father of lies who spoke those words, the very devil whose image my ancestors took for their sign. Great though the mind may be, even in its capacity for self-deception, it has limits. No mind can make heaven of hell, not even mine. You cannot dream your way out of prison, not truly, nor think your way from the camps. No one would say to those suffering under the Lothriad that they could simply imagine a better world. It is one thing to tell the slaves of the Sielsin to shoulder their burdens and fight to survive, quite another to tell them to imagine they wear no chains. I could not imagine I was free, or think my way out of pain. The torment on the wall continued until I thought I must lose my arm, until I knew I must starve. The tortured appendage was blue from blood loss and contusion, and ached worse as the blood returned to it each night. The torments of my guards worsened, their laughter grown harsher and more cruel. The mute slaves visited less and less, and when the Sielsen returned and didn't lower me down the wall, but draped my arms over their shoulders and marched me down through the Dar Yagon, beneath the sculptures of the Watchers, and out into that accursed city, and down once more by several winding stairs and blind tunnels to the cave cell with its iron door. I did not resist them. Alone again I slept. And for how long? No one came, not even death, though I heard her bony feet and the rustle of dark robes at the door to the hall many a time. Against my more rational parts, the animal in me staved her off, forced me to crawl on my belly like a worm, first to the water's edge, then to the replenished stock of ration bars Urbane had left for me. I could not let myself die. Valka was alive. I knew she must be. Urbane, Severine, Jovan. I knew they all had lied. I could not die. Not again. The pain ebbed by inches, wounds hardening to scars. In time, I knelt and stood, and cleaned myself in the waters, thereafter drinking only from the thin stream that ran down the limestone wall. In time, I began to carve my marks in the stone wall again, away from the first set I'd made. I was sure I'd marked a standard year, and surer still that more time had passed, for I could not account for my time above the gates, or the time I spent recovering on the floor. I might have lost months. But I had recovered, though I had not recovered anything like my full strength. I could hardly stand, and though my limbs were wasting of muscle, they seemed heavier to me than ever they had before. It was a trial to walk from one end of my cell to the next, and so most often I sat with my back against the wall, 
staring at the shrinking shadows as Urbane's watchful eye drifted lazily overhead. I muttered to myself and in time fell silent. The ration crate emptied and stayed empty. Desperation drove me to catch the slimy things that swam in the waters of my pool, to eat them raw and spit out the bones. In time I forgot the foul taste of the creatures, as I had forgotten the taste of wine and the warm caress of the sun. I had healed, but I had not healed well, and the motion of my torn shoulder was awkward and unsteady. I could not raise the arm above my head, no matter how I stretched it, nor could I raise it at all without pain. No matter. Though the three fingers left to me on that hand remained, that hand could never grasp a sword. Not well. In the Empire they might grow the bones and flesh anew, might mend the poorly knit tissues of my shoulder. But I was not in the Empire. I might never see the Empire again. That was a strange thought. I had grown to love it in its way. For all its faults and failings, it was home. I loved my Empire not for what it was, but for what it should be, what it must be. For whatever it was, it was not Darantun. It was not Padmarak. It was not Vorgosos. It was a place where humanity might live, might live and remain human. But it was lost to me, as I was lost in the dungeons of the enemy. Lost without a star, without the light of some other world to remind me that hell was only here, to remind me, as Gibson once had, that most of the universe was peaceful and quiet. The only light I had my enemy had given me, and it had illumined nothing save my cage.'